The Century's Armies and Arms By Lt. Col. Arthur L. Wagner Assistant Adjutant General, U.S. Army A true appreciation of the progress made in the arts and sciences in the 19th century can be obtained only by contrasting the conditions found at present with those existing a hundred years ago. The difference between the sperm candle and the electric light, between the stagecoach and the rapid-flying express train, between the flail and the threshing machine, between the handloom and the machinery of the modern woolen mill. Between the cruel medical operations of five score years ago and the skillful surgery, with the use of anesthetics, of the present day. Or between the mail carrier with letters in his saddlebags and the electric telegraph flashing news instantaneously from continent to continent. Marks the difference between the beginning of the 19th and the opening of the 20th centuries. But there is scarcely an agency that has been employed during this wonderful century for the improvement of the condition of man that has not been enlisted for his destruction. Steam, electricity, chemical knowledge, engineering skill, and mechanical invention have all been employed in the science of war, and everything pertaining to the organization, arms, equipment, supply, training, and even the size of armies has been so revolutionized that there is scarcely anything in common between the forces that fought at Marengo and those employed in recent wars, except the characteristic of being armed and organized bodies of soldiers under military leadership. The 19th century was born in the midst of war. All Europe was an armed camp, and the contest between the principles of the French Revolution and the old feudal system had taken the form of actual strife upon the field of battle. A great alteration was taking place in the methods of war. The old pedantic strategy of the Austrian school had already received a rude shock at the hands of the brilliant young Bonaparte, and the old tactical methods bequeathed by Frederick the Great were, also, soon to be shattered by the genius of the newer and greater warrior. To appreciate the changes that were already being made in military methods, a brief glance at the organization of the armed forces in the latter part of the 18th century is necessary. The Prussian army, as organized by the great Frederick, was regarded as the finest of the time. In it the most exact and machine-like methods were observed, the most careful accuracy in marching was required, drill was carried to mechanical perfection, volley firing was conducted with the greatest precision, and no skirmishers were employed. In comparison with later methods, the whole system may be characterized as exact, methodical, and slow. Armies were supplied entirely from magazines, by means of long and cumbrous trains, and the art of moving rapidly and subsisting on the country was still to be discovered. The French army produced by the Revolution, and led by such men as de Gamier, Hoche, Moreau, and Bonaparte, was trained to operate in column, to deploy quickly into line, and generally to act with celerity. While the impoverished treasury of the Republic compelled its armies to live entirely upon the country in which they were operating, as the only alternative to starvation. This entailed serious hardships to the soldiers, and great distress to the population of the country in which they were acting, but it marked distinctly the beginning of a new system of supply. Which contributed greatly to the rapid movement of armies. The French army, at the beginning of the century, contained no regiments but was organized into demi-brigades, each of which consisted of four battalions, each comprising ten companies, two of which were trained to act as skirmishers. These demi-brigades, with one or more batteries of artillery, constituted a division, to which a small force of cavalry was generally added. In 1805 Napoleon, then the supreme ruler of France, made important changes in the organization of the army. The demi-brigade was replaced by the two battalion regiments, each regiment now consisting of eight companies. Two regiments formed a brigade, and two brigades and a regiment of light infantry constituted a division. On the light regiment devolved the duties of skirmishers, namely, to harass and develop the enemy before the main attack. The divisions were grouped into larger organizations known as corps d'armée, or army corps, each of which consisted of all arms of the service, and was, in fact, a force capable of operating independently as a small army. 2 A Corps of Reserve Cavalry was also formed. In numbers the cavalry was equal to one-fourth, and the artillery one-eighth of the strength of the infantry. The infantry was armed with a smoothbore, muzzle-loading, flintlock musket, 
which required some 32 distinct motions in loading, and which had an effective range of only 200 yards. Though by giving it a high elevation it could do some damage at twice that distance. This weapon bore about the same relation to the magazine rifle of the present day that the old-fashioned sickle bears to the modern mowing machine. The artillery consisted of muzzle-loading, smoothbore guns, which had less than one-fourth the range of the modern infantry rifle. Cavalry, being able to form with comparative impunity within close proximity of the opposing infantry, could sweep down upon it in a headlong charge. And the use of the saber on the field of battle, now so rare, was then an almost invariable feature of every conflict. Under Napoleon the armies continued to live on the country, but magazines of supplies were carefully prepared to supplement the exhausted resources of the theater of war. In besieging a fortified place, the first parallel or line of batteries of the besiegers was habitually established at about 600 yards from the enemy's works, a distance then at long artillery range but which would now be under an annihilating fire from infantry rifles. The cannon used solid shot almost exclusively, though early in the present century a projectile, invented by Lieutenant Shrapnel, of the British Army, and which now universally bears his name, was introduced. This consisted of a thin cast-iron shell filled with round musket balls, the interstices between which were filled by pouring in melted sulfur or resin, to solidify the mass and prevent it from cracking the shell when the piece was fired. A hole was bored through the mass of sulfur and bullets to receive the bursting charge, which was just sufficient to rupture the shell and release the bullets, which then moved with the velocity that the projectile had at the moment of bursting. Shrapnel has at all times been a destructive missile, though in its early form it was insignificant in comparison with the man-killing projectile, which now bears the same designation. In the year 1806, the Congreve rocket was added to the weapons of war. It consisted of a case of wrought iron, filled with a composition of nitre, charcoal, and sulfur, in such proportions as to burn more slowly than gunpowder. The head of the rocket consisted of a solid shot, a shell, or a shrapnel. At the base was fastened a stick, which secured steadiness for the projectile in its flight. The range of the rocket was scarcely more than 500 yards, though a subsequent improvement, which dispensed with the guide stick and substituted three tangential vents, increased the range very considerably. Congreve rockets were used with effect in Europe in 1814 and against our raw militia at Bladensburg in the same year. They seem, however, to have depended more upon the moral effect of their hissing rush than upon any really destructive properties, and were effective mainly against raw troops and cavalry. The rocket is now an obsolete weapon, having made its last appearance in war in the Austrian army in 1866. The infantry of all the armies of continental Europe, when deployed for battle, was formed in three ranks. On the eve of the Battle of Leipzig, Napoleon, finding himself greatly outnumbered by the Allies, ordered his infantry to deploy in two ranks, in order that his front might approximate in length to that of the enemy. This formation had, however, been adopted by the British some years before, and had been used with great success against the assaulting French columns, in many of Wellington's battles in Spain. Where the steadfast Anglo-Saxon soldiery was able to maintain the thin red line, and throw the fire of every musket against the denser formation of its foes. It was not until the British troops encountered, upon our own soil, an Anglo-Saxon opponent as steadfast as themselves, and better skilled in marksmanship, that they were unable to achieve a victory over their enemies. True, our raw militia was everywhere beaten when it encountered the disciplined soldiers of Great Britain, but our regular troops at Chippewa and Lundy's Lane gallantly defeated the choice veterans of Wellington's campaigns. And, at New Orleans, an army composed mainly of hardy backwoods men, trained in Indian lighting, and expert in the use of the rifle, hurled back, with frightful carnage. Experienced British soldiers who had habitually triumphed over the best veterans of the French Empire. The Battle of New Orleans marked the introduction of the rifle as a formidable arm for infantry. It was by no means a new weapon, for it had been invented in Germany in 1498 but it had not been used to any extent in military service, mainly because of the slowness of loading. The capabilities of the rifle in the hands of an army of expert marksmen were, however, 
made so manifest by Jackson's great victory that the attention of military men was turned towards the weapon which had enabled a crude army to overwhelm the choicest troops of Europe. Yet it was not until 1850 that a practically efficient military rifle appeared. This was the invention of Captain Minnie, of the French army, and was the well-known Minnie rifle, long familiar to troops on both continents. The weapon was a muzzle loader, and its projectile, the mini ball, was of a conoidal shape, as shown in the accompanying figure. The ball being slightly smaller in diameter than the bore of the piece, the loading was easily accomplished. And the shock of the explosion against the cavity at the base of the bullet forced the lead into the grooves of the bore and caused the shot to take up a rotary motion on its axis, in other words, to take the rifling. Rifles, mostly constructed on principles similar to those on which Minnie's weapon was based, were soon in use in the armies of all great nations. The rifle musket, model of 1855, adopted by the United States, is shown in the accompanying figure. In 1817 percussion caps were invented in the United States, but some time elapsed before they were introduced into military use. And though the percussion rifle was known in 1841, the victorious troops which went with Scott in the brilliant campaign from Vera Cruz to the city of Mexico, six years later, were armed with the flintlock musket. In 1833, Colonel Colt invented the first practical revolving pistol. This weapon, especially in its present perfected form, is so well known as to need no description. The first pattern of Colt's revolver used paper cartridges and percussion caps. In the long period of peace which Europe enjoyed after the Battle of Waterloo, but little change was made in the organization of the armies of the great powers. And in the Crimean War, 1855-56, the composition of the English, French, and Russian armies did not differ materially from the constitution of the forces of the same nations in the Napoleonic Wars. Marked changes had, however, been made in the nature of the weapons. Most of the English and a part of the French infantry being armed with the rifle, though the Russian infantry, with the exception of a few selected regiments, were still armed with the smoothbore musket. Though the extreme range of the rifle at this time did not exceed 800 yards, and was inaccurate at half that distance, it was, nevertheless, a formidable weapon in comparison with the infantry musket of Napoleonic times. Rifled siege guns were employed by the British at Sebastopol, but they were not a success, and were soon withdrawn from the batteries. A striking indication of the increased range of artillery was furnished at Sebastopol, when the besiegers established their first parallel at a distance of 1,300 yards from the Russian works. In the Italian War of 1859 rifled cannon appeared for the first time upon the field of battle. They were employed by the French, and to their use was largely due the victories of the French and Sardinians over the Austrians. For many years the attention of artillerists had been devoted to the production of serviceable rifled artillery, and as early as 1846 an iron breech-loading rifled cannon had been invented in France by Major Cavalli. This gun fired a shell not dissimilar in shape to the projectile employed in the mini-rifled musket. In 1854, experiments with a Cavalli gun gave very satisfactory results, both in range and accuracy. But the breech mechanism seemed dangerously weak, and the rifled guns, adopted by the French and used with such effect in Italy, were muzzle loaders. In 1854, a breech loading rifled field piece was invented by Sir William George Armstrong. It was made of wrought iron bars coiled into spiral tubes and welded by forging. The breech was closed with a screw which could be quickly withdrawn for loading and sponging the gun. The projectile was made of cast iron, thinly coated with lead, and was, with its coating, slightly larger in diameter than the bore. The lead coating was crushed into the grooves by the force of the powder, the necessary rotation being thus given to the projectile. This gun gave excellent results in range and in rapidity and accuracy of fire, but it was not until some years after its invention that it was adopted in the British service. Other breech-loading cannon soon appeared. But in the United States Army the 3-inch Rodman muzzle-loading rifled gun was preferred to any breech-loader then devised, and was used with great effect throughout the War of Secession. This gun was made by wrapping boiler plate around an iron bar, 
so as to form a cylindrical mass, the whole being brought to a welding heat in a furnace and then passed through rollers to unite it solidly. The piece was then bored and turned to the proper shape and dimensions. The projectiles for rifled guns were generally coated with soft metal, or furnished with an expanding base or cup of similar metal or papier mache. Though in some systems they were furnished with studs or buttons which fitted into the grooves of the bore. In the case of the Whitworth gun, the projectile was made nearly of the exact size and form of the bore, so as to fit accurately into the grooves. Breech loading cannon were not, however, quickly adopted, owing, perhaps, to conservatism on the part of artillerists, and partly because the guns first produced did not seem to give appreciably better results in range, accuracy, or even in rapidity of fire than the muzzle loaders. Not only were breech loading cannon adopted with seeming reluctance, but rifled cannon generally were looked upon with disfavor by many artillerists of the old school. Hohenlohe tells of an old Prussian general of artillery who was so prejudiced against the rifled innovation that he requested, on his deathbed, that the salute over his grave should be fired with nothing but smoothbore guns. It must be confessed, however, that the 12-pound smoothbore Napoleon gun long held its own against the new rifled field pieces, as many a bloody battle in our civil war well attested. In the manufacture of heavy guns the United States for some time led the world. In 1860, General Rodman, of the Ordnance Department, produced the first 15-inch gun ever made. This gun was made of cast iron, and was cast on a hollow core, cooled by a stream of water passing through it, by which means the metal nearest the bore was made the hardest and most dense. And the tendency towards bursting was thus reduced to a minimum. General Rodman was also the inventor of the hollow cake powder, which consisted of cakes perforated with numerous small holes for the passage of the flame, thus enabling the powder to be progressively consumed. And causing the amount of gas at the last moments of the discharge to be greater than at the instant of ignition. A large grain powder, known as mammoth powder, was afterwards devised by him to produce the same results. It will be seen later that this invention has rendered possible the powerful ordnance of the present day. And it is perhaps not too much to say, that Rodman is really thus the father of the modern high-power guns. At the beginning of the War of Secession the heaviest gun in the United States was the 15-inch Rodman, the projectile of which weighed 320 pounds, the charge of powder weighing 35 pounds. Next to this was the 10-inch Columbiad, which fired a 100 pounds shell with a charge of 18 pounds, of powder. The effective range of these guns was a little less than 3 miles. The heaviest mortar was of 13-inch caliber, fired a 200 pounds, shell, with a charge of 20 pounds, of powder, and had a range of 4,325 yards. This mortar was, like all others then in use, manipulated by means of hand spikes, and not only was much less powerful, but was much more clumsy than the admirable mortar of the present day. The Crimean and Italian wars had foreshadowed the passing away of the old military conditions and the dawning of a new era of warfare. But it was in the gigantic struggle which rocked our own country for four years that the developments of modern warfare really commenced. At the beginning of this great conflict the ranges of 1,000 to 1,200 yards for field guns, and of 1,500 to 2,000 yards for heavy guns, were as great as could be secured with any degree of accuracy. The infantry rifle with which the Union and Confederate armies were armed had an extreme range of but 1,000 yards, and a really effective range of only half that distance. The rifle was a muzzle loader, which required nine distinct motions in loading besides those necessary in priming the piece with the percussion cap then used. The tactics employed at first in all arms of the service did not differ materially from the methods employed in the Napoleonic Wars. And a line of American infantry deployed for battle in two ranks, shoulder to shoulder, scarcely differed in anything but the color of its uniforms from the thin red line of Wellington's warriors. All this was to be changed. But it was not only in the matter of arms and tactics that a revolution was to be effected, for new forces hitherto untried were to be employed in the art of war. The War of Secession was not only one of the most gigantic conflicts ever waged on earth, but was one which will always be of interest to the military student because of its remarkable developments in the science of warfare. 
and one which will ever be a source of pride to Americans because of the grim earnestness and stubborn valor displayed by the contending armies. From first to last, more than two millions of men were enrolled by the United States, and in the final campaign 1,100,000 men were actually bearing arms in the service of the Union. The infantry was organized in companies of 100 men, 10 companies forming a regiment. At first, three or four regiments constituted a brigade, though it was afterwards formed of a greater number when the regiments became depleted by the losses of battle. Three brigades generally composed a division, which also habitually included two batteries of artillery and a small detachment of cavalry for duty as orderlies and messengers. Three or more divisions constituted an army corps. The cavalry was formed into brigades and divisions, which in the later years of the war were combined to form, in each of the large armies, a corps of cavalry. It was in command of such corps of mounted troops that Sheridan, J. E. B. Stuart, Merritt, and Wilson achieved their great fame. The batteries first distributed to divisions, or even brigades, were afterwards assigned to the Army Corps, and all guns not thus employed were grouped into a corps of reserve artillery. It is a curious fact that the two factors most important in warfare were found to be two inventions designed primarily for the interests of peace, namely, the railroad and the electric telegraph. Steam and electricity had both been used in the Crimean and Italian wars, but it was in the War of Secession that they received their first great and systematic application. The effect of the use of railroads in war not only enables armies to be more rapidly concentrated than was formerly the case, but renders it possible to supply them to an extent and with a certainty that would otherwise be out of the question. The difference between the supply of an army by wagon and by rail was clearly shown in the Siege of Paris, in 1870-71, where six trains a day fed the whole besieging army. While it is estimated that nearly 10,000 wagons would have been required for the same purpose. Moreover, the force of troops necessarily detached to protect a line of railroad communications is not nearly so great as the force that would be necessary to guard the innumerable wagon or pack trains that would otherwise be required. In the opinion of the best military authorities, railroads, had they been in existence, would have enabled Napoleon to conquer Russia, and with it the world. While, without the aid of railroads, the successful invasion of the South by the armies of the Union would have been an impossibility. It is only while it keeps moving that an army can live on the country. It is like a swarm of locusts, consuming everything within reach, and if it be compelled to halt, whether for battle or from other cause, it must be supplied from bases in the rear, or it will speedily disintegrate from hunger alone. This fact was fully appreciated by General Sherman, when he left Atlanta, in his famous, March to the Sea. For though he expected to, and did, live upon the country, he nevertheless took the precaution to carry with him a wagon train containing twenty days rations for his entire army. In the War of Secession the electric telegraph first appeared on the field of battle. The telegraph train became a prominent feature of all our armies. And the day's march was hardly ended before the electric wire, rapidly established by an expert corps, connected the headquarters of the army with those of each army corps, division, and brigade. But it was not in its employment on the actual field of battle that the telegraph found its most valuable military use. It enabled generals, separated by hundreds of miles, to be in constant communication with each other, and rendered it possible for Grant to control from his headquarters hut at City Point the movements of the armies of Sherman, Thomas, and Sheridan in combined operations, which enabled each to perform, in harmony with the others, its part in the mighty plan. It followed as naturally as day follows night that a shrewd and intelligent people, engaged in a desperate struggle for self-preservation, would avail themselves of all means provided by military science for carrying out the contest in which they were engaged. Ironclad vessels had been devised in both England and France, but they were merely frigates designed on the old lines and partly covered with a sheathing of armor. With characteristic energy and ingenuity the Americans, ignoring old traditions and seeking the shortest road to the fulfillment of a manifest want, produced simultaneously the Merrimack and the Monitor. The former resembling a gabled house submerged to the eaves, and the latter looking like a Yankee cheesebox upon a raft. 
These novel vessels met in their memorable combat at Hampton Roads, and the booming of their guns sounded the death knell of the old wooden navies. As with war vessels, so with firearms. New conditions were met with inventive genius and mechanical skill. Though the great mass of our troops continued throughout the conflict to use the muzzle-loading rifle, breech-loaders were in the hands of many thousands of our soldiers before the close of the great contest. In 1864 the cavalry of Sheridan and Wilson and many regiments of infantry were armed with breech-loading carbines, which gave them a great advantage over their opponents. The effect of the breech-loaders upon the Confederates was unpleasantly surprising to them, and the southern soldiers are said to have remarked with dismal humor that the Yankees loaded all night and fired all day. The principal breech-loading arms in use in the Union armies were the Sharps and the Spencer. In the Sharps carbine the barrel was closed by a sliding breech piece which moved at right angles with the axis of the piece, the breech being opened and closed by pulling down and raising up the trigger guard. The Spencer carbine was a magazine rifle, and was greatly superior to the Sharps. The magazine of the rifle lay in the butt of the stock, and was capable of holding seven cartridges. As the cartridge was fired and ejected another was pushed forward into the breech by a spiral spring in the butt of the piece. The Spencer carbine used metallic cartridges. The introduction of these cartridges was one of the most remarkable advances in the art of war made during the present century. The cartridge in use in 1864-65 is shown in the accompanying figure. It consisted of a thin copper case firmly attached to the bullet containing the powder, and having at its base a small metallic anvil, in a cavity of which was placed the fulminate, which was exploded by means of a firing pin. Driven in by a blow of the hammer. The advantages of the metallic cartridge can scarcely be overestimated, it rendered obsolete the percussion cap, and being waterproof it did away with the ever-present bugbear of damp ammunition. The old injunction, put your trust in God and keep your powder dry, has consequently lost much of its force. For while it is to be hoped that the soldier will continue to place his reliance upon providence, the latter part of the advice can now be safely ignored. Among the many advantages possessed by the breech loader over the muzzle loader, the principal ones are greater rapidity of fire, ease of loading in any position, diminished danger of accidents in loading, and the impossibility of putting more than one charge in the piece at the same time. This last advantage is by no means slight. Among 27,000 muzzle-loading muskets picked up on the battlefield of Gettysburg, at least 24,000 were loaded. Of these about half contained two charges, one-fourth held from three to ten charges, and one musket contained twenty-three cartridges. The failure of the Americans to produce during the Great War a practical breech-loading field gun is doubtless due to the fact that the field artillery in use at that time answered fully all the requirements then existing. Owing to the nature of the country in which the armies were operating, the range of the three-inch rifled gun was fully as great as could have been desired. And on the broken and wooded ground which generally formed our field of battle, the smoothbore Napoleon gun, firing shrapnel and canister, seemed to have reached almost the acme of destructiveness. Moreover, the muzzle-loading cannon, both rifled and smoothbore, were served with such celerity as to make it a matter of doubt for some years after whether the introduction of breech-loading field guns would materially increase the rapidity of fire. It was not until infantry fire had greatly increased in range and rapidity that a further improvement in field artillery became necessary. In siege artillery, heavy rifled guns of the Rodman and the Parrot type appeared. The Parrot gun was of cast iron, strengthened by shrinking a coiled band of wrought iron over the portion of the piece surrounding the charge. The famous Swamp Angel, used in the Siege of Charleston, was a parrot gun. The seacoast artillery consisted mainly of smoothbores of large caliber, which were able to contend successfully with any armor then afloat. It is a curious fact that the war, so to speak, between guns and armor has been incessantly waged since the introduction of the latter. Every advance of armor towards the degree of invulnerability being met with the production of a gun capable of piercing it. The seacoast artillery of the United States in the Civil War met fully every demand to which it was subjected. The War of Secession produced the first practical machine gun, the Gatling, though such guns were not used to any extent. The machine gun has, in fact, 
passed through a long period of gestation, and it is only in recent years that it can be said to have attained its full birth. Our Great War was also noted for the introduction of torpedoes. These peculiar weapons had, it is true, been devised many years before. And Robert Fulton had, in the early part of the century, devoted his inventive genius to the production of a submarine torpedo, which, however, was never practically tested in war. It was not until the contest of 1861-65 that torpedoes were of any practical use. The high explosives of the present day being then unknown, these torpedoes depended for their destructive force upon gunpowder alone. Yet crude and insignificant though they were in comparison with the mighty engines of destruction now known by the same name, they accomplished great results in more than one instance. The destruction of the Housatonic off Charleston, the sinking of the Tecumseh in Mobile Bay, and Cushing's daring destruction of the Albemarle, gave notice to the world that a new and terrible engine of warfare had made its appearance. But it was not merely by the production of new weapons that the Great American War was characterized. It marked the turning point in tactics as well. The first efforts of our great armies of raw volunteers were as crude as the warfare of untrained troops always is, and it was fortunate that we were opposed to a foe as unpracticed as ourselves. But as the troops gained experience in war, acquired the necessary military instruction, in brief, learned their trade and became regulars in all but name, they displayed not only a steadfast prowess, but a military skill that placed the veteran American soldier at the head of the warriors of the world. The art of constructing hasty entrenchments on the field of battle grew out of the quickness of the American soldier to appreciate the necessity of providing defensive means to neutralize, in some degree, the greatly increased destructive effect of improved arms. In this respect he was thirteen years in advance of the European soldier, for hasty entrenchments did not appear in Europe until the Turco-Russian War. True, entrenchment on the field of battle was as old as war itself. But the American armies were the first that developed a system of quickly covering the entire front of an army with earthworks hastily thrown up in the presence of the enemy, and often actually under fire. Skirmishers were no longer used merely to feel and develop the enemy. But in many of our battles, notably in Sherman's campaign in Georgia, the engagement was begun, and fought to the end, by strong skirmish lines successively reinforced from the main body, which they gradually absorbed in the course of the action. Here, too, the American soldier was fully six years in advance of the European warrior. For it was not until the Germans had been warned by the terrific losses incurred in their earlier battles with the French, in 1870, that they evolved from their own experience a system of tactics. The essential principles of which had already been demonstrated on the Western continent. The increased range of artillery again received a practical illustration, for at the siege of Fort Pulaski the Union batteries first opened fire at ranges varying from 1650 to 3400 yards from the Confederate fort. At the siege of Charleston shells were thrown into the city from a battery nearly five miles distant. In 1866, the brief but bloody war between Austria and Prussia suddenly raised the latter nation from a comparatively subordinate position to the front rank of military powers. The greatness of Prussia was born in the sackcloth and ashes of national humiliation. Forbidden by Napoleon, after her crushing defeat in 1806-7, to maintain an army of more than 40,000 men, her great war minister, Scharnhorst conceived the plan of discharging the soldiers from military service as soon as they had received the requisite instruction, and filling their places with recruits. In this way, though the standing army never exceeded the stipulated number, many thousands of Prussians received military training. And when Prussia declared war against Napoleon, after his disastrous Russian campaign, the discharged men were called back into the ranks, and there arose as if by magic a formidable Prussian army of trained soldiers. The principle of universal military service, thus called into existence in Prussia in time of war, had been continued through fifty years of peace, and enabled Prussia, with a population scarcely more than half as numerous as that of Austria, to place upon the decisive field of Koniggratz a larger army than that of her opponent. The Prussian system, which has since been copied by all the great military nations of Europe, 
is, in its essential features, as follows, every able-bodied man in the kingdom, upon reaching the age of twenty years, is available for military service. And each year there are chosen by lot sufficient recruits to maintain the army at its authorized strength. The great body of the male population is thus brought into military service. There are a few exceptions, such as the only sons of indigent parents, and a small number of men who are in excess of the force required. Any man who escapes the draft for three successive years, and all able-bodied men exempted for any cause from service in the regular army, are incorporated in the reserve. The term of service in the regular army is two years for the infantry and three for the artillery and cavalry. After being discharged from the regular army the soldier passes into the reserve, where he serves for four years. While in the reserve, he is called out for two field exercises of eight weeks duration each, and the rest of his time is available for his civil vocation. At the end of four years in the reserve he passes into the landwer, in which he is required to participate in only two field exercises of two weeks duration each. After five years in the landwer proper, he passes into the second levy of the landwer, where he is free from all military duty in time of peace, though still liable to be called to arms in case of war. From the second levy of the land where he passes, at the age of thirty-nine years, into the landsturm, where he remains until he reaches his forty-fifth year, when he is finally discharged from military duty. The soldier in the landsturm is practically free from all military duty, for that body is never called out except in case of dire national emergency. By this system Prussia became not only a military power but a nation in arms, in the blaze of whose might the military glory of Austria and of France successively melted away in humiliating defeat. The careful military preparation of Prussia in time of peace was by no means limited to measures for providing an army strong in numbers. Every year her troops were assembled in large bodies for practice in the maneuvers of the battlefield. This mimicry of war, at first lightly regarded by the military leaders of the other European nations, produced such wonderful effects in promoting the efficiency of the army that it has since been copied in all the armies of Europe, and is now regarded as the most important of all instruction for war. Though breech-loading rifles were, as we have seen, used in the War of Secession, the Prussian army was the first that ever took the field completely armed with such weapons. The Prussian rifle was not new, for it had been invented by a Thuringian gunsmith, named Dreys, about the time that the mini rifle appeared. Dreys' arm was known as the Zun Nedeljwer, or needle gun, and its effect in the Austro Prussian War was so decisive and startling as to cause muzzle loading rifles everywhere to be relegated to the limbo of obsolete weapons. Yet the needle gun was but a sorry weapon in comparison to those now in use, and was distinctly inferior to the Spencer carbine. Its breech mechanism was clumsy, it used a paper cartridge, it was not accurate beyond a range of 300 yards, and its effective range was scarcely more than twice that distance. The German infantry fought in three ranks, and its tactics was not equal to that employed by the American infantry in the War of Secession. The Prussian field artillery was the most formidable that had yet appeared, and consisted mainly of steel breech-loading rifled guns, which were classed as six-pounders and four-pounders, though the larger piece fired a shell weighing fifteen pounds. And the smaller projectile used a shell weighing nine pounds. In the Austrian army the infantry was armed with a muzzle-loading rifle, and the artillery consisted entirely of muzzle-loading rifled guns. The exalted military prestige gained by Prussia rendered it certain that she must soon enter the lists in a contest with France, whose commanding position in Europe was so seriously menaced by the rise of the new power. Foreseeing the inevitable conflict, Napoleon III endeavored to prepare for a serious struggle. The French infantry was armed with the Chassepot rifle, which had an effective range nearly doubled that of the needle gun. A machine gun, known as the Mitrailleuse, was also introduced into the French army. Much was expected of these new arms. But so superior was the organization, readiness, generalship, and tactical skill of the Prussians that the war was a practically unbroken series of victories for Prussia and the allied German states. Profiting by their experience in the course of the conflict, the Prussians formed their infantry for attack in three lines. 
the first consisting of skirmishers, the second of supports, either deployed or in small columns, and the third of a reserve, generally held in column until it came under such fire as to render deployment necessary. The skirmishers were constantly reinforced from the supports, and finally from the reserve as the attack progressed, the whole force being united in a heavy line. And opening the hottest possible fire when close enough to the enemy for the final charge. In its essential principles this attack formation is in use at the present day in the armies of all civilized nations. The Prussian artillery was handled with terrible effect both in battle and siege. A new demonstration of the increased power of artillery was given in the siege of Paris, in which shells were thrown from the heights of Clamart to the Pantheon, a distance of five miles. The next European war was the contest between Russia and Turkey, in 1877. In this conflict the American system of hasty entrenchments was used with success by the Turks, who were also armed with an American rifle, the Peabody, which enabled them to inflict serious losses upon the Russians at a range of a mile and a quarter. Owing to the Turkish entrenchments and the inferiority of their own arms, the Russians won their victories over much smaller armies only with a gruesome loss of life. A further impetus was given to the development of the infantry rifle, and the German tactical experience was confirmed by the Russian General Skoblev in the declaration that infantry can successfully assault only in a succession of skirmish lines. The war in Turkey was the last great European conflict. Subsequent campaigns of the Russians in Central Asia, of the English in Egypt, the Sudan, and India, of the Japanese in China, of the Turks in Greece, and the Americans in Cuba, have emphasized the lessons already taught and demonstrated the increased power of new weapons. Having taken a retrospective view of the military forces and weapons employed in the wars of the 19th century, let us now turn to a consideration of the armies and arms of the present day. The adoption of the system of universal military service has increased the size of the standing armies of the nations of Europe far beyond the proportionate increase of their respective populations. In round numbers, the strength of the armies of the great powers is as follows, Russia, 869,000, Germany, 585,000, France, 618,000, Austria, 306,000, Italy, 231,000, Great Britain, 222,000. Three not only are the standing armies greater than in the early days of the century, but, owing to the improved methods of transportation and supply, the forces now brought upon the field of battle are vastly larger than in the days of Napoleon. The French army at Marengo was less than 30,000 strong. At Austerlitz it was only 70,000, which was its strength also at Waterloo. In only two battles, Wagram and Leipzig, was Napoleon able to place 150,000 men on the field. And in the latter battle the armies of all Europe opposed to him numbered only 280,000. In more recent times Prussia alone placed upon the field of Koenigratz 223,000 men with which to oppose the Austrian army of 206,000. And at Gravelotte the great French army of 180,000 men was outnumbered by the German host of 270,000. It is probable that in the next great European war more than a million men will be found contending on a single battlefield. A detailed description of the armies of all the great powers would prove wearisome to the reader, for their points of resemblance are many and their general characteristics are the same. The German army may be taken as the most perfect specimen of a highly organized military force, and a description of its organization would answer with slight modification for the other armies of continental Europe. The infantry of the German army is organized in companies of 250 men each. Four companies constitute a battalion, and three battalions compose a regiment. The brigade consists of two regiments, and the division is composed of two brigades of infantry, four batteries of artillery, and a regiment of cavalry. The army corps consists of two divisions, a body of corps artillery composed of twelve batteries, a battalion of engineers, and a supply train. In round numbers, the fighting strength of the Army Corps consists of 30,000 men and 120 guns. The cavalry is organized in squadrons of 150 sabers each, five squadrons forming a regiment, only four of which are employed in the field, the fifth remaining at the regimental depot. 
the cavalry brigade consists of three regiments. And the cavalry division, which is composed of two brigades, aggregates 3,600 sabers. Thus a small part of the cavalry force is attached to the infantry divisions, while the bulk of it is organized into divisions composed of mounted troops alone, two batteries of horse artillery being attached to each cavalry division. The entire military force is divided into armies, each consisting of from three to six army corps and two or more cavalry divisions. The cavalry has about one-sixth and the artillery about one-seventh of the numerical strength of the infantry. The German cavalry is armed with sabre, carbine, and lance. The officers carry the saber and revolver. In the Army of the United States the organization differs in many respects from that of the German army. The infantry companies each consist of 106 men, including officers. Twelve companies form a regiment, and three regiments constitute a brigade. A division is composed of three brigades, and the army corps is made up of three divisions. The number of batteries assigned to the divisions varies, as also the amount of corps artillery. In the army operating in Cuba, the artillery was all in a separate organization, and was distributed to the divisions only on the eve of battle. Experience and theory alike suggest four batteries for each division and eight batteries for the corps artillery. No cavalry is assigned to the divisions, but a regiment is supposed to be assigned to each army corps. The main force of the cavalry is grouped together into cavalry divisions. The cavalry is organized into troops of 100 sabers, for troops forming a squadron, and three squadrons constituting a regiment. Three regiments form a brigade, and three brigades a division. The American Cavalry Brigade is thus of the same size as a Prussian cavalry division. The cavalry is armed with the saber, carbine, and revolver. The lance is unknown in the American army. Having viewed the composition of modern armies, let us now see how they are armed. A consideration of the powder now in use is a necessary preface to a description of the weapons employed in the warfare of the present day. The old fine-grained black powder familiar to every boy who has ever handled a shotgun has passed completely out of military use. The powders now employed usually have gun cotton or nitroglycerin and gun cotton for a base. They are practically smokeless, the product of their combustion is almost entirely gaseous, they leave no solid residuum, and are of the quality known as slow burning. Giving a constantly increasing pressure on the projectile from the moment of ignition to the time when it leaves the muzzle of the piece. These powders are manufactured in thin sheets or small tubes or cords, which, for small arms, are broken up into grains. They vary in color from light yellow to black. Before the adoption of smokeless powder, the cake powder invented by General Rodman had been highly developed and improved in the form of cocoa powder. This was made in hexagonal prisms, each perforated longitudinally, so as to have a hollow core. These grains were carefully arranged in the cartridges so as to have this core continuous from one grain to another. In order that upon ignition the combustion would begin in the interior and produce a constantly increasing volume of gas as the exterior surface of the grain was reached. Though the time of combustion was too rapid to be appreciated by the ordinary senses, it was, nevertheless, quite different from the practically instantaneous combustion of the old small grain powder, and was susceptible of accurate measurement. Much difficulty was experienced in overcoming the detonating tendencies of the smokeless powders, but at last the requisite slow-burning properties were obtained. The smokeless powder for large guns is made in cartridges composed of bundles of strips or cords, or in the same prismatic form as the cocoa powder, and the process of combustion is the same. The form of the gun is dependent entirely upon the nature of the powder used. As the pressure of the gas constantly increases with the burning of the powder, the maximum force will be reached at the moment the combustion is complete. The length of the bore should, therefore, be just sufficient to enable the powder to be entirely consumed at the exact instant the projectile leaves the muzzle of the piece. A shorter bore would cause much of the powder to be thrown out unconsumed while a much greater length would retard the projectile by subjecting it to the friction of the bore after the maximum force of the powder had been reached. This accounts for the greatly increased length of the modern cannon. 
a change in the method of gun construction has accordingly become necessary. Guns are no longer made of cast iron, but are built up of steel. The explosion of the powder is, of course, exerted in every direction, against the bore and sides of the piece as well as against the base of the projectile. This produces two strains. A longitudinal strain which is exerted in the direction of the axis of the piece, and a transverse strain which tends to burst the gun. It is necessary, therefore, to have the piece so strong, especially at the points of first explosion, as to counteract these strains, and thus cause the entire force to be exerted upon the projectile in the direction of the least resistance. This strength, or initial tension, is obtained by shrinking cylinders of steel over the original cylinder of the piece. Each outer cylinder or jacket being a few thousandths of an inch smaller in its interior diameter than the outer diameter of the cylinder which it encloses. And being expanded by heating to a sufficient degree to enable it to be slipped over the latter. Upon cooling, the jacket exerts a constant and powerful force of compression, which counteracts the outward pressure of the force of explosion. The longitudinal strain is less dangerous than the other, and is usually counteracted by an interlocking of some of the cylinders or hoops, to which the strain is transmitted from the breech plug. The art of building up guns has been of slow growth, the first efforts in this direction having been made by Sir W. G. Armstrong nearly half a century ago. The weight of the projectile of the present 16-inch gun in the United States service is 2,370 pounds, the charge of powder weighs 1,060 pounds, and the extreme range is more than 14 miles. The cost of each shot is $450, and when we consider that this does not include the wear and tear of the gun, it is evident that money has become more than ever before the sinews of war. Not less remarkable than the improvement in cannon is the improvement in mortars. These mortars are very unlike the clumsy weapons of that name manipulated by hand spikes, which were known in our great war. They are now mounted on a platform which turns on rollers. They are elevated or depressed by a mechanical appliance, are loaded at the breech, are accurately rifled, and can drop their projectiles on the decks of hostile vessels at a range of six miles. They are placed in groups of four, each in a separate pit, some batteries containing as many as four groups, or sixteen mortars. In all important seacoast batteries both guns and mortars are so arranged as to be fired by electricity, either singly or in volleys. A dynamite gun has been devised by Captain Zelinsky for the purpose, as the name implies, of throwing a projectile containing dynamite. Attempts to fire dynamite projectiles by means of powder have thus far failed. In the Zelinsky gun the propelling power is compressed air. The projectile contains from 50 to 60 pounds of gelatin dynamite, the explosion of which is terrific. Excellent results have been obtained with Zelinsky's gun up to a range of 2,000 yards, but as this is insignificant in comparison with the enormous range of high-power cannon using powder as a charge. The dynamite gun is still a weapon of limited usefulness. Although the dynamite gun has not as yet fulfilled the desired requirements as to range, promising experiments have been made in firing shells charged with high explosives from mortars using charges of powder. And it is probably a question of only a short time before means will be found for successfully firing dynamite in a similar manner. The great improvements in field artillery make the cannon of the early battlefields of the century seem, in comparison, almost like harmless toys. The modern field gun is made of steel, is rifled, loads at the breech, and has great rapidity and accuracy of fire. The extreme range of the 3.2-inch field gun in the United States service is about 4 miles. This, in fact, is beyond the ordinary range of human vision, and it is but rarely that the ground for so great a distance is free from features that obstruct the view. For these reasons the fire of field guns can seldom be utilized beyond a range of 2 miles. The projectile of the 3.2-inch field gun weighs 13 and a half pounds, and the charge of powder 3 and a half pounds. The 3. 6-inch gun is a still more powerful weapon, the weight of the projectile and charge being 20 and 4 and a half pounds respectively. Shells are used against inanimate objects, such as earthworks or buildings. But the great artillery projectile for the battlefield is shrapnel. 
It is now very different from the crude projectile known by the same name in the early years of the century. The bullets are assembled in circular layers and held in position by separators, which are short cast iron cylinders with hemispherical cavities into which the bullets fit. The bottom separator fits by means of lugs into recesses at the base of the shrapnel and prevents independent rotation of the charge of bullets. The top separator is smooth on its upper side and is kept firmly in place by the head of the projectile, which screws against it. The separators prevent movement or deformation of the bullets under shock of discharge, and being weakened by radial cuts, increase the effect by furnishing additional fragments of effective weight. The shrapnel for the 3. 2-inch gun contains 162 bullets 1 half inch in diameter and weighing 41 to the pound. The total number of bullets and individual pieces in the shrapnel is 201. The heavy seacoast guns are now mounted either in armored turrets, en barbette, or on disappearing gun carriages. The first system is very costly and is not generally used in the United States. The second system, in which the guns are fired over a parapet and are constantly exposed, is used only in rare cases. The third has been perfected in the United States in the Buffington Crozier and the Gordon disappearing gun carriages. These carriages enable the gun to be loaded in safety under cover of the carriage pit, and then to be raised by means of counterweights or compressed air to a position from which it can fire over the parapet. With trained cannoneers, the gun can be raised and fired in 20 seconds, and this brief period of exposure, especially when smokeless powder is used, renders it almost impossible for the enemy to locate the gun with any degree of accuracy. The shock of the recoil, taken up by pneumatic or hydraulic cylinders, brings the piece back, quickly but gently, to the loading position, whence it is again raised for firing. The siege artillery of the United States Army consists of the 5-inch gun, the 7-inch howitzer, and the 7-inch mortar. They all use shell, and their effective range is from 3 to 4 miles. When the enemy is sheltered behind entrenchments it is difficult to reach him with shrapnel fired from field guns. Field mortars have accordingly been devised for this purpose and have given excellent results. The United States 3. 6-inch field mortar is rifled, and carries a shrapnel weighing 20 pounds. The weight of the field mortar is only 500 pounds, and it can be easily carried in a cart drawn by a single mule. But great as the improvements have been in artillery, they are less important than the changes effected in the infantry rifle, for upon the quality of the infantry depends, more than upon anything else, the efficiency of an army. There are many kinds of rifles now in use in the different armies of the world, but in their essential principles they are very similar. All use smokeless powder, and all are provided with a magazine which admits of firing a number of shots without reloading. The Springfield rifle formerly in use in the United States Army has been replaced by the Krag Jorgensen, which has a magazine holding live cartridges, and is provided with a cutoff which enables the piece to be used as a single shooter. When an emergency demands rapid fire, the opening of the cutoff enables the cartridges in the magazine to be fired in rapid succession. The range of the Krag Jorgensen is 4,066 yards, being practically equal to that of the Mauser, which, in the hands of the Spaniards, inflicted casualties upon our men when they were more than two miles from the hostile position. The difference in the penetrating power of the Krag Jorgensen and the Springfield is shown in the accompanying illustration, taken from the report of the Chief of Ordnance for 1893. The Springfield lead bullet was fired with 69 grains of black powder, and penetrated 3.3 inches of poorly seasoned oak, the bullet being badly deformed. With a bullet covered with a German silver jacket the penetration was 5. 3 inches, the bullet being again deformed. The Krag Jorgensen used a bullet consisting of a lead core and a cupronickel jacket, which was fired with 37 grains of smokeless powder. The bullet penetrated well-seasoned oak to a distance of 24. 2 inches and was taken out in perfect condition. The new rifle, at short ranges, has an almost explosive effect and produces a shocking wound. But at ordinary ranges the wounds inflicted by it may be almost characterized as merciful, for the bullet makes a clean puncture, and unless a vital organ is struck the wound heals easily and quickly. 
The old expression of 40 rounds, so familiar to veterans of the Civil War, is now obsolete, for no soldier now thinks of going into action with less than 150 cartridges on his person. Not only is the firing more rapid than was formerly the case, but the lighter weight of the cartridge enables a greater number to be carried. From the rifle to the Gatling gun is only a step, for the latter is essentially a collection of rifle barrels fired by machinery. It consists of a number, generally ten, of rifle barrels grouped around, and parallel to, a central shaft, each barrel being provided with a lock. By turning a crank at the breech, the barrels and locks are made to revolve together around the shaft, the locks having also a forward and backward motion. The first of which inserts the cartridge into the barrel and closes the breech at the time of the discharge, while the latter extracts the cartridge after firing. Upon the gun, near the breech, is a hopper which receives the cartridges from the feed case. The cartridge falls from the hopper into the breech block of the uppermost barrel, and in the course of the first half revolution of the barrel it is inserted, the hammer is drawn back. And at the lowest point of the revolution the breech is closed and the cartridge is fired. As the barrel comes up in the second half revolution the cartridge shell is extracted, and when the barrel reaches the top it receives another cartridge. The Gatling gun can be fired at the rate of 1,000 to 1,500 shots a minute. It generally uses the same cartridge as the infantry rifle, but some patterns of the gun fire a projectile an inch in diameter, and approximate closely in their effect to a field gun. The gun is mounted either on a carriage similar to that of a field piece or on a tripod. Gatling guns were very successfully used by the British in the Zulu War and in the Sudan, and by our own troops in the battles around Santiago. The Gardner is a lighter machine gun than the Gatling. It consists of two parallel rifle barrels, and is operated by means of mechanism at the breech, which, as in the case of the Gatling, is worked with a crank. It can fire 500 shots a minute without danger of overheating, as the breeches are enclosed in a metallic water jacket. Its extreme portability makes it a most valuable weapon, though its firing capacity is not equal to that of the Gatling. There are several other types of machine guns, but the most ingenious, and perhaps the most effective, is the Maxim automatic gun. This has a single barrel, about two-thirds of which, from the muzzle towards the breech, is surrounded by a water jacket into which water is automatically injected at each discharge, thus rendering overheating impossible. The mechanism for operating the gun is at the breech, covering the remaining third of the barrel. All that is necessary is to draw back the trigger to fire the first shot. The recoil of the piece again cocks it, and the gun is then automatically fired, the process being kept up until the cartridges in the feed belt are all expended. The cartridges are fed to the piece by means of belts holding 333 rounds, two or more of the belts being joined together if desired. The Maxim gun can easily fire 10 shots a second, and if every man at the piece were killed the moment the first shot was fired the gun would keep on until it fired at least 332 more shots. The Gatling, Gardner, Maxim, and similar guns are known as machine guns. Of the same general family, so to speak, are rapid-fire guns, which are, however, distinguished from machine guns by having a larger caliber, loading by hand, having only one barrel and being provided with artificial means of checking recoil and returning the piece to the firing position. They use metallic ammunition, and have a breech mechanism which cocks the firing pin and extracts the empty case by the same motion which opens the breech for reloading. Rapid firing guns were first designed as a means of naval defense against torpedo boats. They deliver a rapid and easily aimed fire, and use projectiles of sufficient power to penetrate the plates of the boats. In the naval service the gun is mounted on a spring return carriage fixed to the vessel, so that the piece, when discharged, is brought back to the firing position without any derangement of aim. On land a rigid carriage is used. This carriage has a spade at the end of the trail, which is forced into the ground by the recoil and holds the gun and carriage in place. The principal rapid-fire guns are the Hotchkiss, Drig Schroeder, Nordenfeldt, Krupp, Canet, and Armstrong, which fire from 5 to 10 shots a minute and use either shell or shrapnel. Experiments are now being made in different armies with a view to adopting rapid-fire guns for field artillery. 
the principle of rapid fire, or quick fire, has been successfully applied to guns having a caliber as great as 6 inches. The metallic cartridge used in rapid fire guns is, in appearance, simply a big brother of the cartridge used in the infantry rifle. Closely allied with guns, both in coast defense and in naval warfare, are torpedoes. The crude weapons of this type, used in the War of Secession, have been developed into formidable engines of war, before whose destructive power the strongest vessels are helpless. For their classification and description see The Century's Naval Progress, pages 84, 85. The destructive power of torpedoes is so well known as to give them a great moral weight as a means of defense. The fact that the German harbors on the Baltic were known to be protected by torpedoes saved them from an attack by the French Navy in 1870-71, and Cervera's fleet in the harbor of Santiago, in 1898. Was safe from our squadron so long as the mouth of the channel was closed with Spanish torpedoes. Though necessarily brief, the foregoing sketch will show that in the course of the 19th century armies have increased enormously in size, and in the power of rapid movement and certainty of supply. Infantry has increased in relative numbers and in importance. Extended order fighting, in which the individuality of the soldier comes into play, has taken the place of the old rigid shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder line of battle. The private soldier's vocation has risen, in many branches of the military service, from a trade to a profession, and now, more than ever before, is extensive training in a high order of intellect necessary for the command of armies. Wars have become shorter, sharper, more decisive and more terrible, and increased emphasis has been placed upon the warning, in time of peace prepare for war. The Century's Progress in Agriculture By Waldo F. Brown Agricultural Editor, Cincinnati Gazette I. The vicissitudes of early farming. If the thought enters the mind of the reader that a youth of 67 is not competent to write upon agricultural improvement for the entire century, the answer is that such improvement can scarcely be said to have begun until near the middle of the century. That the early forties saw the writer at work on a farm, that he has ever since lived on a farm, and that he, therefore, writes from personal experience of the improvements which have transformed agriculture from a simple art to a profound science. To realize the progress agriculture has made, we must understand its condition in the first half of the century, and the causes which prevented improvement at that time. The soil was rich with the accumulations of centuries, and the farmer was at no expense to either maintain or restore fertility, for with but indifferent cultivation large crops could be raised. When a field became impoverished, with axe and torch a new field was soon cleared from the forest. The implements in use were of the crudest and mostly manufactured by the nearest blacksmith, and it cost but a few dollars to equip a farm. Still they were sufficient for the wants of the farmer of that date. So it will be seen that the difficulty was not in the farm nor with the farmer. For he could grow not only all that was necessary for family use, but more than enough to supply the demand for such market as he had. Perhaps the greatest difficulty in the way of agricultural progress was the want of transportation facilities. For a market was of little use to a farmer if he was separated from it by a hundred miles or more of roads which, through almost the entire winter, were so deep with mud that modern farmers would think them utterly impassable. With streams unbridged and hills ungraded. The first step toward relieving the farmer of this trouble was John Quincy Adams' message to Congress in 1827, when he recommended the construction of the National Road, the eastern terminus of which was to be in Maryland and the western at St. Louis, M.O. This road was constructed within a few years. It was the first outlet for the crops of the Great West, and over it, across the Allegheny Mountains, a procession of covered wagons passed during the entire year carrying the products of the farms to the eastern markets and bringing back manufactured goods. One other avenue was open for the interchange of products between these two sections, the Erie Canal being completed in 1825 and enlarged and improved many years later. During the thirties, just preceding the era of railroads, there was almost a craze on the subject of canal building, and scores of miles of canals were begun which were never completed. As with the beginning of the fourth decade of the century the railroad idea had taken possession of the minds of the people. 
In some cases the towpath of the canal formed the roadbed for the railroad which superseded it, and probably more lines of canal were abandoned than were completed. The era of railroads, that wonderful factor which was to revolutionize farming, dates from about 1830. The first locomotive in the United States was imported from England and placed upon the rails in 1829, and in 1830 the first American locomotive was built. It was, however, very near the middle of the century before the system of railroads had been completed so as to materially improve the condition of agriculture. And although the fact may sound strange to some, the first railroad train ran into Chicago in 1852. During these years of depressed agriculture, however, the population of the country was rapidly increasing. While the railroad system of the country was developing, turnpikes were being built radiating from the principal markets and railroad stations. With the beginning of the second half of the century the farmers awoke to the fact that the United States was a large and populous nation, requiring an immense amount of supplies. And that improvements for transportation had been furnished so that the markets were easily accessible. Before passing, however, from the discouragements and difficulties of agriculture in the early days, some practical illustrations of the difficulties met with seem necessary to give a clear understanding of the condition. What would the farmer of today think were he obliged to start with a load of wheat in midwinter over roads which crossed unbridged streams and wound over clay hills, not a rod of which was macadamized and all of which were poorly graded? Spending ten days with a four-horse team to make a round trip of one hundred miles with thirty-five bushels of wheat, and sell it in the market for thirty-five cents a bushel. Yet such was the fact which the writer had from the lips of a farmer who had been through this experience. Two thoughts may occur to the reader, first, that thirty-five bushels was a light load for a four-horse team, and, second, that hotel bills would more than absorb the money received from such a load of wheat. But both of these are explained by saying that one cause of the lightness of the load was that the farmer must carry feed for his team for the entire trip, and another, the uncertainty of the condition of the roads. For though he might start with the roads frozen solid and possibly worn smooth by the teams which had preceded him, he was liable on the trip to meet with a sudden thaw which reduced the roadbed to mortar. So that the wheels would sink almost to the axle, and in many cases the load would be found too heavy for his team. It was no uncommon sight to see a score of places to the mile where the fences had been torn down and rails carried into the middle of the road to be used in prying the wagons out of the mud when hopelessly mired. The reason the hotel bills did not consume the proceeds of the load was that there were none, for the farmer carried his camp kettle, bedding, and provisions with him, and slept in the wagon during his entire trip. The same farmer referred to, in telling his story, said that all the money spent on the ten days trip was three fips, eighteen and three quarters cents, and that, presumably, was for three nips of whiskey. An interesting personal experience in the winter of 1846-47 was in driving hogs from Anderson, Indiana, to Cincinnati, Ohio, a distance of about 150 miles. The drove was started with the mercury at zero, and the first difficulty met was in getting them across White River, as there was no bridge and the stream must be forded. The hogs absolutely refused to enter the icy water, but the pioneer of that day was equal to any emergency. The drove was soon huddled on the bank, rails were carried from an adjoining field, and a close pen was built around them. Then two plucky frontiersmen, with thick leggings reaching from ankle to hips, towed them by the ears to frozen shoal water in the center of the river, and pushed them across the ice, when they were obliged to go ashore on the other side. Two days later a sudden and unexpected thaw set in, when for one hundred weary miles the drivers urged the hogs through mud which reached from fence to fence, and which was so fluid that not a trace was left behind. As it flowed in to fill not only the track of the hogs but the footsteps of the drivers. When after days of urging the hogs began to lose strength and fall by the way, they settled down into the ooze, from which the men must lift them into wagons which accompanied the drove or were hired from farmers along the road. When Cincinnati was reached it seemed that the worst trouble of the journey was over. But not so, for the climax of disaster with this drove was reached at the slaughterhouse, when for two weeks the weather was so warm that no slaughtering could be done, and the price of pork declined day by day. 
until the entire drove was finally sold at one and three quarters cents per pound dressed weight, and during the entire time, both on the road and in the pens, the hogs had been losing rapidly in weight every day. This was the lowest price recalled for hogs, but it was very common to have a glut in the market of some staple which reduced the price so low that it scarcely paid for transportation, and in some cases made it actually unsaleable. A neighbor relates that when he was a boy, needing some money, his father made him the offer that he might have all the corn that he would shell, take to mill, and market the meal in Cincinnati, forty miles distant. He went to work with a will, prepared a two-horse load, and reached Cincinnati with it safely, only to find the market glutted so that he could not get an offer on it. A part of it was finally sold at ten cents per bushel, and the remainder was taken home. During the closing years of the fifth decade the prices of stock were at the lowest, good dairy cows bringing from $7 to $9 per head. Yearling calves from $1 to $2, the very best horses, $40, and stock hogs selling for $1 or $2 each. At the same time many of the necessities of life were sold at exorbitant prices, and an examination of an old account book shows the following figures, salt, $4 per barrel, nails, 6 to 8 cents per pound, calico, 12 and a half cents per yard. Drilling, 25 cents per yard, clocks, $40 each, the value of the best horses. Some other facts must be taken into consideration to understand why the farmers did not attempt improved methods. One was the condition of the currency. The United States Bank, which it would seem should have afforded security and stability to the currency, had been wrecked by the action of Andrew Jackson in vetoing its rechartering and withdrawing the United States funds, at that date about $43.000 from it. And private banks had been established over the entire West and South, a system of what was then known as wildcat banks supplying the people with currency. The man who was trading needed to carry in his pocket at all times a bank detector, to which he might refer to ascertain how many cents on the dollar the issue of each bank was worth. Looking back at the condition of affairs as described, remembering how few the markets, how easily glutted, how unstable the currency, and all the uncertainties connected with the disposal of the farmer's products. What was there to stimulate him to improve his methods or increase his products? If, as was occasionally the case, the farmer determined to improve his stock, he must import from England or buy at high prices from an importer, and there being no express companies to deliver his stock. He must either go in person or trust to private individuals to drive them over the mountains or, if small stock, to bring them in wagons the entire distance. He could not afford to carry on a wide correspondence, for each individual letter cost 25 cents postage, if the distance was over 300 miles. It was not until 1845 that postage was reduced to 10 cents, and 10 years later it was reduced to 3 cents for letters of half an ounce. If anyone is inclined to throw the blame upon the farmers for not having done their part to improve agriculture and bring prosperity, he should consider the conditions under which they had lived for a generation, the uncertain markets. The low prices of products, that they must construct roads and bridges, build schoolhouses and churches, clear the farms, nearly all of which were covered with heavy timber, and the fact that all this work was done with the crudest implements. It will be seen that the farmers had been accomplishing wonders and were worthy of the highest praise rather than blame. With the beginning of the last half of the century, the farmers suddenly awoke to the fact that the conditions had become wonderfully favorable. Towns and cities were growing up on every hand, offering new markets. Railroads and other means of transportation were opening to them. Inventive genius had taken up the improvement of implements of agriculture, and, best of all, prices had advanced greatly for all the leading products. The improvements of methods in farming, which have not been less than those in manufacturing and other callings, date from this time, and will be described under the following heads, improvements in implements, in stock, in drainage and tillage. In the maintaining and increasing of fertility, in care and feeding of stock, in and around the farmer's home, in education, which includes agricultural literature, farmers' organizations, and schools. 2. Improvements in farm implements and machinery. 
In writing on the improvements in agriculture one can scarcely fail to be impressed with the fact that whenever the human race comes to the point that it must have helped and make a demand upon nature, she always honors the draft. And as the steps are portrayed by which the agricultural products of this continent have been increased a hundredfold, while the power of the individual worker has increased wonderfully, and the labor has been lightened by machinery. We can see that these inventions and improvements came just as fast as they were needed, and no faster. God has given to the human mind such power, and to the hand such skill, that whatever is necessary is soon provided when the want is made known. Perhaps there is no better way in which this can be traced than in the appliances by which the farmer feeds the world. It is an interesting study to note the successive steps in the improvement of implements for the work of the farm. In the beginning of the century the sickle and flail were all that were needed to cut and thresh the grain, and it was by a series of steps that the steam thresher and the combined mower and binder were evolved. The sickle was all that was needed until population increased and markets were made accessible, then the cradle was invented. With the former, an expert could cut an acre a day, and with the latter four or more acres. But all the work was done by human muscle. The man using a sickle must work with bended back all day. The cradle enabled him to work erect, and lightened the labor, but when the reaper sickle was invented the labor was transferred to brute muscle. The first machines were clumsy and heavy to draw, requiring as much, or more, power to cut the grain as to cut and bind it with the light running modern binder. Now, the man who sweltered with bended back ten or twelve hours to cut an acre of grain with the sickle, drives his team afield, and by simply guiding it cuts and binds ten or fifteen acres a day, and carries the bundles to the shock row. The improvement in threshing machinery has been as marked as in that for harvesting the grain. In the first part of the century all the work was done with the flail, and on farms where a large amount of grain was grown it kept a man busy a good part of the winter to thresh it. The first improvement was in threshing the grain by tramping it out with horses, and with two men and four horses, under the most favorable conditions, from fifty to one hundred bushels could be threshed in a day. But by both these methods there was the disadvantage that in all damp weather the work must be stopped, as the grain would become so tough that it could not be threshed. Another disadvantage of these methods was that it took a long time to prepare the crop for market. And in case of a sudden rise in price the farmer could not take advantage of it as he now can when his grain is all threshed in a single day and held in the granary for sale. In the thirties, the first threshing machines were put in use, and were but little improvement over the method of tramping with horses. The machines were of small capacity, and simply threshed the grain, but did not separate it from the straw and chaff, both of which operations had to be done by hand. And if the straw was to be saved, either in the barn or in a stack, it had to be all handled with rakes and forks. The first threshing machine that the writer ever saw was one that was called the Traveler. This was followed by machines run by stationary horsepower. These were called chaff pilers, from the fact that they threshed the wheat but did not separate it from the straw or chaff. The first horsepowers were inclined planes, or endless chain powers, as they were called, and were run by the weight of the horses, the floor revolving under their weight as they attempted to go up the grade. These were soon superseded by lever powers, made at first for two or four horses, but afterward increased in size and power until ten or twelve horses were used. And about this time the machinery for separating the grain and chaff was added to the machine. It almost seemed to the farmers at this time that perfection had been reached when two or three hundred bushels could be threshed in a day and also cleaned. But the feeding of this large number of horses was a heavy tax upon the farmers, particularly when a rainy day would intervene before the job was finished, and they were obliged to keep the horses two or three days. The invention and introduction of the mounted steam engine not only saved the farmer from this expense, but also increased the power and doubled the daily capacity of the machine. For a short time the farmers were satisfied with this. But the engine was heavy, and often the farmers' teams were light, and as it was the rule that each man must draw the engine from his farm to where the next job was to be done, and often the distance was great and the roads bad. It was not long until he tired of this. Then came the traction engine, which not only transported itself but also drew the thresher and separator. 
About this time another difficulty arose. For now that the machine had been improved and the power increased so that under favorable conditions a thousand bushels could be threshed in a day, the handling of the straw became a serious problem. For it was impossible to build it in a stack suitable for keeping as fast as the machine would deliver it. The first step to lighten and expedite this labor was in adding a straw carrier, a kind of revolving platform, which was attached to the separator and would lift the straw some twelve or fifteen feet. For a year or two the farmers were satisfied with this help, but soon found that it was inadequate for the work. Then the stacker was invented, a separate machine which was backed under the straw carrier to receive the straw, and which had, mounted on wheels, an elevator which would carry the straw to a height of twenty-five or thirty feet. And not only could it do this, but it was the work of a moment, with a crank at its base, to raise it, and it could be run at any angle. When the machine first started, the straw carrier was placed horizontally, and as the stack grew in height, it was raised until in the finishing out of the stack it stood at an angle of 45 degrees or more. The straw carrier could not only be raised, but by an ingenious arrangement of small wheels, it could be moved from side to side by a light pressure with one hand, or by a man on the stack pushing it with his fork. With this admirable machine for handling the straw, it seemed as though perfection had been reached, and that there was now practically nothing more to be desired. But it was not long until the farmer found that with the delivery of six tons of straw per hour it was heavy work for six men to build the stack, and that it was the most disagreeable work about the machine because of the dust. About 1890, some inventive genius produced the blower to take the place of the stacker. This is a long-jointed tube, some 16 or 18 inches in diameter, mounted at the rear of the cylinder through which the straw is forced by compressed air which is furnished by the machine. It can be raised or lowered, turned to the right or to the left, so as to deliver the straw at any desired point on the stack. It is managed by a man standing on top of the separator near the rear end, does away entirely with any hands on the stack, and thus reduces the force about six men. Some other improvements which have been added are the putting of knives in the cylinder to cut the bands, thus saving one or two hands. For often it was necessary to have a man on each side for cutting the bands when the wheat was dry and the work was done with the greatest rapidity. Then a revolving platform, called a self-feeder, was added in front of the cylinder, on which platform the bundles could be thrown from a wagon standing on each side, and be carried automatically and dumped into the cylinder. Doing away with the man who formerly fed the bundles to the machine. To some machines an automatic weigher has been attached which does away with a man for measuring and keeping tally of the wheat. Compare for a moment this modern machinery which, with a force of twelve or fourteen men, will thresh and clean for market from twelve hundred to sixteen hundred bushels of wheat per day, with the man with the flail laboriously pounding out ten bushels. And you will get a vivid idea of the progress in agricultural machinery. One somewhat curious fact must be taken into account in this, which is, that with some of these most wonderful machines the cost of labor is about the same it formerly was. But the advantage is that the work can be done in a few hours, and the farmer's crop be ready for market to take advantage of increased prices, while by the old plan the work would reach almost through the winter. In the cutting and handling of hay there has been as great improvement as in any portion of the farm. A first-class mowing machine, new from the shop, can now be bought for $40 or less, and with it the farmer can drive to the field after supper, in the cool of the day, and in an hour cut more grass, and do it better. Then a man could with a scythe by working hard all day. Instead of shaking out the swath slowly with a fork, with a single horse hitched to a hay tether about two acres an hour can be shaken up and left in such shape that both sun and wind have perfect access to it and cause it to cure rapidly. Instead of raking the hay laboriously by hand, a steel sulky rake does the work easily and quickly, doing more in an hour than was possible in a day with the hand rake. On farms where the acreage of hay is large, a self-loader attached to the rear of the wagon gathers the hay from the windrow and delivers it on the wagon. At the barn, instead of the slow and wearisome hand pitching, the hay fork and hay carrier deliver it in the top of the highest barns. The invention of the hay baler enables the farmer now to condense his crop, so that one-third of the room for storage formerly required for hay will answer. 
and it also enables him to ship it to market by rail, where formerly it was necessary that it should be taken in wagons. While the plow has not been improved to the extent that many of our farm implements have been, it is vastly superior to those used by the pioneers, and modifies somewhat the adage of, poor Richard. Who wrote? He who by the plow would thrive. Himself must either hold or drive. For the modern plowman must not only hold and drive, but drive three horses at that, and turn as many acres in a day. Another adage attributed to poor Richard was. Plow deep while sluggard sleep. And you shall have corn to sell and keep. But the modern farmer has learned that the depth to which he plows must be governed by the nature of his soil, and that deep plowing on heavy clay lands, or lands with a crude subsoil, is often the cause of short crops and permanent injury to the soil. It is doubtful if in any line of farm implements there has been more improvement than in that of Harrow's. And yet this improvement dates back but about a quarter of a century, as previous to that time the old, a, harrow or drag, which was hard on the team and did indifferent work, was the only one found on most farms. More recently the cutting and slicing harrows have been largely introduced, and many other forms of improved harrows have been put on the market. For the preparation of hard land for a seed bed, especially for small grain, the disc harrow cannot be excelled. But for garden use, or for pulverizing sod land which has not been too much compacted, the slicing acme harrow is the most perfect implement in use, it being of light draft, easily transferred from field to field, and capable of making the finest and best seed bed. The cultivators in use have been greatly improved. It is necessary to describe but two of them. The two-horse cultivator with fenders, which enables the farmer to cultivate both sides of the row at once, driving two horses in the field instead of one, as by the old method, has more than doubled the capacity of the individual. As by its use he is able not only to cultivate both sides of the row at once, but to dispense entirely with the man who, under the old rule, was obliged to follow the cultivator and uncover the corn. This fender is exceedingly simple, and the only wonder is that it took the farmer so long to find out its value. Costing but a few cents, it has saved the farmers millions of dollars, as previous to its adoption it was necessary to have one man follow each one horse plow to uncover the corn. There are two forms of this fender, the simplest being a light piece of galvanized sheet iron attached to the cultivator or plow so as to come just between it and the row of corn. The other is in the form of a rolling cutter, and attached in the same way. With either of these the farmer goes into the field as soon as the young plants can be seen in the row, drives his team astride the row, and stirs every inch of the soil. Putting a little fresh earth around each hill of corn or potatoes without covering a single plant. As a single state grows some millions of acres of corn, it can be seen that the saving from this little invention to the farmers amounts to millions of dollars in a single year. The old idea of deep cultivation of most crops has been proven to be wrong, and modern implements are made to cultivate the surface to a depth of two or three inches rather than to tear up the roots of the plants. And one of the most perfect of all implements for this purpose is the Planet Junior One Horse Cultivator. Perhaps no other class of machines has relieved the farmer more than the ones for planting the grain. And with a modern two-horse corn planter two rows can be planted at a time in checkered rows, so that it can be cultivated both ways and with more precision, both as to alignment and as to the number of plants in a hill. Then by the old hand method of planting. The small grain is sown by a two-horse drill arranged for not only the grain, but at the same time to deposit commercial fertilizer along the rows of grain, and with a grass seed sower attached. In the garden a hand drill is used. It is easily adjustable to any sized seed, from that of the turnip up to beans and peas, and the seed is perfectly distributed in straight rows, while the garden hand cultivator does away largely with the use of the hoe. One other modern implement, which promises to be very useful, is, the weeder, and its value rests on two facts which it required the farmer many years to discover. The first is that the thorough pulverizing of the surface, even to the depth of an inch, breaks the capillaries and checks the evaporation of moisture. But to do this it is necessary that the work be done just as soon after a rain as the land will crumble, 
and since often if a drying wind blows the land gets dry in a few hours. A machine is needed that will enable the farmer to thus stir a large surface in a short time. And this the weeder does, as it is made to cover the width of three rows at once, and more than two acres an hour can be stirred with a single machine. The other fact which makes this implement of great value is that all weeds are easily exterminated when in embryo, and this stirring of the soil kills every one that is starting. One other machine which has been greatly improved is the clover huller. Previous to its invention, most of the clover seed was sown in the chaff, and when clean seed was required it took several days' work with four horses to tramp out three or four bushels, and then much of the seed was left in the chaff. The modern huller is equipped with the blower and self-feeder, and with it from 20 to 50 bushels can be hulled and cleaned in a day, the amount depending on how well filled the heads are with seed. It is quite recently that machinery has been invented that relieves the farmer of the hard work of planting potatoes by hand, and at the same time does the work better than the old way. As the machine drops the seed at a uniform distance apart and covers it perfectly. A man with this machine will do the work of eight or ten men dropping by hand. Several potato diggers, operated by horsepower, have also come into recent use. They greatly lighten and accelerate the work, and the cost of growing potatoes has been reduced several cents a bushel by these inventions. 3. Improvement of Stock Perhaps it would be well in beginning to write on this subject to ask, what is, pedigreed stock? Many people have the idea that pedigreeing is an arbitrary rule adopted by stock growers to mystify the buyer and secure larger prices for their stock. The fact is that it is intended as a protection to the purchaser, and is, or should be, a guarantee that the stock has been bred along certain lines for a sufficient period to establish the desirable qualities which it is wished to perpetuate. A rigid censorship is exercised over the record books, and it makes every one recording stock, in a certain sense, a detective to see that the records are truthful and represent the animals just as they are. It is doubtful if along any line of farm operations there has been greater improvement than in the breeding and care of stock, yet there were greater difficulties to overcome in doing this than in improving the implements. These difficulties may be classed as follows. First, the one already alluded to in the opening chapter, to wit, the expense of importing in the consequent high price of thoroughbred animals. And when we recall that this was at a time when the farmers were hewing out their homes from the forest, and could not obtain large prices for their products, it will be seen that few farmers could afford to improve their stock. Second, as to cattle and hogs, it was almost impossible to breed pure stock. For all animals were allowed to run at large, and the woods were full of tramp males, which would break through the fences and invade the fields where the improved stock was kept. Third, those engaged in breeding stock found that there was a limit which when reached brought barrenness to high-bred animals, and in many other cases reduced the vitality so as to invite disease. That this evil was a real and serious one is shown from the fact that large numbers of high-priced animals failed to produce young among cattle, and that many herds of pedigreed swine were carried off by epidemic diseases. Fourth, and perhaps the most serious hindrance to improvement, was the indifference of farmers and the want of appreciation of good stock, and of course the farmer who did not want it would not cooperate in producing it. The difference between the improvement of implements and stock consisted largely in the fact that trained mechanics were responsible for the former, and they would perfect the implements until the farmers could not afford to do without them. While the slipshod farmer would be satisfied with his common stock, and would fail to accept the help of the men who were trying to improve it. Another thing which farmers learned slowly was that good stock requires good care, which not only means shelter and liberal feeding, but also that the food be adapted to the wants of the animal. More fine animals were ruined by overfeeding with corn, a heating and fattening diet, than by insufficient food and exposure to cold and storm. It took many years to teach the farmer what a balanced ration was, and why it was necessary. It would be interesting to take up each separate breed of cattle and trace its source, giving credit to the men who improved and developed it, and the date of each importation. But the limitations of this article forbid anything more than brief mention of the more prominent breeds, and many which possess great merit cannot be even mentioned. The improved cattle of the United States may be grouped under three heads, beef, dairy, 
and general purpose. Of the first the short horn holds, perhaps, the highest place, or certainly did for a long series of years. These for many years were bred under the name of Durham, but about a generation ago the name began to undergo a change to shorthorn. These animals, while especially adapted to the block, are fairly good milkers, and some strains of them are superior dairy cows. They have the quality of early maturity and produce a larger percent of fine cuts of meat than most, if not any, other breeds. These cattle were first imported into America in 1797, and many other importations were made during the first half of the present century. Another breed which closely resembles the short horn is the Hereford. These cattle are usually of a uniform color, a pale red, with white face, breast, and flanks, and drooping horns. They were first introduced by Henry Clay in 1817. Another importation was made in 1840, but it was not until 1860 and subsequently that they were imported largely and a herd book established for them. Since that time they have multiplied largely. The last of the three distinctly beef breeds is a hornless race originating in Scotland, and known by the name of Aberdeen Angus, Galloway, or Polled Cattle. These cattle have the distinctive quality of hardiness, and as they have very thick, close hair they are able to subsist on the range without shelter better than perhaps any other breed. The males have a remarkable prepotency, and the crossbred animals very rarely show horns. Like the Herefords, they are poor milkers, for while their milk is rich, the quantity is small, and they usually go dry for several months of the year. They were first imported into this country about 1850, and in 1883-900 were imported and distributed among the cattle breeders of the plains. Polled cattle are becoming more popular every year, and many farmers now dehorn the cattle of other breeds, and the time is not far distant when horned cattle will be the exception and not the rule. The Channel Island group, the Jerseys, Alderneys, and Guernseys, embraces unquestionably the best butter animals of the world, and if we are to judge by their wide distribution and great popularity, the Jerseys lead the list. They were first introduced into the United States in 1820, and in 1850 large importations were made, but it was during the decade from 1870 to 1880 that greatest interest in the breed was awakened and large and frequent importations were made. There has been a strong and bitter opposition to these cattle by many farmers on account of their small size, but they have won their way until they are more universally distributed, and are to be found on more farms than any other breed. Remarkable yields of butter from the individual have been recorded, many of them running from 12 to 18 pounds per week under high feeding and extra care. While the Ayrshire possesses great merit, so few of them have been imported into this country that it seems scarcely worth while to more than mention them. Under the head of general purpose animals come the Holsteins, Devon, and Red Poles. All of these breeds possess fine qualities. The Holsteins were probably not introduced into this country until the last half of the century, and the Holstein Herd Book, published in 1882, shows that about 5,000 registered animals were in this country at that date. While fair beef cattle, the Holsteins are deep milkers, and show a record of the largest quantity of milk of any breed in America, some cows giving over 12,000 pounds of milk in a year. The milk, however, is not as rich in butter fat as that of the Jersey but probably they are the best breed of dairy cows for the cheese factory in the United States. The Devons are beautiful red cattle. They do not rank as large milkers, but produce a superior quality of milk, and are unexcelled in this respect by any breed but the Jersey. One peculiarity about the breed is the comparative smallness of the cow. For while the steer will weigh from 1400 to 1600 pounds, the cows will average only from 800 to 1000 pounds each. The importation of red poles from England is comparatively recent, and they come nearer filling the idea of a general purpose animal than any other breed in America. The first importation was made in 1873, and consisted of only four animals. Two years later four more were imported, and in 1882-25. Other importations soon followed. They are of a uniformly cherry red color, with occasionally the tip of the tail white or a little white about the udder. 90% of the grades are hornless. 
They are of large size, mature bulls weighing from 1,800 to 2,200 pounds, and occasionally one will exceed 2,500 pounds. Cows weigh from 1,100 to 1,600 pounds, and will average 1,200. That they mature early the following weights, copied from the report of the Smithfield Club, of England, will show. Steer, 22 and one half months old, weighed 1,390 pounds. Heifer, 21 and three quarters months old, weighed 1,258 pounds. Steer, 23 and one half months old, weighed 1,500 pounds. Steer, 22 months old, weighed 1,336 pounds. At the same show a mature cow was exhibited that weighed 1,903 pounds. As dairy cattle they show good records, giving an average of 5,500 pounds of milk per year, and some have exceeded 500 pounds of butter in a year, milking over 300 days. While the United States can show as good horses as any other country in the world, they are not as generally distributed among the farmers as are animals of other breeds of stock. This perhaps can be accounted for, first, from the fact that a horse must be mature, and not less than six years old, before it can be put on the market. And that the low price of the service, fee of grades and scrub stallions, is too great a temptation to the farmer who is in debt and short of money. Still, our standard has been advancing, and there is a sure but slow bettering of the working stock of the country. In the draft class we have the Norman, Percheron, Clydesdale, and Belgian, and possibly some others, while the Cleveland Bay comes as near the general purpose horse as any other breed. The importations that have given us the magnificent horses which are being used in this country have been made chiefly from France, England, Belgium, and Germany. The blood of the English thoroughbred and of the Arab has also contributed to the development of the qualities desired. In no other class of stock produced in this country has the improvement been more marked than in the swine, and while there are probably half a score of breeds in the country. A look through the markets shows that probably 90% of them are of the three following breeds, Poland China, formerly called Meiji, Berkshire, and Duroc or Jersey Red. Although it is quite possible that the Chester White might take the third place. With the exception of the Berkshire, these may be called distinctively American breeds, and even the Berkshire has been so modified and improved as to almost lay claim to American origin. A few other breeds are kept pure in this country, particularly the Essex, Yorkshire, and Victorias, but they are bred to but a limited extent and then for a special purpose. One thing that makes it easy and rapid to improve swine is the fact that they mature so early, and that a new cross may be made every year if desired. The writer, living in that part of Miami Valley, in Ohio, where the Poland China swine originated, has seen, in a quarter of a century, these hogs change in form and color and general characteristics. And these fixed so thoroughly that they could be depended on to reproduce them. As this breed existed in the fifties, they were coarse in form, mongrel in color, and slow in maturing, requiring from eighteen months to two years to be made ready for market. But today they are early maturing, can be put on the market at six months of age, weighing from two hundred to two hundred and fifty pounds, and are of uniform shape and color. They are still the leading breed throughout the Great Corn Belt of the United States, and the herd books have registered breeding stock to the number of many thousand. The Berkshire hog was first introduced into this country in 1823, and a second importation was made in 1832, but there was no systematic breeding and care to preserve their purity. And grades were sold for purebred until the breed fell into disrepute. But in 1865 new importations were made of the finest animals to be found in England, and the merits of the breed became universally known. Though called a small breed, they are but little below the Poland China in weight, and grades from Berkshire males on large rangy sows will give the finest possible hogs for the block. But these grades must not be used for breeding, or the stock will deteriorate. The American Chester White Hog originated in Chester County, Pennsylvania but it is believed that there was an importation of white hogs from England in 1818. The breed, until within less than a quarter of a century, was coarse, large of bone, and slow of maturity, and sometimes would attain enormous weight, nearly 1,000 pounds. 
but in the last quarter of a century they have been improved until they are a close rival of the best breeds we have. The Duroc Jersey Red seems to be a distinctly American breed, having a history dating back to 1824, but it is less than a half century since they came into prominence, and the improvement made in them in that time has put them near the front rank. One thing which caused their rapid increase was the belief that they were proof against swine plague and hog cholera, and they were boomed on that idea. But this did not prove true, and our intelligent farmers have learned that it is not in the breed but in the food and care that immunity from disease will be found. These hogs are of a beautiful red color, and of good form. The mothers are prolific and good nursers, and they mature early, making the choicest of pig pork at an early age. No other class of animals has been subject to so much foreign competition or has figured to such an extent as a political factor as the sheep and this, for more than a generation past, has kept the sheep industry fluctuating between a depression which destroyed all profit and a boom which placed fictitious values on them, and both extremes have worked harm to the industry. Yet through all these changes, those who have recognized the intrinsic value of the sheep and stuck to the work of improvement, have not only found the business profitable but have prevented the deterioration of the animals which threatened. While swine are of no value until killed, the sheep gives two coupons in a year, one in the fleece and the other in the increase, and the breeder always has two distinct objects before him, the production of wool and mutton. The breeds of sheep are almost as dissimilar as are horses from cattle, and some are suited for hot arid lands, while others are adapted to the rich lowlands with their abundant and succulent herbage. The most ancient of all breeds is the merino. And those who have studied this question trace its descent back in direct line, probably, to the flocks of the patriarchs. For ages they have been the clothers of mankind, first with the skin and later with the fleece, and still they maintain a high, if not first, place among different breeds. They have been wonderfully improved, but the improvement has been along the line of increasing the value of the fleece rather than the carcass, and it has been changed from an animal that would produce two or three pounds of wool, and one which had bare belly and legs, to one which produces a fleece from the hoofs to very near the nose. It is within bounds to say the weight of the fleece has been doubled. With the long wool breeds the improvement has been designed to develop the carcass and mutton qualities rather than the wool, and of these the two typical breeds are the Shropshire and Cotswold. Probably the best mutton lambs that are produced in this country are from the Shropshire rams and merino ewes. The representative Cotswold is of majestic port and large size. The wool is curly, long, and lustrous. Not dry and harsh to the touch, and has but a slight amount of yoke. At maturity it ought to be 8 inches long. The fleece averages 6 or 7 pounds. 4. Improvement in farming methods. The improvement of methods on the farm has been discussed to some extent in speaking of implements and stock, as their use involves better methods, but there are other points worthy of notice. One of the most important of these is drainage. The first attempts to remove surface water from farmland were by the construction of open ditches. But as these had to follow the natural watercourses which often zigzagged through the fields, they were objectionable, not only because of making bad shaped lands to plow and cultivate, but also because they caused a waste of land. And usually had to be bridged to be crossed with the wagons. Other objections to them were that they produced crops of weeds to give trouble in the fields, and there was a constant tendency to fill up, which soon impaired their usefulness, or, if kept cleaned out, it had to be done at heavy expense. The first attempt at under drains, or blind ditches, as they were called, was by making an underground waterway with stone or timber. But both these materials were found objectionable, because such drains were easily damaged by the action of crawfish and rarely continued to do good work for more than a few years. It was after the middle of the century that drain tiles made of burnt clay were introduced, resembling good hard brick in material. But the first drains laid were usually with tiles of too small caliber, two inch being largely used, which were not only easily choked but failed to carry the water off rapidly enough in a wet time. Large sections of many of our states were originally swampy and so nearly level as to make it necessary to construct open ditches, almost like canals, as an outlet for the water flowing into them from the drains. 
These could not, of course, be constructed by individuals, as no man had a right to go on his neighbor's land to open a ditch for this purpose. So, in many cases, this was made a matter of legislation, and the large open ditches were built by taxation equitably levied on the lands. By this means the farmers were enabled to thoroughly drain large areas of country which otherwise would have been nearly worthless for agricultural purposes. In some instances the earth taken from these large ditches was graded up several feet high at the side, and on the top of this levee a turnpike road was constructed, thus giving a double benefit from a single operation. The first draining of farms was in the wet spots where, usually, a single line of tiles, laid for a moderate distance, would bring the parts of the field under cultivation that otherwise would be waste. But gradually the farmers learned that there were other valuable effects from drainage, and that most heavy clay lands would be benefited by it sufficiently to justify the expense. The following incidental advantages have been learned, first, drainage deepens the soil, second, it prevents the killing out of grass and grains during a wet season, third, it makes the land warmer. Fourth, it improves the texture of the soil and makes it possible to work and plant it earlier in the spring, fifth, it prevents washing and waste of manure. Sixth, it often prevents failure of crops in excessively wet seasons, and enables them to endure drought better in dry seasons. Although drainage is expensive it is a permanent improvement, and in many cases the increase of the wheat crop in a single year has defrayed the expense of tilling the land. Another improvement, which seems to be the opposite of this, is the irrigation of arid lands in those parts of the country where the annual rainfall is small and every summer brings a drought. In these cases, water stored in large natural or artificial reservoirs, or that furnished by snow melting on the mountains, is utilized to carry the crops through the dry season and to enable the farmer to grow large crops where nothing could be produced without this aid. Perhaps in no other line have the methods changed for the better more than in the care of domestic animals, and this includes both shelter and feeding. In the first half of the century, cattle and hogs were usually exposed to the severe weather of the winter with no other shelter than that afforded by a straw stack, and this often was found leveled to the ground by the first of March, leaving them entirely without shelter at that changeable season of the year. They were allowed at all seasons to roam over the farm and gather their own living, and were turned into the cornfields as soon as the ears were removed, where they lived well as long as the stock pasture lasted. After which they depended on straw for food until spring. And it was common to have the cattle so poor, as spring approached, that many died of actual starvation, while others became so feeble that they would have to be lifted to help them on their feet. Then the stables for horses were constructed apparently with the idea that ventilation was the chief thing. And the horses stood and shivered in their stalls from the drafts that blew through the sides of the barn and up through the floors of their stalls. Gradually these things have changed, until the larger part of farm stock is warmly sheltered, and well fed with a variety of food. Succulent food is now largely furnished from ensilage preserved in silos, from beets and other roots grown and stored for winter use, and, more recently, from sorghum, which has been found to retain its succulence and sweetness during the entire winter. Farmers have learned what is meant by a balanced ration, which is a combination of foods that will give the proper proportion of heat and fat producers with those which make bone and muscle. And that it means both health and economy to substitute to a certain extent bran and oil meal for corn, and clover hay for hay made from the grasses, and straw. Another great improvement has been along the line of fencing. And, in this respect, the most economical step of all has been in reducing the amount of division fence on the farm, keeping only a portion of it divided into fields for pasture. And leaving half or more of the best parts to be cultivated in a single enclosure on which stock is never turned. In most states, laws have been passed obliging each farmer to fence in his own stock, and no one is compelled to fence out his neighbors. The substitution of wire for wood as a fencing material has reduced the cost of fence construction about one half, and the waste of land occupied by fences is reduced in about the same proportion. V. Improvement in and around the home. The change in this direction in a single generation has been most marked, and is one of the surest signs of prosperity. 
The log cabin has given place to a substantial and, in many cases, an elegant home. The irregular and ill-shaped yards, fenced with rails, which surrounded both house and barn, and in which hogs and cattle were kept, with no shelter but a rail pen with straw roof, have disappeared. And rectangular lots enclosed with neat fences and good barns and piggeries have taken their place. The woodpile has retired from the front yard, and is now sheltered in a woodshed adjoining the kitchen, and a neat lawn with flowers and shrubbery is no longer the exception, but the rule. A good garden, in which the newer and improved vegetables have taken the place of the old sorts, and a berry patch, well cared for, afford the luxuries which they alone can give for a period of many weeks each season. The water is no longer carried from a remote spring, but good wells and cisterns are placed conveniently, many of them so that the pump is in the kitchen or under a porch attached to the house. The cellar is usually floored with cement, and the stairs leading to it are of easy grade, while good walks of plank or cement make it a pleasure to pass from the house to the surrounding outbuildings. Another line in which very great improvement is shown is in maintaining the fertility of the soil. The old method was to exhaust the fertility of a field and then clear a new one. And it is doubtful if one farmer in a hundred could have answered the question, why does land become sterile after long cultivation, for they had no conception of what the chemical elements of the soil were which are necessary to its fertility. There are two theories of fertilizing and fertility, one, that the soil is a mine to be worked out, and which will inevitably become unproductive in the process. The other, that it is a laboratory in which, under the intelligent management of man, forces can be set at work which will maintain and develop a perpetual fertility. Malthus, more than a century ago, announced that the time would come before long when the people of the earth would starve because they had outgrown the fertility of the soil and its productive capacity. But after long cultivation, we find it possible to produce on less than half the cultivatable land enough not only to feed our own nation, but the world at large. And there is no questioning the accurateness of the laboratory theory as opposed to the mine theory. The first improvement along this line was in the better saving and utilizing of animal manures, but when it was found that these were insufficient, science came to the help of the farmer. The chemist analyzed both crop and soils, ascertaining what was needed, and then the world was searched for the materials necessary. The elements which formed our plants were found to be fifteen in number, but of these it was found that it was necessary to furnish only three, nitrogen, phosphoric acid, and potash. Nitrogen was known to exist in inexhaustible quantities in the atmosphere, forming 76% of its composition, but the question was long unsolved, can growing plants appropriate atmospheric nitrogen? Finally, it was discovered that plants of the leguminosae family, of which clover is the best type and of greatest value for this purpose to the farmer, could appropriate nitrogen from the atmosphere. And after careful research, with the aid of the microscope, it was discovered that this appropriation came about through the agency of bacteria in the roots. This fact connected with the clover plant is one of immense importance to the farmer, because nitrogen is not only the most expensive element of fertility to purchase, but is likely to be lost both through evaporation and leaching. So it can be seen that clover is one of the most valuable plants which can be grown on the farm, for the reason that the crop can be utilized as food for stock, while still great benefit in years to the soil. As the fertility is largely stored in the roots, which cannot be used for any other purpose, and as by the action of these roots the mechanical condition of the soil is greatly improved. Further, the dense shade the plant affords induces chemical action in the soil, which makes plant food available that would otherwise remain inert. One of the most wonderful things connected with fertility is that God has so locked it up in the earth that no greedy generation can exhaust it, and that the greatest source of fertility is the atmosphere, whose secrets are just being discovered. An English scientist has recently announced that by the aid of electricity, furnished by cheap water power, Nitrates can be manufactured directly from the atmosphere so as to reduce their cost to less than one-fourth what it has heretofore been. Again, the intelligent use of clover will enable the farmer to produce his own nitrogen and reduce the cost of chemical fertilizers to one-half what it usually is when containing nitrogen. This brings us to the question of commercial fertilizers. With the single exception of guano, they are a product of the last third of the century. 
The first step toward the use of commercial fertilizers was by analyzing our barnyard manures. When the chemist discovered that a ton or more which the farmer drew out laboriously with two horses to the field contained but 20 or 30 pounds of actual plant food, the remainder being water, sand, and other dead matter. The next step was to combine the three elements essential to a perfect fertilizer in such proportions that a single sack would hold enough manure for an acre of ground. And in tens of thousands of cases, the application of this amount of fertilizer has increased the wheat crop from 5 to 15 bushels per acre, doubling the grass crop which followed, which in turn, and through the influence of the fertilizer, formed a sward which, by its decay, fertilized a third crop when it was turned under in the rotation. The element in fertilizers of next importance to nitrogen is phosphoric acid, and the first source from which this was obtained was the bones of animals. But the supply from animals slaughtered was entirely insufficient. And so the great plains of the West were gleaned, and tens of thousands of tons of buffalo bones were gathered and shipped east to fertilize our farms. But soon this source began to wane. Then two other sources, practically inexhaustible, of this indispensable element were discovered, the phosphate rocks of the south and the iron slag from furnaces, each of which is found to contain a large percent of phosphoric acid. And when the rock is dissolved by acids and the slag ground to an impalpable powder by machinery, the fertilizing elements in both are found to be as available and valuable as that from bones. The supply of potash was obtained at first from wood ashes, which the clearing of the farms and the universal use of wood as fuel made abundant. But later, when these sources were no longer sufficient, potash salts were found in large quantities where they could be mined from the earth, so that now there seems to be in sight an inexhaustible supply of the elements needed for plant food. Like almost every reform, the use of commercial fertilizers was opposed bitterly by many farmers, and statements were made by them that their effects on the soil were like those of whiskey or other stimulants on the body. And that the ultimate result of their use would be that the soil would become barren. Many refused to use them at all, others, after a single trial made without intelligence, denounced them as humbugs. But as they saw on the farms of their neighbors the wonderful results from their use, they have been gradually led to adopt them, until now, with most farmers, the question no longer is, can I afford to use commercial fertilizers? But rather, can I afford to do without them? 6. Improvement in Agricultural Education To one who has followed the writer to this point, it must be apparent that the farmer of today has made progress in the knowledge of his calling to at least as great an extent as he has improved in his methods. And that the terms farm drudge and clodhopper are misapplied and should be obsolete. There is no other industrial calling in which one touches nature and science at so many points, or which gives such good opportunities to develop the perfect man, the sound mind in the sound body, as that of the farmer. Admitting that not all farmers understand this and live up to their privileges, does not alter the fact that the farm offers a great opportunity to develop and broaden the mind. That the last quarter of the century has brought into active operation forces which have touched and influenced a large percent of the tillers of the soil, and that the leaven of education is working mightily. The intelligent, studious farmer becomes a practical botanist as he studies the growth and habits of plants. As he is dependent more than any other man upon the weather and must change his plans frequently to correspond with climatic changes, he becomes a meteorologist. Myriads of insects, which include both enemies and friends, make him a student of entomology. And the wonderful alchemy of the soil by which offensive and poisonous matters are transmuted into golden grain, luscious fruits, vegetables, and flowers, calls for a knowledge of chemistry. The use of modern machinery develops his mechanical powers, and the man on the farm develops in more directions and has an opportunity to acquire a broader education than any other man who earns his living by his own labor. To sustain this statement, it is only necessary to enumerate the educational opportunities and privileges now open to the farmer and which are, to a great extent, utilized by him. First, what the government is doing for him. No other calling is represented in the cabinet of the president, and time and experience have demonstrated the wisdom of a secretary of agriculture. Not only are we distinctively an agricultural people, 
but the prosperity of the nation depends on the intelligence and prosperity of the farmer more than on all other classes combined. Not only must the food supply of our people be furnished, but the foreign demand must be met, and this gives to the farmers money to spend, so that the industries which contribute to their wants shall share in the general prosperity. While there are many honorable and useful callings, agriculture seems to be the only one which touches and affects all others. The financial importance of agriculture is shown by the fact that, after the wants of the nation were supplied, in the year 1897 we exported in round numbers $690 million worth of agricultural products, or nearly 67% of the entire exports. And notwithstanding an enormous increase of imports of wool and sugar, in anticipation of increased duties, the balance of trade on agricultural products for the year was $289 million. And the export of agricultural products for the current fiscal year would show still larger figures. Considering the specific educational influences which are elevating the farmer in his calling, we enumerate the following, agricultural literature, farmers' organizations, including farmers' clubs, farmers' institutes, and the Grange. Agricultural experiment stations, and agricultural colleges, all of which have contributed their share to the intelligence and prosperity of the farmer, and all are products of the last half of the century. To give an intelligent idea of the help which these influences have brought to the farmer, it is necessary to treat them to some extent in detail. First, agricultural literature. All that is necessary to an understanding of the progress in this direction is to get one of the very few so-called agricultural papers of fifty years ago and compare it with those of today. Not only have they multiplied a hundredfold, but while the former largely contained stilted articles written by theorists, today every page is full of practical instruction written by farmers. And often by specialists who have spent years in improving some line of farming or stock breeding. Most of our agricultural papers have a staff of paid contributors, nearly all of whom have made a success in some branch of farming. And so anxious are the publishers of these papers to give their readers all the help possible, that they search out the men who are prospering on the farm and engage their services as instructors for their readers. The journals devoted to agriculture are numbered by hundreds, some of them devoted to a single line, such as sheep, poultry, or gardening, and others with well-classified departments which give instruction on all points. In addition to this, nearly all of the weeklies have a page of agriculture, usually conducted by a farmer or someone with practical knowledge of farm work. There are no secrets in agriculture, and every farmer is ready to impart to all any valuable information he acquires. Farmers appreciate the value of these helps and make large use of them, and the circulation of these papers is enormous. By farmers' clubs we mean those organizations of farmers, governed by constitutions and bylaws, who meet at stated times for the discussion of topics connected with the improvement of their calling. There are no statistics available from which can be gathered the extent of this movement, but Ohio reports 50 clubs and has formed a state organization. In Michigan, where the clubs are organized on a different basis, 30,000 members are reported. They have also formed a state organization, which was attended by 200 delegates at the last meeting. Indiana is but little, if any, behind these two states, and the club idea is rapidly spreading through the northern states. There are two forms of these clubs, one of which limits the membership to 12 families, and the meetings are all held at the homes of the members, one each month. The advantages of this plan are several. First, with the club thus limited, the horses can be stabled and cared for during inclement weather of winter. Second, the wives need prepare but one meal in the year for the club. While with the large club it is necessary that each should contribute to a basket dinner for every meeting, which often causes as much trouble as to prepare the meal for the entire club once a year. Third, the attendance is sure to be more regular in the small club, and one condition of membership is that every member shall be present at each meeting unless providentially detained. Fourth, with a club of this size every member can take part in the discussion, and there will be less danger of a few talkers monopolizing the time. Fifth, the social features in the small club are very much better than in the large. Most of the clubs in Ohio and Indiana are organized on this basis, while in Michigan it is probable that most of the clubs have an unlimited membership. 
The objection is sometimes urged that the small club seems selfish, but as any twelve or even six families are at liberty to organize a club this objection is not valid. As many farmers who would like to organize may not be able to find a form of constitution and bylaws, it seems proper to give one here. Preamble Recognizing the fact that farmers need an opportunity to compare methods and to cultivate their social qualities, and considering that, as iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. In order that we may be mutually helpful to each other in matters relating to husbandry, home comfort, and economy, we do form ourselves into an association known as the Farmers Club, fill the blank with the name you wish to use for your club. And adopt for our government the following. Constitution. Article 1. The officers shall be president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, and librarian, who shall be elected annually in November, and assume their duties in January of the following year. Article 2. The duties of these officers shall be such as pertain to the offices in other organizations and are indicated by the name of the office. Article 3. The active members of this club shall be engaged in agricultural pursuits, but honorary members may be elected by unanimous vote. Honorary members are not obliged to attend all the meetings, but will be welcome to any. Article 4. Application for membership must be submitted at the meeting previous to their being balloted for, and members will be admitted on receiving a two-thirds vote by ballot, but the membership shall be limited to twelve families. Article 5. Amendments may be made at any regular meeting by a two-thirds vote of the active members. By laws. 1. The club shall meet at the residence of one of the members on the third Thursday of each month, at ten o'clock, invitations to which shall be limited to the hostess of the day. 2. The club shall be called to order by the president, after an hour spent in social intercourse, and the order of exercises shall be as follows. a. Reading and approving minutes of last meeting. b. Monthly record of current events. c. Selections, recitations, essays. d. Adjournment for dinner and social intercourse until two o'clock. E. Discussion, so conducted as to avoid all questions of politics and theology. F. Question drawer. G. Miscellaneous business. In order that the work of the club may be systematic and the time fully occupied, a program covering the entire year is prepared and printed so as to be ready for distribution at the December meeting of each year. That the reader may understand the working of this plan, a few topics will be given, taken from the program of the club of which the writer is a member. January. The club will meet at the home of Mr. Thursday, the 19th. Selection. Mrs. Paper. Mr. Topic, a review of the previous year. Each member will give in writing a statement of profits and losses for the year under the following heads. 1. General crops grown and acreage and yield thereof. 2. What special crops have been raised. 3. Stock raised or handled. 4. What experiments have been made on the farm. 5. What losses of stock, or crops, and the cause thereof. June. The club will meet at the home of Mr. Thursday, the 15th. Selection. Mrs. Paper. Hindrances to sheep raising and how to avoid them. Mr. Topic, the farmer's barn. 1. Relative size to farm. 2. Location and ground plan. 3. Arrangement of stabling, feeding, and water conveniences. 4. Plan for saving manure. Either a gentleman or a lady is appointed to open each topic, after which the subject is open for question or discussion by any member of the club. During one month of the summer, usually July or August, a picnic takes the place of the regular meeting, at which a basket dinner is served. Farmers' institutes are, in the best sense of the word, a farmer's school, and while it is less than twenty years since their first organization, nearly all of the states, at least in the North, are conducting them to a greater or less extent. As Ohio claims the honor of inaugurating this movement, 
and the writer is more familiar with the plan of organization and the work of institutes in that state than any other, some facts concerning them will be given. The first attempt to teach the farmers by lecture courses was made late in the 70s at the Ohio State Agricultural College, when a course of 80 lectures on subjects connected with farm interests were given. All of them by professors of the college. This first course occupied five weeks. And as it was found that but a limited number of farmers could be induced to leave their homes and care of their stock in the winter, and that the attendance was only about 40. The next two years the course was shortened in hopes that a larger attendance might result, but such was not the case. Then someone suggested, if the farmers will not come to the lectures, why not take the lectures to the farmers, and the outcome of this suggestion has been a wonderful success. The state holding 300 institutes in the winter of 1897 and 1898, under a law providing a fund for that purpose, and over a hundred independent institutes in addition. By which is meant institutes in which the local organization pays its own expenses and chooses its own lecturers and subjects. The work in most of our states is thoroughly organized, a fund provided to meet the expenses of the work, placed in some states under the charge of the Secretary of Agriculture, and in others in charge of a superintendent of institutes. The farmers have met this effort for their improvement with great enthusiasm, and the attendance is usually limited by the size of the hall provided. All partisan and sectarian questions are rigorously excluded from the discussions. A bulletin is issued in the fall, which gives the names of a large corps of lecturers and a list of subjects, and these are sent to the officers of the local organizations, from which they can select such topics as they wish discussed. Half of the time of each session is allotted to the state lecturers, while local talent is expected to fill the other half. The greatest possible freedom is allowed in asking questions and discussing the work of the speakers, and no other educational influence which has come to the farmer has equaled that offered by these meetings. At the close of each year the best papers and discussions are printed in a bulletin for free distribution among the farmers, and are given out at the meeting the ensuing year. Or are mailed from the office of the Secretary of the State Board of Agriculture on application. The Grange was organized at Washington, D.C., in 1807, but existed only on paper until January, 1873, when the first meeting of the National Grange convened at Georgetown, D.C., with delegates from ten states. It was started as a secret society, with a ritual and degrees, and seemed to catch the popular fancy among the farmers. At the meeting of the National Grange in 1874, 32 states were represented. Probably no other organization has made so rapid a growth as this. A large element, however, of the membership was attracted to it by the rallying cry of, down with the middleman, and had little or no conception of its educational possibilities. Little country stores with very small capital, and managed by men with no business training, sprang up at every crossroad, which, contrary to the expectation of their founders, did not save money. But resulted in some valuable business education for which a good tuition fee was paid. The reaction which set in made it seem for a time as though the entire order would disintegrate. But fortunately there were wise leaders who had caught the true idea, that the organization must be kept on an educational basis to save it from extinction, and through their efforts it has become a power for good in most localities. And has been of great service to the farmers. County, state, and national societies have been organized, and no other large bodies of farmers can so quickly and thoroughly cooperate in measures pertaining to the interests of the farmer as those belonging to this order. Another educational force of immense value to the farmers is found in the experiment stations, which are established in every state of the Union. This work was started by an Act of Congress, approved March 2, 1887, and known as the Hatch Act. By this act the sum of $15,000 per annum was appropriated for each state in the Union, to be specially provided by Congress in the appropriations from year to year. In addition to this sum, most of the states have made large appropriations for the purchase of suitable grounds and the erection of buildings. And to cover the expense of printing the reports and pamphlets which are sent out free to the farmers who apply for them. To go a little farther, 
the questions requiring investigation by the agricultural experiment stations may be divided into three principal groups, according as they are related to the soil, to the growth of crops and vegetation, or to domestic animals and their products. I. The soil is studied. 1. In its varieties, as found in different parts of the farm and of the state. 2. In its physical properties, as affected by tillage, drainage, irrigation, etc. 3. In its chemical properties, as related to the maintenance of fertility by the use of fertilizers and otherwise. 2. In vegetation and crop production some of the objects of study are. 1. Varieties, including the selection and dissemination of new sorts, the elimination of synonyms, the comparison of strains of varieties. The production of improved varieties, etc., etc. 2. Vegetable pathology, including studies of rusts, smuts, blights, rots, mildews, etc. 3. Control of injurious insects. 4. Forestry, embracing the culture of forest trees for windbreaks, for timber, for nuts and incidental products. 3. In the study of animals some of the problems are. 1. Breeds and their comparative values for different purposes. 2. Foods and feeding, for growth, for meat, for milk and wool. 3. The diseases of animals, especially those of contagious, epizootic, or parasitic nature. The stations have done most valuable work along these different lines, and have contributed in a large measure to the introduction of improved varieties of cereals, forage crops, and fruits. In the case of wheat especially, there can be no doubt that the work of the stations has been a factor of great importance in producing large yields, by stimulating the farmers to a more careful comparison of varieties and of methods of culture. A plan of purchasing and testing most of the so-called new varieties of fruits and grains has been followed by some of the stations. Thus enabling the farmers and fruit growers to judge whether such varieties are likely to be superior to sorts already cultivated. It has been part of the work of the stations to expose fraudulent sales of fruit, stock, and fertilizers. Much other work has been and is being done, but the instances given show the value of the investigations made. As has already been stated under another heading, the officers of the experiment stations take an active part in the work of the institutes. And by the frequent issuing of bulletins and their annual reports convey valuable information to the farmer in every department of his work. In many states they have established reading courses for the study of nature, which are conducted similarly to those in the Chautauqua courses. In the same connection the work of the Bureau of Animal Industry should be noticed. Possibly no other organization of the government is doing so much to save farmers from loss through disease of stock and educating them to the same extent as this. The organization is made up of men of the highest scientific training, whose lives are devoted to the study of diseases of domestic animals and whose work extends to the testing of remedies, the inspection of meats, the study of foreign markets, and everything that pertains to the interest of the stock growers. No disease can break out in the herds of livestock in any part of the country without this bureau being at once notified of it, and trained officials are sent to study all the circumstances connected with it and to prevent, if possible, such disease from becoming epidemic. Some years ago, when contagious pleuronomonia had secured a foothold in this country, the Bureau of Animal Industry set to work to stamp it out. The old world was paralyzed by the enormity of the undertaking. Veterinarians in England and continental Europe laughed at us and considered us fit subjects for lunatic asylums. Hadn't they always had it? It cost them millions of dollars annually in cattle, yet they had been unable to stamp it out, and most assuredly we could not do what European veterinarians could not. They forgot that we were Yankees. It cost us many good hard dollars that were represented by large figures, but we stamped it out, and it has now been years since Uncle Sam officially declared the country free from it. Another work which this bureau undertook was the regulation of vessels in which cattle were exported, and they reduced the losses so as to save from two to three million dollars annually in the insurance of export cattle. The greatest possible care is taken to disinfect vessels in which cattle have been shipped, and strict regulations are established regulating the size of stalls, ventilation, the number of cattle to be carried on any single vessel. 
and every point which has a bearing on the health and comfort of the animals. It was not until after the Civil War that such a thing as an agricultural college was known in this country, but through the action of Congress very liberal appropriations were made. Which in most states were supplemented by the action of the state legislatures, and an agricultural college was started in every state of the Union. In the beginning there was much criticism, and without doubt many mistakes were made by those to whom the work was assigned. But now that a generation has passed, the farmers have come to understand better the objects of these schools, and scientific men have been trained to do the work. And these men have gone out into other departments, such as those already described, and have made possible the splendid achievements which have already been hinted at in what has been written. The teachers and officials of these colleges have been exceedingly friendly to everything that could help the farmers, and are in close touch with them. Aiding in the work of local, state, and national organizations, and, in most states, carrying on the work of the experiment stations through their professors and graduates. And in many of them courses of lectures by practical farmers have been established. Without question they are becoming more and more helpful as the years go by, and their power for good is constantly increasing. A summing up. What has agriculture gained, or rather along what lines, in the century's progress? A brief summary would seem a fitting close of this chapter. 1. The marvelous advance in methods and means of transportation, and the consequent opening of the markets of the world. 2. The knowledge of the chemical constituents of the soil and its management in the line of maintaining fertility. 3. The appliances to lighten labor and shorten processes in the production and harvesting of crops. 4. Increased knowledge of plants, as to their growth and cultivation, their feeding qualities, and the combination of these qualities in feeding our domestic animals. By which we are able to reduce the cost of production through the early maturity of the animals and the maintaining of vigorous health. 5. Increased knowledge of the value and power of organization and of agricultural literature in helping to a practical education for the duties of the farm. 6. In an increase of home comforts and a higher ideal of living, and an appreciation of the fact that the work of the farm should be subservient to the life on the farm, as, the life is more than meat, and the body than raiment. 7. In no other country on the globe are there so many tillers of the soil who own their homes, and, as a consequence, there is no country where there is so much of patriotism. When Matthew Arnold visited the United States, nothing that he saw delighted him more than the beautiful farms, with their comfortable dwellings and outbuildings and the evidences of high cultivation and fertility. But one thing puzzled him, and that was the absence of tenant houses, and he asked, where do the men live who cultivate these farms? When told that in most cases the farmers were their own tenants, he could scarcely express his astonishment. Prince Kropotkin, of Russia, who has traveled in this country and paid particular attention to the condition of agriculture, says in his summing up, American agriculture offers an imposing sight. Not in the wheat fields of the far west, which will soon become a thing of the past, but by the development of rational agriculture and of the forces which promote it. Read the description of an agricultural exhibition in a small town in Iowa, with 70,000 farmers camping with their families in tents during the fair week, studying, learning, buying and selling, and enjoying life. You see a national fate, and you feel that you deal with a nation in which agriculture is held in respect. Or read the publications of the scores of experiment stations, whose reports are published by thousands and scattered broadcast over the country, and are read by the farmers and discussed at countless farmers' meetings. And you will feel that American agriculture is a real force, imbued with life, which no longer fears mammoth farms, and needs not, like a child, cry for protection. The future of agriculture in this country seems safe, and no class of men can look the future in the face with more of confidence than those who till the soil. Progress in Civil Engineering By Walter Loring Webb, C.E. Assistant Professor of Civil Engineering, University of Pennsylvania I. An Introductory View If we broadly define civil engineering as the art of construction, then the birth of the art is as old as the emergence of man from savagery. The savage who hollows out a log of wood in order to construct a canoe has taken the first step in the art of shipbuilding. And when he has constructed a hut, however rude, 
to take the place, as an abode, of the cave hollowed out by nature, he has moved one step nearer to those triumphs of building construction which satisfy man's necessities, comforts, and aesthetic desires. From this standpoint civil engineering is as old as the oldest of the arts and sciences. Not only is civil engineering an ancient art, but when the archaeologist points to some of the masterpieces of building construction which have been literally hidden from view by the debris of centuries, and describes the old roads which the disintegrating forces of nature, working for centuries, have not been able to destroy, it is natural to assume that in many features the civil engineering of the present day is but a copy of ancient work or, at least, that there has been comparatively little real progress. It may be claimed that bridges are very old, that canals, lighthouses, and roads antedate the Christian era, and that even the ancient Egyptians knew that the earth is round, and had made a rough computation of its diameter. But it will be shown that even in these cases there has been an enormous advance, not only in the character and magnitude of the work done, but also in another feature of civil engineering which is frequently overlooked, namely, the economy of labor and material. Civil engineering has been defined as the art of doing well with one dollar what any bungler can do somehow with two dollars. This definition, although very loose and one-sided, nevertheless contains a very important truth. If by improved methods a canal or a bridge can be constructed for one half to one third of what it would have cost by older methods, then the world has advanced. In that it may have two or three canals or bridges at the same cost of labor as would have been previously required for the construction of one. When we add to this a vast improvement in quality, an improvement that would have been previously impossible at any cost, the world's advance is hardly measurable by any standard. It is a well-known fact that many engineering works, justly considered masterpieces at the time of their construction, could now be replaced by a much better structure for a comparatively small part of their original cost. This statement not only applies to very old constructions, but even to some of the great engineering works of the latter half of this century. Some of these reconstructions have actually occurred, as is illustrated in the Victoria Tubular Bridge at Montreal, or the Roebling Suspension Bridge at Niagara Falls, described later. In fact, the progress in civil engineering during the 19th century is chiefly made up of the enormous advances which have been made during the latter half of the century. It should not be argued that these recent constructions are cheaper, because everything is cheaper now. The general scale of wages has advanced, and the total cost of construction is cheaper. Only because improved methods of work have reduced the labor required to produce finished building material from the raw product and to erect that material into a structure. Therefore in considering in detail the construction of the great masterpieces of this century, we should not lose sight of the enormous advance in general methods of work. Which has rendered it possible to have all of these structures which so minister to the prosperity of the world, at such a reduced cost in labor. A complete discussion of the century's progress in civil engineering would require a treatise on all modern practice as well as a description of nearly all of the great engineering masterpieces in existence. But the limitations of this article utterly preclude the possibility of even a short discussion of all the branches of the science, to say nothing of a detailed description of all of the examples. The following discussion will therefore be confined to those branches in which the advance has been most notable, even to the unscientific reader, the progress being illustrated by brief statements regarding the most typical constructions. 2. Bridges. Not only is there evidence that bridges of the simplest forms have been used from prehistoric times, but the engineering world has been frequently surprised at the discovery. In semi-barbarous lands where there was evidently no scientific knowledge of bridge construction, of a bridge which, in its mechanical analysis, is a rude example of some one of the more complicated types now in use. But these bridges are always small, and are constructed with an utter disregard of that economy of construction which is one of the great triumphs of modern bridge engineering, being uselessly strong in some parts. Considering their weakness in others. At the beginning of this century there was not a wrought iron or steel bridge in existence. Disregarding stone arches for the present, all other bridges were made of wood, with the exception of a few bridges of cast iron, which were constructed during the latter part of the 18th century. 
But cast iron is unsuitable for pieces requiring tensile strength, it is also difficult to cast very large pieces with any assurance of uniformity. The best existing examples of cast iron bridges are, therefore, those of the arch type. But these are very heavy in proportion to their real strength, and would now be much more costly than, as well as inferior to, steel bridges of equal strength. Therefore the great advance in bridge work during this century consists in the development of steel bridge construction, and a brief description will be given of a few bridges which represent the chief types. Brooklyn Bridge the suspension bridge between New York and Brooklyn is the largest bridge of its kind in existence, and, until the construction of the fourth bridge, was the longest clear span ever built. Everyone is so familiar with this stupendous structure that only a few statements will be made, which may give a better idea of the unprecedented problem which confronted the great engineer, John A. Roebling. When looking at the exceedingly graceful design of the towers, one is apt to forget that a large part of the structure of each tower is hidden from view. The bottom of the foundation of the pier, on the New York side, is 78 feet below mean high tide, and spreads over an area 172 feet long and 102 feet wide. The pressure exerted by the caisson on its base is about 114,000 tons, or 6.5 tons per square foot. This great area, 354 feet below the parapet of the towers, is a surface consisting partly of bedrock and partly of a material so compact that it was found to be almost impossible to drive an iron bar into it. Down below the mud, below all danger of scour, far below the depth where the dreaded Teredo Navalis can destroy the timber in the caissons, these piers rest on an immovable foundation and are an imperishable monument of man's skill. The floor of the bridge is supported by four cables, each containing 6,300 wires. Each wire is supposed to be subjected to a stress of about 570 pounds, and to have an ultimate strength of 3,400 pounds. To say that each cable is pulled by a force of 3,591,000 pounds conveys but little real impression to the mind, as little as to say that it would require a pull of over 21 million pounds to break it. And there are four such cables. The main span, including the weight of the cables, weighs about 5,000 tons. Some interesting facts concerning the caissons under the piers of this bridge will be given under the heading of caissons. Niagara Railway Arch The railway suspension bridge, constructed by Mr. John A. Roebling across the Niagara Gorge in 1853-55, was justly considered a monument to the skill of a great engineer, a monument of the world's progress. And yet so rapid has been the advance in the art of bridge engineering, that this great structure is already a thing of the past, and has now been replaced by another bridge which better fulfills the increased requirements. It was not that Roebling's bridge was an engineering failure, but that the large increase in the weight and length of trains now requires a much stronger bridge. There were several formidable conditions confronting the engineer who designed the steel arch which has now replaced the suspension bridge. For one thing, a heavy railroad traffic was using the old bridge. The interruption of railroad traffic for even a few days is a serious matter. Extend the time to several months, and the consequences are too serious for toleration. And thus it became necessary to so plan and construct the arch that both structures would occupy the same site, not interfere with each other, and not interfere with the running of trains. It is an amazing, almost inconceivable, triumph of constructive skill that this was accomplished so that not a single train was delayed, and traffic on the highway floor was suspended only for about two hours each day. While the upper floor system was being put in, the second rigid requirement was the necessity for constructing the arch without any false works underneath. Of course it was not practicable to suspend the various members of the arch during construction, from the old bridge, as it was not designed for such a load. Nor would it have been possible to plant false works in the deep and swift current of the Niagara River. And so it became necessary to make each half of the bridge self-supporting, as it hung out over the raging torrent a distance of about 275 feet from the abutments, until the two projecting arms could be joined in the center. The illustration does not show the independence of the arch from the old bridge. If the old bridge had not been there, as was virtually the case, 
so far as support given by it is concerned, the independence of those arms reaching out over the river would have been more apparent. Add to all these rigorous conditions the marvelous fact that the erection of this great arch was begun on September 17, 1896, and that the bridge was tested on July 29, 1897, only 315 days afterward. And we have here one of the greatest triumphs of engineering which could be imagined. Pecos River Viaduct, the original location of the Galveston, Harrisburg, and San Antonio Railway included a section of about 25 miles which was very difficult to operate, on account of its very heavy grades and sharp curvature. After some years of study and surveying, a line was found which would save 11.2 miles in distance, 378 feet of rise and fall, and 1933 degrees of curvature, besides being free from land slides which threatened the old line at many points. But the great economic advantages in the expenses of operating could only be obtained at the cost of an almost unprecedented structure, a viaduct 2,180 feet long, which should cross the Pecos River at an elevation of 320 feet 10 and a half inches above the water surface. There are two bridges in Europe which span very deep gorges by arches, which are higher above the water than this viaduct, but in such cases the depth of gorge is of no engineering importance. There is also a viaduct, for a narrow-gauge railway in Bolivia, 800 feet long and with a height of 336 feet from the rails to the water. But the Pecos Viaduct is built to carry standard-gauge railway traffic over a valley nearly half a mile wide, and at such a height that a train moving over it appears diminutive. The stone towers in the illustration appear small, but they are constructed to a height of over 50 feet above the ordinary level of the water, to allow for possible floods. The longest, bents, have a height of 241 feet 0 3 4 inches. No, false works, were used in erecting the bridge. The traveler, shown in the illustration, had an arm 124 feet 6 inches long. After completing the construction on one side of the river, including one half of the suspended span immediately over the river, the traveler was taken apart, loaded on cars and transported by rail a distance of nearly 40 miles in order to reach the other side of the valley. Then the construction was carried on as before, until the two halves of the suspended span met in the center. The work of erection began November 3, 1891, and on February 20, 1892, only 108 days later, the two halves of the suspended span were connected. A portion even of this time was lost by inclement weather and unavoidable delays. This light, spiderweb, method of construction for crossing very high valleys was originated by American engineers, the first notable instance of it being the construction of the Kinzua Viaduct on the N, Y, L, E, and W, R, R, which has a length of 2,050 feet and a height of 302 feet above the water, figures which are only slightly less than the above. Fourth Bridge The next type of bridge to be considered has for its example the largest bridge in the world, the cantilever, crossing the Firth of Forth, in Scotland. The economic design of bridges of this type, on the basis of the mechanical principles involved, is not only an achievement of this century, but of the latter part of the century. Nevertheless, we may find illustrations of the fundamental principle in the stone lintels in an Egyptian temple, in a rough wooden bridge erected by Indians in Canada, near the line of the Canadian Pacific Railroad and in a bridge erected over 200 years ago in Thibet, and discovered in 1783 by Lieutenant Davis, of the English Embassy to the court of the Teshu Lama. The principle of these bridges is very graphically shown by a photograph made at the time of the construction of the fourth bridge. This bridge joins two sections of Scotland which had been previously separated by an arm of the sea, which could only be crossed by a tedious ferry. Even this ferry was frequently tied up by fog or by the strong gales which so often blow up the channel. The prevalence of heavy wind pressure demanded that special attention should be given to this feature, and the most elaborate tests ever made of the effect of wind on a bridge structure formed a part of the preliminary work. The estuary, for a distance of nearly 50 miles, is never less than 2 miles wide, except at this one place, where it is but little more than 1 mile wide. With the added advantage of having the island of Inchgarvi nearly in the center of the channel. The channel on both sides is about 200 feet deep, 
which would forbid the location of a pier at any place except on this island, which, being composed of basaltic trap rock, furnished a sufficient foundation at a comparatively slight depth below the surface. To secure the maximum rigidity consistent with economy in weight, the vertical columns of the towers were spaced 120 feet apart at the base, but only 33 feet apart at the top. The towers are 330 feet high. As shown in the illustration, the cross-sectional dimensions of the cantilevers diminish rapidly both in width and height, so that although the weight of the steel per running foot at the towers is 23 tons, it becomes only a little over 2 tons per foot at the center. The structure is exceptionally rigid. The picture of any gigantic structure, especially when well-proportioned, utterly fails to give an adequate idea of the size of its component parts. It is difficult to realize from the illustration that the four tubular, vertical columns, on each main pier are 12 feet each in diameter at the base, large enough for the coach and four to drive into, if they were laid horizontally. Over 50,000 tons of steel were used in the main spans. The total cost of the whole structure was over 3,200,000 pounds, $16 million. Stone arches. The 19th century has but little to claim as to the development of stone arches. The mechanical theory of their stresses is perhaps better understood now than ever, and the largest masonry arch in existence, the Cabin John Arch, having a span of 220 feet. Carrying the Washington Aqueduct over a creek, is a piece of American work of this century. But it should not be forgotten that more than 500 years ago there was constructed at Trezzo, Italy, a granite arch of 251 feet span. This arch was unfortunately destroyed in 1427. One of the most remarkable arches in existence was designed and built by an uneducated stonemason at Pont Ypryd, Wales, in 1750. A rigorous analysis of its strains, of which the designer probably knew nothing, shows that the line of resistance passes almost exactly through the center of the arch ring. The most highly educated engineer of the present day could do no better. On the other hand, the development of the theory has been shown by the successful construction of an exceedingly bold design for a bridge on the Bourbonnais Railway, in France. The span is 124 feet, and the rise only 6.92 feet. The design was considered so very bold that a model of the arch was first constructed and tested before the design was finally adopted. The extension of the use of stone arches, especially those of very large size, is doubtless prevented by their excessive initial cost over the cost of a steel structure of equal span and strength. Since a stone arch is generally considered more beautiful than a steel bridge, the aesthetical element often demands the construction of stone arches in public parks in situations where a metal structure would be more economical. The great reduction in the cost of steel during the past few years, due to improved processes of manufacture, generally renders the cost of a steel bridge, even with a proper allowance for maintenance, repairs, and renewals, cheaper than a stone arch, unless the span is short. 3. Caissons The use of compressed air to keep back the water that would naturally flow through the soil into a deep excavation is a comparatively recent idea. In 1839 M. Trigger, a French engineer, conceived the idea of sinking an iron cylinder through 20 meters of quicksand in the valley of the Loire River, in order to reach a valuable coal deposit which was known to be located beneath the river. A chamber with doors, such as is now called an airlock, was constructed at the top of the cylinder. To pass into the cylinder the lower door, opening downward, was closed, and when the air in the chamber was at atmospheric pressure, the upper door, also opening downward, was opened. Upon entering the chamber the upper door was shut, and air was pumped in until the pressure equaled the pressure in the cylinder underneath, which was also the pressure necessary to keep back the water from the excavation. The lower door could then be opened and the working chamber entered. To pass out, the reverse process in inverse order was necessary. This was the first pneumatic caisson ever sunk, although such plans had been proposed and even patented in England several years before. The idea was essentially the present plan, but the process has been improved and enlarged. 
The required pressure is substantially that due to the weight of a column of water as high as the depth of the base of the caisson below the water surface. In the case of this T. Lewis Bridge, the bottom of the caisson was sunk to 109 feet 8 and a half inches below the water surface, which required an air pressure of about 47 pounds per square inch in the working chamber. Such a pressure is dangerous to those working in it. The men literally live fast. Great exertion is easily made, but is followed by corresponding exhaustion after leaving the caisson. Those having heart disease, or who have been debilitated by previous excesses, are liable to be seriously affected, generally by a form of paralysis which has been specifically named by physicians the caisson disease. At this T. Lewis Bridge, when working at the greatest depths, the men were only worked four hours per day, in two-hour shifts. Facilities were likewise provided to have them bathe, rest, and take hot coffee on coming out of the working chamber. Healthy men, who observed these and similar precautions, were not permanently affected by the work. The caissons of the New York and Brooklyn Suspension Bridge are the largest ever constructed, and a bald account of some of the experiences encountered is fairly dramatic. Under such air pressures the flame of a candle will return when blown out, and so the danger of fire inside the wooden caissons became very serious. One evening a fire was discovered in one of the caissons, caused presumably by a workman holding a candle temporarily against the wooden roof while searching for his dinner pail. When discovered it was apparent that the fire had burned out a cavity in the solid timber roof, and the supply of compressed air was fast turning those timbers into a mass of living coal. Two pipes capable of throwing one and one half inch streams had been provided for this express contingency, and the two streams were turned on as quickly as possible. All night the fight went on. At 4 a.m. When the water was pouring out of the orifice of the cavity as fast as it was sent in by the hose, it seemed as if the cavity must have been thoroughly flooded and the fire out. To make sure of the absolute extinction of the fire, borings were made, which showed that the fire had worked its way along individual timbers, especially those which were fat with resin. And that the fourth roof course was still a mass of burning timber. It was then decided that the caisson must be flooded, which was done by pumping in 1,350,000 gallons of water. After flooding the caisson for two and one half days, it was pumped out and the work examined. It required the services of 18 carpenters, working day and night for two months, to repair the damage caused by that fire. When the Brooklyn caisson was 25 feet below the water level, the boulders encountered became so large that blasting became necessary. But blasting inside of a caisson was hitherto an untried experiment. It was feared that the men would be injured, that their eardrums would break by a sudden explosion in that confined space under heavy air pressure, that a blowout might occur, i.e. that the compressed air might suddenly escape past the edges, and that an inflow of water would then drown the men. At first a pistol was fired, gradually using heavier charges, then a small blast was set off. Encouraged by their freedom from resulting complications, the blasts were gradually increased, until they finally used as heavy blasts as was desired, the men simply stepping into an adjoining chamber to avoid flying fragments. And an increase in the rate of progress was at once apparent, the caisson being lowered from 12 to 18 inches, rather than only 6 inches, per week. The caissons of the bridge across the Firth of Forth, Scotland, are examples of the great development of the caisson idea. The pneumatic caisson of Trigger, in 1839, had but one air lock, through which must pass men, excavated material, and constructed material for linings, etc. This plan meant slow and expensive work. The caissons of the Brooklyn Bridge were a vast improvement over this plan, both on the score of economy and safety. In the fourth bridge the caissons were made almost wholly of iron, thus avoiding the danger of the fire which so nearly wrecked the caisson of the Brooklyn Bridge. The careless or premature opening of the doors of air locks, which once nearly caused a serious accident on the Brooklyn caisson, was rendered impossible by a very elaborate system of interlocking. The efficiency of the apparatus for removing excavated material from the compressed air chamber was also greatly increased. Electric lights were used instead of gas or candles. Freezing process. 
This process is mentioned here on account of the analogy of its object to that of pneumatic caissons, sinking a shaft through excessively soft wet soil. The process is very recent, it having been invented by Dr. F. H. Poch, of Prussia, in 1883. It has been used only in a very few cases up to the present time, but where it has been used it has accomplished results which were practically unattainable by ordinary methods. A very brief description of one instance of its use will explain the general idea. For many years engineers had been baffled in their attempts to sink a shaft through 107 feet of quicksand at the Centrum Mine, near Berlin, Germany. Dar. Poach sunk 16 pipes in a circle around the proposed location of the shaft, and in 33 days had succeeded in producing a frozen circular wall 6 feet thick, within which the excavation was readily made and the shaft suitably lined. The freezing is accomplished by circulating a freezing liquid, chloride of calcium, through the tubes. After the shaft is completed the pipes can be thawed loose from the wall of ice by simply circulating a hot liquid instead of a cold one. The pipes can then be redrawn uninjured, and used over again, a consideration of no small advantage. The process is not cheap. It would seldom, if ever, be used where the more common methods are practicable. But for passing through very soft and wet soils it is frequently the only possible method. History records the construction of a ship canal across the Suez Isthmus as early as 600 BC. That it continued in use for about 1,400 years and was then abandoned. It was very small, all traces of it are now utterly lost. The authentic records of it are very meager, and they serve only to show the great antiquity of the canal idea. The 19th century progress on this line, therefore, consists in the enormously greater magnitude of the works accomplished in the solution of the great subsidiary problems involved. And in the improvement in methods of work which has rendered these great structures possible. The limitations of this article utterly forbid even a brief description of all the great canals which have been constructed during this century. And it must therefore be confined to a few statements regarding the more important and typical constructions. It might be thought that no discussion of 19th century canals would be complete without a mention of the Nicaragua and Panama Canal projects. But these stupendous works, which will eclipse anything of the kind which the world has ever seen, are not yet accomplished facts. The 20th century will be well underway before a trip around the Horn will become unnecessary. The successful completion of one of these canals will, very probably, so reduce the demand for the other that its construction will be indefinitely postponed. These canals will not be further considered. Suez Canal This great work permits a reduction of about 3,750 miles in the length of a voyage from Western Europe to India. Compared with some of the other great canals of the world, its construction was easy. The total length between Termini is about 101 statute miles, of which about 9 miles required no excavation. 16 miles more required only a slight excavation to make the channel of sufficient depth through existing dry depressions, called lakes, and the remaining 76 miles of excavation were cut chiefly through a soft alluvial soil. At only one point did the excavation reach 50 or 60 feet in depth, and here also was found the only instance of rock excavation. Even this rock, gypsum, was so soft that part of it was excavated by the steam shovels. About 80 million cubic yards of material were removed. If this material had been loaded onto cars carrying 25 cubic yards per car, made up into trains of 20 cars per train, and the trains were strung along at the rate of 5 per mile, it would have required 32. 000 miles of such trains to transport the material that was excavated. Work was actually begun in 1800. The Viceroy of Egypt originally agreed to furnish the laborers required, and at one time about 30,000 laborers were thus employed. On a change of administration in Egypt, the new Viceroy refused to furnish the native labor, and it then became necessary to import labor from Europe. And to supplement this insufficient and high-priced supply of labor by very large dredging machines, or steam shovels, of which about 60 were employed. The task of supplying water for the vast army of workmen was an engineering feat of no mean character and cost, as the entire route lies through an arid desert. 
a system of waterworks, having its source at Cairo, on the Nile, and distributing the water throughout the length of the canal, was therefore constructed. In the latter part of 1869, the waters of the Red and Mediterranean seas were joined, large arid depressions had been transformed into great lakes, and ocean-going vessels were sailing through what had been a desert. The canal is 26 feet deep, 72 feet wide at the bottom, the side sloping variably, according to the nature of the material, the resulting width at the top varying from 190 to 328 feet. Although not deep enough for the very largest vessels afloat, it will accommodate the great bulk of ocean travel, including war vessels. The total cost of this work, including the breakwaters, lighthouses, etc. at each terminus, was, approximately, 20 million pounds, or 100 million dollars. Unlike most canals, the Suez Canal has no locks. The original plan of the Panama Canal did not include locks, but the revised plan provided for them, in order to save excessive cutting. The Nicaragua Canal scheme necessarily includes locks. The water for the Suez Canal comes directly from the seas which are connected. A canal with locks necessarily requires an ample water supply from some river or freshwater lake. If the Suez Canal had been constructed at a higher level than the Mediterranean and Red Seas, had been supplied with water from the Nile, and had, therefore, been constructed with suitable locks at each end, as was actually recommended by some engineers, the cost of construction, as well as the perpetual expense of maintenance, would have been greatly in excess of its actual cost. And so the fact that it was possible to construct the canal without locks, and without providing for a supply of water, was a great advantage that facilitated the promotion of the enterprise. Manchester Canal This canal, having a total length of only 35 and one-half miles, has transformed the city of Manchester, England, from an inland city to a seaport. Actual excavation was begun in November, 1887, and just six years afterwards the whole canal was filled with water. It has a depth of 26 feet, and a width at the bottom of from 120 to 170 feet, thus giving a greater capacity than the Suez Canal or the proposed Panama Canal. Some of the greatest difficulties involved arose from the necessity of providing for the existing canals and railroads with which that busy portion of England is so crowded. Perhaps the most interesting feat of engineering was the drawbridge carrying the Duke of Bridgewater's canal at Barton. This small canal, having originally a depth of only four and one-half feet, here crosses the River Irwell. It was justly considered a great feat of engineering when James Brindley constructed the canal, during the 18th century, so that it crossed the river on a viaduct. A waterway crossing a waterway on a viaduct was then a new idea. But this old canal was constructed considerably above the desired level of the Manchester Canal, and yet, of course, not so high that a masted ship might pass under it. Therefore a draw became necessary. To add to the complication, the water supply of the small canal being somewhat limited, it was considered very undesirable to lose a trough full of water, roughly, 200,000 gallons, each time the draw was opened. To allow this water to flow into a tank and then pump it back would consume too much time, to say nothing of the expense. Therefore the bridge must swing with the trough full of water. That required gates at each end of the draw, as well as at the ends of the canal on each abutment. These gates were comparatively simple. But the difficult problem was to ensure a watertight joint between the ends of the draw trough and the corresponding ends of the canal. Temperature changes, as well as many other considerations, would preclude the possibility of making even a fairly tight joint by swinging the draw to a close fit with the abutments. The desired result was accomplished by placing at each end of the draw a very short U-shaped structure, having the same cross-section as the cross-section of the trough, and having beveled ends fitting corresponding bevels on the ends of the trough. These beveled ends are faced with rubber. To open the draw the gates are closed, the water between the gates at each end, a comparatively small amount, is drained off and wasted, the U-shaped wedges are raised, and the draw is then free to turn. The wedges are operated by hydraulic rams. Chicago Drainage Canal 
It will probably be a surprise to many people to learn that this drainage canal has a greater cross-section throughout the earthwork sections than any ship canal in existence. And is only exceeded through the rock sections by the Manchester Canal. The city of Chicago obtains its water supply from Lake Michigan. The intake pipe was at first located comparatively near the shore. As the population of the city grew and the volume of its sewage increased, it was observed that the water supply was becoming contaminated. The Chicago River, into which the sewage was emptied, became so foul that the odor was intolerable. The very evident fact of this odor probably had more to do with the promotion and accomplishment of the means of relief adopted than the far less evident but very dangerous pollution of the water supply. An extension of the intake pipe to a point several miles from shore by means of a tunnel, which was in itself a notable feat of engineering, only deferred the time when the water supply would again be fatally contaminated if the sewage continued to flow into the lake. It was accordingly determined to dispose of the sewage by discharging it into an artificial channel where it might become diluted with water from Lake Michigan, and thence pass from the watershed of the Great Lakes to the watershed of the Mississippi. The level of Lake Michigan is so high that there was no trouble about obtaining the requisite grade, and the divide between the watersheds is so low that the depth of the required cutting at the summit was not forbidding. But why have such a large canal? It was required that the sewage should be diluted, so as not to become offensive to the inhabitants of the region through which the canal must pass. The law under which the work was authorized required that the flow should be 600,000 cubic feet per minute, and that the minimum width at the bottom of the channel must be 160 feet. According to the well-known laws of hydraulics, it was seen that a deep canal would have a greater capacity per unit of excavation than a very wide shallow canal. This is especially true through the sections of deepest cut, since excavation above the water line adds nothing whatever to the capacity for flow. The sections adopted called for a depth of water of 22 feet. The side walls in rock are practically vertical, the width of channel being 160 feet at the bottom and 162 feet at the top. In earthwork the cross section is larger than in rock, thus reducing the velocity of flow and danger of scouring the banks. The width of channel at the bottom is 202 feet, the width at the water surface being 290 feet, and the side slopes two horizontal to one vertical. A very expensive feature of this great work was the necessity for constructing a diversion channel for the Desplaines River throughout that portion of the river valley occupied by the canal. Lack of space forbids a further discussion of this feature. The canal drains into the Desplaines River at a point where the slope of the river is so great that there will never be danger that a strong west wind or an unusual lowering of the level of Lake Michigan can possibly cause the current to flow. Eastward Work on the canal was commenced only after many years of discussion, planning, legislation, litigation, and bitter opposition by the varied interests which considered themselves more or less injured. But the work was actually commenced in July, 1892. The estimated excavation was approximately 40 million cubic yards, about one half that of the Suez Canal, but the length is only 29 miles, compared with 101 miles for the Suez Canal. The total cost was estimated at something over $27 million. On August 22, 1900, the Congressional River and Harbor Committee approved the work as far as completed. V. Geodesy It may be that many, who have read of the incredulity of all Europe when the voyages of navigators during the 15th and 16th centuries first demonstrated the sphericity of the earth will be surprised to learn that this knowledge had been acquired almost 2,000 years before, and had since then been forgotten. To Eratosthenes, a Grecian, belongs the honor of first making a measurement, about the year 230 B.C., of the size of the earth, which, while very rude and inaccurate, used the same fundamental principle as is now employed by geodesists. But the appliances of those ancient Grecians and of the Arabians, who later carried on the work, were exceedingly crude. Even during the 16th and 17th centuries, when the French, English, and Dutch were working very hard on the problem, and were gradually obtaining results which came closer and closer to those now known to be correct. 
The appliances for measuring angles were so rough and inaccurate that it was only possible to assert that the Earth is spherical, with a diameter of about 7,900 miles. The 17th century was nearly past when Picard first used spider lines to determine the line of collimation, or the true line of sight, in a telescope. This marked a new era in methods of work, but the 18th century was about half gone when it was first authoritatively proven that the Earth is not a sphere, but is more truly an oblate spheroid. Such a figure as would be obtained by flattening a sphere at the poles. Some idea of the accuracy of the work done, even at this stage, may be obtained by considering that the computed flattening is so slight that if we had a perfect reproduction of the Earth, reduced to a diameter of 12 inches, the flattening would be less than 1 25th of an inch, almost imperceptible even to a trained eye. The very highest mountain would be considerably less than 1 100 of an inch in height on such a sphere. The present marvelous state of the science is due to the great improvements which have been made in the construction and use of angle measuring instruments and of base bars. Also to the development of the mathematical theory and processes involved, notably that of the method of least squares. As an illustration of the accuracy attainable in the construction of theodolites, the writer recently made an elaborate test of the error of the centering of one of these angle measuring instruments. Of course no direct measurement is possible. The result is based on a long series of observations, which, when combined according to certain mathematical principles, will give the desired result. The error was thus computed to be 42 millionths of an inch. To realize what is meant when an angle is measured with a probable error of a few hundredths of a second of arc, it should be remembered that one second of arc on a circle 10 inches in diameter is less than 1 slash 40,000 of an inch. The accuracy which has been attained in the measurement of base lines is not easily realized by a layman. An engineer realizes the practical impossibility of measuring a line twice and obtaining precisely the same result to the finest unit of measurement. The initiated are therefore able to appreciate the achievement of measuring a base line having a length of over 9 miles, with a probable error of less than one five millionth of its length. The words, probable error, as used above, have a scientifically exact meaning, but they may be taken by the uninitiated as representing a measure of the precision obtained. At about the close of the last century the great mathematician, Laplace, had declared that the results of the surveys which had then been made were inconsistent with the theory that the form of the Earth is exactly that of an oblate spheroid. That form would require that the equator and all parallels of latitude shall be true circles, and that all meridian sections shall be equal ellipses. Laplace showed that the discrepancies between the actual results obtained and the results which the theory would call for are too great to be considered as mere inaccuracies in the work done. With the extension, during this century, of the great geodetic surveys, carried on by the various governments of the world, more and more evidence has developed that the meridian sections of the earth are not equal. Which is equivalent to saying that the equator is not a perfect circle. This has led to the next stage, which has been to prove that the form of the earth may be more closely represented by an ellipsoid than by a spheroid, that is, that every section of the earth is an ellipse. Several calculations have been made to determine the length and location of the principal axes of such a figure. But these calculations are considered unsatisfactory, because evidence has developed that the true form of the Earth cannot be represented even by an ellipsoid. This figure is symmetrical above and below the equator. There are reasons for believing that the southern hemisphere of the Earth is slightly larger than the northern, and that the form of the Earth is more nearly that of an ovaloid, a figure of which the ordinary hen's egg is an exaggerated example. All the above forms, the sphere, spheroid, ellipsoid, and ovaloid are geometrical forms which represent with more and more exactness the true form of the Earth. But even this increasing exactness will not account for the discrepancies and irregularities which have been found at various places, and which cannot be explained on the ground of inaccurate work. Geodesists have been forced to the conclusion that the true form of the Earth is not a regular geometrical form, but is a geoid, that is, like the Earth and like nothing else, unless we admit the exaggerated comparison that it is, like a potato. It should be understood that the words, form of the Earth, do not refer to the actual surface of mountain, valley, or ocean bottom, 
but to the actual ocean surface. And to the surface which the free ocean would assume if it could penetrate into the heart of the continents. The astounding accuracy of the work done may be appreciated when we consider that the differences between the geoid and the more accurate mathematical forms are distances which should be measured in feet rather than in miles. For many purposes, it is sufficiently exact to consider the Earth as a sphere. For some very precise work it is necessary to consider it as a spheroid. The more exact forms have little or no utilitarian value, and the vast amount of work that has been spent on these researches has been due to man's thirst for knowledge as such. Due to the same enthusiasm which advances the sciences in fields which only broaden man's knowledge of the world in which we live. 6. Railroads. The achievements of engineering skill on the line of bridges, canals, tunnels, etc. have been great, but their effect is insignificant compared with the social revolution that was created by the invention and development of railroads. The railroads of this country represent a value of about $12 billion, one-sixth of the national wealth. Their payrolls include about 850,000 employees, one-twenty-eighth of the working population. They support, directly or indirectly, about 5 million people. They collect an annual revenue of about $1,200,000,000, which is greater than the value of the combined products of gold, silver, iron, coal, and other minerals, wheat, rye, oats, barley, potatoes, and tobacco, produced by the entire nation. Such a stupendous social institution requires special discussion, and it will be found treated separately under the heading of Evolution of the Railway. 7. Tunnels Tunnels are of exceedingly ancient origin, if by tunnels we include all artificial underground excavations. From prehistoric times natural caves have been used as burial places, and, following this practice, tunnels and artificial rock chambers have been cut out by kings and rulers in Thebes, Nubia, and India during periods so ancient that we call the study of their history archaeology. Nor were the ancient tunnels confined to tombs. The Babylonians constructed tunnels through material so soft that a lining of brick masonry had to be used to sustain the work. The Romans constructed a tunnel over three and one-half miles long to drain the waters of Lake Fusino. About 30,000 laborers were occupied on this work for 11 years. The 19th century can hardly boast of works that represent a greater amount of labor, measured in mere days of work, than some of these ancient monuments of constructive skill. But the masterpieces of this century are works which have been greatly aided and even rendered possible by three modern inventions, compressed air drilling machines, modern explosives, and the compressed air process used in subaqueous work. The advance in methods of tunnel surveying is as great and nearly as important. Progress in excavating tunnels is necessarily slow, because the working face is so small that only a few men can work there at a time, and the rate of advance depends upon them. As an illustration, although the Mont Sainis tunnel belongs to the latter half of this century, the first blast being made in 1857, yet for the first four years hand drilling was employed, when the average progress was about 9 inches per day. Then machine drilling with compressed air was adopted, when the rate of advance was multiplied five times. The invention of compressed air drills simultaneously solved two difficulties, one, the compressed air furnishes an extremely convenient and safe form of power, which enables holes to be drilled much more rapidly than it is possible to drill them by hand. 2. The compressed air, after doing its work, is exhausted into the tunnel, and thus furnishes a continuous supply of fresh air. The necessity for ventilation has often required the construction and operation of expensive ventilating plants. Add to these improvements the lighting of the tunnel, even during construction, by electric lights which consume no oxygen, and the comparison between ancient and modern methods becomes especially marked. Before the invention of explosives, hard rock was sometimes broken by building wood fires next to the rock, and then, when the rock had become very hot, cooling it suddenly with water. The sudden contraction would split the rock. Ventilation was attempted by waving fans at the tunnel entrances. With torches and fires to consume the precious oxygen, and no effective ventilation, it is a wonder how those earlier tunnels were constructed. 
the compressed air methods for subaqueous work will be referred to under a special case. The essential principles have already been described under caissons. Tunnel surveying. The tunnel surveying developed during this century is one of the marvels of surveying work. If a tunnel is to be several miles in length, not only is the excavation commenced at each end, but one or more intermediate shafts are frequently sunk to the level of the tunnel, and excavation is extended in each direction from the shafts. It is extremely important that these sections of the tunnel should meet exactly. If they should fail to do so by any appreciable amount, the necessary modifications are frequently costly and therefore justify the most elaborate precautions in the surveying work. Especially since the surveying costs much less than the consequences of such a blunder. The Husik Tunnel is over 25,000 feet long. The heading from the east end met the heading from the central shaft at a point 11,274 feet from the east end and 1,563 feet from the shaft. The error in alignment was 5 sixteenths of an inch, that of levels, a few hundredths, error of distance, trifling. The corrected alignment was then carried on toward the heading from the west end, which it met at a point 10,138 feet, nearly 2 miles, from the west end and 2,056 feet from the shaft. Here the error of alignment was 9 sixteenths of an inch and that of levels about 1 and 5 eighths inches. The surveying work of the spiral tunnels on this T. Gothard Railway, to be described later, is another example of marvelously accurate work under peculiarly unfavorable circumstances. St. Gothard Tunnel To appreciate the magnitude of the problem involved, of which this great tunnel is the crowning feature, some idea should be obtained of the alpine topography lying between Silenen, in Switzerland, and Bodio, in Italy, less than 40 miles apart. The idea of connecting Switzerland and Italy by a railroad passing over or through the Alps, by utilizing the St. Gothard Pass as far as possible, dates back to 1850, or even earlier. An enterprise of such magnitude could be consummated only after years of discussion, planning, surveying, negotiations, and even international agreements. In 1871 a treaty was finally ratified between Germany, Italy, and Switzerland, by which the construction and financiering was duly authorized. On August 7, 1872, the contract for the construction was signed, with a proviso that the work must be completed within eight years. On April 30, 1880, the advance headings met, and soon thereafter the mails were regularly carried through, although the tunnel was not actually completed in the specified time. The route adopted was bold enough to stagger the financier, if not the engineer. Starting from Silenen, Switzerland, it required a climb of nearly 2,000 feet to reach Goskinen, the adopted northern portal of the tunnel. This would require an average grade of 200 feet per mile in the 10 miles of distance, or an actual grade of 370 feet per mile in the upper part of the line, if the river valley were followed. The line was therefore, developed, that is, the distance was purposely increased by adopting an indirect line, in order that the grade might be less. It was found possible to run the line from Silenen to Pfaffensprung, a distance of about 6 miles, on the comparatively low grade of 137 feet per mile. At this point the line suddenly plunges into the mountain, and curves around in a circle, which is, roughly, 2,000 feet in diameter, while it continues an upward grade of 121 and a half feet per mile. After traversing 4,845 feet of such tunnel, the line again emerges into the open air, having turned nearly three-fourths of a circle in the solid rock. About 2,000 feet farther on the line actually crosses itself, the upper line there being 167 and a half feet higher than the lower line, which is at that point within the tunnel. By this device, which is called a spiral, the line is run at a practicable grade, and an elevation of 167 and a half feet is surmounted by introducing 6,986 feet of development. Near the entrance of the Legistine Tunnel, the line is less than 500 feet away, horizontally, from a lower part of the line, which is about 350 feet lower in elevation. Space forbids a further description of this climb of 2,000 feet to Goskinen, where the line plunges into the bowels of the earth, and does not again emerge until it has traversed nine and one quarter miles. 
and has reached the southern slope of the Alps. Even here the portal is 3,755 feet above sea level, and the valley down to Bodio is steeper in places than the valley of the Rus. For spirals are used in descending about 2,650 feet in an airline distance of less than 19 miles. In one place even the upper line, where it crosses the lower line, is in solid rock. Imagine standing in the gloom of a tunnel and considering that vertically beneath your feet, more than 100 feet further down in the bowels of the earth, there is another tunnel belonging to the same line of road. The great majority of tunnels are straight. A few have curves at one or both ends, but nowhere else in the world can be found such examples of spiral tunnels carved out of the living rock. St. Clair Tunnel A glance at a map of Lower Canada and Michigan will show that all the rail traffic of Lower Canada, and even that from Montreal and Quebec, that passes as far west as Chicago, must either cross the Detroit River at Detroit or the St. Clair River, at or near Port Huron. Plans for bridging the river have been frequently made, but the Canadian government has steadily refused permission. The traffic along the river in 1896 amounted to over 35 million tons, or more than was shipped at the ports of either New York, London, or Liverpool, and greatly in excess of that which passed through the Suez Canal. Such traffic must not be impeded even by a drawbridge, and therefore a tunnel was the only alternative. The problem was in many respects unique. Borings showed that the tunnel must pass through clay and occasional pockets of quicksand, and therefore it would be necessary to employ a pneumatic method. Brunel had used a shield on the Thames Tunnel half a century before. But all of the earlier tunnels constructed by this method were much smaller, and the difficulty and danger increase very rapidly as the size increases. In 1886 the Festi. Clare Tunnel Company, virtually a creature of the Grand Trunk Railway Company, was organized, and in 1888 work was begun. After a false start, made by sinking shafts which were afterwards abandoned, open cuttings were commenced at each end, which were extended to points 6,000 feet apart, between which the tunnel was excavated and lined. The circular lining, having an outside diameter of 21 feet, is of cast iron, made in segments which are bolted together, having strips of wood 3 sixteenths of an inch thick placed in the joints. Liquid asphalt was freely used as a preservative and to make tight joints. The tunnel was excavated for nearly 2,000 feet on each side as an ordinary open tunnel until the excavation was actually under the river. Then a diaphragm with air locks was built on each side, and that part of the tunnel lying under the river, 2,290 feet in length, was constructed under air pressure. Several curious facts were developed during the construction. The material excavated outside of the shields was thrown inside, loaded onto cars, and hauled by mules to the diaphragm. It was found that horses could not work in compressed air. Mules could do so, but even they were sometimes affected by the bends, a disease akin to paralysis, which frequently occurred among the men. The shields were forced forward by 24 hydraulic rams, each having a capacity of 125 tons, or 3,000 tons for each shield. Usually a force of 1,200 to 1,500 tons was sufficient. Much gas was encountered, which, on account of its explosiveness, prevented the employment of blasting to break up the boulders which were frequently found. The advantages of electric lighting in compressed air work were exemplified in this tunnel. In August, 1890, about one year after the shields were placed on each side of the river, they met near the center. The progress of each shield averaged nearly 10 feet per day. Considering the frequency with which the cost of great engineering work exceeds the original estimate, it is remarkable to note that in this case the actual cost, $2,700,000, was less than the original estimate, which was about $3 million. The Century's Progress in the Animal World By D. E. Salmon, M.D. Chief of Bureau of Animal Industry U.S. Agricultural Department. I. Of Animal Diseases. The Wars of Napoleon, which in the early years of the 19th century so seriously affected the governments and institutions of Europe, had an equally marked influence upon the development of the animal industry in the countries that were brought within the sphere of the military operations. 
This chapter of the history of that period appears to have been neglected by writers who have industriously delved into details of subjects of far less interest and importance. Enough has been chronicled by various historians, however, to show that in many cases those engaged in successful operations for improving the breeds of domesticated animals were forced to abandon the work to which they had devoted their lives. And for which long study and experience had specially fitted them, and to become units in the vast armies which were organized only to melt away in the bloody and disastrous campaigns of that epoch. But it was not the men alone that were taken. The best horses were seized for the use of the officers and the cavalry, for the artillery and the transportation trains. The sheep and swine were slaughtered for the subsistence of the armies, and the cattle were driven off for the same purpose. Neither the choicest flocks and herds nor the most magnificent individuals produced by the breeders are escaped. The fruits of many years of patient effort in selection and in guiding the forces of heredity were blotted out, the animals left were few and inferior. To crown all these disasters, the most deadly forms of contagion were gathered from their hiding places with the animals that were seized. The plagues which these caused were propagated among the vast aggregation of beasts that were required for the service of the armies, and, finally, they were disseminated throughout all sections to which these armies penetrated. The agriculturists of Great Britain, thanks to the isolation due to the considerable expanse of water which separates their territory from the mainland, escaped not only the invasions of armed and destructive hosts, but also the pestilences which accompanied them. While, therefore, the farmers of the continent were struggling to save a few of their remaining animals from the ravages of glanders, rinderpest, foot and mouth disease, pleuronomonia, and other plagues. Those of the British Isles were perfecting the work of their ancestors without molestation. These circumstances, lost sight of by many, explain to a certain extent the apparently marvellous success of the British husbandmen in developing so many breeds of horses, cattle, sheep, and swine to the wonderful perfection which we see at the end of the nineteenth century. The favourable climate, together with the abundant and nutritious herbage, have undoubtedly been factors in the production of the British breeds. But the power and opportunity to select the best animals and retain these for breeding purposes must also have had great influence. The effect of contagious diseases in retarding the development of animal life may be appreciated from the estimate, carefully made. That in the closing years of the 18th century the cattle plague, Rinderpest, alone destroyed in Europe 200 million head of cattle, valued at 7 billions of dollars. During the first half of the 19th century, cattle plague, pleuronomonia, and foot and mouth disease were particularly disastrous to the animal industry of the continent of Europe, and unquestionably, also, throughout Asia. Which appears to have been the original habitat of these plagues. During the last third of this century the development of veterinary science, together with the enactment of sanitary legislation and the enforcement of intelligent measures of repression, have practically eradicated the cattle plague from the countries of Europe, and we have only to note, as important, its invasion of Great Britain in 1865, which led to the adoption of the present most excellent sanitary organization, and the extensive outbreak on the continent following the Franco-Prussian War. During the last six years this plague has swept over large sections of the African continent, destroying nearly every bovine animal in the regions first invaded. And had it not been for the fortunate and timely discovery of a successful method of preventive inoculation, the cattle industry would have been absolutely annihilated. Pleuronomonia, almost equally destructive with cattle plague and much more persistent, was widely disseminated over the continent of Europe during the 17th century, and reached England about 1840. Many years were lost in feudal contentions over the subject of contagion, and it was not until the last twenty years that vigorous measures for its extermination were enforced. In the meantime the contagion had been carried to Australia and South Africa, where it has since remained domiciled, a constant source of loss to the cattle growers. The losses from this disease in Europe are now comparatively unimportant, but in the countries of Asia and Africa, and in Australia, it is still a great incubus. Foot and mouth disease, less fatal in its effects than the other maladies mentioned, appears to be more difficult to control, and, in the closing years of the century, we find it prevailing extensively over the principal countries of continental Europe. 
The diseases which have most seriously affected the development of other species of animals are the glanders of horses, the variola of sheep, sheeppox, and the three diseases of swine known in Europe as erysipelas, swine pest, and swine plague. These have been extremely prevalent and fatal in many parts of Europe. Glanders, swine pest, and swine plague have been brought to the American continent, and have been even more destructive here than in their ancient habitat. The diseases which at present are regarded as most serious attracted but little attention at the beginning of the century, or were unknown. Tuberculosis has now become the great scourge of dairy cows and other highly bred cattle, ruining many of the best herds and threatening the health of the consumers of milk, if not also of beef. Texas fever, a disease of cattle first studied in the United States, but now known to be widely disseminated over the South American, African, and Australian continents has during late years retarded operations for improving and increasing the stock of cattle, and has seriously restricted the marketing of animals from the infected districts. This brief summary relative to contagious diseases and their effects is all the attention that can be given in this article to conditions which through all historic times have been important, and, in many cases, have been supreme in their influence upon the tendencies and development of the animal population. As the 20th century approaches, however, the influence of the animal plagues is on the wane. And with a few more years of active scientific investigations they will all be so thoroughly controlled that the disastrous visitations of the past can never be repeated, and they will not even be a hindrance or menace to the stock grower. 2. Increase in numbers. As might be expected, there has been an increase in the numbers of the domesticated animals held in the various countries of the world, but this increase has been far from uniform, and cannot be measured either by the growth of the population or the degree of prosperity. Evidently the density of population, the development of manufactures, and the fertility of the soil have had much influence. In the United Kingdom there were 1,500,000 horses in 1800, and but 2 million in 1898. During this time the cattle had increased from 5 million to 11 million, the sheep from 25 million to 31 million, and the swine from 3 million to 3 million 700,000. Thus, while the cattle doubled in numbers during the century, the horses increased but one-third, the sheep one-fourth, and the swine one-fourth. As in the same period the population of the country was augmented from 16,200,000 to 40 million, or two and one-half times, it is not difficult to see why England has become the world's greatest market for animals and animal products. It is important to note the increase in animals in a few of the principal countries of Europe. In France there were 1,800,000 horses at the beginning of the century, and there were 3,418,000 in 1896. The cattle increased from 6 million to 13 million 334,000, the swine from 4 million 500,000 to 6 million 400,000, the goats from 800,000 to 1 million 500,000, while the sheep decreased from 30 million to 21 million 200,000. That is, in round numbers, the horses, cattle, and goats doubled, the swine increased nearly 50%, but the sheep were diminished one fourth. The population advanced from 27,350,000 to 38,500,000, or about 40%. In Germany, from 1828 to 1892, the horses increased from 2,500,000 to 3,836,000, the cattle from 9,770,000 to 17,500,000, the goats from 700,000 to 3 million the swine from 4,500,000 to 12,174,000. And the sheep decreased from 17,300,000 to 13,600,000. The population increased during the same time from 29,700,000 to 49,500,000. In European Russia, from 1828 to 1888, the horses were increased from 12 million to 20 million. The cattle from 19 million to 23 million 840,000, the sheep from 36 million to 47 million 500,000, while the swine decreased from 15 million 800,000 to 9 million 200,000. The population during this period increased from 45 million to 90 million. 
these are the countries in which there is most interest on account of their influence upon the markets of the world. In regard to Europe as a whole, owing to the lack of statistics, we can only estimate approximately as to the condition at the beginning of the century. From such data as are available it appears that there were about 20,600,000 horses, 61,800,000 cattle, 157,500,000 sheep and 36,600,000 swine. The population of Europe at that time is placed at 175 million. In the year 1900 there will be in Europe not far from 44,250,000 horses, 108 million cattle, 180,575,000 sheep, and 56,800,000 swine. The population will reach about 380 million. From these figures it would appear that, taking all of Europe, the human population has increased more rapidly than have any of these species of domesticated animals. In other words, the population is 2. 17 times what it was at the beginning of the century, while there are but 2.14 times as many horses, 1.75 times as many cattle, 1.55 times as many swine, and 1.14 times as many sheep. This growing deficiency in the stock of animals, coupled with an increasing consumption of meat per capita, has led to the importation of great numbers of animals and large quantities of meats and other animal products. The resulting trade has stimulated the production of animals in other parts of the world, particularly in the United States of America, Australia, and Argentina, in all of which there has been a marvelous development. There are no reliable statistics as to the number of animals in the United States at the beginning of the century. Some have estimated that there were only 300,000 horses, 600,000 cattle, and 600,000 sheep. But the writer is of the opinion that there were from 500,000 to 1 million horses, at least 3 million head of cattle, and from 2 million to 3 million sheep. In 1840, with a population of 17,063,000, there were 4,300,000 horses, 14,900,000 cattle, 19,300,000 sheep, and 26,300,000 swine. While in 1899 the number is placed at 15,800,000 horses and mules, 44 million cattle, 39 million sheep, and 38,600,000 swine. In 1888 the horses of Canada numbered 1,100,000, the cattle 3,790,000, the sheep 2,600,000, and the swine 1,205,000. In the same year Mexico was credited with 2 million horses, 3 million cattle, 2 million sheep, and 5 million goats. Taking the whole of North America, and making allowances for the increase since 1888 in Canada and Mexico, it may be fairly assumed that at the close of the century there will be about 19 million horses and mules, 55 million cattle, 50,000. 000 sheep, and 40 million swine. In South America, Argentina far outstrips all other countries in animal production. The horses, which in 1864 numbered 3,875,000, had increased by 1895 to 4,447,000, the cattle increased in the same period from 10,215,000 to 21,702,000. The sheep, from 23,110,000 to 74,380,000. The population in 1895 was only 3,964,000. In Uruguay there were, in 1895, 402,348 horses, 5,248,000 cattle, and 14,333,000 sheep. In Paraguay there were, in 1896, 246,000 horses and 2,100,000 cattle. The last returns from Chile, 1882, give 450,000 horses, 1,530,000 cattle, and 2,500,000 sheep. As to the condition in Brazil, we have no reliable statistics. The animal industries of Australasia have shown the most wonderful development during the century. In 1800, there were but 200 horses, 1040 cattle, and 6,100 sheep. In 1810, there were 1130 horses, 12,440 cattle, 25,900 sheep, 
and 9,540 swine. In 1896, there were 1,923,554 horses, 12,701,600 cattle, 110,524,000 sheep, and 1 million swine. In Asia there are large numbers of animals, but it is impossible to give statistics, except for British India, where, in 1895, there were 1,152,000 horses, 49 million cattle, and 17,200,000 sheep. Mr. Simons endeavored to ascertain the number of each class of livestock in the world in 1890, and his conclusions may be accepted as approximately correct. He placed the total number of horses in all countries at 63,469,000, the asses and mules at 10,318,000, the cattle at 309,807,000, the sheep at 588,935,000, the swine at 102,526,000, and the goats at 59,971,000. 3. Improvement of breeds of animals The increased number of animals now held in various parts of the world does not give an adequate idea of the enlarged production of animal food products, as compared with 100 years ago. During the last century there has been constant improvement in the various breeds of animals, with a view to perfect their form and shorten the time required for their growth. The breeder has learned how to stimulate development, and has fixed the quality of early maturity, through hereditary influence, until it is now transmitted with the same regularity as are other characteristics. Cattle are no longer fed until they are three or four years old before being sent to the butcher, and it has been found that they can be made to yield an equal quantity of beef of better quality at 18 months to two years. It is the flesh of such young animals which has been much discussed under the title of baby beef. Not only is this beef commended on account of its tenderness, its high nutritive value, and the more even distribution of fat through the muscular tissue. But because this shortening of the feeding period enables the farmer to produce a greatly increased quantity of human food from the same number of acres. That is, by reducing the age at which bullocks are marketed from three and one half years, as was formerly the rule, to twenty months, it is possible for the same farm to produce one third more animals in a given series of years. It may be admitted that not all of the stock of beef-producing animals, nor even the greater part of it, has acquired this extreme degree of early maturity, but most of it has developed somewhat in this direction. The large-boned, gaunt, and long-horned cattle of Texas have nearly disappeared, and even in Mexico they are being rapidly replaced by others of better quality. The most important fact is that breeds exist which can be depended upon for the speedy transformation of the entire stock of cattle when the necessity arises. A similar hastening of maturing has been accomplished with the mutton breeds of sheep, with numerous varieties of swine, and to a considerable extent with poultry. The development of the dairy breeds of cattle has also been remarkable. It can be best appreciated by contrasting the half-wild cows of our western plains, which yield but two or three quarts of milk a day at their best, and none for half of the year. With the highly specialized types which produce twenty to thirty quarts daily when in full flow, and with which the milk secretion continues from year to year without interruption. The yield of butter has been increased equally with that of milk, and among the dairy breeds there are some which are specially valued because of their aptitude for butter production. While the unimproved cow yields but one-fourth to one-half pound of butter a day, good specimens of the best breeds produce from one and one-half to three pounds, and in numerous instances still greater quantities. In the production of wool there has also been a wonderful advance. The fiber has been increased in length, the fleece has been distributed more uniformly over the surface of the body. And the quality of the fiber has been modified to conform to the requirements for manufacturing the infinite varieties of fabrics demanded by modern civilization. The fleece of today is probably three times as heavy as that of a century ago. The improvement in the merino type has been truly wonderful. Not only have the beautiful long and silky wools of the Rambouillet and Saxony breeds been developed by persistent selection, but the body of the merino, formerly small and almost useless for its flesh, has been brought to a standard closely approaching that of the best mutton breeds. 
It is unfortunate that the changes of fashion have, during the latter part of the century, made the production of the extra fine wools less profitable than the coarse varieties, and that, as a consequence, many flocks which had been bred to the very highest degree of perfection in this direction have gone to the shambles, and their peculiar points of excellence have been lost. With poultry, a vast number of varieties and strains have been developed, among which the most fastidious taste may readily find its ideal. Some of these have been perfected from the standpoint of utility, while with others the guiding principle has been purely aesthetic. Thus there are breeds which are characterized by their size, rapid growth, and excellence of flesh. Others which have been developed simply as egg-producing machines and which have even lost the maternal instinct for incubation. And still others in which the beauty, the complication, and the perfection of the feathering constitute the principal claims to attention. The standard weights of the heavy varieties, such as Brahmas and Cochins, is now 11 pounds to 12 pounds. For cocks, and 8.5 pounds to 9.5 pounds for hens. In the United States, there has been developed a distinct American class of medium weight fowls, of which the Plymouth Rocks and Wyandots are the most popular varieties. The cocks of these varieties weigh from 8.5 pounds to 9.5 pounds, and the hens 6.5 pounds to 7.5 pounds. They are valued both for their flesh and for egg production. The rapid multiplication of varieties by modern breeders is illustrated by the Wyandots, which came into existence during the last third of the century, and of which there are now five distinct varieties, the silver, golden, white, buff, and black. The breeder's art has been most successfully brought to bear in stimulating the function of egg production. Not many years ago, an average yield of 125 to 150 eggs annually from the hens of even a small flock was considered all that it was possible to obtain. But at present there are varieties which may be relied upon to produce more than 200 eggs annually. In some instances, it is alleged that an average of nearly 300 eggs a year has been reached in small flocks which have been given special care. It should not be forgotten that there has also been great improvement in the various breeds of horses. The heavy draft horses have been bred into a more compact form, with better legs and feet and less sluggish disposition. The most noticeable advance has, however, been in the lighter grades of horses, and this has largely been accomplished by infusing the blood of the English thoroughbred. The French, by systematically breeding the heavy mares of the country to thoroughbred stallions with careful selection of the offspring, produced an extremely valuable breed of carriage horses, known there as the demi-sang and which have been imported into the United States as French coach horses. These animals, beautiful in form and action, have been brought to a high degree of perfection, and the breed is so well established that its good qualities are reliably transmitted from generation to generation. There are also German coach horses and similar breeds in several other countries, which have been established by following the same general plan as that adopted by the French. These breeds are peculiarly the product of the 19th century, and are in their most valuable condition as the century closes. The American trotting horse has without doubt been one of the most remarkable triumphs of the breeder's art which the century has seen. Originating in considerable obscurity, but undoubtedly owing much of its excellence to the thoroughbred, the trotter was born with the century, and has continually increased its speed until the very end. It now gives promise of continuing its evolution through at least a considerable part of the 20th century. In the decade from 1800 to 1810, the best recorded speed at this gate was 259, from 1810 to 1820, the time was lowered to 2,48 one half. From 1830 to 1840, it reached 2,31 one half, from 1840 to 1850, the limit was 228, from 1850 to 1860, 2,19 one fourth, from 1860 to 1870, 2,17 one fourth, from 1870 to 1880, 2,12 three fourth, from 1880 to 1890, 2,08 three fourth, and from 1890 to 1898, 2,03 three, three fourth. This extraordinary and constantly progressing increase in speed during the century has excited the interest and admiration of the world. It is, however, 
quite generally admitted that too much attention has been given to speed and not enough to disposition, size, conformation, and soundness, to bring the animals to their highest value for other than racing purposes. Owing to the relatively small extent of agricultural territory and the great development of manufactures, Great Britain has become the best market in the world for animals and animal products. The purchases of cattle, sheep, beef, and mutton have been particularly large. Considering, first, the importations of cattle, it is found that during the five years from 1861 to 1865 inclusive, the average number was 174,177. From 1866 to 1870, the average was 194,947, from 1871 to 1875, 215,990, from 1876 to 1880, 272,745, from 1881 to 1885, 387,282, from 1886 to 1890, 438,098, from 1891 to 1895, 448,139, and for the two years 1896 and 1897, 590,437. This unparalleled growth in the consumption of foreign cattle has had a marked influence in encouraging the development of the cattle industry of some other parts of the world, particularly in the United States, Canada, and Argentina. The export trade of the United States has developed even more rapidly than the import trade of Great Britain. In 1871 this traffic was in its infancy, and but 20,530 head of cattle were exported, valued at $400,000. By 1879 the number had increased to 136,720, valued at $8,300,000. Then came the British restrictions prohibiting American cattle from leaving the docks where landed, and requiring their slaughter on these docks within ten days from their arrival. These regulations were a rude shock to the American cattle grower, and led to measures here for the control and eradication of the cattle diseases which were cited by the English authorities as the cause of their unfavorable action. Although the pleuronomonia, about which most apprehension was expressed, has long since been extirpated, and an elaborate inspection service has been organized to prevent any affected animals from leaving our shores. The restrictions have been continued. Fortunately, the trade was only temporarily embarrassed, and has continued its growth notwithstanding this obstruction. In 1889 these exports first exceeded 200,000, and the following year reached 394,836. Since that time the number has fluctuated between 287,000 and 392,000, until 1898, when it reached the enormous aggregate of 439,255, valued at $37,800,000. Not quite all of these cattle have gone to Great Britain, but that has been the destination of by far the greater part. The exports of sheep have varied widely, according to the fluctuations of the markets at home and abroad. From 1870 to 1873 the number varied from 39,000 to 66,000, from 1874 to 1889, it varied from 110,000 to 337,000. In 1890 the exports were but 67,500, in 1891, 60,900, in 1892, 46,900, and in 1893, 37,200. Beginning with 1894, the exports of sheep again increased, reaching in that year 132,000, in 1895 they were 405,000, and in 1896, 491,000. In 1897 there was a decrease to 244,000, and in 1898 a further decrease to 200,000, valued at $1,213,000. The export trade in horses and mules was inconsiderable, varying from 2,000 to 800 a year until 1895, when 14,000 horses and 4,800 mules were shipped to foreign ports. This trade increased in 1896 to 25,126 horses and 6,534 mules, together valued at about $4 million. 
In 1897 a further increase was made to 39,532 horses and 7,753 mules, the value being $5,400,000. And, finally, in 1898 there were exported the largest number ever sent from this country, amounting to 51,150 horses and 6,996 mules, valued at $6,691,000. Swine are not exported in very large numbers, as they do not stand shipping well. The largest number sent abroad was 158,581, in 1874, the value of which was $1,625,837. In 1897 and 1898 there were only 16,800 exported each year. Very few of these crossed the ocean. This resume of the development of the international traffic in live animals and the status of the animal industry would not be complete without some reference to the markets for animal products. The quantity of foreign meat consumed in Great Britain is most remarkable. The imports of fresh beef, which from 1861 to 1865 averaged but 15,772 CWTS, had increased in the years 1891-1895 to an average of 2,020,668 CWTS. And in 1897 exceeded 3 million CWTS. The proportion of this supplied by the United States is indicated by the returns for 1896, giving a total of 2,659,700 CWTS. Of imported beef, of which this country furnished 2,074,644 CWTS. Great Britain also imported 3,193,276 CWTS. Of fresh mutton in 1897, more than nine-tenths of it being frozen carcasses from Argentina and Australasia. Of fresh and salted pork, the United States supplied 4,183,800 CWTS. Out of a total of 6,563,688 CWTS. The principal other animal products imported by that country are, 1,750,000 CWTS. Of lard, 276,458 CWTS. Of rabbits, and 1,683,810,000 eggs. The continent of Europe consumes considerable quantities of lard and salted pork, which are largely furnished by the United States. Notwithstanding the unfavorable attitude of the governments toward such traffic and the existence of many annoying and injurious regulations, fresh meats from America have been practically excluded. The British markets for dairy products and wool have also had considerable influence upon the prosperity of the animal industries in various parts of the world. The rapidly increasing demand for dairy products is worthy of attention. In 1877 there were imported into the United Kingdom 1,637,403 CWTS. Of butter and margarine. In 1897 the imports had been raised to 3,217,801 CWTS. Of butter and 936,543 CWTS. Of margarine, or a total of 4,154,344 CWTS, being two and one half times the quantity imported in 1877. The quantity of cheese imported in 1877 was 1,653,920 CWTS, and had increased to 2,603,608 CWTS. In 1897, the country supplying the largest quantity of butter in 1896 was Denmark, with France second, Sweden third, Holland fourth, and Australasia fifth. Nearly all of the margarine came from Holland. The largest quantity of cheese came from Canada, the United States being second, with less than half the quantity furnished by her neighbor to the north, and Holland third. The quantity of wool imported by the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Austria, Belgium, United States, and other consuming countries, increased from 200,000 tons, in the decade 1821-1830, to 3,300,000 tons in 1871 to 1880. This wool came principally from Australia, River Plate, 
South Africa, Russia, and Spain. The excess of imports of wool into the United Kingdom over the exports were, in 1892, 312,217,111 pounds, and in 1896, 383,845,450 pounds. Of the total quantity imported by the United Kingdom in 1896, the United States supplied but 4,500,000 pounds, while Australasia furnished 477,600,000 pounds, Cape of Good Hope, 70 million pounds, British East Indies, 43 million pounds. Natal, 21 million pounds, France, 20 million pounds, Turkey, 16,500,000 pounds, and Belgium, 11,400,000 pounds. The tendency of the last decade of the 19th century has been to displace horses and adopt mechanical motors. The great increase of steam railroads, cable cars, electric cars, bicycles, and automobile vehicles has so reduced the demand for these animals that their value has decreased over 50%. While there is still a good market for horses suitable for carriage use, for drays, for army service, and for agricultural purposes, buyers are becoming more critical and the future is uncertain. As it is five or six years after a breeding establishment is started before any of the horses produced can be placed upon the market. The effect of this uncertainty is to discourage would-be horse breeders and influence them toward other enterprises. The end of the century also finds the sheep industry in a depressed condition on account of overproduction. The vast quantities of wool grown in Australasia and South Africa have clogged the markets to such an extent that Australian wool in the London market has dropped from 15 d. per pound in 1877 to 8 one fourth d. In 1897, and South African wool from 15 three fourth d. to 7 one half d. During the same period, other wools have fallen in about the same proportion. Although sheep are raised for the production of mutton as well as wool, and the tendency in the United States has been towards the breeding of mutton sheep, the value of these animals has been reduced about one half. There have been periods of depression with the cattle and swine industries, but prices have been well sustained. The European markets are yearly requiring larger supplies, and the stock of beef producing cattle in the United States, in proportion to the population, is rapidly diminishing. The decreased number is in a slight degree counterbalanced by earlier maturity, but when due allowance is made for this, it is plain that the United States has not the surplus of beef which it boasted a few years ago. At the same time, our meat trade in the markets of the world is threatened with more serious competition from South America, Australasia, and even Russia. The century closes in a period of wonderful achievements in the extension of transportation facilities and in the education of the masses in all parts of the world. The producer in South America, Africa, and Australasia keeps abreast with the most enlightened stockgrowers of Europe and America in his knowledge of the best breeds, the most economical methods of feeding, and the most desirable handling of his products. There is no animal product so perishable but that it can now be sent from the antipodes to London in good condition. All of this has brought surprising changes in the traffic between different countries and in the modification of industries to meet new conditions. The producers of the most distant parts of the world are aggressively entering our nearest markets. Competition is becoming more intense, and commercial rivalry is assuming more the appearance of warfare than heretofore. The nations of the world are actively engaged in assisting their people in this struggle. They diffuse information as to the best and most economical methods of production, they seek out new markets, they subsidize transportation lines, they assist in the introduction of new kinds of goods. They sustain their subjects in the most aggressive practices, they exclude the products of competing countries by tariffs and hostile sentiment, by discriminations, by unpacking, delaying, or damaging goods, under the pretext of inspection. And by burdensome charges and regulations. Some countries have gone so far as to absolutely prohibit competing products for comprehensive but indefinite sanitary reasons. The outcome of this commercial warfare cannot be foreseen. The struggle has been, and is, fiercest over the international traffic in animals and animal products. The greatest forces of the world are today contending as to what the future shall be.
the United States has only recently begun to realize that it also must take part in this commercial struggle, if it would retain markets for its products and secure prosperity for its people. Its trade has been unjustly prohibited and discriminated against, its merchants have been unfairly treated and insulted, and its protests have been treated with ill-disguised contempt. Notwithstanding all these efforts at repression, American trade has gone on increasing at an amazing rate, the forbearance of the government having been far overbalanced by the energy of the people. Having grown to be one of the greatest powers of the world, with magnificent resources yet undeveloped, the United States will no doubt maintain its position and continue to supply the markets of the world with the best animals, the best meats. And probably with the best dairy products. Leading Wars of the Century by Major General Joseph Wheeler, U.S. Army. I. Wars of the United States. The progress of the 19th century, in everything that pertains to civilization, arts, and sciences, has been greater than the total progress in any decade of centuries in the history of the world. And this is equally true in regard to the art and science of war. For the expenditure of blood and treasure in the prosecution of the wars and the fighting of the battles of this century far exceeds that of any other like period. The first year of the nineteenth century dawned upon the United States at peace with the world. In September, 1800, Napoleon, finding that he could not coerce the young nation into an entangling alliance, and fearing lest the United States should join England in opposing him, found it his best policy to conclude a peace. The brilliant achievements of the newly organized navy, under Commodore Truxton, not only illuminated these early pages of our history, but established a prestige never yet forfeited. For the history of this branch of our service is unparalleled from the first effort, during the revolution, of Isaac Hopkins, to that of George Dewey at Manila, and Samson and Schley at Santiago. War with Barbary States in 1803 the United States determined to end the piracy of the Barbary states, and an expedition under Commodore Preble was sent to the Mediterranean. The Philadelphia, while pursuing a pirate, was grounded off the coast of Tripoli, and captured by the Tripoli Tans, who made slaves of the crew and prisoners of the officers. In February, 1804, Captain Decatur, with 76 men from his ship, the Intrepid, boarded the Philadelphia, killed or drove off the moors, fired the vessel, and returned without the loss of a man. Although fiercely attacked by the shore batteries. In July, Commodore Preble, with his squadron, laid siege to Tripoli, but his bombardment was ineffective. General Eaton, consul to Tunis, induced Hammett, the brother of Yusef, who had usurped the sovereignty of Tripoli, to furnish him a troop of Arab cavalry and a company of Greeks. With these, and a band of Tripoli Tan rebels and a force of American sailors, he crossed the Barkan Desert, stormed and captured Dern, an eastern seaport of Yusef. The latter was glad to make peace, and a treaty was signed June 4, 1805. Indian Wars. From 1809 to 1811, fighting with the Indians in the south and northwest was constant. General Harrison and the celebrated Indian chief Tecumseh were the principal actors. War of 1812. The contest between England and France for the dominion of the seas was the cause of the War of 1812. England declared the German and French coast to be in a state of blockade. Napoleon, in 1806, made the same declaration regarding British ports. In 1807, England prohibited trade with the coast of France. American commerce was injured and almost destroyed by the combined action of the two powers. For years were consumed in negotiations, with constant aggressions on the part of England, and on June 19, 1812, Congress declared war. The great error of the campaign was the attempted invasion of Canada. Had the war been made entirely upon the seas, an early peace might have ensued. The war began on the lakes, and, repulsed in the effort to make a stand on the Canada shore, and falling back, Hull surrendered Detroit, August 5. Again, at Queenstown, October 13, the Americans were defeated with the loss of a thousand men. Altogether the first year of the war was a disastrous one on land. At sea, the navy, consisting of not more than a half-dozen frigates, with its magnificently disciplined officers, had been eminently successful. On August 13, the Essex, 
Captain Porter, captured the British sloop alert. On August 19, Captain Hull, commanding the Constitution, destroyed the Guerriere off the Gulf of St. Lawrence. October 18, the Wasp, Captain Jones, captured the Frolic, but later in the day both the Frolic and the Wasp fell into the hands of the British ship Poictiers. October 25th, Captain Decatur, with the frigate United States, captured the Macedonian off the Azores. On December 29th, after a desperate fight in the South Atlantic, Captain Bainbridge, commanding the Constitution, defeated the British ship Java. The campaign of 1813 opened on the Canadian frontier with the several divisions in command of Generals Harrison, Dearborn, and Hampton. On June 8, General Winchester, with 800 Kentuckians, drove the British and Indians, under Proctor, from Frenchtown, on the River Raisin, but returning with a force of 1500, they obliged Winchester to surrender. Which he only consented to do under Proctor's promise to protect the Americans from the Indians. Which promise Proctor treacherously disregarded, and marched away, leaving the sick and wounded Kentuckians to be massacred. Henceforth the Kentucky War cry was, Remember the River Raisin, and many were the British and Indians who had cause to dread that slogan. May 5th, General Harrison, reinforced by General Green Clay and his Kentucky troops, repulsed the British and their dusky allies under Tecumseh. July 21st, they returned 4,000 strong, but were again repulsed. The Americans, by wonderful exertion and hard work, built and equipped, at Erie, a squadron of nine ships with 55 guns, the command of which was given to Commodore Perry. September 10, Perry won his grand victory on Lake Erie, over the English squadron of six ships and 63 guns. This was the turning point of the war, and Perry's name goes down to posterity with the immortal names that never die. On October 5th, General Harrison, conveyed by Perry's ships, landed his forces in Canada and completely destroyed Proctor's army, Tecumseh being among the slain. So ended the war in the Northwest. In the meantime, General Dearborn was fighting with varying success in Upper Canada. Jackson, in the South, was avenging the Fort Mims massacre, finally crushing the Creeks early in the next year. The British, under the odious Admiral Cochrane, plundered and ravaged and burned everything in reach, from Lewistown to the Carolina coast, seizing the Negroes and selling them in the West Indies. During this year the American Navy continued to be successful, meeting few losses, though the fighting was even more desperate. July 5, 1814, the Americans defeated the British at Chippewa. And on the 25th was fought the Battle of Lundy's Lane, where Generals Brown and Scott were wounded. In this desperate battle, 800 men were lost on either side. And though the battle was undecisive, it had the effect of a victory for the Americans. August 14, 5,000 troops, under General Ross, were landed on the Patuxent, and, defeating General Winder, who made a stand with a handful of men near Bladensburg, proceeded to the city of Washington. After burning the Capitol and White House, and other buildings, they hastily withdrew. The attempt to take Baltimore proved abortive, and on September 14 the British re-embarked. It was at this time that Key wrote the Star-Spangled Banner. August 15, the enemy were repulsed at Fort Erie with the loss of 1,000 men, and a month later were finally driven back. The whole British squadron on Lake Champlain surrendered to Commodore McDonough after a terrific fight for several hours, on September 17. And on the same day the British army of 12,000 was forced to retreat from Plattsburgh by General Macomb's force of 4,500. In Florida the Spaniards had allowed, if not encouraged, the English to use their territory to fit out expeditions against the United States. Jackson, with 2,000 men, took possession of Pensacola on the 7th of November, driving out the British. December the 28th the British opened fire on New Orleans, again, on January 1, 1815. And on January 8 Pakenham, with 12,000 men, made his supreme effort. Jackson's force was now about 6,000. The British were driven to their ships after losing 2,000 killed and wounded, their general being among the slain. The American loss was seven killed and six wounded. The war was kept up on the ocean until March, the last capture being that of the British brig Penguin by the American sloop of war Hornet, 
in the South Atlantic. The Treaty of Ghent had been signed on 24 September, 1814, and the news of the glorious victory at New Orleans reached Washington simultaneously with that of the signing of the treaty. The war had been so distasteful to the people of New England that Massachusetts and Connecticut had passed laws directly antagonistic to those of the United States, and hostilities between the federal and state governments were feared, which, perhaps, were only averted by the ending of the war. The issues leading to the War of 1812 were left unsettled by the treaty, but England never again attempted to interfere with American shipping. Second War with Barbary States Immediately on the close of the War of 1812, the Algerians, supposing that the American navy was badly crippled, began again their depredations on American commerce. Commodore Decatur was sent to the Mediterranean with a squadron, and once more gave them an American drubbing. June 17, 1815, he destroyed two Algerine vessels. June 28, in front of the city of Algiers, he demanded the release of all American prisoners, indemnification for all property destroyed, and a relinquishment of all claims for tribute from the United States. The day quickly assented to the terms, and signed a treaty of peace. Tunis, Tripoli, and Morocco were likewise brought to terms, the United States thus taking the lead of all the other powers in its determination to break up the piracy of the Barbary states. Mexican War the Republic of Texas became, by its own request and by act of Congress, one of the United States July 4, 1845. Mexico prepared for war, the United States took measures to protect the new state. March 8, 1846, General Zachary Taylor marched with 1,500 men to a point on the Rio Grande opposite Matamoros, where he erected Fort Brown. To the Secretary of War, William L. Marcy, and to General Winfield Scott was due the plan of campaign, the battles of which, like instantaneous flashes of victory from the beginning of the war until its close, illumine the pages of American history. Then, as now, Congress was slow to respond to the needs of the military branch of the government. April 24, 1846, hostilities began. General Taylor advanced into Mexico and, May 8, won the brilliant victory of Palo Alto, and again, the next day, the Battle of Resica de la Palma. Taylor's force was less than one-third the number of the enemy, whose loss was one thousand. These two battles crushed the flower of Santa Ana's army. Taylor returned to the relief of Fort Brown, where the brave garrison had sustained a cannonade for 168 hours. September 24, Monterey and its garrison of 9,000 men were taken by General Taylor with 6,000. February 23, 1847, Taylor gained the glorious victory of Buena Vista, in which the Mexican loss was 2,000, the American, 714. At times the Mexicans were within a few yards of Bragg's guns. A little more grape, Captain Bragg, was Taylor's celebrated order, the execution of which decided the day. The American loss was severe in officers. Taylor's force, depleted by more than two-thirds, which had been sent to reinforce General Scott, was barely 4,500, the Mexican troops numbered 20,000. Captain Fremont, assisted by Commodores Sloat and Stockton, had subjugated California, General Kearney and Colonel Donovan, northern Mexico. Donovan defeated the Mexicans at Bracito, December 25, 1846, and at Sacramento, February 8, 1847, and took possession of Chihuahua, a city of 40,000 inhabitants, and marched to join General Wool at Saltillo, March 22. Early in January, 1847, General Scott reached the mouth of the Rio Grande, where he awaited the 8,000 troops sent by General Taylor. This raised his force to 12,000. These were landed at Sacrificios. The Americans debarked just below Vera Cruz between sunset and 10 o'clock on the night of March 8 without a single accident. With wonderful skill the investiture of Vera Cruz and the castle of St. John Delaware Aloha was completed. On March 22 the governor of Vera Cruz was summoned to surrender. Day and night the mortar batteries played upon the city, the fleet ably assisting, and on the 29th the stars and stripes floated above the walls of city and fortress. 
the Americans lost but two officers and a few soldiers. April 18, the magnificent victory at Cerro Gordo, where 3,000 Mexicans were captured, was won, April 19, Jalapa was taken. April 22, Picot, the strongest of Mexican forts, was captured, and May 15, Puebla surrendered to General Worth. 10,000 prisoners, 700 cannon, 10,000 stands of arms, and 30,000 shot and shells were captured within two months. When the army entered Puebla it numbered but 4,500. Reinforcements reaching him, Scott set out from Puebla to the Valley of Mexico on August 7. August 20, the heights of Contreras were assailed and taken, and the Battle of Cherubusco, with 9,000 Americans against 30,000 Mexicans, was fought and won. September 8, Molino del Rey was taken. September 13, the heights of Chapultepec. The Mexicans fled from the capital, and the victorious American army marched in and took possession of the city, September 14, 1847. Here Scott and his noble warriors rested until the treaty was concluded at Guadalupe Hidalgo, February 2, 1848, and peace was proclaimed, July 4, by President Polk. Guadalupe Hidalgo, New Mexico, and California were ceded to the United States, $15 million paid to Mexico, and the debts due from Mexico to American citizens were assumed by the United States. The Civil War It is not here the place to rehearse or to discuss the causes which led to America's Civil War, a war perhaps the most stupendous recorded in history. Looking backward, after the bloody footprints have been well nigh obliterated by the growth of a generation, we can see that the trend of human progress, the political problems confronting the Federated States, in the solution of which were evolved elements of discord, the inherited antagonism between the Puritans of the North and the Cavaliers of the South, all combined to make the conflict inevitable. For more than a decade of years grievances had been growing and rumblings were heard, like the imprisoned fires beneath the surface of the earth, until the election of Abraham Lincoln as president. Pledged to a policy believed to be inimical to the South, caused the outburst of the volcano, whose fierce fires and molten lava for four years spread desolation over the land. Time and milder judgment have very nearly smoothed away the wrinkles of discord, and the close of the century finds the nation a reunited people, whose new compact is written in the lifeblood of her sons on the battlefields of the recent war with Spain. December 20, 1860, South Carolina, January 9, 1861, Mississippi, January 10, Florida, January 11, Alabama, January 18, Georgia. January 23, Louisiana, and February 1, Texas, one by one asserted their supposed right to withdraw from the federal compact and enacted ordinances of secession in their several state conventions. Each state, as it took action, claimed and possessed itself of all government property, forts, guns, ammunition, within its borders, and armed its militia for garrison duty. A convention of delegates from the seceded states, held February 4, 1861, at Montgomery, Alabama, organized a new federation, to be known as the Confederate States of America, chose Jefferson Davis president and Alexander Stevens vice president, and set the whole machinery of a provisional government in working order. July 20, Richmond became the capital of the Southern Confederacy. Virginia seceded April 17, Arkansas, May 6, North Carolina, May 20, and Tennessee, June 8. Kentucky declared neutrality. Lincoln, upon assuming the executive chair, March 4, 1861, found the Treasury depleted, the army of only 16,000 men scattered in the West, and many of its best officers already with the Confederacy. The Navy had been sadly neglected by Congress, partly because this branch of the service had been steadily antagonized by the West, so that at the beginning of the war, both as to vessels and armament, it was by no means in a condition for active service. As in the Army, some of its most valuable officers had espoused the cause of their native states, and the South Atlantic and Gulf ports, being in possession of the new Federation, left the United States vessels no place of refuge. With unlimited means at command, the Union Navy increased the number of its vessels to 588, 75 of them ironclads, with 4,443 guns and 30,000 men, 
before the end of 1862. Torpedoes and steel rams were first used during this war, and monitors, just invented, were used by the United States. With a nucleus of ten vessels, around which to build its navy, the Confederacy had, by November, raised the number to thirty-four. Until the blockade became effective, cotton was king, for, in October, 1861, the Nashville, running out with a heavy consignment, brought back into Charleston in exchange a cargo worth three million dollars. Vessel after vessel was bought from English shipbuilders, among them the celebrated Alabama, which, in the fourteen months of her service, captured sixty-nine prizes, and destroyed ten million dollars worth of merchandise. The armored ram Stonewall was bought in France. April 12, 1861, Fort Sumter, in Charleston Harbor, was forced to surrender to the Confederates, and the first shot at the old flag ushered in the long, bitter struggle. Troops were called for by Lincoln. Lieutenant General Scott, the veteran hero of Mexico, was in command of the army. In three months, 300,000 men were in the field. 100,000 had sworn to the Confederate ranks. General McClellan was sent to the front and, after the resignation of Scott in the latter part of the year, was made commander of the army. July 21, the Battle of Bull Run was fought. The Union troops were disastrously routed and retreated in confusion to Washington. The army did little more during this year. April 21, after setting fire to and destroying the Navy Yard and ships, Norfolk was evacuated by the Union forces. The frigate Merrimack, which had been sunk, was raised by the Confederates, plated with iron, renamed Virginia, and became the scourge of the shipping off the Virginia coast. The Navy, as is usual, and because of its very organization, got in its effective work much earlier than did the Army, and the seizure of the forts and ports on the coast of the seceded states began at once. Fort Hatteras was taken August 29. Port Royal, in South Carolina, November 7. November 7 a naval officer, by overhauling an English mail steamer and taking off Messrs. Mason and Slidell, who had been appointed commissioners of the Confederate States to France and England, very nearly caused a complication with the latter power. Mr. Seward's diplomacy settled the incident amicably, and the commissioners were allowed to proceed upon their mission, which, however, proved futile. By the close of the year, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri, at first doubtful, were securely in the Union, though many of their citizens were in the Southern Army. 1862 February 6, General Grant, commanding the Army of the Tennessee, with the assistance of Commodore Foote and his gunboats, captured Fort Henry, on the Tennessee River, and, on the 16th, Fort Donelson on the Cumberland. The Federal forces had reached the number of 450,000, of which McClellan had 200,000. May 23, at Front Royal, and May 25, at Winchester, Stonewall, Jackson defeated the Union troops and forced them across the Potomac. Banks, Fremont, and McDowell, concentrating their forces, bore down on Jackson, who slipped through their lines, and, on June 9, defeated Shields at Fort Republic. The cry of the Northern press was, on to Richmond, and McClellan endeavored to obey the command. He had arrived not far from the city, between the York and James Rivers, when he was defeated in the bloody Battle of Seven Pines, May 31 and June 1. The Confederate General Johnston was wounded, and General Lee was assigned to the command of the Army of Northern Virginia, which he retained until the end. The Seven Days Battles, from June 25 to July 1, were fought at fearful cost to the Confederates, nevertheless, it was a glorious victory, and the siege of Richmond was raised. Lee advanced toward Washington, met the armies of Banks and Pope, and defeated them in the Second Battle of Bull Run, August 29 and 30, and at Chantilly, September 1 and 2, forcing Pope's army to retreat to Washington. The clamor in the South had been, on to Washington. Lee crossed the Potomac at Harper's Ferry and took 12,000 prisoners. McClellan, who had been recalled, met the Confederates at Sharpsburg, Antietam, September 17, and fought a battle with undecisive results. Each side lost about 10,000 men, and Lee returned. The Union army under Burnside, who had superseded McClellan, 
met a fearful repulse at Fredericksburg, December 13, with a loss of 14,000. The Confederate loss was 5,000. December 31, January 1 and 2, was fought the terrible Battle of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, where Bragg's force was 35,000, and his loss in killed, wounded, and missing, 10,466. Rosecrans's force was 43,400, and his loss 12,595. March 8, the Virginia attacked the Union fleet at Fortress Monroe and destroyed the Cumberland and the Congress. The next day, the Monitor attacked the Virginia, and, after five hours fighting, succeeded in disabling her so that she returned to Norfolk. The Virginia was destroyed by the Confederates before evacuating Norfolk, May 10. Admiral Farragut, with a fleet of 45 vessels, entered the Mississippi and bombarded the forts of St. Philip and Jackson. Despising the fear of mines and torpedoes, he continued on his course, defeating the Confederate fleet, and, together with General Butler, entered New Orleans April 25. During this year the Navy, with the assistance of land forces, had retaken all important ports on the Virginia, North Carolina, and Georgia coasts, seriously interfering with the blockade running. Upon which the Confederacy depended for its foreign supplies. The year 1862 closed with no advantage having been gained on either side. 1863. On January 1st, Lincoln issued the threatened Emancipation Proclamation. This destroyed the last hope of the Confederacy for recognition by England. No event of importance occurred before the middle of spring, when Hooker, who had relieved Burnside, made another advance upon Richmond, and was routed by Lee and Jackson at Chancellorsville, May 2. And on the 5th was forced to cross the Rapidan with a loss of 17,000. The Confederate loss was less than 5,000. In Jackson's death the Confederacy received a blow, the consequences of which may never be estimated. Lee's army again crossed the Potomac for an invasion of the North. The Union forces, under Meade, marched in an almost parallel line with Lee's through Maryland into Pennsylvania. They met and fought at Gettysburg, July 1, 2, and 3, one of the decisive battles of the world's history. Lee was forced to again retire beyond the river. The Union could well afford the loss of 23,000 men, but Lee's loss of 20,000 of the choice troops of his army was irreparable. In the meantime, Grant had been sent to open the Mississippi, and after a six-week siege, on July 4, Vicksburg, with nearly 30,000 prisoners and vast quantities of stores, fell into his hands. These two almost simultaneous victories greatly encouraged the North, and formed the turning point in the history of the war. July 9, Banks's victory at Port Hudson accomplished the desired possession of the Mississippi River. Bragg, who had been sorely pressed by Rosecrans, made a stand at Chickamauga, defeating the Union General Rosecrans, September 19 and 20, and forcing him to retreat to Chattanooga, where he was besieged by Bragg. Grant, with Sherman, coming to his aid, the battles of Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge were fought, November 23 and 25, and Bragg was driven back into Georgia. The Federal Navy was gradually taking possession of the whole coast, and Charleston was tightly blockaded. In March the Confederate ship Nashville was sunk in the entrance of the Savannah River. During this year both governments were forced to resort to conscription. Lincoln ordered a draft, and, in July, a three days riot in consequence prevailed in New York, during which two million dollars worth of property was destroyed. 1864. In March, Grant was put in command of the whole Union Army, the grade of Lieutenant General having been revived in his behalf. He left Sherman in command, repaired to Washington, and, May 3, started on the third campaign against Richmond, with a force of 140,000. Sherman, with 100,000, was to march to Atlanta. The whole strength of the Union Army at this time was about 700,000. Grant had spent some weeks in formulating his plans of campaigns, from the main features of which he never deviated. The Union had at last found the man, and at the same time had acquired the wisdom to leave the conduct of the war to his judgment. Proving, also, that, there is no war on record that has not given its man to the world or shaped the destiny of some other. Crossing the Rapidan, 
Grant encountered the Confederates, and the fighting, on the 5th, 6th, and 7th, of the Battles of the Wilderness, was terrific, but the result undecisive. At Spotsylvania he fought from the 8th to the 18th with fearful loss. June 1st, he was repulsed at Cold Harbor, and again on the 3d, and fighting, more or less desultory, continued in that vicinity until the 12th. Since the opening of the campaign, the Union Army had lost 60,000 men. The Confederate 30,000. Grant moved on Petersburg and began the siege which lasted from June until the next April. The western part of Virginia had seceded from the eastern portion, and, June 20, was admitted into the United States. To divert Grant, and, if possible, to raise the siege of Petersburg, in July, Lee sent General Early to threaten Washington and Baltimore, which he accomplished without, however, affecting Grant's position. Returning laden with spoils, Early turned, and driving back the Federal troops invaded Pennsylvania, burning Chambersburg, and came back again bringing vast quantities of supplies. Sheridan was sent to dispose of Early and to ravage the valley. At Winchester, he met and defeated Early in a very severe fight on October 20, almost destroying the force under that general's command. Sherman set out for Chattanooga on May 7, marching towards Atlanta. At Dalton he met General Johnston's army of 50,000 men. Johnston's masterly retreat from Dalton to Atlanta is unrivaled in military history. He made a stand from May 25 to June 4 at Dallas, but, being outflanked, was obliged to fall back. The next stand was made at Great Kennesaw, on June 22, when he repulsed the Federals. On the 27th, Sherman made a powerful assault, but was again repulsed with a loss of 4,000, Johnston's loss being 400, but, again outflanked. Johnston was forced to cross the Chattahoochee, and July 10 found the Confederate army entrenched in Atlanta. Johnston's retreating tactics caused the people to clamor for a fighting leader, and Davis, in transferring the command from Johnston at such a crucial time, committed a grave error. Johnston was superseded by General Hood, whose chief ambition was to fight, which, in this case, was a great mistake in judgment. On the 20th, 22d, and 28th of July, Hood assaulted the lines of the besiegers, only to be repulsed again and again. In these fights more men were lost than during Johnston's long, skillful retreat. An injudicious movement by Hood separated his command, obliging him to evacuate Atlanta, of which Sherman, on September 2, took possession. In its advance on Atlanta, the Union army had lost 30,000 men. Hood saved his army and made his way towards Nashville, hoping to divert Sherman from Georgia. At Franklin, November 30th, he met General Schofield, and drove him back to Nashville, from whence General Thomas made a sortie, and fell upon Hood's troops, December 15, completely routing them. In the two fights, Hood lost and killed, wounded, and captured over 11,000. With the remnant he escaped into Alabama, and these finally reached Johnston, participated in his last fight with Sherman, and were surrendered at Raleigh with the troops of their old commander. November 14, Sherman burned Atlanta, cut all telegraph lines and began his march to the sea, ravaging, devastating, and utterly destroying everything in his reach. He was opposed by the Confederate cavalry, which successfully defended the cities of Macon and Augusta, upon which the Confederacy mainly depended for the manufacture of munitions of war. Sherman entered Savannah on December 22, the advance having cost him only 567 men killed and wounded. On June 19, the celebrated sea fight between the Kearsarge and the Alabama took place off Cherbourg, France. The Alabama was sunk after a five hours fight. Admiral Semmes was rescued by the Deerhound, belonging to an English gentleman, and thus saved from capture. August 5, Commodore Farragut, overcoming the Confederate ram Tennessee in the gunboats, sailed into Mobile Bay, commanding his fleet from the maintop of his flagship. 1865 The opening of the campaign of 1865 found Grant's army still before Petersburg. On April 2, he ordered an attack along his whole line, which had been so lengthened that the lines of Lee's depleted army were very thin. The Confederates were driven back with heavy loss. Lee telegraphed to Davis, 
my lines are broken in three places, we can hold Petersburg no longer. Richmond must be evacuated this evening. That night Admiral Semmes, in obedience to orders, destroyed the Confederate fleet in the James River. Richmond was in the possession of the Union forces the next day, and on April 4 Lincoln held a reception in Davis's vacated mansion. Lee attempted to break through Grant's lines at Appomattox, but closely pursued by Sheridan, and finding further retreat impossible, he surrendered with about 26,000 men on the 9th of April. Grant's magnanimous terms were worthy of his fame. The troops were paroled on condition of promise not to take up arms until exchanged. The officers were permitted to keep baggage and side arms, and all were to retain their horses, as, Grant said, they would be needed in the crops. Turning northward from Savannah, Sherman continued his march and reached Fayetteville, North Carolina. Wilmington had been captured early in the year by a land and naval force. Johnston had been reinforced by the garrison which had been forced to evacuate Charleston and the remnant of Hood's army, and had several severe fights, with no decisive results, with Sherman, who entered Raleigh. And here, on April 26, Johnston's army surrendered on the same terms given by Grant. December 31 and January 1 Fort Fisher was captured, and on January 12 Wilmington was entered by the Federals, February 18, Charleston was captured. The regular battles during the Civil War numbered 892. Lincoln called in all for 2,690,000 men. There were actually in service 1,490,000. There were 400,000 disabled, 304,369 perished, 220,000 were captured, and 26,000 died in captivity. The expenses of the war were $3,500,000 per day. The national debt was $2,700,000,000. This great American war was fought on both sides with a courage and fortitude never before experienced in the annals of warfare. As compared with the statements of forces and losses in battles of European armies, the casualties in the battles of the Civil War were three and four times as great. And this proves that in the American war each side met foemen worthy of their steel. These overwhelmingly fearful casualties are not to be explained otherwise. And each section respects the other more than before the war, a war in which the conquered felt not, nor said, Peccavi. And in which surrender to greater numbers and heavier artillery involved no sacrifice of belief in the truth and justice of their cause. Was there ever an armed strife that brought forth greater generals or more knightly valor, undiminished courage and unflinching fortitude on the part of combatants? Together must the names of Grant and Lee go down to posterity as great types of the American soldier, the one, noble and generous in victory, the other, though a hero uncrowned by success, a warrior still more heroic in defeat. The Spanish-American War The proximate causes of the war with Spain are tersely set forth in the joint resolution declaring the independence of Cuba and demanding the withdrawal of Spanish sovereignty therefrom, which says. Whereas. The abhorrent conditions which have existed for more than three years in the island of Cuba, so near our own borders, have shocked the moral sense of the people of the United States, have been a disgrace to Christian civilization. Culminating as they have in the destruction of a United States battleship, with 266 of its officers and crew, while on a friendly visit in the harbor of Havana, and cannot longer be endured. As has been set forth by the President of the United States in his message to Congress of April 11, 1898, upon which the action of Congress was invited. Therefore, resolved, by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled. First, that the people of the island of Cuba are, and of right ought to be, free and independent. Second, that it is the duty of the United States to demand, and the government of the United States does hereby demand, that the government of Spain at once relinquish its authority and government in the island of Cuba, and withdraw its land and naval forces from Cuba and Cuban waters. Third, that the President of the United States be, and he hereby is, directed and empowered to use the entire land and naval forces of the United States and to call into the actual service of the United States the militia of the several states to such extent as may be necessary to carry these resolutions into effect. 
Fourth, that the United States hereby disclaims any disposition or intention to exercise sovereignty, jurisdiction, or control over said island, except for the pacification thereof. And asserts its determination when that is completed to leave the government and control of the island to its people. This resolution was signed by the President at 11.24 o'clock a.m., April 20, 1898. It was on February 15, 1898, that the catastrophe referred to, the blowing up of the main, occurred. On April 25, the formal declaration of war was made. Spain had three fleets, Admiral Cervera's flying squadron, the Asiatic fleet under Admiral Montejo, and Admiral Camara's fleet of heavy armored vessels. The American Navy is always ready for emergencies, and even with the grudging appropriations made by Congress, the new Navy, while not possessing vessels of such large size as those of some other nations, was much more formidable than was generally supposed. Congress, apprehending the outcome, had given the President $50 million to put the country on a war footing. In reply to the call for 125,000 volunteers, five times that number offered themselves. It had been more than 50 years since the United States had encountered a foreign foe, and since the close of the Civil War, for a third of a century, peace had reigned. April 25, by cable to Hong Kong, Commodore Dewey was ordered to find and destroy the Spanish Asiatic fleet, which he proceeded to do on May 1, without the loss of a single man. Entering Manila Bay, scorning torpedoes and mines, his wonderful battle at Cavita is the admiration of the world. Schley, with his flying squadron, watched in Hampton Roads for an attack by the enemy on the Atlantic coast. Havana was blockaded by Samson's squadron April 22, and his searchlights seen from the Cuban capital were as the handwriting on the sky, for dooming Spanish rule. His tactics were to take no risk with his vessels while awaiting the appearance of the Spanish ships, so he failed to return the greeting of the shore batteries. The first casualties of the war were in Cardenas Harbor May 11, when upon the Winslow, while chasing a decoy gunboat too far under the fire of the land batteries. Ensign Bagley and four sailors were the first men of the Navy to lay down their lives. It was known that Cervera had sailed from Cadiz toward the West Indies. Samson made a tour of Puerto Rico to hunt the Spaniard, who mysteriously eluded the sight of the Americans. San Juan was bombarded on May 12. On May 30 Schley, who in the meantime had arrived off Santiago, dispatched, I have seen the enemy's ships with my own eyes. Cervera had then been in the harbor ten days. On the 31st, Schley commenced a bombardment, and the forts at the mouth of Santiago Harbor and the vessels within replied for an hour. June 1st Samson came, and all hope of escape for Cervera was cut off. On that night Lt. Hobson executed his bold, heroic plan of sinking the Merrimack in the channel of the harbor, which was accomplished without the loss of one of his seven co-heroes, although subjected to a deadly fire from forts and vessels. The first troops landed on Cuban soil were the Marines, 650 in number, under Lt. Col. Huntington. This battalion had been on board the Panther since May 22, and the men were eager to land. After Samson had shelled the shore and adjacent hills and woods, on the afternoon of June 10 the landing was made and the American flag raised for the first time on Spanish territory in the West. No Spaniards were seen until after the tents had been erected and the evening shadows were falling. Then for five nights and days there was no sleep for these men, than whom there were no greater heroes in this short, sharp war. With few exceptions they received their baptism of fire, and nobly did they acquit themselves. I am told that when almost utterly exhausted the first platoon reached the summit of Cusco Hill, so exactly in unison was their fire that the Spanish, believing that machine guns were opening upon them, turned and ran, never again making a stand. The first to consecrate the soil with his life's blood was Dr. John Blair Gibbs, who left a $10,000 practice in New York to go as surgeon of the battalion, and who had greatly endeared himself to both officers and men. Sergeant Good, one of the finest subalterns in the Corps, and four men were killed. The good condition and health of this battalion during the whole campaign were due to the fine organization of the commissariat and the strict discipline maintained in this corps. General Shafter arrived off Santiago, June 20, 
with a force of 773 officers and 14,564 men. General Garcia, the Cuban commander, with 4,000 insurgents, was at Asuadero, 18 miles west. There he, Shafter, and Sampson held a consultation. On the 22d, the disembarkment of troops was begun. On the morning of the 23d, General Lawton with his division advanced to Juragua. Major General Wheeler, after landing 964 of his force, pursuant to General Shafter's orders, moved rapidly to the front, and, passing through Lawton's lines, pushed on to Las Guasimas. Attacking and defeating General Linares on the morning of June 24. The entire American force was pressed forward under General Wheeler, General Shafter being detained on the ships to attend to the landing of the armament and supplies. On the 29th, the commanding general left his ships and pitched his camp on the Santiago Road, and on the next day orders were given for an attack along the whole line. In carrying out these orders, General Lawton with about 6,000 men attacked El Cani, a small town about five miles north of Santiago. The garrison consisted of 520 men, the defenses being one blockhouse and a shore fortification. It was not until four o'clock that General Lawton's success was complete. His loss was 437 killed and wounded, and but 30 of the enemy succeeded in escaping and reaching the Spanish lines. While Lawton was moving on El Cani, the cavalry division, unmounted, and Kent's infantry division were ordered to move forward. Crossing San Juan River at a point about 500 yards from the enemy's fortifications on San Juan Ridge, the left of the cavalry rested on the main Santiago Road and the infantry formed to the left of the cavalry. These troops were subjected to a very heavy fire in advancing from El Pozo, in crossing the river and in forming on the other side. They, however, most bravely charged the enemy in their strong position on Kettle Hill and San Juan Ridge, and drove them precipitately from their strong fortifications, the American loss being 154 killed and 997 wounded. This placed the Americans in a position commanding the fortifications around the city of Santiago. The Spanish fleet, consisting of five armored cruisers of 7,000 tons and two torpedo boat destroyers, attempted to escape from Santiago at 9. 30 o'clock on Sunday morning, July 3rd, just nine weeks after the destruction of Montejo's fleet. Schley and Sampson destroyed the vessels and made prisoners of 70 officers and 1,600 men, 350 were killed and 160 wounded. Fighting more or less severe occurred until the 10th, when negotiations for surrender were inaugurated, resulting in the capitulation of Santiago, July 16, the Spanish fortifications, 24,000 prisoners. And a large amount of arms and ammunition. At noon on Sunday, July 17, 1898, the American flag was hoisted over the headquarters at Santiago. General Miles started on the invasion of Puerto Rico, July 25, and reached Guanica at daylight next morning. He landed with 3,500 men, marched toward Yauco, five miles distant, which he entered after a skirmish, and was received enthusiastically by the citizens, as he also was at Ponce where he was joined by General Wilson, who had come with the war ships, and who was made governor. The army continued on to San Juan along the military road, meeting very little opposition. July 26, the French ambassador, M. Jules Cambon, acting for Spain, made overtures for peace. The protocol was signed on April 21, by M. Cambon and Secretary of State Day. A cessation of hostilities was proclaimed. At the very moment of the signing of the protocol, the last naval battle took place at Manzanilla, Cuba, and an artillery engagement at Abenito in Puerto Rico. The 100 days Spanish-American War was concluded by the Treaty of Paris. It will be only in the retrospect that we may tell the results of this conflict. As the future unfolds them to our view, it may be that it will have been more momentous in its consequences than we can now determine. One thing it has proved, that is, that this nation is really reunited. For, from all sections and from all grades of life, men flock together to fight and conquer under the old stars and stripes. 2. Foreign Wars Napoleonic Wars 
The long contest between France and Austria began when the Girondist Ministry of France declared war, April 20, 1792. By the execution of Louis XVI, January 21, 1793, the revolution threw down the gauntlet to all ancient Europe. England, whose sympathies had hitherto been more or less with France, began to take measures to bring about more cordial relations with the other powers of Europe. Spain, Portugal, Austria, Prussia, and Russia, for the time seemed to forget their several grievances as they found themselves confronted with a totally new move on the chessboard of European autonomy. The year 1794 saw the French Revolution progressing triumphantly, and all Europe, except England and Austria, appeared acquiescent in apathetic indifference. In 1795 the Royalists made a supreme effort to recover power, but were crushed by the Man of Destiny, and the Directory, consisting of five members, of whom Carnot was one, came into power. Dominated by the martial genius of Carnot, the organizer of victory, the Directory won the confidence of the army. Scherer, the commander, lacked the qualifications to undertake a successful campaign against Austria, and Bonaparte, succeeding him, soon infused his own spirit into the army and bound it to himself with a devotion that never failed. Early in the year 1800, Napoleon, having been made first consul, took up his abode in the old palace of the kings of France, the Tilleries. The history of Napoleon for the ensuing fifteen years is the history of Europe. It is, therefore, best to begin with the close of the eighteenth century, in order to appreciate the situation at the dawn of the 19th. Austria and England, with several small German principalities, were still in arms against France. The plans and movements of the armies under Napoleon showed him to be verily a master in military skill. Opening this campaign, he left Messina with about 8,000 soldiers to hold the territory from Nice to Genoa, so as to keep the Austrian army in Italy busy. He sent the Rhine army, under Moreau, to threaten Bavaria and to secure the most important position between the Rhine and the Danube. Moreau drove the Austrians to Ulm, and disposed his left flank to support Napoleon. Meantime, he himself was recruiting another army for operations on the Po. Baron de Melas, commanding the Austrian troops in northern Italy, besieged Messina in Genoa, which, after severe suffering, surrendered, leaving de Melas free to join the army of the Po. Napoleon was between de Melas and Austria. General Ott, with 18,000 men, attempted to reach Placentia, but Lons, with 12,000, defeated him at Montebello, forcing him back to Alessandria. Napoleon hastened across the Pe to Stradella to intercept de Melas and prevent his breaking through the French lines to Placentia. The night of June 13, 1800, the French army was scattered, watching along the Pe and the Ticino for the Austrians, while their army, 40,000 strong, with 10,000 more not far distant, was ready at daybreak of the 14th to cut its way through the armies of France, and reach Placentia. The French force was but 18,000, but Victor with his division held his position firmly, and the great leader, Kellerman, was in command of the cavalry. Backward and forward surged the battle with varying fortune, and at noon victory seemed perched upon the banners of Austria. De Melas was so certain that the battle was won that he galloped back to Alessandria and sent dispatches to that effect to the governments of Europe. General de Zac was left in command to conduct the pursuit and to drive the French across the Scrivia. Napoleon, dismayed, hoping against hope that de Sakes, whom he had sent towards Novi the day before to look out in that quarter for de Melas, might hear the thunders of the battle and return, saw him in the distance, hurrying with his troops, who, Though worn and tired, were eager for the fight, and Napoleon saw already the tide of battle turned. De Sakes had found no trace of the Austrians, but he had heard the sound of battle at day dawn, and he knew that de Melas was there, and that there he was needed, and not at Novi. He roused his division, and hastened back to Napoleon. A short conference with his chief, to whose questioning he answered, the battle is lost, but it is only three o'clock, there is yet time to win another, and the Battle of Marengo, glorious in its consequences to Napoleon. Stupendous in its carnage, was won. But de Sakes, the brave paladin, lay dead upon the field. De Melas returned from Alessandria to meet the victorious army he had left, 
flying in disorder, thoroughly routed. On December 2, Moreau and Ney won the field of Hohenlinden, and the Peace of Lunaville was concluded, February 9, 1801. The result of this campaign was the cession of Austria's strongholds in the Tyrol and Bavaria to France, as also a number of important holdings in Italy. France secured the left bank of the Rhine, the Belgian provinces in Tuscany, and the King of Naples closed his harbours to England. In March, 1802, by the Treaty of Amiens, peace was concluded with England. The coalition of Denmark, Sweden, Russia, and Prussia, with France against England, in 1800, fomented by Napoleon, broke down in 1801, after Nelson's Battle of Copenhagen. England had secured the supremacy of the sea and dominion over India, rescued Portugal, Naples, and the states of the Church from France, and restored the sublime port to Turkey. Finding Napoleon again militating against her interests, and resenting his encroachments, England declared war against France in the spring of 1803. Russia espoused the cause of England, Prussia held off, and Austria was friendly, though not in fighting trim. The third coalition comprised England, Russia, and Austria. Powerless to hurt England on the seas, Napoleon, who had the year previous been proclaimed emperor, attacked Austria, invaded her territory, captured her army at Ulm, proceeded to Vienna, and occupied a great part of the valley of the Danube. On December 2, 1805, the Battle of the Three Emperors, the Battle of Austerlitz, was fought. The Peace of Pressburg, concluded December 26, left Austria shorn of her ancient prestige, her title of German Empire, and of a great part of her possessions. The Son of Austerlitz melted the Third Coalition. In the meantime the Battle of Trafalgar, won by the immortal Nelson, crushed the naval power of both France and Spain. In September, 1806, Prussia declared war against France, and, to the amazement of Europe, alone undertook to engage armies flushed from their recent victories and still in Germany. October 14, Napoleon utterly defeated the Prussians at Jena and Auerstadt, and entered Berlin a conqueror, the king having fled to Königsberg. Russia came to the aid of Prussia, but arrived too late to accomplish anything except to check the advance of the French, whose armies wintered on the Vistula. The next summer, however, the Russians met their final defeat in this campaign at Friedland, and Königsberg was taken. The Treaty of Tilsit ended the operations of this Fourth Coalition July 7, 1807. The Fifth Coalition against Napoleon comprised England, Austria, Spain, and Portugal. The decisive battle of this campaign was at Wagram, July 5 and 6, 1809, and terrible as were the consequences of his defeat to Austria, so crippled was Napoleon that he willingly granted the armistice of Znaim and concluded the Peace of Vienna. When the Fifth Coalition ended, Napoleon had acquired the Illyrian provinces and part of the Tyrol for France, and eventually the Emperor's daughter, Maria Luisa, for his wife. In 1812 came war with Russia, and that most disastrous campaign which cost France more than 300,000 soldiers and Napoleon his empire. Russia, England, Prussia, and Sweden formed the coalition now, and Turkey had made peace with Russia. Napoleon crossed the Neman in June, halted at Wilna to put his new conscripts in better order, addressed words of sympathy to Poland, and took measures to keep Austria conciliated. The Russians retreated before him. He met and fought and defeated them at Smolensk, August 17, they retreated in good order, burning and destroying all in their reach. The terrible Battle of Borodino was fought September 7. The defeated Russians again retreated in good order, pursuing the same tactics. Napoleon reached Moscow September 15, but the heroic measure of Russia in destroying that city was equal in its results to several victories. October 15, the French troops commenced their fearful retreat. The Russian armies grew bold, they harassed the French troops, weak from hunger and cold, and from Moscow to Wilna their progress was one continual guerrilla warfare. From Wilna, their flight to France, December 5, was even more disastrous. Of the Grand Army that set out in the spring not one-fourth ever returned. Affairs in Spain had fared badly for France. Wellington defeated the French army in Spain, and finally expelled it. 
France, though sometimes shaken in her devotion by the conscription that was draining her children's blood, still had faith in Napoleon, and in 1813, having raised another grand army, he undertook to subjugate Prussia. His first victory was on the plain of Lutzen. The Prussians and Russians retreated in good order through Dresden. Napoleon pursued and drove them from Bakken, on May 20 and 21, and established his headquarters at Dresden. Austria now joined the Allies. In their attack upon Dresden, August 26 and 27, they were defeated, but Russian troops and the King of Bavaria coming up made Napoleon's position untenable. The Allies were awaiting him at Leipzig. The battle raged for three days, and Napoleon withdrew on October 19, utterly defeated. January 23, 1814, Napoleon, having raised another army, left Paris to assume command. The Allies, England, Austria, Prussia, and Russia, were more determined than ever to crush him. Many battles were fought, and the fortunes of war varied. Blucher defeated him at La Pothiers on the 1st of February. Napoleon was the victor at Montano. Unsuccessful at Soissons, March 3, victorious at Cravon, March 7, and defeated by Blucher at Léon, March 9. With more than half his army lost, Napoleon worried the Allies in their rear, but Blucher marched on Paris. The prestige of Napoleon and France in Europe was at an end. The Empress and the Regency retired to Blois. On March 31 Paris surrendered, and the Emperor of Russia and the King of Prussia entered the city. A provisional government, with Talleyrand at its head, deposed Napoleon on April 2, and on April 6 he abdicated. May 30, the first peace of Paris was concluded between France and the Allies. France was to have her boundaries as they were in 1792, and also her foreign possessions, except Tobago, St. Lucia, and Mauritius, which, with Malta, were ceded to England. The Bourbons, in the person of Louis XVIII, were restored. But the French people were not content, so that when Napoleon appeared at Caen on March 1, 1815, he was greeted with joy, even by the troops sent out to oppose him. This astonishing news was communicated to the Congress of the Allies assembled at Vienna. The Allied armies at once gathered on the borders of France, Wellington landed in Flanders, and Blucher's Prussians joined him. Wellington, finding Napoleon in front of him, fell back to Waterloo, lest the approach of the Prussians should be cut off. Napoleon hurled his force on Blucher at Fleurs, and victoriously drove him from the field on the 15th. Ney, who had been sent to confront Wellington, fought at Cotter Bras, and the following day joined Napoleon. On the 18th of June, 1815, Napoleon made his supreme and final effort to recuperate his lost fortunes and to re-establish his empire. The story of the Battle of Waterloo, than which none ever fought was more decisive in its consequences, has been told and retold. The battle was at first undecided, victory seeming to incline to Napoleon, though the English and Germans with unflinching heroism still held the field until the afternoon, when Blucher, with his Prussians, at last arrived. Napoleon perceived that the supreme moment was at hand, and that his only hope was to crush Wellington before Blucher's advancing columns could be thrown into line of battle. He sent forward his magnificent imperial guard. They charged with chivalric splendor, fought with heroic desperation, were repulsed, and the star of Napoleon set to rise no more. Finding his cause irretrievably lost, leaving the remnant of his army in command of Marshal Soult, Napoleon fled and, failing to find a passage to America, surrendered. This battle, magnificent in its results, ensured to England a long peace, and raised her to the first rank, for military prowess, among the nations of the world. Napoleon's skill at Waterloo was up to the highest standard of his most glorious work. But he was overwhelmed by preponderance in numbers. His entire force with which he conducted this campaign was barely 104,000, while the combined armies of Wellington and Blucher numbered 220,000. The Congress of Vienna restored the Ancien Regime, replacing dethroned monarchs upon their hereditary domains, but the parceling out of the smaller territories showed the powers to be quite as arbitrary as Napoleon himself. 
The semi-decade of passive submission to the policies of princes was broken in 1820 by general revolts in Europe. Spanish-American colonies, indignant at French interference in Spanish matters, began their struggles for independence. Greek War for Independence. Since the capture of Constantinople by the Turks, in 1453, Greece had been subject to Turkey. Out of the defeats of several rebellions against the greed, tyranny, and brutality of the Moslem, particularly from the revolutions of 1770 and 1790, grew the secret society of the Hetiria. Cementing the union of the Greeks for the struggle beginning in 1821. It is claimed that 10,000 Greeks were slaughtered within a few days, and 30,000 in less than three months. Mahmud, having failed in 1825 to crush the rebellion, called Mehmet Ali, the Pasha of Egypt, to his aid. Mehmet sent Ibrahim, his son, with his army in navy, trained in the tactics of European warfare, into the Peloponnesus. Victory and devastation marked his course. Never was grander courage nor loftier bravery displayed than by the Greeks. The siege of Missolonghi lasted from April 27, 1825, until April 22, 1826. Athens was captured, June 2, 1827. The fleets of England, France, and Russia were cruising on the coasts to prevent attacks by the Turks on the islands. Approaching the Bay of Navarino, they were attacked by the Turks and Egyptians, whose combined fleets were thereupon annihilated on October 20, 1827. The Sultan was forced by the powers to consent to the establishment of the Kingdom of Greece, and his delay to do so was punished by Tsar Nicholas, who declared war, crossed the Balkans. And at Adrianople in 1829 compelled the Sultan to recognize her independence, grant Christian governors to Serbia, Moldavia, and Wallachia, and to yield Bessarabia to Russia. Minor European wars. The French Revolution of 1830, placing Louis Philippe on the throne of France, brought about Belgium's independence. The Polish insurrection of 1831 32 lost Poland her last vestige of liberty, enchaining her irretrievably under the tyranny of Russia. From 1840 to 1852, England was engaged in quelling periodic wars in her Indian possessions. In 1841, her army, numbering 17,000 men, perished in their retreat from Afghanistan. So with France in Algiers and Morocco. And revolts in Spain were more or less successful. In 1842, England's war with China, caused by seizure of opium, resulted in the cession by China of Hong Kong, the freedom of five other ports, and $21 million indemnity. In 1848, the revolutionary spirit broke out fiercely, and the people made strong leaps for liberty and constitutional government. In France, it overthrew Louis Philippe, establishing a republic, with Louis Napoleon president. In all Europe its echo resounded. Riots in Vienna forced Metternich to flee to England, Ferdinand, to take refuge in the Tyrol and to abdicate in favor of his son, Francis Joseph. Frederick William was compelled by the conditions in Berlin to promise a constitution. The Frankfurt Assembly, in 1849, offered Frederick William the title and prerogative of Emperor of Germany, and though, because of his respect for the Habsburgs, he declined the honor. He still took advantage of the sentiment that prompted the offer to so strengthen the dynasty that later it might be held. Hungary rose against Austria in 1848, and almost won independence. Kossuth proclaimed Hungary a republic, and Nicholas immediately sent aid to Austria. The Russian army, 130,000 strong, joined the Austrians. The Hungarians retreated to Temeswar, where they were defeated with great slaughter, and Georgi surrendered, August 9, 1849. The name of Haina, the Austrian commander, is held in execration for his awful cruelty to the conquered. In the meantime Italy rose. Lombardy drove out the Austrians. Charles Albert, King of Sardinia, had declared war on Austria and crossed the Mincio, April 8, 1848. Radetzky, commanding the Austrians, lost Gorto and yielded Pescura in May, but in June he forced the papal troops, who were assisting Charles Albert, to surrender, and completely routed the Italians at Castazza, July 25, and entered Milan. 
Charles Albert was again defeated by Radetsky at Novari, March 23, 1849, and Venice was captured August 23. Charles Albert resigned his crown to his son, Victor Emmanuel, and died shortly after. Pope Pius IX was forced to flee from Rome. Mazzini established the Roman Republic in November. Austria, by the close of the summer of 1849, had regained control of her disputed possessions. Louis Napoleon, taking part against Italy, occupied Rome with his troops, July 2, 1849, and drove out Mazzini and Garibaldi. The Crimean War. In 1853, Louis Napoleon wanted war. He fomented trouble between the Porte and Nicholas, which ended by a declaration of war by Russia. The Tsar claimed and demanded the protectorate of Christians in Turkey. Austria, France, and England opposed the demand. Nicholas had intimated to the British minister at St. Petersburg that England and Russia should share the partition of Turkey, showing that he was ready to carry out the will and aims of Peter the Great and Catherine. The Russian army was thrown across the Pruth into Moldavia, and was at first worsted by the Turks. In deference to the wishes of Austria and Prussia, Nicholas withdrew his army from the Danubian provinces, and so secured their neutrality. He dislodged the Turkish fleet at Sinope, November 4, 1853. England and France allied with Turkey in declared war against Russia, March 28, 1854. The Allied fleets and troops proceeded to the Black Sea. Sebastopol was the great arsenal of Russia. 27,000 English, 30,000 French, and 7,000 Turks were landed in the Bay of Eupatoria, 30 miles above Sebastopol, September 14, 1854, towards which, five days later, the southerly march began. The Allies waded the river Alma under terrific fire from the large Russian army, and won a brilliant victory. The attack was remarkable in that it won victory over superior numbers in seemingly impregnable positions, and in spite of official blunders. Menshikov, the Russian general, withdrew the crews from the ships in the harbor and put them, 18,000 strong, in command of the batteries. With his own army he marched out of Sebastopol, leaving 25,000 defenders to the city. Admiral Kornilov and his able assistant, Colonel von Tottelben, undertook to strengthen the defenses and to inspire the troops. On October 17, the siege guns of the Allies were in position. The English stormed the suburbs of the city, the Malakoff and the Redan, the French stormed the city. Both were unsuccessful. Russian troops poured into Sebastopol, and invited battle outside of the fortifications. At the harbor of Balaclava, Turkish troops recoiled from the Russian advance, and Sir Colin Campbell, with the Highland Brigade, saved the shipping and stores by timely check to the Russians. The Battle of Balaclava, October 25th, gave the town to the British after stubborn fighting, more than two-thirds of the Light Brigade having been sacrificed to Lord Lucan's misconstruction of orders. At Inkerman, on November 5th, 60,000 Russians, in fog and rain, surprised the British household guards, and for six hours vainly strove to crush them. General Boskett, with the genius of the soldier, guessed the point of severest attack, and sent reinforcements to the guards. The Russians were finally driven back. Little good resulted from these two stubborn battles. Winter put an end to active operations. Rain, hurricanes, insufficient shelter, lack of supplies, and extreme cold produced fearful misery among the soldiers. Russia suffered as severely as did the Allies, besides having had her fleet on the Black Sea destroyed and her army beaten. In April, 1855, the bombardment began again. In May the Allies captured Kerch and Yenikail, thus cutting off Russian supplies from the Caucasian provinces. In June, Marshal Polissier succeeded Canrobert and successfully stormed Manilon. And, after the abortive attacks, June 18, of the French on the Malakoff and the English on the Redan, General Simpson succeeded Lord Raglan. August 16, the Russians crossed Chernea, but were repulsed by the French. On September 8 the French carried the Malakoff, the British failed to carry the Redan. The Russians set fire to the city and ships and retired to the northern part of the harbour, 
where they held strongly entrenched positions opposite the Allied armies and beyond the reach of the Allied fleets. Russia was driven from the Black Sea, had lost her prestige in the Baltic Sea, Bomarsund, on the Åland Islands, and the arsenal of Sweborg, in the Gulf of Finland. She had saved Kronstadt, and, at terrible sacrifice, had captured Kars from the English General Williams with his army of Turks. Her vast territory was comparatively intact. The nations were not satisfied. The Peace of Paris increased the prestige of Louis Napoleon, it postponed the Eastern question by putting the Christian subjects under the nominal protection of the powers, but virtually under that of the Sultan. The Treaty of Peace was signed March 30, 1856. Wars in the East. In 1857, the Indian mutiny was caused by the introduction of Enfield rifles. Delhi was taken after desperate fighting, September 20th. Kanpur and Lucknow were the theatre of horrible scenes. The rebellion was finally crushed in 1859. In the meantime war with Persia was begun and ended by the recapture of Herat, in Afghanistan. In December, 1857, England and France made war on China and captured Canton. They secured many concessions by the Treaty of Tien Sin, and $2 million indemnity. War between Austria, France, and Sardinia. In 1859, Louis Napoleon made a secret alliance with Italy. General disarmament was proposed. Sardinia agreed to it, Austria stood aloof. On April 25, 1859, Austria ordered the disarmament of Piedmont. On the 27th, King Victor Emmanuel proclaimed war. On the 30th, French troops were in Turin. On May 13, Louis Napoleon himself disembarked at Genoa, where he was met by Victor Emmanuel. The Austrian forces crossed the Ticino, en route for Milan, but hesitated, because of the French advance. The opening battles at Montebello and Balestro, May 20, 30, and 31, were favorable to the Allies. At Magenta, June 4, the Austrians met with terrible defeat. The forces of the Allies numbered 55,000, and their loss was 4,000, the Austrian army of 75,000 lost 10,000 killed and wounded and 7,000 prisoners. The conquerors entered Milan on June 8. Francis Joseph fell back to the line of the Mincio, and at Solferino the decisive battle of the campaign was fought on June 24. Napoleon commanded the Allied armies, which numbered about 150,000. They fought for 16 hours against the Austrian force of 170,000, gaining a fearful victory. This battle cost Austria 20,000 men, the French lost in killed and wounded 12,000 and the Sardinians 5,000 men. The Allies crossed the Mincio and laid siege to Pescira, but while all Europe expected another fight, an armistice of five weeks was agreed to, and Napoleon, unknown to his ally, met Francis at Villafranca and made a peace. Upon which was based the Treaty of Zurich, signed November 10. Austria gave Lombardy to Napoleon for the King of Sardinia, as also the fortresses of Mantua and Pescira. Italy was to become a confederation, with the Pope as president, of which Austria was to be a member, because of her holdings in Venetia. Tuscany and Medina were to be restored to their princes. Garibaldi's brilliant conquest of Sicily in Naples, in 1860, and Sardinia's growing power, startled Europe, but the nations dared not interfere. The General Parliament of Italy met in 1861, at Turin, and made Victor Emmanuel King of Italy. Rome, under the Pope, and Venetia, under Austria, were as yet dismembered from, young Italy. War with Denmark. Christian IX. Succeeded to the throne of Denmark November 15, 1863. He endeavored to incorporate Schleswig with Denmark, the German population repudiated him and appealed to the Confederacy. The Diet sent troops into Holstein. Bismarck induced Austria to join Prussia in setting aside the London Treaty of 1853, and the Allied troops forced the Danes back to the entrenchments of Duppel. The capture of Duppel by the Prussians, April 18, proved the efficiency of needle guns and rifled cannon. June 22, the Allies crossed the channel to the island of Olsen and, on the 28th, 
captured the Danish stronghold Dennewerk, hitherto considered impregnable. The Treaty of Vienna, October 30, 1864, closed the war. Prussia and Austria together were to control the duchies. The Seven Weeks' War. The arrangement between Prussia and Austria respecting the Danish duchies caused the Seven Weeks' War of 1866. Bismarck induced Victor Emmanuel to form an alliance against Austria, March 27. The Prussians, on June 7, without a blow forced the Austrians to retire from Holstein, ignoring the protest of the Federal Diet. Austria was not prepared for war. Her army, together with that of Saxony, amounted to 271,000. With Prussia, fully equipped and on a war footing with three armies, besides the reserves, the grand total estimated at 300,000, the result was a foregone conclusion. Prussia declared war, June 15, 1866, against Hanover, Hesse, and Saxony, and next day threw her armies into the hostile states. On the 17th Francis Joseph published his war manifesto. Italy declared war, on the 20th, against Austria and Bavaria. In 14 days Prussia's immense army was mobilized. In five days the northern states to the main were disarmed, and the Saxon army was forced to retreat toward Bohemia. General Benedek was commander of the Austrians. Upon news of Prussian victories, he advised Francis Joseph to make terms of peace with William. Prussia fought for German unification, Austria to protect her pride. It was supposed the Austrians would first enter Saxony and dispute the Prussian advance, but Bismarck had determined the war should be brief, for Prussia was now master of the situation. On June 23, the Prussian army marched from three points towards Josephstadt, where Benedek was preparing to fight. On the 27th the Austrians were driven back at Soer, next day at Scalitz, and on the 29th at Gitchen. Archduke Leopold, on the 28th, and Count Clam Gallas, at Gitchen, both attacked the enemy in disobedience of orders, and thus forced Benedek to fall back from his strongest position towards Konigratz. The Austrians were also defeated, on the 28th, at Konigenhof and Schweinschattel, and their loss by this time numbered over 35,000. Benedek asked permission to retreat into Moravia and await reinforcements, but news of the Austrian victory over the Italians at Castazza reached Vienna, and immediately battle was enjoined upon Benedek. Benedek placed 500 guns in position, spanning a league between the Elba and Bistritz. On July 2, the King of Prussia assumed command of the Prussian hosts and ordered attack for the next day. The Crown Prince, several miles away with his army, received orders at four o'clock in the morning of the 3d to advance his Silesian army from Konigenhof. At eight o'clock, Prince Frederick Charles, with a hundred thousand, attacked the Austrian center lying against Zadova. General Herworth, with four hundred thousand men, attacked the Austrian right. The whole Austrian army was hurled against these two commands for five hours. Prince Frederick Charles forced passage through the Bistritz and took Zadova, but could not take the heights. At one o'clock retreat was being considered, but the crown prince coming up with his troops the heights were taken at four o'clock. The fighting on both sides in this battle was determined and heroic. The Prussian loss was over 10,000, and the Austrians lost 27,000 killed and wounded, 19,000 prisoners, with 174 cannon and 11 colors. At Lissa, on July 20, the Austrian navy destroyed the Italian fleet. July 22, an armistice of four weeks was granted. The Peace of Prague was concluded August 23. Her defeat cost Austria Venetia and the quadrilateral, namely, the fortresses of Pescura, Mantua, Verona, and Legnano, deprived her of any part in Germany or German affairs, and Holstein and Schleswig, and obliged her to pay 40 million thalers one half of which she was to retain in lieu of the duchies. Austria emerged from the Seven Weeks' War with her ideas somewhat liberalized, and though her territory was diminished her progress and prosperity increased. The dual Austro-Hungarian Empire was formed by Francis Joseph, he ruling at Vienna as Emperor of Austria and at Budapest as King of Hungary. This war also ended the Germanic Confederation of 1815, and the North German Confederation under Prussia arose. 
At the Peace of Vienna, October 3, Austria recognized the Kingdom of Italy, and with the acquisition of Venetia and the quadrilateral fortresses the Seven Weeks' War had greatly helped on the cause of United Italy. In April, 1864, Louis Napoleon sent an army of 25,000 to sustain the Austrian Archduke Maximilian on the throne of Mexico. At that time the United States was occupied with the Civil War. This ended, Napoleon was summarily required to withdraw his forces from the American continent, which he did. Maximilian was thus left to his fate, and, after being condemned by court-martial, was shot at Querétaro, June 19, 1867. The Franco-Prussian War. Prince Leopold, of Hohenzollern, was offered the throne of Spain after Isabella had fled from Madrid. Leopold declined, but Napoleon demanded that the Emperor William should guarantee never to permit Leopold to accept. William refused to accede to the demand, and Napoleon, urged by the war party, declared war July 19, 1870. On the same day the Confederation placed its forces in the hands of William, as did the South Germans. This spontaneous uprising of all Germany was unlooked for. Napoleon's army numbered 310,000 men. In ten days William had nearly half a million soldiers ready to march against the enemy. August 2, the first fight took place at Saarbrücken, a little town over the German frontier. Napoleon and the young Prince Imperial were present, and the force of Ulan was driven back. August 4, the Crown Prince of Prussia drove the right wing of McMahon's army back at Weissenberg, and on the 6th, again was McMahon defeated at Worth. The Germans, having separated McMahon's army, advanced into Alsace. In the meantime General Steinmetz carried Spicheren by storm, and the whole German army went forward. Together with the Crown Prince, Steinmetz, on the 14th of August, defeated Marshal Bazaine, at Corcellus, who retreated to Metz, and then endeavoured to push on with his hundred thousand men to Chalens. Von Malka hurried on the Crown Prince to intercept Bazaine, and at Mars Latour was fought the fiercest battle, so far, of the war. On either side the losses amounted to seventeen thousand. Grave Latte was fought, on August 18, between the armies of Steinmetz and the Crown Prince, King William commanding in person. The battle lasted all day between 200,000 Germans and 180,000 French. The Germans lost 20,000 men, and succeeded in forcing Bazaine into Metz. Although, in one sort, an undecisive battle, Gravelotte perhaps settled the fate of the empire. McMahon's plan was, with his 125,000 men reorganized at Chalens, to prevent the German advance on Paris. He was overruled and sent to the relief of Bazaine. Defeated in several small fights, McMahon was obliged to fall back on Sedan. The heights and ridges above Sedan once occupied by hostile troops, surrender or annihilation was the outcome. McMahon was wounded, then Dukrat, and the command fell to Wimpfen. Sedan was forced to surrender, September 1, and Napoleon himself gave his sword to King William. Paris was maddened. The Empress escaped to England. Napoleon was taken to the castle of Wilhelmshow. A month had hardly passed since the outbreak of the war, and one of the two great French armies with the Emperor had been captured, the other was besieged in Metz. Gambetta and other prominent men in Paris set up the government of the national defence. A republic was proclaimed. The defence of Paris was zealously undertaken. Large supplies of provisions were gathered. Fortifications were strengthened. The siege began September 19, 1870, and ended January 28, 1871. The direst famine attended it. Gambetta left Paris in a balloon, and at Tours succeeded in forming the Army of the Loire and the Army of the North. Both were defeated. Strasbourg was captured, and Metz surrendered with 173,000 men, among them three marshals of France. The entire German loss in this war was 129,700 men. January 17, 1871, Thiers was elected president of the Third Republic. Knowing the impossibility of further resistance, with half a million German soldiers, 
flushed and inspired by constant success, on the soil of France, and Paris in their anaconda coils, he counseled that peace be asked. Thiers, Favre, and Picard negotiated with William and Bismarck. An armistice of twenty days was permitted, that the National Convention then at Bordeaux might ratify terms. In the meantime the House of Hohenzollern reached the summit of its gratified ambition, when, on March 18, William was crowned at Versailles, Emperor of Germany. The cession of Alsace and Lorraine, and one billion dollar indemnity, was the price of peace. No patriot name in all history deserves more reverence than that of Louis Adolphe Thiers. Upon him devolved the task of making peace with the German foe, of quelling the civil war, and of so managing the finances of France, that her people within two years were enabled, to the astonishment of the world, to pay the enormous indemnity extorted by the Germans, and, by September, 1873, the last franc was paid and the last German sentinel removed from the soil of France. The civil war between the Republic and the Commune settled the question once for all, that Paris, accountable for all the errors and vicissitudes of the country, is not France. And there is every reason to hope that out of the unequalled horrors of those awful days of carnage the Republican government of France arose to remain in perpetuity. Garibaldi, taking advantage of the fall of Louis Napoleon, and caring not for the king's promises, took possession with his troops of the city of Rome, September 20, 1870. And on July 2 of the next year Victor Emmanuel erected his throne in the Quirinal. Turco-Russian War. In 1875, the Bosnians, Turkish subjects, revolted. They maintained their struggle, and the enraged Turks sent Mohammedan troops among the defenseless Bulgarians, destroying unnumbered thousands of men, women, and children. Tsar Alexander declared war April 1, 1877. His army crossed the Balkans and occupied Shipka Pass. Osman Pasha developed unexpected military genius and skill. For five months he checked the onward march of the Russians and won worldwide admiration by his defense of Plevna. By the 1st of December Plevna was invested completely by the Russians. Driven back whenever attempting to make a sortie, starvation compelled Osman to surrender with 44,000 troops. Adrianople was occupied. The Treaty of San Stefano was wrested in sight of Constantinople. It greatly reduced Turkish power in Europe, and constituted Russia heir to Turkey in Europe. Bulgaria was to be protected by 50,000 Russian troops for two years and to have a Christian governor. Three months later, England formed a secret treaty with Turkey, securing Cyprus and agreeing to protect Turkey in Asia. Austria, too, was dissatisfied, and the Treaty of Berlin was made in 1878, to rectify the balances of the nations. Russia was by this treaty damaged in prestige and, shorn of triumphs, was given only Asiatic provinces. Turkey was stripped of all real power in Europe. Chino-Japanese War In Japan's declaration of war against China, August 1, 1894, she set forth succinctly the provocation forcing her to this action. She said that Korea had been brought into the notice of the nations of the world by her efforts. That China constantly had interfered with Korea's government, insistently posing as her suzerain. That when an insurrection in Korea broke out China sent troops into Korea, and that when Japan, under the Treaty of 1885, also sent troops to assist Korea to quell the rebels, asking China's cooperation in the effort. China refused her rightful demand. That China's course tended to keep up the trouble indefinitely, so that the only course left for Japan was to declare war. As with Germany a score of years previously, when the time came Japan was ready, not only with munitions of war, but with better topographical knowledge of the enemy's country than they themselves possessed. The emperor, whose dynasty antedates the Christian era, gave his people a constitution, and stretching his hand towards Korea he helped her in the same direction. He had Japan's army and her navy drilled by expert European officers. Arsenals and extensive manufactories for the implements of war were started, with European superintendents. The latest and best of ships were both bought at foreign marts and made at home. Her students were to be found in the universities of the world. Her agents were sent to study in their capitals the economy of every government and the machinery of their executive departments. 
To find the best and assimilate it seemed the principle of her progression, so that both in military skill and the knowledge of diplomacy she acquired the ability to hold her place among the nations of the civilized world. A war alone was needed to prove that this was a fact. Japan's navy consisted of four armored cruisers and eight vessels of 3,000 tons each. This was a much lighter fleet than that of China, but swifter. China's navy had been trained by an able English naval chief, Captain Lang. Her outfit of ships was, perhaps, superior to that of Japan, consisting of five armored vessels, nine protected cruisers, and torpedo boats besides. The principal battle of this Chino-Japanese war was fought on September 15 at Pingyang, an old capital of Korea, situated at the meeting of several roads. The Japanese landed troops at Gensan, on the northeast, and at Huangzhou, on the northwest, coast of Korea. These formed the right and left wings of the army whose center, under General Naju, advanced from Seoul, about 100 miles to the south, of which the Japanese were already in possession. Only one wing of the army met opposition in its march, a small battle having been fought. The forces, so far as we can learn, were between 20 and 30,000 of Chinese and between 30 and 40,000 of Japanese. Japan's 24 years of scientific preparation, her study of the art of war, the practicability of her strategic movements, admired by the soldiers of the world, left China, with her old semi-barbarian methods, no chance for victory. The battle was a bloody one, the defeated Chinese fled until they were on the other side of the Yalu River, in Mancoria. 700, some accounts say 14,000, Chinese were captured, 2,000 killed and wounded. The army continued fighting and conquering until practically the province of Mancoria was in Japan's possession, as well as the peninsula of Liatung, terminating with Port Arthur. The Battle of Yalu, or Hai Yuntao, afforded the first practical test of modern vessels, guns, and projectiles in Asiatic waters. Pingyang has been called China's sedan, and Yalu, Japan's Trafalgar. Japan had nine cruisers and two converted cruisers wherewith to fight twelve Chinese warships and four torpedo boats. It is said that Japan used melanite shells. The fleet of Chinese warships, convoying transports with 10,000 troops, entered the Yalu River. The next day, September 17, the Japanese fleet, under Admiral Ito, went out to meet them. A European officer on a Chinese vessel says, passing along the Chinese line, the Japanese poured as heavy a fire as they could bring to bear upon each ship in succession, and, while they had sea room, circled round their opponents. The Japanese state that no Japanese warship was lost and only three seriously injured. A Chinese officer says, as soon as the Chinese on the port side had brought their guns to bear and had obtained range accurately, the Japanese would work around and attack the starboard side. Four ships were destroyed and two badly injured. One of the Chinese ships was said to have been hit 200 times. The Chinese ironclads that escaped were later sunk off Wei Highway. Port Arthur, captured October 21, was filled to overflowing with ammunition, grain, and other supplies. China made three informal overtures for peace. Finally, Li Hung Chang went from Tianjin to Shimonoseki, to make terms, on 19 March, 1895. By the treaty there made, May 17, China recognized the independence and autonomy of Korea, ceded certain territory in Mancoria, all the islands in the eastern part of the Bay of Liatung in the northern part of the Yellow Sea, Formosa, and all islands belonging to it, and the Pescadores group. Two hundred million cupping tails were exacted as indemnity, to be paid in eight installments, one every six months. The inhabitants were to sell out and leave, or in two years to be Japanese subjects. Russia, Germany, and France recommended that Japan should not permanently possess the peninsula of Phong Tan, and Japan agreed to their suggestions. Formosa, as a strategetical post, is of the greatest value. Korea and Japan now control absolutely the Japan Sea. It was only after four months of fighting that Japan completely conquered the Formosans and had all her new possessions under her control. China paid Japan an additional $30 million for the release of Port Arthur and Liatung Peninsula. China was well pleased. 
But in April, 1897, Russia herself had obtained possession of Port Arthur in Talian Wan, and in December the Germans received Keo Chow, the finest naval station of the province of Shantung. France subsequently obtained Kuang Chow, the best port of Wangxi, and England, though not joining these powers in the demand in favor of China in 1895, obtained Wei Highway in 1897. Greco-Turkish War in 1895, the fearful atrocities committed by the unspeakable Turk began to assume appalling proportions. During three years 100,000 Cretans were murdered. February 8, 1897, the Cretans proclaimed union with Greece. The Greeks, unable longer to endure the sufferings of their kindred, determined to help them. Prince George left for Crete with a torpedo flotilla February 10. Colonel Vassos, aide de camp to the king, followed with 1,500 men and two batteries on the 13th, Prince Nicholas led a regiment of artillery to the Thessalian frontiers. The powers sent a collective note of protest to Greece, but it was not heeded. Colonel Vassos landed in Crete on the 14th, sailors from the fleet of the powers occupied the coast towns of Crete. Pasha Berovich resigned and returned to Constantinople. Greek reserves rallied promptly. Volunteers offered. Colonel Vassos established headquarters in the mountainous interior at Sphakia. March 18, the powers blockaded Crete. On the 27th, Crown Prince Constantine proceeded to the Turkish frontier. On April 5, the powers declared no gain should accrue to the combatant who approached the salient borders. April 8, 3,000 Greeks crossed near Crania, began fighting, and were driven back. On April 17 Turkey declared war. On the 18th, a battle of 24 hours, in Milouna Pass, crowned Turkish arms with victory. Another hard-fought battle, at Ravini, discomfited the Greeks. Greeks passed the Arda River and Greek ironclads bombarded Provesa. On the 19th, the Turks were in Thessaly and the Greeks in retreat to Larissa. After terrific battles Tornevo and Larissa, on the 25th, fell into the hands of the Turks. Colonel Smolensky fought desperately at Valestino, but had to yield, and Volo also fell to the Turks. The Turks occupied Pharsaos on May 6. Greece asked the powers for peace, May 8, Cretan autonomy was agreed to, and Turkey permitted armistice on the 15th. The war closed. Turkey was forced to yield all Thessalian territory, and Crete was relieved of Turkish oppression. Greece was forced to withdraw all support from Crete and pay $20 million indemnity. The remarkable feature of this war was the intensely hard fighting from start to close, and the disposition of the powers to assist Turkey by interfering with the Grecian navy. Frequently the Austrians helped the Turks by placing their guns in position. It was only when the Sultan conquered Thessaly and threatened to keep it that the powers interposed. The crime committed by the powers against civilization and Christianity by their action seems incredible, even though the peace of Europe was thereby secured. England's wars in the Sudan. The Khedive of Egypt had obtained great loans from Europe. England and France took financial control of the country. Arabi Pasha inaugurated a rebellion and fortified Alexandria. Many Europeans were murdered, and England bombarded the city, taking possession July 12. 1882. General Wolseley, at Tel el Kabir, September 13, fought and defeated Araby, who fled leaving 2,000 dead. France withdrew from the financial arrangement. The English remained to put the Egyptians in condition for self government. England has remained ever since. Muhammad Ahmed arose in the Sudan, proclaiming himself El Mahdi, the Muslim Messiah. The barbarian hordes flocked to his banner. He defeated the Egyptians in four engagements, October, 1883. The Anglo-Egyptian force of 10,000 men, under General Hicks, was destroyed, only two escaping. General Gordon was sent to the relief of the Egyptian army. He reached Khartoum, February 18, 1884. The Mahdiists besieged the city. Gordon sent for reinforcements. England was so slow in sending them that they arrived two days too late. Khartoum was captured through treachery, and Gordon, 
the most beloved of English soldiers for his saintly and heroic character, was put to death on January 27, 1885. General Sir Horatio Herbert Kitchener was made Sirdar in 1890. He started from Cairo with 1,000 British and 15,000 Egyptians, black and fella troops, building a road across the desert as he advanced and engineering his gunboats up the Nile. The distance from his base, at Cairo, to his first storehouse, at Wadi Halfa, is 800 miles. April 8, 1898, was fought the Battle of Atbara, a ford at the point where the Atbara River enters the Nile. Here Mahmud, the commander of the barbarians, was captured and his army of 12,000 infantry destroyed. Osman Digna got away with the greater part of the cavalry, numbering 4,000. The force was about a month reaching Wadi Hamed, and, September 1, was in sight of Omdurman. The Sirdar's line was drawn up in crescent form, with Omdurman and Khartoum for its center. In this position was fought the First Battle of Egida, in which 22,000 of the dervishes fell. The Khalifa and Osman Digna fled with a scant handful of followers, and are now said to be bandits in the Kordofan. The number of the annihilated army of the Mahdiists will never be known. The British loss of whites was less than 200, and the native loss less than 300. The fire of the barbarians was generally too high to effect great injury. September 2 will be a marked day in England's calendar. The Sirdar marched into Khartoum, the Union Jack was raised, and beneath its floating crosses his chaplains performed Gordon's funeral ceremonies on the spot where he was slain nearly fourteen years before. The Boer War By the Treaty of 1881 Great Britain claimed suzerainty over the South African, Transvaal, Republic and Orange Free State. These republics claimed that by the Treaty of 1884 Great Britain gave up her claim of suzerainty. Here arose an issue which was aggravated by the discovery of diamonds at Kimberley and of gold at Johannesburg, followed by the Jameson Raid, which, shorn of its disguise, was noticed to the Boers that Great Britain desired and designed to occupy and absorb their two republics. The diplomatic war went on for years between President Kruger, of the Transvaal, and Mr. Chamberlain, Great Britain's colonial secretary. It culminated in an ultimatum on the part of Kruger, on October 9, 1899, which Chamberlain rejected. Both sides had been preparing for this, and on October 11, the outbreak of the war, Great Britain had already an army of 25,000 men in South Africa, while the Boers had mobilized an equal, if not superior, army of effectives. The Boers immediately invaded Natal and Cape Colony, shutting up General White and his army in Ladysmith, and Colonel Powell and his forces in Mafeking. Kimberley was also besieged. The initial battles were numerous, fierce, and generally favourable to the Boers. Great Britain's eyes were speedily opened to the gravity of the situation. She hurried large reinforcements to the scene till her armies far outnumbered those of the Boers. Yet her best generals, as Buller at Tugela River, and Methuen, at Magersfontein, continued to meet with disastrous defeats. Lord Roberts, in connection with General Kitchener, was sent, January 10, 1900, to supersede the blundering generals, and to organize a new campaign. It was seen that direct battle against the Boers was bound to end in defeat. So Roberts was provided with an overwhelming army, estimated at 225,000, and he at once entered upon a war of strategy. His northward advance was general along his lines, thus keeping the Boers divided. He flanked them out of their strongholds. By February he had invaded the Orange Free State, and raised the siege of Kimberley. On February 27 he captured General Cronje and his force of 4,000 men, and on March 13 took possession of Bloemfontein, the Free State capital, whence he issued a proclamation annexing the Republic under the name of Orange River Colony. On February 28 the siege of Ladysmith was raised, and shortly after that of Mafeking. The Boers continued to fight doggedly, all the while inflicting heavy losses on their enemy, but resistance was futile against such overwhelming odds. They were gradually forced from one position to another in the direction of Pretoria, the Transvaal capital. On March 5 Presidents Kruger and Stein joined in peace proposals, which were rejected. 
On March 12 they made an appeal to the nations for mediation. All refused to mediate. On March 27 the Boers lost their ablest general in the person of General Joubert, who died at Pretoria. By May 12 Kronstadt, the second free state capital, had fallen into Lord Robert's hands. The Val River was then crossed and the Transvaal invaded. On May 31st the British army entered the important town of Johannesburg, and hastened toward Pretoria, which was captured on June 5, 1900. President Kruger and General Bota had left a few days before, the former in the direction of the Portuguese port of Lorenzo Marques, the latter with the remnant of the Boer army to the mountains beyond Pretoria. On September 3 Lord Roberts declared the Transvaal Annex to Great Britain under the name of the Vaal River Colony. Generals Bota and De Wet continued a guerrilla warfare far past the end of the century. President Kruger accepted the protection of Holland, and sailed thither on October 20, 1900. Lord Roberts arrived in England in December, 1900, to receive his honours. At the turn of the century the South African problem was a most wearying one for Great Britain. The Boxer Uprising The defeat of China by Japan in 1894, the ambition of European powers to occupy her ports and enlarge their spheres of influence, the ominous threats to partition her territory soured the Manchu dynasty and the people of northern China against foreigners. The Empress Dowager deposed the young emperor, seized the reins of government, and catered to that reactionary and hostile spirit which culminated in the Boxer Uprising. These mobs began the destruction of missions, the murder and expulsion of missionaries, and concerted attack against everything that savored of foreign direction and influence. The Chinese regular soldiers were either helpless before them or in sympathy with them. By May, 1900, all the powers represented at Peking stood aghast at the startling fact that their respective legations were beleaguered in Peking and liable to be murdered. Warships were instantly ordered to Taku. By June 1, 1900, 23 vessels had reported, 9 Russian, 3 British, 3 German, 3 French, 2 American, 2 Japanese, one Italian. A force of 2,000 soldiers was landed from these, and immediately started for Peking, under command of the British Rear Admiral Seymour, for the rescue of the legations. This force was defeated by the Boxers, and compelled to retreat to Tianjin with heavy loss. An attempt to torpedo the Taku Harbor was resented by the warships. They bombarded and blew up the Taku forts. In this action the American warships did not participate. The boxers swarmed in Tianjin, and an allied force of 4,000 men was sent thither to capture it. In their first attack, on July 9, they were repulsed with heavy loss. Being reinforced up to 7,000 men, their second attack, on July 13, was successful. The city was taken, and made the base of further operations against Peking, 80 miles up the Peiho. The Allies were further reinforced, and started for Peking with an army of 16,000 men. They met the Chinese army of 30,000 men at Peisang, and after a severe battle on August 5, drove them from their fortifications with great loss. The Chinese rallied at Yangtzeun, but were again defeated by the Allies on August 6. They offered no further serious resistance to the Allies, who moved swiftly on Peking, invested it, and, on August 14, breached its walls and entered it in triumph. The legations were relieved after an imprisonment of nearly three months. Two ministers, one of Japan, the other of Germany, had been murdered. The others had escaped death only by concentrating and defending themselves in the English compound. The Allied forces occupied the city for a time, and then those of Russia and the United States withdrew, leaving a strong legation guard. The Chinese government appointed Li Hengchang and Prince Qing ministers to meet ministers of the powers to arrange terms of settlement. After months of conference a protocol was signed in January, 1901, which was supposed to contain the germs of future settlement. But there was that in the Chinese situation which was bound to tax the diplomacy of the world during many years of the 20th century. A Review of Martial Results the history of the world shows that successful war adds to the glory and prestige of the victorious nation, and this is particularly exemplified by the wars of the 19th century. 
France, so long victorious, dazzled the world. At Waterloo, her glory was clouded. Napier, in his closing words of the history of these events of the twenty years of war and turmoil, showed how thoroughly the English people appreciated that their greatness and power were due to the glory achieved by the arms of Britain's chivalrous sons. While England was covering herself with glory, her offspring, the United States, was teaching her, in the War of 1812, that being now of age his pockets were not again to be turned inside out, a lesson which thereafter she heeded. Greece, throbbing with the impulse of freedom, achieved her independence, displaying all the heroism of her Hellenic ancestry. The Mexican War added greatly to the glory of American arms and resulted in the acquisition of a vast territory, whose inhabitants quickly assimilated themselves to the requirements of American citizenship. The Revolution of 48 but served to consolidate the power of Prussia, laying the foundation for the imperial crown to rest upon the head of her king, while fitting France for her future solid republican career. The Crimean War, except that it checked the policy of Russia, produced few results in comparison with the vast amount of blood and treasure so lavishly spent. The victories of Magenta and Solferino illumined again the eagles of France. The Seven Weeks' War, while still further consolidating Germany under Prussia, was not without its blessings for Austria, and advanced, young Italy, greatly toward the goal of her ambition. In America, the appeal to arms was made to decide the questions mooted since the nation's birth. One effect of this war was to show the wonderful prowess and soldierly qualities of the American citizen. The Franco-Prussian War lifted the dignity of Hohenzollern to its height, ended forever the Empire of France in a crushing fall, and taught the lesson of scientific preparation for war. Than which no science is more worthy of intense study and application in all its branches. The Chino-Japanese War was a triumph of a growing civilization over semi-barbarism, and foreshadows the prominent role that Japan may be called upon to play in the 20th century. The enlargement of her territory was a fitting reward for her unselfish championing of her weaker sister, Korea. The greco cretan turkish War shed no glory on the Turkish nor on the so-called Christian nations, and will stand on history's page as a crowning shame to European civilization. The opening of Africa by General Kitchener and his great achievements read like old-time stories, and the 20th century may see great results in Africa from this wonderful campaign. The War of the United States with Spain, fought because it was impossible longer to allow the atrocities of her rule on this hemisphere at our very doors, has brought conditions not dreamed of, and which, under the providence of God, may lead to greater results in the development of Christian civilization than we now may comprehend. The Boer War had little instigation on the part of Great Britain, except greed. Its management reflected no credit on her military genius, weakened her in the eyes of nations, and entailed a loss of life and money from which she will not recover in generations. The Chinese disturbance did not rise to the dignity of war, but opened problems of startling intricacy and moment for all the powers. The Century's Fairs and Expositions By George J. Hagar Editor of Appendix to Encyclopedia Britannica Dr. Alfred Russell Wallace, in a recent work, argues that the 19th century is altogether unique in that it inaugurated a new era. To grasp its marvelous achievements, he tells us, it should be compared with a long historical period, rather than with another century, however happily selected. The progress it environs is set down as almost wholly material and intellectual, and the palm for completeness is given to the material. Debatable as his conclusion may be, there can be no dispute either as to the qualitative or quantitative progress in the material advancement of mankind in the century now closing. In the present retrospect the broader view becomes apparent, that the material and the intellectual have been allied forces that have constantly pushed forward side by side, one devising in the solitude that genius needs for expansion. The other showing to the world the realizations of thought that in practical application benefit all. The evolution of the international exposition of today is a conspicuous result of this material and intellectual wedlock. It seems a long time between the fair that was held to allow people not closely settled to purchase the ordinary commodities of life, food, clothing, and household belongings. And the great expositions to which the nations of the world bring the surpassing embodiments of native thought.
Measured by years, the time is really beyond computation, but measured by results, mere time is annihilated, and the progress that the evolution illustrates is found to have kept a steady pace with man's physical necessities and intellectual growth. The moment necessity has shown that mankind needed something to make life brighter, happier, or more comfortable to pass through, intellect has undertaken the task of creating it and has fashioned out the material. In the great expositions of today are seen the effects of the marvelous influence which sprang from the fair as a market, instituted so long ago that no call for the records is answerable. Of this kind, only a very few remain. Then came the fair designed to promote the useful arts and manufactures, the fair to advance agriculture and allied industries, and the fair to show special articles, to commemorate historical events, and to aid interests of large public concern. Under an ever-increasing expansion, stimulated by popular favor, the fair, with the commercial feature abandoned or having it only as a restricted branch, became the exhibition to show a larger development of the arts, sciences, and mechanical trades. To celebrate great public occurrences on a grander scale than earlier fairs had done, to promote special industries, local or national, to aid education by permanent displays of natural or manufactured products and to promote the commercial intercourse of the world. From the first of this class of exhibitions came the international undertakings, first known as World's Fairs, and afterward as international exhibitions and expositions. In some one of these classes may be found every kind of a display of products, irrespective of its purpose or individual name. The development of the modern exhibition from the early fair has been confined to no one country nor people. Everywhere the purpose and process have been the same. A few years changed the old-time mart, where people went to buy what they knew they would find, to the convenient place where tradesmen placed on view the things they knew people would need and buy. As well as articles offered at a venture that people who really didn't need them might be tempted to purchase because of novelty or other quality. Thus, the bargain counter and the department store are several hundred years older than the thrifty housewife of today reckons. Trade competition, then as now, led to a broadening of plans, rival efforts, and special attractions. People began to attend fairs to see what was new, as well as to buy, and soon, lest they should tire of sightseeing, it became necessary to provide means for entertaining them. Punch and Judy came on the scene with perennial popularity. Jugglery astounded the young and fascinated their elders. Dancing and wrestling rings proved sportive magnets of annually increasing strength. The fair now began to change from a strictly commercial undertaking to an occasion for holiday hilarity, and soon trade and amusement were struggling for the mastery. In many places, hilarity led to excesses, and excesses to crime. Public opinion demanded the forceful intervention of the law, and one by one the most demoralizing fairs were suppressed, the notorious Donnabrook closing its long career of debauchery and lighting in 1855. The display of merchandise and the gathering of customers at the most noted fairs in time became really enormous, and for many years the great fairs of the day were held on open and extensive plains. Then, too, the fair assumed an importance that led first the local authorities, and after them higher dignitaries, to seek to turn it to their individual advantage. For a time no fair could be held in Great Britain without a special grant from the Crown. And it was a widely observed custom for royal or ecclesiastical authorities to give permission to a town or village that had suffered some misfortune to hold a fair as a means of re-establishing itself. The famous fair of St. Giles's Hill, near Manchester, England, was instituted as a revenue to the bishop by William the Conqueror. That it was a valuable monopoly is shown by the facts that its jurisdiction extended seven miles around the city, and that all merchants who sold wares within that circuit, unless at the fair, forfeited them to the bishop. A curious evidence of early international interest in the fair, as well as of its importance and influence, is found in the records of 1314, when King Philip of France sent a formal complaint to King Edward II of England, to the effect that the merchants of England had ceased frequenting the fairs in his dominions with their wood and other goods, to the great loss of his subjects. Philip entreated Edward to persuade, and, if necessary, to compel, English people to frequent the fairs of France as formerly, promising them all possible security and encouragement. 
As a purely commercial institution, the fair had its best day when people were widely separated. The increase of population, the development of new life and activity by growing communities, the opening of means of travel between distant points, and the establishment of stores and markets, were all fatal to the commercial fair. Today, in all Europe, only three really great annual fairs of this character remain, those of Nizhny Novgorod, in Russia, Beaucaire, in France, and Leipzig, in Germany. The same conditions that brought the popular usefulness of the commercial fair to an end were the forces from which the fair as an exponent of industrial achievement has been developed. And the material progress of the 19th century is to be traced. For the modern fair in all of its forms the world is indebted to the Society of Arts, of London, an organization whose fame in America was so great that Benjamin Franklin, in soliciting corresponding membership, declared that he would esteem it a great honor to be admitted and also to be permitted to contribute 20 guineas to be expended in premiums. What this society in its early days did for Great Britain it did also for civilization. It organized the first exhibition of specimens of improvements in the useful arts and manufactures in 1760. Stimulated native ingenuity by judicious awards of prizes and premiums for exhibits of exceptional merit. And extended its powerful influence to foster art, science, mechanical and agricultural industry, and the fishery trade and colonial commerce of the country. Of the many influences of this society that came to the United States, it may be questioned if any had a more lasting benefit for both people and country than that which gave birth to the Mechanics Institutes. There are people still living who are able to recall how the large cities in the eastern and middle states vied with each other in the establishment of two great and kindred institutions, the Mechanics Institute and the Apprentices Library. Philadelphia led the cities in the matter of time, her Franklin Institute being founded in 1824. For years afterward the American Institute was chartered in New York City. After these came the Massachusetts Charitable Mechanics Association in Boston, the Maryland Institute in Baltimore, and numerous others, those mentioned being the principal ones that still maintain annual or other exhibitions. At first, the exhibitions of these institutes, like the first one ever held under the patronage of a national government, that in Paris in 1798, were composed of various articles loaned by their owners. Soon, however, the popularity of the institutes and the awarding of prizes and diplomas brought to the exhibition specimens of the handicraft of members and friends. And the rising lights in the arts and manufactures became eager to secure the recognition of their genius that such awards established. Thus, the influence of the principal surviving institutes has spread far beyond local limits. Purely national exhibitions have never found much popular favor in the United States. When as a whole people we decide to hold one for a purpose of general interest, we prefer to set a large table and invite the universe to help us celebrate. In France, the first national exhibition was a lone exhibition. Its effect, however, was so immediate that the government repeated it the same year, organized more elaborate ones in 1801 and 1802, and decided to hold them triennially thereafter, a course that has since been interrupted by political exigencies. These exhibitions were projected to illustrate the progress of France only. In the United States there have been no state exhibitions, excepting agricultural fairs, for which outside cooperation has not been invited. The life of the American agricultural fair is almost measurable by the full century. This, too, had its origin in England. The father of the American system of combined agricultural fairs and cattle shows was Elkanah Watson, a native of Plymouth, Massachusetts, who spent the greater part of his life in promoting large public measures besides agriculture and education. In 1807 he removed from Albany, N.Y., to Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where he engaged in general and experimental agriculture and cattle raising. His efforts to improve local farming conditions and to raise a superior breed of cattle attracted widespread interest, and this suggested to him that an annual exhibition of cattle and of farm products, resulting from a more painstaking system of cultivation than was commonly followed, would prove of material advantage to the farmer, the breeder, and the general public. Accordingly, he induced his farming friends in the country to contribute specimens of improved breeds of cattle and of superior products of the soil, 
and the first exhibition or fair was held in 1810. This, with modest prizes for the best exhibits, proved a complete success. Encouraged by the results of his initial efforts, he went to Boston to solicit pecuniary aid for a second and much larger exhibition. Although he was at that time widely known for his public-spirited philanthropy, and also as the founder of the influential Berkshire Agricultural Society, his appeals for aid brought him little save derision. To show how small concern was felt by business and public men toward the farming industry, a sentence in a letter from ex-president John Adams to Mr. Watson is sufficient. You will get no aid from Boston. Commerce, literature, theology, medicine, the university, and universal politics are against you. The ex-president was correct in his judgment. Mr. Watson did not receive a single favorable response to his appeals. Yet he lost not a particle of faith in the wisdom of his undertaking. With the cooperation only of the farmers in his county, Mr. Watson succeeded in arranging annual exhibitions until 1816, when he returned to Albany. The same year he organized the first agricultural society in the state of New York, and began establishing fairs and cattle shows in the nearby counties. In 1819 he secured the passage of an act by the legislature appropriating $10,000 annually for six years for the promotion of agriculture and domestic manufactures. Conditional on a like amount being raised by the agricultural societies in the different counties. A state society was incorporated in 1832, to which county societies were directed to report, while it, in turn, had to render a combined report to the legislature annually. Since then an agricultural department has become an indispensable part of the government of the various states and territories, even of those that are popularly believed to be only metallic producers. The character of the state and county agricultural fair has been undergoing a radical change for many years, especially in sections thickly settled or near large cities. And the chief attractions have passed from the exhibition of sleek domestic animals and choice fruits of the soil to horse racing and bicycle contests. Innovations foreign to the spirit and intention of the fair have already wrought its ruin in many places and are threatening it generally. Of American fairs in the original commercial sense, those held during the Civil War, to aid the work of the United States Sanitary Commission on the battlefield and in the camp and hospital, will always be historically conspicuous. During those memorable four years it is doubtful if there was a single city, town, or village in the northern states that did not put forth a special effort to provide necessities and conveniences for the soldiers and sailors that were not supplied by the government. And the fair was the most popular form of raising the needful money. Exhibitions of special articles, possessing the features of state, national, and international combinations, and independent of any locality, event, or period of time, are growing in frequency. Many of these have a predominating technical interest, as the international exhibitions of fisheries and fishery methods, of life-saving methods and apparatus, of forestry products and systems of forest preservation, and of railway appliances. While others combine the technical and popular features, as the exhibitions of electrical apparatus, of improved food preparations, of bicycles, of automobile vehicles, and of woodworking and labor-saving machinery. Special exhibitions in the United States that possess a large popular interest include the annual showing of the art associations and leagues in the principal cities, and the annual horse, dog, and sportsman shows in New York City. Among them also are to be noted the permanent expositions in Philadelphia and Chicago, both reminders of the greatest international expositions that have been held up to their day. The Philadelphia Exposition is held in Memorial Hall, the building erected in Fairmount Park by the state of Pennsylvania at a cost of $1,500,000, and used for the art gallery of the Centennial Exposition in 1876. It now contains an art and industrial collection similar to the famous South Kensington Museum in London. The Chicago Exposition is in the former Art Palace of the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893, and, having been endowed by Marshall Field with $1 million, is now known as the Field Columbian Museum. Its most conspicuous feature is a collection showing the development of the railway, and the next, its forestry exhibits. In the line of permanent expositions, Philadelphia is to be credited with two commercial museums of far-reaching influence that will be considered further on. 
The first exhibition of the industries of all nations was that held in Hyde Park, London, in 1851. It was an outgrowth of the annual exhibitions of the Society of Arts, before mentioned, and was at first designed to be only a national enterprise, but on a more extended scale than the former exhibitions of the Society. The late Prince Albert, husband of Queen Victoria, however, conceived the idea of throwing this particular exhibition open to the industry of the world. His suggestion at once met the favour of the Council of the Society, as well as of the leading manufacturers of England and the general public. A royal warrant was procured appointing a commission to manage an exhibition of the works of industry of all nations, and of this body Prince Albert became president. On February 21, 1850, the commissioners felt justified in making a public announcement that the building would cover an area of from 16 to 20 acres, that it would be ready for the reception of goods by January 1, 1851. And that the exhibition would be open to the public on May 1, following. The plans for a building submitted by Sir Joseph Paxton were accepted after a large number had been considered. They called for a vast structure of iron and glass, somewhat similar to the great conservatory he had erected for the Duke of Devonshire at Chatsworth. A contract was signed with Messrs. Fox and Henderson for the construction of the building, under which they were to receive £79,800, and the materials of the building were to remain their property. On February 3, the completed structure was formally delivered to the commissioners. It had an extreme length of 1851 feet and an extreme breadth of 408 feet, with an additional projection on the north side, 936 feet long by 48 feet wide. While the erection of the building was in progress, Dr. Lion Playfair was chosen to decide and classify the wide range of articles that was sought to be brought together under the general title of Objects of Industrial and Productive Art. He arranged these under four great sections, raw materials, machinery, manufactures, and fine arts, and they in turn were divided and subdivided into a vast number of classes and smaller divisions. The collecting of national exhibits was placed in the hands of district committees in all the principal towns and manufacturing localities, and in response to invitations extended to all the British colonies and the various foreign governments. Nearly every country in Europe, almost every state in the North American Union, the South American republics, India, Egypt, Persia, and the far-off islands of the seas, sent objects that swelled the total estimated value of exhibits, excluding the renowned Koinur diamond, to £1,781,929. The exhibition was opened by Queen Victoria on the appointed day, and was continued till October 11. The total number of exhibitors was about 15,000. During the 114 days the exhibition was open a total of 6,063,986 persons visited it, a daily average of 42,111. The largest number in a single day was on Tuesday of the closing week, 109,915. An attempt to ascertain the number of foreign visitors developed the unexpected result that not much more than 40,000 foreigners visited London beyond the annual average of 15,000. The financial result of the exhibition was really remarkable. The total receipts from all sources amounted to £506,000, and the total expenditures to about £330,000, leaving a surplus of £176,000, which was subsequently increased to £186,436. The distinctions of all kinds that were awarded, council and prize medals and honourable mentions, aggregated 5084. It is here interesting to note, as showing the truly international character of the First World's exhibition, that foreign guests occupied two-fifths of the exhibition space and received three-fifths of the honours. British exhibitors of machinery, manufacturers in metal, and manufacturers in glass and porcelain, took more prizes than all the foreigners combined. Foreigners led in the number of prizes for textile fabrics, fine arts, and miscellaneous manufacturers, and in the section of raw materials for food and manufactures the foreign exhibitors gained nearly four times as many prizes as the British. This exhibition developed a number of features that should be borne in mind when considering those that came after it. It was an experiment in an untried field, it was comprised in a single building, and it was self-supporting. 
In all respects it was a marvelous achievement. It made the late prince consort the father, and the Society of Arts the pioneer promoters, of the International Exposition. The beneficial influence of the First World's Exhibition began to be felt immediately. An exhibition of the arts and manufactures of Ireland was held in Cork in the following year, and the Royal Dublin Society, which had been holding similar exhibitions triennially, got up a much larger one than usual. Through the generous pecuniary aid of William Dargan, in 1853. The Dublin Exhibition, unlike that of Cork, was international in scope. American visitors to the London Exhibition brought home with them a pretty large inspiration for a similar effort, and before the close of 1851 a number of citizens of New York had associated themselves for that purpose. In January, 1852, the Corporation of the City of New York granted a lease for five years of Reservoir Square, on the conditions that a building of iron, glass, and wood should be erected thereon and that the entrance fee to the proposed exhibition should not exceed 50 cents. In March, the legislature incorporated the Association for the Exhibition of the Industries of All Nations, with a capital of $200,000 that might be increased to $300,000. Subsequently, the federal government constituted the building a bonded warehouse and exempted foreign exhibits from the payment of duties. This exhibition was therefore a private enterprise, having no other official recognition than that mentioned. It was also an unfortunate affair from beginning to end. The location was then three or four miles from the heart of the city, the area was entirely inadequate for the purpose. The day of opening had to be postponed, because of the incomplete condition of the building, and financially the enterprise was a huge failure. The exhibition was opened July 14, 1853, with much ceremony, although still scarcely half ready for exhibits or visitors, and was continued for 119 days. There were about 4,800 exhibitors, somewhat more than one-half being foreign. The total cost of the exhibition was nearly $1 million, and the receipts were $340,000. Although a financial failure, and a disappointment in many ways, this first international exhibition in the United States was productive of much good. The success of the London Exhibition also aroused the French to depart from the exclusively national character of their former exhibitions and to inaugurate one open to the world. This was done under the direct auspices of the imperial government, which undertook to combine certain features of both the London and the New York enterprises. Hence, the first international exhibition held in Paris was practically a private scheme supported by official guarantees. A further departure was here made in the matter of building, and, instead of the single great structure, there were the Palais de l'Industrie, the Palais de Beaux-Arts, the Panorama, and three smaller buildings for agricultural implements, carriages, and a variety of less costly articles. Another innovation was here introduced, a partial return to the methods of the commercial fair, in the setting apart of exhibiting spaces on the open ground. The main building, the Palais de l'Industrie, was erected by a joint stock company on the Champs Elysees, and provided a floor space of 1,770,000 square feet. It was built of glass, stone, and brick, and was 800 feet long by 350 feet wide. The various buildings cost about $5 million, and the Palais de l'Industrie was erected for a permanent structure. This exhibition was opened on May 15, 1855, and closed on November 15, following. It was visited by 4,533,464 persons. Besides France and her colonies, 53 foreign states and 22 colonies belonging to them sent exhibits. In all there were 20,839 exhibitors, those of France and her colonies predominating by only about 500. The exhibits were classified on the London plan, there being in each case 30 classes altogether. Excluding the main building, which the imperial government acquired, the exhibition cost about $2,250,000. Between the first and second London exhibitions there were many industrial and art displays in the United Kingdom and colonies and on the continent, among which should be noted those of New Brunswick and Madras in 1853, Munich in 1854, and Edinburgh and Manchester in 1857. The second London exhibition was undertaken by a commission headed, 
as the first, by the Prince Consort, under a guarantee fund of $2,250,000. While it was in course of preparation the Prince Consort died, and for a while a heavy pall hung over the scheme. The commission here introduced the French idea of separate buildings. The site was at South Kensington, and the main structure was built of brick, glass, and iron, was nearly rectangular in shape, and covered an area of about seven acres. With the annexes the total area under roof was about 23 acres. This exhibition was opened by the Duke of Cambridge on May 1, 1862, and remained open for 177 days. It was visited by 6,211,103 persons, a daily average of 36,329, its receipts were wholly absorbed by expenses, and a slight deficit was left. Foreign exhibitors numbered 17,861, and received more than 9,000 prizes. In 1863 the French government announced that an exhibition would be held in Paris in 1867, that was intended to be more completely universal in character and more comprehensive in plan than any that had ever been held. The Champ de Mars, the great parade ground on which the École Militaire faced, containing about 111 acres, was placed at the disposal of the commissioners by the government. In the center of this space was erected the principal building, an oval structure mainly of iron, 1,607 feet long and 1,246 feet wide, that cost $2,357,000. In planning this building the convenience of exhibitors and visitors in ready access to the exhibits of any desired country or class was given the preference over architectural effect. Here, again, was a diffusion of exhibits in detached buildings. And a noteworthy novelty was the reservation of ground on the park surrounding the main building for the erection by foreign exhibitors of special buildings for the display of articles that could not be accommodated in the main structure. This feature became the most popular one of the entire exhibition, for it gave a most graphic illustration of the architecture, manners, customs, and countless peculiarities of the peoples of the world. The exhibition was opened by the Emperor on April 1, 1867, and was closed on October 31, following. The number of visitors was upward of 15 million, a daily average of nearly 70,000, and of exhibitors, 51,819. In all, 12,944 medals and grand prizes of honorable mention were awarded. From beginning to end the expenses were $4,596,764, and the receipts aggregated $2,822,000. The national and municipal governments contributed $1,200,000 each, which added to the receipts of the exhibition proper created a surplus over expenditure of $626,000. London's third exhibition, from May 1 till September 30, 1871, was projected as the first of an annual series that should separately promote a distinct branch of industrial effort. Thirty-three foreign countries were represented. There were approximately 4,000 art and 7,000 industrial exhibitors, and the visitors numbered 1,142,000. The second in the series, in 1872, was confined to printing, paper, music, musical instruments, jewelry, cotton goods, and fine arts. And the third, in 1873, was devoted to the general subject of cookery. Great as was the Universal Exposition of Paris in 1867, that at Vienna in 1873 far surpassed it in extent and grandeur, although its pecuniary success was severely affected by an epidemic of cholera, a financial crisis, and local extortions. As each of the preceding international exhibitions had developed a distinctive feature, so this of Vienna introduced the custom of holding world's congresses for the discussion of great problems of universal application. The exhibition was opened on May 1 and closed on November 3, following. Turnstiles recorded the entrance of 7,254,687 visitors. There were about 70,000 exhibitors, whose display, in extent and costliness, exceeded that of Paris in 1867. The gross receipts were about $2 million, and expenditures about $9,850,000, making a deficiency of some $7,850,000, which the government liquidated.
The United States was represented by 643 exhibitors, more than half of whom were awarded prizes. This brings the record up to the Centennial Exposition, at Philadelphia, in 1876, and covers the third quarter of the century. The actual work of making the Centennial Exhibition began on March 3, 1871, when Congress passed an act creating the United States Centennial Commission. This authorized the President to appoint a commissioner and an alternate from each state and territory, on the nomination of the respective governors. The appointments were promptly made, and from the whole body of commissioners the following were chosen for the principal executive officers, President, Joseph R. Hawley, of Connecticut, Vice Presidents, Alfred T. Goshorn, of Ohio, Orestes Cleveland, of New Jersey, John D. Cray, of California, Robert Lowry, of Iowa, and Robert Mallory, of Kentucky, Director General, Alfred T. Goshorn, Secretary, John L. Campbell, of Indiana. Assistant Secretary, Dorsey Gardner, Counselor and Solicitor, John L. Shoemaker. Details of organization and management were vested in an executive committee. On June 1, 1872, Congress passed an act creating the Centennial Board of Finance, with large powers. This board estimated that the cost of the exhibition would be $10 million, and apportioned shares of capital stock for this amount among the several states and territories, on the basis of population. Subsequently, a board of revenue was appointed and vested with authority to collect subscriptions and other funds. Despite the financial panic of the summer of 1873, Preparations progressed so favorably that on July 3 President Grant issued a proclamation reciting that the 100th anniversary of the independence of the United States would be celebrated by holding an international exhibition of arts, manufactures, and the products of the soil and mine, in Philadelphia, in 1876, opening April 19 and closing October 19, and inviting the nations of the world to take part in both the celebration and the exhibition. In response to a formal invitation issued by the Secretary of State, 32 foreign governments sent favorable replies for themselves and their colonies. The city of Philadelphia placed at the disposal of the commissioners a tract in Fairmount Park, aggregating 236 acres, for the principal buildings. And also made proportionately large allotments for the exhibition of livestock and agricultural implements. Five principal buildings were erected. The main exhibition building was in the form of a parallelogram, 1880 feet long and 464 feet wide, with projections at the center of the longest sides 416 feet long, and at the center of the short ones 216 feet long. The building was erected on piers of masonry, wrought iron columns supporting wrought iron roof trusses forming the superstructure, the sides of which for some distance above the ground were finished between the columns with paneled brickwork. This building covered 21.47 acres, had a floor space of 936,008 square feet, and cost $1,600,000. The Art Gallery in Memorial Hall, designed to be a permanent structure, was erected on an eminence in the Lansdowne Plateau. It is built of granite, glass, and iron, in the modern Renaissance style of architecture, on a terrace several feet above the level of the plateau, and cost $1,500,000. The dimensions are, length, 365 feet, width, 210 feet, height, 59 feet. From the center of the structure rises a dome of iron and glass, 150 feet in height, surmounted by a figure of Columbia with outstretched hands. This building was erected by the state of Pennsylvania, and is now used as a permanent art and industrial museum. Machinery Hall was 1,402 feet long and 360 feet wide, with an annex on the south side 210 by 208 feet, and the main building and annex had together a floor space of 558,440 square feet, or nearly 13 acres. The total cost was $792,000. Horticultural Hall, near the Art Gallery, was built by the City of Philadelphia for permanent uses. It exhibits the Moorish architecture of the 12th century, is 383 feet long by 193 feet wide, and is 72 feet high to the top of the lantern. Its cost was $251,937.
The agricultural building was erected of wood and glass, the ground plan showing a parallelogram 630 feet long by 465 feet wide, and a nave 826 feet long and 100 feet wide crossed by three transepts, and cost about $356,000. Other noteworthy edifices were the United States Government Building, 504 feet long by 300 feet wide, prepared to exhibit the various functions of the public service. The Women's Pavilion, covering an area of an acre, and with its exhibits of woman's handiwork from the 15 leading nations of the world constituting the first display of the kind ever attempted on a large scale. 26 buildings erected by state and territorial governments, and many others put up by foreign governments or exhibitors. Before the exhibition closed there were more than 200 buildings on the ground. An interesting feature of this exhibition was the observance of state days, when the governors of the states, with their official staffs and a large following of citizens, made ceremonial visits and held receptions in the several state buildings. There were also numerous other special days, when hosts of people united in a common interest, religious, fraternal, social, military, aquatic, or educational, added thousands to the ordinary attendance. During the exhibition 9,910,966 persons entered the grounds, of whom 7,250,620 paid the full rate of 50 cents, 753,634 paid 25 cents each, and 1,906,692 had free entry. The exhibition represented an outlay of all kinds and by all interests of about $20 million. The United States government aided it with a loan of $1,500,000, which was repaid. The state of Pennsylvania appropriated $1 million, and the city of Philadelphia gave $1,500,000. From every point of view it was an unqualified success. Two years after the Centennial Exposition another one was held in Paris, which not only exceeded all previous ones in that city in size and magnificence, but made an unprecedented display of works of art and literature. On this occasion about 100 acres were set apart for the various buildings, the exhibitors numbered some 80,000, the gross receipts were upward of $2,500,000, and 16,032,725 visitors were registered. The Third World's Exhibition in the United States was held in New Orleans during the winter of 1884-85, and was planned to commemorate the centennial of the first export of cotton from America. The conception was an outgrowth of the exposition in Philadelphia, and was first carried out on a limited scale in Atlanta in 1881, and on a larger one in Louisville in 1883. Under the belief that the cotton centennial should be celebrated in the chief city of the cotton belt, the National Cotton Planters Association joined heartily in the scheme suggested by Major E. A. Burke, of New Orleans, for a universal exhibition in that city, in which the great industry of the southern states should play the most prominent part. Congress aided the movement by an act incorporating the world's industrial and cotton centennial exposition, and, further, made a loan of $1 million and appropriated $300,000 for a federal building. Railroad and other corporations subscribed for $500,000 in stock, the state of Louisiana appropriated $100,000, and the city of New Orleans contributed a similar sum for the erection of a permanent horticultural hall. Formal invitations were sent out to all foreign governments by the State Department at Washington, Commissioners were appointed for the several states and territories, and the time of the exposition was fixed for December 1, 1884, to May 31, 1885. The site selected was the Upper City Park, an unimproved tract of 245 acres, and in its center was erected the main building, a structure built wholly of wood, 1,378 feet long and 905 feet wide, and with a continuous roof principally of glass. The entire building covered a space of 33 acres. A music hall capable of seating 11,000 persons was constructed in the center of this building, and a machinery hall in the rear. An extension at the southern end, 570 by 120 feet, was devoted to mills and factories in operation, and at right angles with this extension was a building given up to sawmills. 
The federal building, planned for the exhibits of the United States government and of the states, was 885 feet long by 565 feet wide, and in general style and construction conformed to the main building. Horticultural Hall, built of iron and glass, is 600 feet long, 100 feet wide in main structure, and has a central transept carrying out the extreme width to 194 feet. The art building, of corrugated iron and glass, stood nearly in front of the main building, and was 250 long by 100 feet wide, with a rotunda 50 feet square in the center. Two other noteworthy buildings were erected by the Mexican government, one in the style of a native hacienda, with an interior gallery for the display of horticulture and bird life, the other for native minerals. Excluding those of Mexico, the various buildings covered an area of 2,673,588 square feet, or 62 acres, and all buildings covered about 76 acres. Among the special features of this exposition were the display of woman's work, under charge of Mrs. Julia Ward Howe, of the work of the colored race, under charge of the late Blanche K. Bruce. Of the cultivation of cotton and manufacture of the fiber, and of the cultivation, harvesting, and preparation for market of rice and sugar. On May 5, 1889, another universal exposition was opened in Paris. This was also a commemorative one, marking the centennial of the French Revolution, and because of its political character only the United States and Switzerland accorded it official recognition. Although most of the European governments encouraged individual participation. The exposition, despite this feature, was a grand success because of its unusual extent and comprehensiveness and its distinctive features. This exposition cost $8,600,000, and had about 60,000 exhibitors and more than 28 million reported visitors, the greater number, of course, being French. The making of the world's Columbian Exposition, to commemorate the discovery of America by Columbus, began soon after the close of the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. It was at first proposed to create a permanent exposition, to be held in Washington in 1892, to illustrate the progress of North, Central, and South America, and a board of promotion was organized. By 1889, however, a strong popular sentiment had been aroused for a more comprehensive display, and citizens of Washington, New York, Chicago, and St. Lewis vied with each other in pressing on a special committee of the United States Senate the advantages of their respective cities. A certificate to the effect that subscriptions to the amount of $5 million had been made in Chicago decided the controversy in favor of that city. On April 25, 1890, Congress passed an act giving a legal status to a world's Columbian exposition, to be held under the auspices and supervision of the United States government, the organizing corporation to guarantee the subscription of $10,000.000 and the payment of $500,000 before the national commissioners should officially recognize the site offered by the corporation for the exposition. On December 24, following, President Harrison announced the forthcoming exposition, to be opened on May 1, 1893, and invited the nations of the world to participate in it. Congress appropriated in various sums a total of $3,238,250 in money and authorized the coining of 5 million souvenir 50-cent pieces in silver to be sold for the benefit of the exposition. The management was vested in a national commission of two representatives of each state and territory and of the District of Columbia, and eight from the country at large. The site was Jackson Park, on the shore of Lake Michigan, to which was added the Midway Plaisance tract of 80 acres, making an aggregate ground area of 633 acres. On the main ground more than 150 noteworthy buildings were erected. The Midway Plaisance was devoted to amusements and the illustration of the manners and customs of the world. Here, the most conspicuous of a multitude of great and curious objects was the gigantic revolving and passenger-carrying Ferris wheel. All of the exposition buildings proper were constructed of wood, iron, and glass, in combination with a material known as staff, made by uniting plaster and jute fiber in water, in the form of a paste. As all exterior surfaces were painted white, the exposition grounds became popularly known as the White City. The principal buildings, with their cost, 
were those of manufactures and liberal arts, the largest of all, 1687 by 787 feet, $1,500,000. Machinery, $1,285,000, fine arts, $670,000, agriculture, $618,000, administration, $435,000, electricity, $401,000, United States government, $400,000, livestock, $385,000, transportation, $370,000, horticulture, $300,000, mines, $265,000. Fisheries, $224,000, women's, $138,000, forestry, $100,000, and a brick imitation of a modern United States battleship, with complete armament and equipment, $100,000. Foreign governments appropriated a total of $6,571,520 for their respective buildings and exhibits, France leading with $650,000, and being followed by Japan, $630,000, Brazil, $600,000, Germany, $214,200, and Austria, $149,100. And the states and territories, a total of $6,020,850. The entire cost of construction was $18,322,622. According to the original Act of Congress, the buildings then completed were dedicated on Columbus Day, October 21, 1892, with prayer, music, and an oration by Chauncey M. Depew, and during that week a number of state buildings were also dedicated. The exposition was formally opened with exceedingly brilliant ceremonies on May 1, 1893, and was closed with an entire lack of formality on October 30, following, in consequence of the assassination of Carter Harrison, mayor of Chicago. Two days before. Up to November 12, the receipts from all sources aggregated $33,290,065, and the expenditures, $31,117,353. The total number of paid admissions, excluding those prior to the opening and after the closing, was 21,477,218, and of all, 27,529,400. Smallest single day number, 10,791, largest, on Chicago Day, 729,203. In all, there were 65,422 exhibitors, and medals were awarded to 23,757 of them, the jury examining and reporting on more than 250,000 separate exhibits. Present space will only permit the briefest summarizing of this greatest of all international expositions hitherto held, matchless in extent, in completeness of composition, in grandeur of setting. A pleasing evidence of the influence the undertaking was expected to yield is found in the remarkably large number of international congresses that were held during its progress. This feature alone called for 1245 separate sessions, at which there were 5,974 speakers and a special attendance of more than 700,000 persons, chiefly adults. Almost every conceivable branch of human thought and effort had its individual congress. Particularly noticeable among these formal gatherings was the Parliament of Religions, in which Christian, Protestant, Catholic, Jew, and Buddhist expounded their doctrinal beliefs and narrated the story of their sectarian progress and hopes. The Cotton States and International Exposition, opened in Atlanta on September 18, 1895, had its origin in two purposes, the first, to give the industrial conditions of the southern states a more adequate display than they had at Chicago. Owing to the constitutional inability of their legislatures to appropriate public money for such a purpose. The second, to promote larger trade relations between the South and the Latin American republics and with Europe. It was set on foot by private enterprise, and received its largest official aid from the City Council of Atlanta, which appropriated $75,000. Piedmont Park, a tract of 189 acres, two miles from the center of the city, and memorable because traversed by the rifle pits over which General Sherman threw shells into the city 31 years before, was selected as the site. In a natural dip of the ground an artificial lake was constructed, covering 13 acres, 
and around it the principal buildings were erected. Not only the southern, but many of the northern and western states aided the enterprise with special buildings and exhibits. Of the thirteen large buildings, that of the United States government occupied the most conspicuous site. The administration building was a reproduction of portions of Blarney Castle, the Tower of London, Warwick Castle, the Rheinstein in Germany, and St. Michael's, on the coast of Brittany. On a considerable elevation was the auditorium, a four-story building with a dome surmounted by a statue of music. The largest building was that devoted to manufactures and liberal arts, and the most original of all in design was the one set apart for minerals and forestry, which was constructed entirely of wood from the different southern states in its natural condition, with the bark on. The fine arts and the woman's buildings were the showiest, and the Negro building was made attractive by specimens of the industry of Negroes in fourteen states. The exposition was closed December 31st, and cost about $2 million. The International Exposition at Nashville, open from May 1st to October 30th, 1897, was a commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the admission of Tennessee into the Union and had for its special attraction a reproduction of a number of notable buildings of antiquity. The original plan provided for an exposition in 1896, the true centennial year, but the projectors encountered unusual opposition in their efforts to procure the necessary funds. And it was not till early in 1897 that the incorporators were able to begin the creation of the centennial city. West Side Park, a former racecourse in the suburbs of Nashville, with many natural attractions in running water and forest growths, was selected as the site. And Centennial City was made for the brief time of the exposition a full-fledged municipality, with a mayor, board of aldermen, and a combined police and fire department. The reproduction of notable buildings showed on a reduced scale the Parthenon, the Pyramid of Cheops, the Alamo of Texas, the Blue Grotto of Capri, a glimpse of the Rialto of Venice, and, in the beautiful main entrance a type of early Egyptian architecture. A flagstaff 250 feet high, cotton and tobacco fields, Venetian gondolas, vanity fair, a typical Chinese farm, an abundance of statues of classical and mythological subjects, waterfall and old-time will at work, Lake Catherine, Ellen Island. The umbrella fountain, and a large field for athletic sports, were among the pleasurable features. The state made a strong showing of its industrial development and of its riches yet in reserve. In all 190 acres of ground were occupied. The total receipts were $1,087,227, and the expenditures balanced to a cent. A unique expense feature was that, excluding the preliminary work, the women raised the money and paid the entire running cost of the woman's department. The turnstiles registered 1,886,714 entrances. This exposition was succeeded in 1898 by the Trans-Mississippi and International Exposition at Omaha, an undertaking designed to show what had been accomplished by the pioneers and their children in the great Trans-Mississippi Valley. And especially in a state that 43 years before was an unorganized territory in the vast tract known as the Louisiana Purchase. The site was a plateau just north of the city, and in planning the display every consideration was given to originality. Excepting that the grounds constituted a second white city, from the use of staff, as at Chicago, every feature of design and construction possessed striking elements of difference from all similar efforts in the past. The management was under the presidency of Gordon W. Waddles, and the exposition was formally opened by President McKinley who, in the White House at Washington, pressed an electric button that started the great engine. The United States government erected a building of the classic style, following the Ionic Order. It was surmounted by a colossal dome supporting a copy of Bartholdi's statue of Liberty Enlightening the World, and had a floor space for exhibits of about 50,000 square feet. The government also recognized the importance of the event by issuing a special set of commemorative postage stamps. Fine arts was exhibited in a twin-domed building, a structure in two parts, with an elaborate peristyle between them, and all under one great roof. What afforded the masses the greatest delight were the ethnological exhibits and the instructive and amusing scenes on the Midway Reserve. These included an Indian village, 
with representatives from every tribe between Alaska and Florida, a Chinese village, an Arabian encampment, a Moorish town, a Swiss village, a Cairo street, the entertaining Egyptian pyramid. And the gigantic passenger carrying Sherman umbrella, a mechanical marvel operated by electricity, and 100 feet higher than the Ferris wheel of Chicago. There was also a picturesque lagoon or canal, half a mile long and 150 feet wide at its narrowest part, terminating in an artificial lake trefoil in shape and 400 feet across. The exposition was opened on June 1st and was closed on October 31st. In that time it was visited by more than 2,600,000 people, the largest single-day attendance being 98,785. The total receipts were not quite $2 million, and the expenditures were about $1,500,000. This completes the record of the most notable expositions and the incidental history of their development, from the commercial fair of the previous century up to near the close of 1899. There remains to note a form of permanent exhibition that has been purposely reserved for this point. The Commercial Museum, of which Philadelphia has the two most effective examples in existence, is a purely commercial development, yet an educational textbook of unique and extraordinary compass. Though the Philadelphia Commercial Museum and the similar department of the Philadelphia Bourse were both projected before the foreign trade of the United States had reached the enormous volume that caused wonder and alarm alike all over the world. Both have had a powerful, direct, and immediate influence in bringing about a greater appreciation abroad of American products. The commercial museums stand between the American producer and the foreign factor. They inform the former where special articles are needed and the latter of reputable firms who can supply their needs. By a large corps of traveling agents, an enormous correspondence, and a direct cooperation with the State Department and its representatives, these museums keep in the closest possible touch with the commercial interests of the world. All this is independent of the exhibition feature, a vast department in which the principal economic productions, first of the United States and then correspondingly of the world, are spread before the eye of the visitor. In this connection should also be noted the fact that many of our commercial representatives abroad have established at their headquarters collections of American products that are particularly needed in their respective localities. In all of the foregoing a single text has been kept in mind, what has been the influence of the fair, the exhibition, the international exposition. Ready answers have been suggested by the several items of cost and attendance. Another answer may be divined in their frequency and universality. And at the close of this survey of more than a hundred years, probably the best answer of all is to be found in the efforts in this line with which one century is closed and another opened. These include the Greater American Exposition at Omaha, July-November, 1899, a commercial success, and a revelation of Trans-Mississippi pioneering enterprise. This was supplemented by the Export Exposition and World's Commercial Congress, the first of the kind ever held under the joint auspices of the Commercial Museum and the Franklin Institute of Philadelphia, in that city, in September-November, 1899. Then followed the Universal Exposition in Paris, in 1900. It was regarded as especially elaborate and successful. It beautified the Champ de Mars and placed the invalids with handsome industrial palaces, brought into permanent existence the two palaces of fine arts and the Alexander III. Bridge, lined the banks of the Seine with the Street of Nations, and swarmed the Trocadero with the world's colonization. Over 50 million witnessed its panoramic scenes. Its expense was largely provided for by prior sales of tickets on a bonded plan. The century turned with a perspective of the Pan American Exposition at Buffalo and International at Glasgow in 1901. The Ohio Centennial and International at Toledo in 1902, the International at Liege, Belgium, in 1903, and the Louisiana Purchase Centennial at St. Louis in 1904. The Century's Progress in Coinage, Currency, and Banking By H. O. N. Bradford Rhodes Editor of Bankers Magazine I. Banks and Banking Resources the history of nation-building contains no parallel to the progress and development of the United States in the past 100 years. And the most accurate and striking indication of this remarkable growth may be seen in the evolution of our currency and banking systems. 
As the variations in temperature and the changes in atmospheric pressure are measured by the thermometer and barometer, so are the fluctuations in a country's wealth gauged by the banks and other financial institutions. Likewise the degree of civilization to which a country has attained is reflected by the perfection of its monetary machinery. After having tried nearly every unwise experiment condemned by the teachings of history, the United States has finally reached a position where its currency meets the two fundamental requirements of sound finance, namely. 1. The standard of value is that in use among the great commercial states of the world. 2. All of the currency is either directly or indirectly convertible into the standard coin. Despite some minor faults in our financial system which make the maintenance of the parity of the several kinds of currency a cumbersome and expensive operation, and prevent the banks from rendering that full degree of assistance to commerce and industry which they would afford under laws that did not unnecessarily restrict their rightful functions. All our money responds to the two essential tests, safety and convertibility. While the banks have been among the most powerful factors in placing the United States in the front rank of the nations of the earth, our finances may be likened to a triangle, of which the base, the gold standard, has been in actual existence since 1879, much longer than that in law, and the other side, safety, also assured. Wanting but another addition, elasticity, to complete the symmetrical and perfect figure. That this last requisite of a sound currency will be supplied by the wisdom and ingenuity of our people, is not to be doubted. There are two respects in which the financial policy of the United States is unique in comparison with most other great commercial countries. First, its gold reserve is unprotected by the devices in use elsewhere, as it does not charge a premium on gold as the Bank of France does when gold is wanted for export. Nor can it protect the gold reserve by raising the rate of discount as the great banks of Europe may do. Second, banking is practically free and anti-monopolistic. Under these conditions we have reached a place that may well excite the astonishment of the old world countries. Our stock of metallic money, as estimated by the director of the Mint, in 1898, was $925 million in gold and $638 million in silver. No other nation owned so much gold. Only one, China, owned as much silver, but it had no gold and the per capita of silver in China is only $1.96 against $8.56 in the United States. Our stock of gold is more than double that of Great Britain, greater by a hundred millions than that of France, and also exceeds that of Germany and Russia. Of our silver stock, $561,500,000 is a full legal tender, and $76,700,000 a limited legal tender, the latter some representing the subsidiary coins. In our banking power the situation is equally fortunate. Mulhall defines banking power as the paid-up capital of banks, the deposits exclusive of savings banks, and the amount of convertible paper money. In the two great essentials of financial strength, the quantity of metallic money and banking power, we have far outstripped every other nation. This is an unfailing sign of our advance toward a position of commercial and industrial supremacy. The scepter of financial power has crossed the Atlantic from Europe to the New World. We are gradually acquiring command of the world's markets. And in time we shall see our banks, ever the handmaids of commerce, extending their operations to the most distant quarters of the earth and carrying everywhere the beneficent influences of modern civilization. New York as a financial center has been growing with astonishing rapidity in recent years. From 1879 to 1899 the banks belonging to the New York Clearinghouse Association increased their deposits from $254,700,000 to $910,500,000, and their specie, chiefly gold, from $54,700,000 to $202,600,000. The latter item having about doubled in the past two years, being $104,700,000 in 1897 and $202,600,000, as above stated, in 1899. The aggregate of banking institutions in the city, national banks, state banks, trust companies, and savings banks, exclusive of private banking firms, had, about January 1, 1899, capital, surplus, 
and profits amounting to $311,600,000. Deposits of $2,047,800,000, and total resources of nearly $2,500,000,000. One bank, the National City, with over $144 million of deposits, is the largest in the United States. While the Bowery Savings Bank, with 121,000 depositors and $67 million of deposits, is the largest of its kind in the country. There were 3,582 national banks that reported, and 5,903 other banks, a total of 9,485. The total banking funds, that is, capital, surplus and profits, and individual deposits, of all banks reporting, amounted to $7,416,355,568. We cannot get a correct understanding of these figures without going back to earlier dates and making comparisons. In 1798 there were 25 state banks in the country, against 3965 reporting to the Comptroller of the Currency in 1898, which is perhaps about 90% of the total of such institutions now existing. A hundred years ago the capital of the state banks was less than 20 millions, compared with $233,971,643 now reported. They had, all told, but $14 million of specie, half as much as is now held by one New York City bank alone. Their circulation was only $9 million, compared with more than $200 million of national bank circulation now outstanding. The national banks also show a remarkable growth. In 1869 there were 1,620 banks in operation, reporting $420,800,000 capital, $547,900,000 individual deposits, $17,500,000 specie, and $1,517,700,000 total resources. Thirty years later the number of banks had increased to 3590, while the capital was $608,300,000, the individual deposits $2,232,100,000, and specie $371,843,400, while the total resources had increased to $4,403,800,000. The total wealth of the United States in 1895 was estimated at more than $80 billion, far exceeding in the aggregate that of any other country in the world. It is expected that the census of 1900 will show our total wealth to be more than $100 billion, or probably double that of Great Britain, the next richest nation. But while the nation is piling up wealth at an unexampled rate, it cannot be said that this is a land where wealth accumulates and men decay. Great in its material resources, the country was never before stronger in those elements which constitute the chief reliance of national power. A united citizenship, possessing an honesty that adversity cannot sully and an intelligence that when once aroused penetrates the most cunningly concealed economic sophistries. Working out the problems of the future under laws and conditions assuring to the individual the largest opportunities, points to a development in the 20th century in no wise inferior to that of the hundred years preceding. 2. Coinage and production of precious metals. The prevailing systems of coinage in this country and among all great commercial nations are the result of development and growth. Gold and silver have become the principal money metals by a process of natural selection, which has chosen the instruments best suited to the purpose. In recent years, and under the laws of development, nearly all the great trading countries of the world have selected gold as the standard of value. In the future, gold itself may give way to something better, for it only relatively meets the essentials of a perfect standard. Among Greeks, Romans, and Oriental peoples, cattle were generally used as a standard of value. The modern rupee of India is the old Sanskrit word rupa, a herd. Capital is but the estimate of Roman riches in cattle. The Latin pecus, cattle, is the root of pecunia, riches, and the origin of our word pecuniary. The Icelanders measured values in dried fish, the Hudson Bay country in skins, the early Virginians in tobacco, the Indians of the United States and Canada in wampum the Chinese, even in recent times, in squares of pressed tea. The Africans in bars of salt and slaves. 
these primitive devices gradually gave way, under the demands of international trade, to the use of metals as standards of value. Tin, copper, gold, silver, and iron all were used, and, at first, passed by weight. Government coinage of money is thought to date from the 7th century BC and is credited to the Lydians and to Phidon of Argos, the official stamp being a guarantee of the honesty, weight, and purity of the coins. Modern coinage dates from the reformation of the coinage of Rome under Constantine, who introduced the gold solidus of $3.02 in value, and a silver coin of like weight but of relative value. After the time of Julian, this silver piece, called Siliqua, was given such value as that 24 of them equaled a gold solidus. In the Frankish Empire, under the Merovingian kings, the relative values of the solidus and siliqua fluctuated greatly. In the 8th century, on account of the scarcity of gold, there was a gradual transition to the silver standard, and a silver unit, also called a solidus, was substituted for the gold solidus, the former being divided into 12 pence. This silver solidus afterwards became the shilling of England and Germany. At first 300 pence were coined out of a pound of silver, but under Pepin the number was reduced to 22 solidi of 12 pence each, 264 pence, out of a pound of silver. Under Charlemagne it was provided that only 240 pence, or 20 solidi of account, should be stamped out of a pound of silver, and this system was introduced, with more or less success, in what is now France and Germany. As to form, it has remained, up to the most recent period, the basis not only of the countries of Charlemagne's empire but of England. After the time of Henry VIII came a period of coinage debasement which culminated in 1551. A thorough coinage reform was effected under Elizabeth in 1560. The first large coinages of gold in England were made under James I. These continued until the death of William III, in 1701. Still, Silver continued to be the standard metal, and in 1695 another attempt was made to reform the currency by a recoinage of the silver pieces, most of which had been clipped or worn, into a new full-weight silver coin. These, however, were soon exported, in spite of a reduction of the current value of the guinea, in 1717. The gold standard in England gained a nearly complete victory by Act of Parliament in 1774, which provided that silver coins not of full weight, there were hardly any others, need not be accepted in payments of more than £25. Except by weight. This provision, after several renewals, became permanent in 1798. In 1797 coinage of silver was suspended, and the single gold standard practically introduced, though its operation was somewhat interfered with by the existence of a paper currency. In 1816 the present English monetary system was introduced. It held fast to the gold standard, by the provision that silver pieces should be used only as divisional coins, and with a legal tender power limited to 40 shillings. Properly speaking, there was no coinage in the United States during the colonial period. Maryland had a mint at one time, and one or two of the other states, but they practically amounted to nothing. In the early colonial period the substitutes for coins were wampum and bullets, as in Massachusetts, skins and furs, as in New York, tobacco, as in Maryland and Virginia. The coins in use before the Revolution were, to some extent, those of England, but more largely those of Spain, circulated in South America and traveling up to the United States. The unit of account was the Spanish mill dollar or piece of eight, though, up to 1775, accounts were kept in pounds, shillings, and pence, a pound consisting, then as now, of twenty shillings and a shilling of twelve pence colonial or pound currency. For pounds of this colonial currency were reckoned as equal to three pounds sterling. This colonial composite system of current coins was regulated by coinage tariffs. Such a tariff, issued in 1750, valued one ounce of silver at six shillings and eight pence, the Spanish mill dollar at six shillings, the guinea at twenty-eight shillings, and the English crown at six shillings and eight pence. All foreign coins were valued in proportion to the value of the Spanish piece of eight. Some of the colonies stamped the shilling, which constituted a large part of the money in circulation. 
It, however, varied greatly in value in the different colonies. Thus, the Spanish dollar equaled five shillings in Georgia, eight in North Carolina and New York, six in Virginia, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. Seven and sixpence in Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, thirty-two and sixpence in South Carolina. The Spanish dollar itself, with which these comparisons were made, was frequently below legal weight, and, therefore, varied in value. Where the pieces mentioned in the tariff of 1776 were a full weight, the ratio there established was the English ratio of 1 to 15.21, the ratio for bullion being nearly the same. After the tariff of 1776 had been in operation for six years, the colonies began to feel keenly the difficulties caused by the variety of coins constituting their metallic circulating medium. And the need of a special American coinage was frequently expressed. In 1782, Robert Morris, Superintendent of Finance, submitted to the Congress of the Confederation a scheme for a national coinage and the establishment of an American mint, which met with approval. Jefferson recommended the decimal system, with the dollar as the unit. Neither of these proposals was carried into effect till, in 1786, the Congress of the Confederation chose as the monetary unit of the United States the dollar of 375. 64 grains of pure silver, which unit had its origin in the Spanish piaster or mill dollar, then the basis of the metallic circulation of the English colonies in America. This American dollar was never coined, there not being at the time a mint in the United States. The Act of April 2, 1792, established the first monetary system of the United States. The basis of the system were, the gold dollar, containing 24. 75 grains of pure gold, and stamped in pieces of $10, $5, and $2.50, denominated respectively eagles, half-eagles, and quarter-eagles, the silver dollar, containing 371.25 grains of pure silver. A mint was established. The coinage was unlimited, and there was no mint charge. The ratio of gold to silver in coinage was 115. Both gold and silver were legal tender. The standard was double point for the Act of 1792 undervalued gold, which was therefore exported. The Act of June 28, 1834, was passed to remedy this by changing the mint ratio between the metals to 1 minute and 16.02 seconds. The latter act fixed the weight of the gold dollar at 25.8 grains, but lowered the fineness from 0 0.916 two thirds to 0 0.899225. The fine weight of the gold dollar was thus reduced to 23.2 grains. The Act of 1834 undervalued silver as that of 1792 had undervalued gold, and silver was attracted to Europe by the more favorable ratio of 1 to 15 one half. The Act of January 18, 1837, was passed to make the fineness of the gold and silver coins uniform. The legal weight of the gold dollar was fixed at 25.8 grains, and its fine weight at 23.22 grains. The fineness was therefore changed by this act to 0 0.900 and the ratio to 1 to 15.988 plus. Silver continued to be exported. The act of February 21, 1853, reduced the weight of the silver coins of a denomination less than $1, which the acts of 1792, 1834, and 1837 had made exactly proportional to the weight of the silver dollar and provided that they should be legal tender to the amount of only $5. Under the Acts of 1792, 1834, and 1837 they had been full legal tender. By the Act of 1853 the legal weight of the half dollar was reduced to 192 grains, and other fractions of the dollar in proportion. The coinage of the fractional parts of the dollar was reserved to the government. The Act of February 12, 1873, provided that the unit of value of the United States should be the gold dollar of the standard weight of 25.8 grains, and that there should be coined besides the following gold coins, a quarter eagle, or two and a half dollar gold piece, a three dollar gold piece, a half eagle, or five dollar piece, an eagle, or ten dollar piece. And a double eagle, or twenty dollar piece, 
all of a standard weight proportional to that of the dollar piece. These coins were made legal tender in all payments at their nominal value when not below the standard weight and limit of tolerance provided in the act for the single piece. And when reduced in weight they should be legal tender at a valuation in proportion to their actual weight. The silver coins provided for by the act were a trade dollar, a half dollar or fifty cent piece, a quarter dollar, and a ten cent piece, the weight of the trade dollar to be 420 grains troy, the half dollar, twelve and a half grams. The quarter dollar and dime, respectively, one half and one fifth of the weight of the half dollar. The silver coins were made legal tender at their nominal value for any amount not exceeding five dollars in any one payment. Owners of silver bullion were allowed to deposit it at any mint of the United States to be formed into bars or into trade dollars, and no deposit of silver for other coinage was to be received. Section 2 of the Joint Resolution of July 22, 1876, recited that the trade dollar should not thereafter be legal tender. And that the Secretary of the Treasury should be authorized to limit the coinage of the same to an amount sufficient to meet the export demand for it. The Act of March 3, 1887, retired the trade dollar and prohibited its coinage. That of September 26, 1890, discontinued the coinage of the $1 and $3 gold pieces. The Act of February 28, 1878, directed the coinage of silver dollars of the weight of 412 and a half grains troy of standard silver, as provided in the Act of January 18, 1837, and that such coins, with all silver dollars theretofore coined, should be legal tender at their nominal value for all debts and dues, public and private, except where otherwise expressly stipulated in the contract. The Secretary of the Treasury was authorized and directed by the first section of the Act to purchase from time to time silver bullion at the market price thereof, not less than $2 million worth nor more than $4 million worth per month. And to cause the same to be coined monthly, as fast as purchased, into such dollars. A subsequent Act, that of July 14, 1890, enacted that the Secretary of the Treasury should purchase silver bullion to the aggregate amount of 4,500,000 ounces, or so much thereof as might be offered, each month, at the market price thereof. Not exceeding one dollar. Zero zero for three hundred and seventy-one. Twenty-five grains of pure silver, and to issue in payment thereof Treasury notes of the United States, such notes to be redeemable by the government, on demand, in coin, and to be legal tender in payment of all debts, public and private. Except where otherwise expressly stipulated in the contract. The Act directed the Secretary of the Treasury to coin each month two million ounces of the silver bullion purchased under the provisions of the Act into standard silver dollars until July 1, 1891, and thereafter as much as might be necessary. To provide for the redemption of the Treasury notes issued under the Act. The Purchasing Clause of the Act of July 14, 1890, was repealed by the Act of November 1, 1893. The War Revenue Act of June 13, 1898, authorized and directed the coinage of standard silver dollars to the amount of not less than one and one half million dollars a month, from the bullion in the Treasury purchased under the Act of July 14, 1890. The Act of June 9, 1879, made the subsidiary silver coins of the United States legal tender to the amount of $10. The minor coins are legal tender to the amount of 25 cents. At this writing the report of the director of the mint has not been published, but the coinage for the full year 1897 may be stated as follows, gold, $76,028,484, silver, $18,486,697, and for the year 1898, gold, $77,985,757, silver, $23,034,034. From January 1 to June 30, 1899, the coinage was, gold, $65,915,020, silver, $12,780,441. It is sometimes thought that the silver dollars are not a full legal tender, but this is not so. They are an unlimited legal tender for all debts, public and private. The Treasury does not, in practice, redeem silver dollars in gold, 
but successive secretaries of the Treasury have announced their readiness to do so, if necessary to keep the silver dollars from depreciating, that is, preserve their parity. Which the law directs. Silver certificates and gold certificates are not legal tender, but entitle the holder to receive the kind and amount of coin named on their face. The value of gold bullion in a dollar of that metal is 99.991125 cents, or practically 100 cents. The value of the silver bullion in a dollar of that metal is about 45 cents. It varies, however, with the fluctuations in the market value of silver. It will thus be seen that the bullion value of a silver dollar and of a gold dollar differs greatly, but the equality of the purchasing power of the two coins is due to the fact that the silver dollars are receivable for public and private debts. That they are indirectly exchangeable for gold, by depositing them in the banks, and that the government is pledged to redeem them in gold, if necessary to preserve their parity with gold. As early as 1826 the United States began to export domestic gold, beginning with an export of $1,056,088 of gold coin and bullion, and receiving an import of $678,740. Up to 1897 the grand total of exports of gold coin and bullion amounted to $2,186,238,541, and the total imports to $1,112,138,766, an excess of exports over imports of $1,074,099,775. In 1898 the imports of gold coin and bullion into the United States were $120,391,674, and the exports $15,406,391, making the net imports $104,985,283. From 1821 to 1897 the grand total of exports of silver coin and bullion from the United States was 1,152,688,776 dollars, and the import 730,325,881 dollars, making an excess of exports over imports of 422,362,895 dollars. In the fiscal year 1898, the silver imports were $30,927,781, and the exports $55,105,239, making the excess of exports $24,177,458. The total product of gold in the United States from 1792 up to 1896 was $2,113,034,769, and of silver $1,444,970,000 making a grand total of the precious metals of $3,558,004,769. The total value of the entire world's production of gold, between the years 1493 and 1896, was $8,983,320,600, and of silver $10,556,700,800 making a grand total of gold and silver of $19,540,021,400. As a comparison of the money status of the United States at the beginning and end of the century, the following figures are interesting, in 1800 the population was 5,308,483, the estimated bank notes outstanding, $10,500,000. The estimated specie in the country, $17,500,000, the total money in the United States, $28,000,000, the specie in the Treasury, $1,500,000, the money in circulation, $26,500,000, the amount per capita, $4.99. In 1898 the population was 74,522,000. The total coin in the United States, including bullion in the Treasury, $1,498,993,249, total paper money, $1,138,440,126, total money of all kinds, $2,637,433,375, coin, bullion, and paper money in the Treasury, $2,637,433,375, 
$799,537,480. Total circulation, $1,837,859,895, circulation per capita, $24.66. Perhaps no law relating to the coins and currency of the United States has been so widely discussed, or has borne more directly on the attitude and influence of political parties than the Coinage Act of 1873. This act grew out of a proposition to revise our coinage laws, made by John J. Knox to the Secretary of the Treasury, in April, 1870. Mr. Knox, in his rough draft of a bill, provided for a silver dollar of 384 grains, to be a legal tender for sums not exceeding $5. Thus, the standard silver dollar of 412 and a half grains was eliminated. It did not appear in the bill as it passed the Senate, January 10, 1871, nor in that reported to the House, March 9, 1871. The bill underwent protracted and thorough discussion, and on May 27, 1872, was passed in the House. As passed, it contained the original provision for coining a silver dollar of the weight of 384 grains, twice the weight of the silver half dollar. These dollars were to be a legal tender for amounts not exceeding $5. The Senate amended this House bill, by substituting a trade dollar of the weight of 420 grains for that of 384 grains, at the same time preserving the legal tender limit of $5. In the amended form, it passed the Senate, January 17, 1873, and the House, February 7, 1873, and became a law. It will be seen that the standard silver dollar of 412 and a half grains was never in the bill, and could not, therefore, have been secretly omitted, as was afterwards charged. It was omitted from the first draft, and all through, because none were being coined, and those that had been coined were exported the silver bullion in them being, at that time, worth more as bullion than coin. By joint resolution of Congress, approved July 22, 1876, the trade dollars provided for in the Act were deprived of their legal tender quality. It was supposed they would circulate in China, but they proved useless even for that purpose. 3. Early Banking in the United States the first banks in the United States owed their origin to Robert Morris and Alexander Hamilton. Morris, as early as 1763, conceived the plan of a bank to assist in developing American trade, and in 1779, Hamilton proposed the organization of the Company of the Bank of the United States. These plans did not mature, but were followed, at the suggestion of Thomas Paine, by an association of 92 subscribers to a fund of £300,000 Pennsylvania currency to support the Revolutionary Army. This association became known as the Pennsylvania Bank. It commenced business July 17, 1780, and after a career of a year and a half, during which time it greatly aided the government in furnishing army supplies, its affairs were wound up. On May 17, 1781, Hamilton presented the plan of a bank to Congress, which was to be truly national, and created avowedly to aid the United States. Its name was to be the Bank of North America, with a subscription of $400,000 in gold and silver, and its notes, payable on demand, to be receivable for duties and taxes in every state. Congress approved the plan, and Morris, then Superintendent of Finance, published it, with an address showing its advantages to the government and people, then suffering from the ill effects of a depreciated currency. The Bank of North America was organized November 1, 1781, and began business January 7, 1782. It creditably fulfilled its mission to aid the United States, and, after the expiration of its charter, became a state institution. In 1864 it entered the national banking system, though retaining its old name. This bank was followed by the Bank of New York, which began business June 9, 1784, and by the Massachusetts Bank, which began business July 5, 1784. First United States Bank. This institution grew out of the recommendations of Alexander Hamilton, and formed a part of his scheme of strengthening the public credit and bringing about a closer union of states. His plan was incorporated into a bill which passed the Senate January 3, 1791, and the House, January 20, 
1791. Washington signed it February 25, 1791. The bill was hotly opposed as unconstitutional by Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, Attorney General Edmund Randolph, and in general by representatives from the southern states. The capital of the bank was fixed at $10 million, one-fifth of which was to be subscribed by the government. The remainder was subscribed by individuals, and two hours after the opening of the books the capital was oversubscribed to the amount of 4,000 shares. The central bank was located at Philadelphia, and afterwards branches were established in New York, Boston, Baltimore, Washington, Norfolk, Charleston, Savannah, and New Orleans. Business was first opened in Carpenters Hall, Philadelphia, December 12, 1791. In July, 1797, the site was removed to a new building on 3rd Street, below Chestnut, and it remained there till the dissolution of the bank, with the exception of a brief removal to Germantown in 1798, during the epidemic of yellow fever. Though this bank proved a profitable enterprise for the government, it failed to secure a renewal of its charter in 1811, chiefly because so many of its shares had passed into foreign hands. Early State Banks From 1790 to 1811 the number of state banks increased from 4 to 88, their circulation from $2,500,000 to $22,700,000, their capital from $2,500,000 to $42,610,000. In the same time the metallic circulation of the country rose from $9,000,000 to $30,000,000. These banks failed to meet the monetary necessities of the War of 1812, and in 1814 practically all of them south of New England suspended specie payments. Their notes were poured out in all denominations from six cents upward, and, with coin redemption stopped, they depreciated rapidly. This led to great financial distress in 1818-1820, and to excessive bank failures. The seriousness of the general situation, and the declining credit of the government, led to the establishment of the Second Bank of the United States. Second Bank of the United States In October, 1814, Secretary Dallas laid a report before Congress, in which he deprecated the uncertain amount and value of the paper currency. There exists, he said, at this time no adequate circulating medium common to the citizens of the United States. The money transactions of private life are at a stand, and the fiscal operations of the government labor with extreme inconvenience. He then recommended as the remedy the establishment of a national banking institution. A bill, based upon Dallas's plan for such an institution, failed of passage in the House in 1814, and again in 1815, though passed by the Senate. It was, however, finally passed in an amended form, but was vetoed by President Madison. On December 24, 1815, Mr. Dallas laid before Congress another plan for a national bank. A bill was framed authorizing such an institution, with a capital of $35 million, $7 million of which were to be subscribed by the government, the central bank to be at Philadelphia, with power to establish branches. Payments to be made in specie at all times unless otherwise authorized by Congress. This bill passed both houses of Congress, and was signed by President Madison, April 10, 1816. When the subscription books of this bank were closed, it was found that the subscriptions fell short of the authorized $35 million by $3 million, which amount was taken by Stephen Girard. The bank could not lend more than $500,000 to the government without authority of Congress, was to be the fiscal agent of the Treasury, and to receive deposits of public monies. No notes of a less denomination than $5.00 were to be issued, and the penalty for refusing to pay notes or deposits in specie on demand was 12% per annum until paid. It began business January 7, 1817. Owing to the impending financial crisis and bad management, the bank verged rapidly toward insolvency, but was resuscitated under the vigorous management of a new president, Langdon Chivas, who was elected March 6, 1819. He was succeeded by Nicholas Biddle in 1823, who was destined to see the fall of the great institution. 
The National Bank incurred the hostility of the state banks, which called it a monster because it refused to allow the notes of the local banks to accumulate as deposits in its branches without redemption. Various states passed discriminating laws against it. Jackson, in his message to Congress in 1829, attacked the constitutionality of the law establishing it, and charged that it had failed in the great end of establishing a uniform and sound currency. At this time the bank was an imposing institution with its capital of $35 million, its public deposits of 6 to 7 million, its private deposits of a like amount, its circulation of $12 million, its annual discounts of $40 million. Its annual profits of over $3 million, its palatial establishment in Philadelphia, its 25 branches throughout the Union, its 500 employees, its stock distributed through nearly all parts of the world. And its notes current at par at home and abroad. Jackson's message was not received favorably by Congress. His aversion, it was thought, was due rather to his belief that the bank was his enemy than to any dislike of a national bank. The growing hostility between him and Henry Clay induced the latter to make the renewal of the bank's charter a political issue. When the bill rechartering the bank was passed in July, 1832, Jackson vetoed it, charging, in the main, that the bank was a monopoly. This brought the question of the further existence of the bank fully into the arena of politics, in the presidential election of 1832, with the hero of New Orleans, on one side, and on the other, monster monopoly, old Nick's money. And, Clay's rags. Jackson won, and speedily decided to remove the public deposits from the bank. This decision precipitated a bitter war between Jackson and Congress. But Jackson did not swerve from his purpose. By 1835 it became apparent that the bank could not secure a renewal of its charter from Congress. As a confession of its defeat, and just 13 days before the expiration of its federal charter, the bank obtained from the state of Pennsylvania, February 18, 1836, a charter for the United States Bank of Pennsylvania. For a period of 30 years. Shorn of its importance, in a restricted field, yet with enormous capital, it fell into large bond and stock investments of questionable value. Its troubles were aggravated by bad management. It suspended during the Panic of 1837 and the next year, and again for the last time in 1841. Biddle resigned the presidency in 1840, and four years later died poor and broken-hearted. Thus perished what is sometimes called the Third Bank of the United States, its predecessor, the Second Bank of the United States, having fallen a victim to political intrigue and loss of prestige. The shareholders lost their entire investment of $28 million, but the circulating notes were all paid, and also the deposits. The government got back its investment of $7 million, and made $6,093,167 besides, from its connection with the bank. State banks and independent treasury. After the removal of deposits from the Bank of the United States, September 26, 1833, the public revenues were deposited in selected state banks, sometimes called pet banks. In 1836-88 state banks in 24 states held public deposits to the amount of $49,377,986. As the state banks had thrown their influence against the national bank, they were rewarded by allowing them to use the public money entrusted to them as a basis of extending their loans and for enormous issues of their own notes. Banks were started for the sole purpose of issuing notes which they could use in buying public lands. As a consequence the government lost heavily through the depreciation of these notes and the failure of the banks. On July 11, 1836, the Secretary of the Treasury issued a circular forbidding the receipt of anything but specie in payment for public lands. This caused a run on the banks and aided in hastening the financial crisis of 1837. An Act of Congress of June 23, 1836, authorizing the calling in of $37,468,859 of the public funds deposited in the state banks, for purposes of distribution, forced the suspension of specie payments by all such banks, with very few exceptions. 
The unsatisfactory trial of both federal and state banks as custodians of the public funds led to the establishment of what became known as the independent treasury system, by which the government collects its money and keeps it in the hands of the United States treasurer or sub-treasurers, making disbursements when required. An act putting this system into effect became law July 4, 1840, but was repealed the next year. It was repassed August 6, 1846, and remained in operation until the passage of the National Currency Act in February, 1863, which gave the Secretary of the Treasury the right to designate certain national banks as depositories of public funds. There were in such banks, on February 4, 1899, United States deposits amounting to $81,120,873, secured by United States bonds belonging to the banks and deposited in the Treasury, amounting to $89,100,240. Prior to the adoption of the national banking system the country had a somewhat disastrous experience with what has been known as wildcat banks. Many of them were organized for the sole purpose of issuing notes they never intended to pay. While they were numerous and dangerous, it must be remembered that in a number of states the leading banks carried on only a legitimate business, and state banks as they exist today compare favorably in their management with the national banks. 4. History of the Legal Tender Note The first act authorizing the issue of legal tender notes, known popularly as greenbacks, was approved by President Lincoln, February 25, 1862. It provided for the issue of $150 million in notes, in denominations of not less than $5. Holders of these notes could deposit them with the United States Treasurer or Assistant Treasurers in any sum not less than $50. Zero, zero, or any multiple thereof, and receive United States bonds bearing 6% interest. The first notes were issued March 10, 1862. An act authorizing a second issue of $150 million was signed by the President, July 11, 1862. Of these $35 million were to be in denominations of less than $5. A third issue of $150 million was authorized March 3, 1863, but this act deprived the legal tender note of its convertibility into 6% bonds at the option of the holder. The withdrawal of this privilege worked no particular hardship at the time, for bond issues and various interest-bearing certificates were plenty during the period of war. But after the war had closed and the issues of new securities had ceased, the absence of this provision began to prevent the absorption of the legal tender notes. The highest amount of legal tender notes outstanding at any date was on January 3, 1864, $449,338,902. Their depreciation was hastened by the issue of the short-time interest-bearing securities in large amounts. During 1862 the average gold premium was 113.3, during 1863, 145.2, during 1864, 203.3. In July, 1864, this premium reached its highest point, an average of 258.1. In 1865 the country began to feel the necessity of a contraction of the currency, with a view to as early a resumption of specie payments as the business interests would permit. And the Congress expressed the public sentiment by an almost unanimous resolution. On March 12, 1866, an act was approved calling for the retirement and cancellation of not more than $10 million of legal tenders within six months, and thereafter not more than $4 million during any one month. The effect was to reduce the legal tenders outstanding on December 31, 1867, to $356 million. This reduction, together with the rapid payment of notes of other classes, used as currency, led to so sudden a contraction of the circulating medium, and such stringency in the money market, that Congress, by Act of February 4, 1868, prohibited the further reduction of the legal tender notes. The amount outstanding, October 1, 1872, was $356 million, and on January 1, 1874, $382,979,815. 
the increase being due to a construction on the part of secretaries of the Treasury to the effect that they had power to reissue retired notes which were held as a reserve. On June 20, 1874, Congress enacted that the United States notes outstanding and to be used as part of the circulating medium should not exceed $382 million, and that no part thereof should be held or used as a reserve. Another attempt was made in 1875 to reduce the aggregate of legal tender notes, preparatory to the resumption of specie payments. The Resumption Act of January 14, 1875, authorized, among other things, the retirement and cancellation of legal tenders till the amount outstanding should be reduced to $300 million. $35,318,984 were retired under this law, but further reduction was prohibited by Act of May 31, 1878. The amount outstanding at that date was $346,681,016, and this has continued to the present time, no new issues having been authorized. On January 1, 1879, the resumption of specie payments took place as provided in the Act of January 14, 1875. At this latter date, the only legal tender coin recognized by law was the gold coin. But, in February, 1878, the coinage of standard silver dollars was authorized, and they were to be a legal tender for all debts, unless otherwise expressly stipulated in the contract. This led to the claim on the part of those who favored silver that the redemption of legal tender notes, provided for in coin in the Act of 1875, could be effected by the use of silver dollars. But the general, and doubtless sound, construction of the law of 1875 has been that it was an express contract to redeem the legal tender notes in the coin then recognized as legal tender, and in no other. And so the Treasury has redeemed legal tenders since 1879, in gold, when the same is demanded. In 1869 the United States Supreme Court, the bench not being full, declared the acts authorizing legal tender notes to be unconstitutional. But subsequently, the bench having its full quota of nine, the court sustained the constitutionality of the acts, on the ground, mainly, that they were a proper exercise of the war power vested in the Congress. In 1883 the court decided that the reissues of these notes, made in time of peace, were constitutional. At the time of the resumption of specie payments there were $135 million in gold and bullion on hand to provide for the redemption of such notes as might be presented. By Act of July 12, 1882, it was provided that when the redemption reserve of gold coin and bullion in the Treasury fell below $100 million, the issue of gold certificates should cease. This is held to indicate that Congress regarded $100 million as the limit below which the redemption reserve should not be permitted to fall. If this reserve had not been called upon to bear other burdens, there would probably never have been any doubts as to its sufficiency. In 1878, however, began the coinage of silver dollars and the issue of silver certificates. These notes were kept at par in gold by their interchangeability in the operations of commerce for legal tender notes. They were thus an indirect charge on the gold reserve. From 1878 to 1890 they were increased at the rate of over $2,500,000 a month. In that year, July 14, 1890, an act was passed providing for the issue of treasury notes in the purchase of silver bullion, which provided also for the coinage of some of the bullion purchased into silver dollars. These treasury notes were redeemable both in gold and silver, and as the government never availed itself of its option to redeem in silver when gold was demanded for them. These notes as they were issued became a further burden on the gold reserve provided for the legal tender notes. By the beginning of the year 1893 the legal tender notes, silver certificates, and treasury notes had reached an aggregate of nearly $800 million, all depending on the treasury reserve for gold redemption. This reduction of the percentage of gold held to the amount of the demand liabilities raised doubts as to the ability of the government to maintain gold payments, and the legal tenders and treasury notes were presented for redemption. The depletion of gold was so great that on one or two occasions there was danger that the reserve would be exhausted, and resort was had to the sale of bonds to procure gold to replenish the reserve. The issue of further treasury notes was stopped by the repeal of the Act of 1890 in November, 1893, 
and since this repeal confidence in the ability of the Treasury to maintain gold redemptions has been gradually restored. Under the provisions of the Act of May, 1878, the legal tender notes when redeemed cannot be cancelled. They must be paid out again, and therefore when reissued, they may again be presented for redemption. This constitutes the so-called endless chain by which the gold in the treasury is always liable to be drawn out. v. The National Banking System The desirability of perfecting the banking and currency system of the country was readily perceived on the breaking out of the Civil War in 1861. Secretary Chase in two annual reports, those of 1861 and 1862, recommended a system of national banks, whose supervision should be by national authority, and whose issues of notes should be based on deposits of bonds of the government. After several unsuccessful attempts, a bill, introduced by Mr. Sherman, passed both Senate and House, and became a law February 25, 1863. This act embodied the essential features of Mr. Chase's reports. Under it the first charter was issued to the First National Bank of Philadelphia. The formation of national banks proceeded very slowly at first. In order to hold out greater inducements for the state banks to enter the national system, the act was amended on June 3, 1864. The first report of the Comptroller of the Currency, November 28, 1863, showed that only 134 national banks had been organized up to that date, but when the Act of June 3, 1864, went into operation, new banks were formed more frequently. A more rapid increase took place after the passage of the Act of March 3, 1865, imposing a tax of 10% on the circulating notes of state banks. This increase was from 638 banks in January, 1865, to 1513 in October of the same year. With an increase in capital of from $135,618,874 to $393,187,206, and in circulation of from $66,769,375 to $171,321,903. Prior to 1869 national banks were required to make their reports on fixed dates, but after March 3, 1869, they were required by law to make their reports to the Comptroller five times a year on some past date fixed upon by the Comptroller. National Bank Laws and Regulations. The national banks are under the supervision of the Comptroller of the Currency, who is appointed by the President on the recommendation of the Secretary of the Treasury. His salary is $5,000 a year. A national bank may be organized by any number of persons not less than five, on permission of the comptroller. The capital required is not less than $50,000 in any case, and this minimum applies only to towns the population of which does not exceed 6,000, in cities having a population exceeding 50,000, the minimum capital is $200,000. For places having a population over 6,000 and not exceeding 50,000, the capital required is $100,000. One half of the capital must be paid in before the bank is authorized to begin business, and the remainder in installments of not less than 10% on the entire amount of the capital. As frequently as one installment at the end of each succeeding month from the time it is authorized to begin business. Capital stock is divided into shares of $100 each. The banks are managed by a board of not less than five directors, chosen by the stockholders. Executive officers of the bank, president, vice president, cashier, and assistant cashier, are chosen by the directors. Shareholders are individually liable for the debts, contracts, and engagements of the bank to the extent of the amount of their stock therein, at the par value, in addition to the amount invested in such shares. This is what is known as the double liability of shareholders, and is one of the features adding to the strength of the system. National banks are designated by the Secretary of the Treasury to act as depositaries or custodians of public money. Such deposits are secured specially by a deposit of United States bonds with the Treasury. All national banks before commencing business are required to transfer and deliver to the Treasurer of the United States as security for their circulating notes.
United States registered bonds to an amount not less than one-fourth the capital where the capital is $150,000 or less, and to the amount of $50,000 where the capital is in excess of $150,000. These bonds must be taken by the banks whether they issue circulation or not. Circulating notes are issued to national banks on a deposit of United States bonds with the treasurer. Notes are limited to 90% of the par value of the bonds, also to 90% of the capital of the bank. They are oversecured, and no holder of them has ever lost a dollar by reason of the failure of a bank. The notes are secured by the government bonds, there being a difference of the 10% between the par of the bonds and the notes issued, and the bonds nearly always command a premium. They are further secured by the first lien on the assets of the bank, including the double liability of shareholders, by a 5% redemption fund in the treasury, and also by the margin between the capital and the amount of notes permitted. National bank notes are redeemable at the counters of the issuing banks and at the treasury in lawful money of the United States. This term, as commonly used, means legal tender money, and in practice, perhaps, gold coin or legal tender notes. Reserves of national banks are the amounts of money kept on hand to pay their deposits and current checks and drafts. This reserve is to be kept in lawful money, gold and silver coin or certificates, and United States currency certificates or legal tender notes. There are three central reserve cities, namely, New York, Chicago, and St. Louis. National banks in these three cities must keep a reserve of 25% against their deposits, and this amount must be kept in their own vaults. There are 24 other reserve cities which are also required to keep a reserve of 25%, but one half of that amount may be due from other banks in New York and other central reserve cities. Approved as reserve agents by the Comptroller of the Currency Banks outside of these reserve cities must keep a reserve of 15%, three-fifths of which may be due from approved reserve agents in the reserve cities or central reserve cities. In times of panic when there is a run on banks they may use this reserve to pay their depositors, and it often happens that the reserve falls below the amount required by law. Under such circumstances the comptroller may notify the banks to make good the deficiency, failing to comply with this request within 30 days, they may be closed. National banks are not permitted to make loans on real estate. The regulations prescribed by the law for the management of these institutions are very stringent, supplemented by a system of examination and reports. In 1896 the Comptroller of the Currency estimated that the government had made a net profit of $157,439,248.98 out of the revenues derived from the national banks. It was estimated in the same report that the average percentage of dividends paid to creditors of insolvent national banks was 75%. There have been no losses on circulation. In 1878 the Comptroller estimated that the annual losses upon all the currency issued by state and private banks amounted to 5% annually. The national banks are not monopolistic. Any body of five reputable citizens can form one by getting together $50,000 capital. The total shares of the national banks are approximately 300,000. Profits on national bank stock are not exorbitant. For a period of 29 years the net earnings on capital and surplus have been only a little over 7%. Since the establishment of the national banking system 5,171 banks have been organized, of which 1224 have gone into liquidation, 368 have become insolvent, and 3,579 are in operation, February 4, 1899. There is a marked falling off in the number of new national banks organized in recent years. In 1890 there were 307 organized, but in 1898 there were only 50 organizations reported, and that was the highest number reported since 1893. The capital of the national banks is also decreasing, but the deposits show a large increase. At present the state banks are gaining in numbers more rapidly than the national banks. Profit on National Bank Circulation Many suppose that national banks make an undue profit on the privilege they have of issuing notes to circulate as money, based on a deposit of bonds with the United States Treasurer. Official figures disprove this. The total national bank notes outstanding, 
February 4, 1899, was $203,636,184.50. The law permits these banks to issue notes to the extent of 90% of their capital. This capital, on February 4, 1899, was $608,301,245. Therefore they might have had notes at issue on that date to the amount of $545,871,120.50, instead of only $203,636,184.50. This is conclusive evidence that there is no substantial profit in the issuing of such notes. In the figures furnished by the Comptroller of the Currency for 1898, he shows that the profit which a national bank could make by taking out circulation on a deposit of $100,000 of United States bonds, on October 31, 1898, was less than 1%. On that date eight leading banks had no circulating notes at all out. The meager profits of national banks explain why they do not supply an adequate paper currency. The restrictions on them make it impossible to render any substantial assistance to business in this respect. This is especially true in times of panic. Possessing gigantic strength, they are compelled to see the industries of the country attacked by doubt and distrust, and are unable to go to their aid because of the restraints which forbid them to exercise their legitimate functions. 6. Foreign Banking and Finance most foreign countries issue metallic money only, except those that are on a paper basis. In general the paper currency is issued by banks, many of which are more or less remotely associated with the government. Some of these banks issue notes on the security of the government or other stocks and bonds, while many emit notes based on no special form of security, but upon the general assets of the bank. As compared with the United States there are but few banks in the principal foreign countries. England has less than 100, Scotland less than a dozen, Canada but 38 chartered banks. As in other foreign countries, the Canadian banks have numerous branches affiliated with the head office. National banks in the United States are prohibited from having branches. The Bank of France, the Bank of England, the Imperial Bank of Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Bank, the Imperial Bank of Russia, are all more or less intimately associated with their respective governments. The Bank of England was incorporated by Royal Charter, July 27, 1694, its incorporators lending £1,200,000 to the government, in return for which the bank was permitted to issue notes to a like amount. It had a practical monopoly up to 1826, and even now, it is believed, no bank within a radius of 65 miles of London may issue notes. It has suspended specie payments more than once. In 1844, the banking and issue departments of the bank were separated. One-fifth of the reserve may be silver, though in practice the reserve is kept in gold coin and bullion. Its notes are based on gold, except £16,800,000, which are secured by the government debt and other securities. It is compelled to buy all gold offered at a fixed price, paying for it in notes. So it must redeem all notes on demand in gold. When so redeemed they are cancelled and, after five years, burned. No notes of a less denomination than five pounds are issued. The bank checks gold exports by raising the rate of discount. The building covers about four acres of ground, and employs over 1100 persons. It is the keystone of the entire system of British credit, and commands the assistance of the government when needed. The Scotch banks issue notes on their own credit to the amount outstanding at the time of the passage of the Bank Act in 1844. Their rate of interest is said to be the same at all of their thousand offices. A unique feature of the Scotch banking system is that of cash credits, by means of which a person of good credit may get his checks cashed without a deposit of actual money, the bank simply entering the credits on their books. The Bank of France has a monopoly of note issues, charges a premium on gold for export, and may redeem its notes in either gold or silver. The Imperial Bank of Germany and a few other German banks issue notes on gold and other securities, and further amounts on their general credit. Beyond a fixed sum, called the emergency circulation, a tax of 5% is levied. 
Other European banks are generally modeled on the same leading principle, a central bank of issue, with numerous branches, and associated with the government directly or indirectly. The Imperial Bank of Russia issues notes practically covered by gold and redeemable in that coin. Japan tried a system of national banks combined with government paper money, but is now substituting a system of bank notes issued by the Bank of Japan. 7. United States Government Debt Since 1857 In 1857 the government owed only $10 million over and above the cash held in the Treasury. At the breaking out of the Civil War the debt had increased to about $80 million. By August 31, 1865, it had increased to $2,756 million, with an interest charge of $150 million. In 28 years, down to June 30, 1893, the government extinguished $1,917,500,000 of its debt, paid $2,364,000,000 for interest on its debt, and $118,000,000 for premium on bonds redeemed, making a grand total of $4,400,000,000. Or an annual average payment of $157,000,000 for the entire period. In 1865 the annual interest charge on the public debt was $150,977,697. In 1898 it was only $34,387,408. From 1791 to 1898 the gross receipts of the government were $30,547,063,336.06 and the gross expenditures $29,768,597,237.24. The net ordinary receipts, which do not include loans or proceeds from the issue of Treasury notes, were $405,321,335. 20 for the fiscal year ended June 30, 1898, and the net ordinary expenditures, which do not include payments on account of premiums or interest on the public debt, were $405,783,526.57. 8. Postal Savings Banks Many believe that a system of postal savings banks could be generally introduced into the United States. Such banks doubtless appeal to those who have more confidence in the government than in any association of individuals. Their safety may be conceded, for when the government fails other institutions are likely to go the same way. But when people deposit money in a postal savings bank, they make a loan to the government. This implies that the government must be a perpetual borrower, Whereas, until recent years, the United States has been a debt-paying nation, and in the course of affairs may soon be again. Unless we are to have a large permanent debt, the deposits in postal savings banks would have to be invested in general securities. Such investments could not well be made by the post office officials of the country. In Great Britain these banks have been in existence for about 38 years, and their number has grown to about 12,000 with more than 6 million depositors. The system prevails in a number of other countries. The more concentrated and paternal system of government prevalent in countries having these banks renders their management a much less difficult problem than it would be in the United States with our large areas, vast number of post offices, and general diversity of conditions. In Great Britain the deposits in the postal savings banks are made at the money order post offices in a passbook held by the depositor. Withdrawals are made by filling up blank forms, and these withdrawals may be made at any money order post office. Deposits are invested in the public debt, and the rate of interest is about 2 and 1 half percent. The postal savings banks of Great Britain contain deposits approximating $527 million, those of France, $152 million, those of Italy, $90 million, those of Belgium, $67 million those of Canada, $31 million. 9. Savings Banks in the United States There are no worthier financial institutions in the country today than the savings banks. Most of these are organized on what is known as the mutual plan. They have no capital, no stockholders, and all the assets are held in trust for the benefit of the depositors. They are managed by a board of trustees, who serve without pay. 
The investments which the banks are permitted to make are generally restricted to high-class securities ensuring safety. The savings banks in New York State, especially, are closely restricted in investing their funds, and failures in recent years are almost unknown. A deposit in one of these banks is hardly less safe than an investment in government bonds. The savings banks are the primary schools of economy and thrift, and I believe that an extension of the mutual savings bank system throughout the country, under proper legal safeguards, would be of the greatest benefit to the people of the United States. The deposits in banks of this kind are usually limited by law to amounts not exceeding $3,000 to one depositor, as they are not intended to be used by the wealthier class of people. In addition to the mutual and stock savings banks in the United States, a system of school savings banks, introduced into the schools of the United States by J. H. Theory, of Long Island City, N. Y., is worthy of mention. Such banks have been very successful in inculcating habits of thrift and economy among the children of the country. X. The Clearing House A clearinghouse may be defined as an institution for saving time, money, and labor. Its underlying principle is that of setting off one claim against another. A bank in a large city receives every day in its mail a great number of checks or drafts drawn on banks in the same place. It does not present these checks directly to the banks on which they are drawn for payment, but sends them by messenger to the clearinghouse. Let us say, for illustration, that the First National Bank presents to the clearinghouse checks on other banks amounting to $100,000. At the same time the other banks send to the clearinghouse checks they have received drawn on the First National Bank, aggregating $75,000. A payment of $25,000 in money to the First National Bank will be all the cash required to pay checks representing $175,000. The economy and the use of money is still better illustrated by the following statement of an actual transaction. On a day in the latter part of 1898 the Bank of the State of New York took to the New York Clearinghouse checks on other banks amounting to $15,647,583.82, and other banks brought checks against it amounting to $15,647,401.85. The sum of these items was $31,294,985.67. And they were paid with $181.97 in money, which represents the credit balance due to the Bank of the State of New York. This instance shows what large transactions may be affected with small sums of money by employing proper banking machinery. Banks multiply the usefulness of money many fold. The New York Clearinghouse Association was organized September 13, 1853 and the first clearing made by the association took place on October 11, 1853. The banks belonging to the New York Clearinghouse Association reported on April 1, 1899, loans and discounts, $779,951,100, deposits, $898,917,000, specie, $187,114,300, circulation. $13,870,600. Clearinghouse Loan Certificates These are simply devices that the banks have invented for use in times of panic. They are issued by a committee of the Clearinghouse Association on the deposit of approved securities by the bank desiring them, and are used only to settle balances between the banks. They are not money, but serve a useful purpose in diminishing the demand for money, for when the banks agree to accept these certificates among themselves, it makes that much money available to be loaned or paid to depositors. In 1893, and in other years of financial stringency, the issue of these certificates afforded great relief to business interests and saved the country from some of the most disastrous results consequent upon such panics. These certificates are not to be confounded with clearinghouse gold certificates issued by the Association on Deposits of Gold Coin. They are used in making payments of balances between banks, and obviate the necessity of frequently passing the actual coin from hand to hand. On April 11, 1898, the clearings at the New York Clearinghouse for that day amounted to $352,882,567, the largest amount ever reported up to that time. 
The balances to be paid in money were $17,345,452, or only about 5%. For the year 1898 the bank clearings at New York were $41,971,781,684, and for the whole country, $68,750,000,000. An investigation of the amount of credit paper used respectively in the wholesale and retail trade was made by the Comptroller of the Currency in 1896. In his report for that year the Comptroller says, from the face of the returns the conclusion to be drawn is that 67.4% of the retail trade of the country is transacted by means of credit paper, checks, that 95.3% of the wholesale trade is so carried on, 95.1% of business other than mercantile, and 92.5% of all business. 11. Panics and their causes. A panic is generally due to inflation and speculation, and these, of course, have their origin in various sources not easily determined. An unusual increase in the production of precious metals, bountiful crops, a speculative craze taking possession of the public, such as the tulip mania in Holland, all these and many other causes lead to speculation. The fall in prices due to a stoppage in speculation brings on the panic. Sometimes the catastrophe is produced by war or rumors of war, often by the most trivial circumstances, and not infrequently without any apparent cause. Before everybody had desired to buy, they now became as eager to sell, and this rush to convert securities and commodities into money precipitates a panic. Crises may be divided into commercial and financial. The last one in the United States, whatever may have been its ultimate developments, was in its inception and culmination essentially a financial panic. The Treasury and the banks were both regarded with more or less distrust. Panics or crises more or less severe have occurred in the United States in 1814, 1818, 1826, 1837 to 39, 1848, 1857, during the Civil War, 1861 to 65, 1873, 1882, 1884, 1890, 1893. Some of these should hardly be called panics, as they were mere local disturbances. Different causes have been given for each of these revulsions. Overtrading and speculation were doubtless responsible for them. The Panic of 1857 was coincident with large net imports of merchandise. On August 24, 1857, the onward wave of prosperity, which had been steadily rising to a great height, received a check by the failure of the Ohio Life Insurance and Trust Company. Followed by numerous other failures. On October 4 every bank in New York, except the chemical, suspended specie payments, and they did not resume until December 12. The speculation in gold in 1869 culminated in what is known as the Black Friday Panic, September 24, 1869. Fisk and Gould were conducting a speculation in gold, and sought to corner it. They forced the price up to a high figure, but the government suddenly appeared as a seller of gold and broke the corner. The year 1873 witnessed another revulsion of confidence and another disruption of the commercial and financial affairs of the country. Business had long been unduly expanded, and the collapse finally came. The failure, on September 18, of the honored firm of J. Cook and Company, which had not only been identified with the building of the Northern Pacific R.R., but had been a strong supporter of the credit of the government when it was in the direst distress, was the first bad news. House after house fell. The stock exchange closed its doors on September 20, and did not reopen them until September 30. More than 50 stock exchange firms suspended, and several of the leading banking institutions of New York and other cities had to stop business. During this panic the New York Clearinghouse Association issued clearinghouse certificates to those of its members who needed available funds, and during the trouble issued $24,915,000 of them. In May, 1884, it issued $24,915,000. In the 1890 panic, $16,645,000, in 1893, $41,490,000. Following the resumption of specie payments the times were good for several years. 
the production of the precious metals was averaging $75 million or more per year. From 1879 to 1883 we imported about $190 million of gold. Railroad construction reached a higher point than was ever recorded, either before or since, nearly 40,000 miles of track having been laid in five years. All seemed well, when another collapse came in May, 1884. This was preceded by the failure of Grant and Ward, and it was followed by the failure of the Marine and the Metropolitan ranks. The disclosures of bad faith on the part of men occupying positions of great trust, made the 1884 panic one of distinct characteristics of its own. The previous activity in all lines of enterprise may have made the revulsion timely, but individual dishonesty greatly aggravated the situation. The Panic of 1890, in the United States, was but a reflection of the great bearing failure in London in the fall of that year. This crash was due to South American speculations, and was one of the greatest failures of modern times. It is the opinion of many well-informed financiers that this was one of the causes which operated to produce the Panic of 1893 in the United States. The course of the United States in regard to the purchase of silver, doubts as to the tariff, deficiency in revenues, all, perhaps, had their share in creating distrust. But back of these were the conditions superinduced by an era of inflation and speculation. The 1893 panic bore most heavily upon the banks. There was a continued demand upon the treasury for gold, and the deposits in banks were withdrawn so rapidly that hundreds of failures ensued. The period of depression continued for nearly three years, and has been succeeded by an era of general prosperity, which it is hoped may be long continued. The Century's Progress in Fruit Culture By H. E. Van de Man Late Professor of Horticulture, Kansas State Agricultural College From the earliest histories of civilization we learn that the cultivation of fruits has been a delightful pastime and also a substantial means of living. Their tempting colors, fragrant perfumes and luscious flavors are unequaled in combined attractiveness and satisfaction to the human senses by anything else among all the products of nature. Their juices are at once appetizing, nutritious, and wholesome. Millions of people have subsisted upon them largely, from time out of mind. It is, therefore, not a matter of wonder that our forefathers, when they came to the shores of this new world, brought with them seeds, cuttings, and plants of the best fruits they had at their old homes. Thus it was that the apple, pear, peach, plum, cherry, grape, olive, date, almond, European walnut and chestnut, and many other less valuable fruits were first cultivated in North America. The Beginning Previous to the beginning of the 19th century there had been considerable development in fruit culture in the colonies. Small apple orchards were quite common in the settlements, from New England to the Carolinas. The pear, peach, plum, grape, and a few other fruits were cultivated in less degree. The Spanish had introduced the peach and orange in Florida, and the French had planted the grape and pear in their sparse settlements in the Mississippi Valley and near the Great Lakes. There are today, and yet in a healthy condition, near Detroit, Michigan, several immense pear trees from these first plantings, that are nearly 300 years old. The Catholic fathers planted the vine and the olive, and occasionally the date palm, at their mission stations along the Rio Grande and on the Pacific coast. Thus we see that when the year 1800 ushered in the century now closing, there were many feeble beginnings in the way of fruit culture scattered over the continent. The Indians, contrary to what we might have supposed, helped materially in the distribution of some of the orchard fruits. In 1799, when General Sullivan made his famous raid against the tribes which composed the historic Six Nations, he found bearing apple orchards in western New York. In southern Canada and Michigan the Indians occasionally planted the apple and pear. The tribes living along the Gulf of Mexico had peach trees in their little cultivated patches, having obtained the seeds from the Spaniards. And today we find the descendants of these Spanish or Indian peaches commonly grown throughout all the southern states, and to some extent all over the peach-growing sections of America. The Experimental Stage during the life of the generation which existed for the first thirty or more years of the century the culture of fruits was still principally in the experimental stage. 
some of the foreign species and varieties had not proved satisfactory, and they were being critically tested or abandoned. New varieties were being originated on our own soil. Our native fruits were being brought under culture, too, and with the most satisfactory results in many cases. It was learned that we had in them the foundation of almost unlimited development. Their progeny has revolutionized some lines of fruit culture. This is especially true in our vineyards and berry fields. There were men of noble and patriotic cast of mind, who devoted their lives to the development of this lovely and wholly humane work. They deserve to rank beside the heroes of our battlefields. Their victories were those of peace, and were followed by an increase of the delightful products of the orchard, vineyard, and garden. Once that our forefathers were free from the bondage of European greed, this art of peace kept pace with our civilization on other lines. There is nothing in the whole list of our scientific attainments or material industries that can show more substantial progress. Nor is there a nation on earth that has so rich, varied, and adaptable soils, together with climatic conditions so admirably and generally suited to fruit culture, nor a people more alive to their opportunities in this direction. The Age of Progress During the generation of fruit growers who lived from about 1830 until the time of the Civil War, the region lying between the Allegheny Mountains and the Missouri River, and extending from the Ottawa River in Canada to the mountains of Tennessee, which is now the great apple bin of America, as well as its granary, was being rapidly filled with energetic settlers. These pioneers carried with them carefully selected seeds, cuttings, and trees of the best varieties of fruits known in their eastern and southern homes. These were planted in the rich, virgin soil of the new territory, which was then known as, the West. Under the happy influences of a congenial climate and careful cultivation, they developed into fruitful orchards and vineyards, yielding finer specimens, and, in some cases, larger crops than had ever been known in the older parts of the country. This gave a great impetus to the culture of fruits. The first large commercial orchards of the apple, peach, and pear in the central United States were then being planted in Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. The South had not yet awakened to a knowledge of her possibilities in fruit culture. Under slave labor the land was almost solely given up to cotton and tobacco. Florida had not then even dreamed of her wonderful developments in orange culture. In Missouri, Kansas, Arkansas, Texas, and the Great Northwest, where now there are fruit plantations of almost unparalleled extent, only the first trees and plants were being set. And it was only thought possible that someday fruits could be produced in abundance there. The Rocky Mountain and Pacific states had scarcely been heard of, even as territories, and only an occasional plantation of vines and trees around some mission station could be found. The Age of Triumph At the close of the Civil War, which had somewhat distracted the attention of our people both north and south from the progress of the peaceful arts, there was a great expansion of our rural population. The love of travel had taken possession of many who had been in the armies. They were no longer content with the narrow boundaries and the poor lands of the old eastern farms. They wanted new fields for their energies. The building of the great railroad systems across the continent solved the question of the settlement of the Far West and the mythical American desert that was supposed to lie this side of it. The prairies were covered with homesteaders' shanties, sod houses, and dugouts. The forests of Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Missouri, and Arkansas fell before the axe of the pioneer. The boys in blue, who had seen the natural advantages of the southern states, while they're on the dread errand of war, began the rehabilitation of the country they had helped to devastate. They took with them their Yankee notions and western vim, and planted many kinds of farm crops, trees, vines, and berry bushes upon the old plantations where little else than cotton and tobacco used to grow. Florida was veritably turned into a garden of orange trees and truck patches. The chocolate hills and rich black lands of Texas were planted to grapes, peaches, and berries. The dry plains and mesas of the Rocky Mountain region, that were naturally almost devoid of vegetation, were irrigated and made to produce the most delightful fruits in abundance. The giant forests of Oregon and Washington were invaded by the lumbermen and the home seeker, 
and in their stead were planted trees which yielded the largest and best of fruits. And California, what shall we say of her wonderful valleys, grassy foothills, and timbered mountain slopes? All of the fruits of the temperate zones are growing there, and in some places the hardier of the tropical kind succeed. California is indeed a land of fruits. Taking the whole of North America, except the frozen regions of the British possessions, and Alaska, where few cultivated fruits can be grown, and half-civilized Mexico, where progress is scarcely known. The last 35 years have witnessed such advancements in fruit culture as seem almost beyond belief. It has truly been an age of triumph. Not only has the territory of its successful culture been wonderfully extended, but the whole plan and science of fruit growing has been almost revolutionized. Old things have largely passed away. New varieties, new methods of culture and new markets for the products of the fruit farm have been found. Some of the old varieties have been retained, but many new ones have been originated here, some by chance and others by scientific breeding. Valuable kinds that had long been lying in obscurity have been brought into public favor. Others have been imported from foreign countries. Almost the entire world has been ransacked in order to obtain fruits that might prove of value to us. At the beginning of this period of unparalleled progress the experiments of former years had shown the success or failure of the different species and varieties already in cultivation in many parts of the country. And now, at its close, after nearly forty years more of experience, there is scarcely a section within the entire domain of North American fruit culture where it is not quite well known what is and what is not adapted to each locality. The methods of culture are changed from the old ones, which were largely those practiced in Europe, to such as have been evolved by the peculiar necessities of our soil, climate, and varieties. This is especially true of our vineyards. For, except on the Pacific Slope, where the foreign grapes succeed, our native vines require much less severe pruning, and a much more roomy trellis upon which to grow than those old kinds. The first vineyards were planted very thickly and trained by the stake method, which is the French and German style. I remember working in such vineyards just prior to 1870, and of seeing the dwarfing and dwindling effect upon the vines. Nothing of the kind is now seen this side the Rocky Mountains, because our American grapes will not endure such treatment and continue to bear well. Horse culture has in a great measure succeeded hand culture. Without such a change it would be impossible to profitably cultivate the vast stretches of orchards, vineyards, and berry fields that are today found in many parts of the country. The common plow and harrow were about the only tools available thirty or forty years ago. They are now supplemented, and in some cases superseded, by various kinds of cultivators, weeders, and improved plows and harrows. They are made to carry out the modern idea of frequent but shallow stirring of the soil. This method of culture disturbs the roots but little and retains the moisture in the soil, by keeping the surface finely pulverized, thus forming a dust mulch. Some of these tools are so made as to enable one man with one horse to easily cultivate 25 acres per day, and with a two or three horse implement, to thoroughly pulverize the surface over 50 or more acres in that time. The tendency during the last half century has been towards heading orchard trees lower. The old style was to have them with trunks so tall that a horse could walk under the branches. Low heads have the advantage of giving the winds less purchase upon the roots, the fruit is more easily gathered, and the sun is less likely to scald the trunks. The old idea of our forefathers was, that apples were chiefly to be used for making cider, peaches for brandy, and grapes for wine. We have become a nation of fruit eaters, as compared with our predecessors and the Europeans. The greatest impetus ever given to American fruit culture came from the increased demand in our own country for fresh fruit. It is a staple article of diet here, rather than a luxury, as it is in most parts of Europe. Nearly all of our fresh fruits are consumed in the homes of our people, or exported. A very little is made into cider, brandy, or wine, and the larger part of the remainder is dried or canned. The proportion of grapes made into wine east of California is trifling, while there it is considerable. The enormous production and consumption of berries of various kinds by the Americans is unparalleled in the history of the world. 
And nearly all of this has come through the development of our wild berries. Instead of buying largely of foreign fruits and their products, except such as are strictly tropical and cannot be grown within our borders only in a limited way, we have nearly stopped their importation, and have, in turn, become exporters. The rapid increase in our population demands more and more fruit, and it is not to be wondered at that our imports of oranges and lemons is increasing. But if it was not for our home production of these fruits the present amount would be more than doubled. Our raisins and dried prunes have almost driven out the foreign products, and their quality is so good that there is a growing demand for them in England and some other foreign countries. The same is true of our canned and preserved fruits. Our apples bring the highest price of any that reach the markets of Europe, and the demand for them is increasing. Fresh pears and peaches have also been sent to England in limited quantities from as far west as California and Oregon. Our oranges also have an enviable reputation there because of their beauty and delicious flavor. Our apples are sent to Mexico, China, and Japan. The street vendors of Bombay, India, cry their sale with great gusto, American apples. True American apples, and sell them at a price which would require more than a whole day's wages of a good workman to buy a single one. The world is beginning to know the value and goodness of our fruits. We are selling, inside their dainty skins, a portion of our sunshine and water, for the golden, pink, and crimson tints are from the glowing sun, and the water, which is the main part of all fruits, is fresh from nature's fountain. Growth of Apple Culture. From the first settlement of the country well into the present century, the principal purpose for which apples were cultivated in America was to make cider. This was a common beverage in England and on the continent of Europe, whence our forefathers came. Here they introduced the old world custom of drinking hard cider, in season and out of season. In 1721, in one town near Boston, wherein lived about forty families, there were made in one year three thousand barrels of cider, and in another of two hundred families, near ten thousand barrels. This is fifty barrels to the family, which seems ample for a great many drinks per day for each person, with plenty left to sell to the cider-loving citizens of Boston. Colonel John Taylor of Virginia wrote, in 1813, nearly one hundred years later, the apple will furnish some food for hogs, a luxury for the family in winter, and a healthy liquor for the farmer and his laborers all the year. But hard cider did not always satisfy. Applejack, which is the strongest kind of brandy, suited the taste of many of the old-fashioned folk much better. The Virginia gentleman, the Dutch burger, whose ample acres fronted upon the Hudson, the solemn Philadelphia Quaker and the staid Puritan of New England, all loved their dram and took it frequently. Besides alcoholic liquors, vinegar was made in considerable quantities. But as late as the middle of this century there was scarcely a good family apple orchard to be found, such as we now have, with varieties arranged to ripen from early to late. Nor were there many commercial orchards of consequence. The famous orchard of Robert L. Pell, in Ulster County, New York, was a remarkable exception. It consisted of 20,000 trees, all of the yellow and green Newtown apples. Fruit from this orchard sold at wholesale in London, England, in 1845, at the enormous price of $21 per barrel, but the next year the price had fallen to $6 in New York City, ready for foreign shipment. This orchard gradually fell into decay, and was not soon followed by others of so large acreage. The Newtown apple proved unsuitable for general culture, and is now grown only in two localities with much success. In the mountain, coves, or sheltered slopes and valleys, of the Blue Ridge, in Virginia and North Carolina, where it is called Albemarle Pippin, there are many orchards that produce as fine fruit as any from the Pell Orchard. And it now sells from $5.00 to $12 and more per barrel in England. In the higher foothills of California and Oregon this variety does equally well, and apples from there are being sold in England during this closing period of the century at almost fabulous prices. In the old days, if an orchard furnished an abundance of apples for cider, brandy, vinegar, apple butter, some for drying, and a few of fair quality that would keep for winter use, it was all that was expected. Most of the trees in those old orchards were inferior seedlings, 
and it is no wonder that the people of those days did not use apples as we do. A few of them were very good, and it is from such chance favorites that we have preserved to us, by grafting, the Baldwin wine sap and hundreds more that fill our orchards today. We have developed a new race of American seedlings. Most of the old varieties that were so highly esteemed across the ocean are now rarely mentioned. Our newer and better kinds have largely supplanted them. As time advanced more choice varieties were added, until we may now confidently boast of having the best apples in existence. Whoever has eaten our delicious Grimes Golden, Jonathan, and Northern Spy, need not look for better kinds, because they cannot now be found. Indeed, the name, Seek No Farther, has been triumphantly applied to one variety. However, we are still seeking and expecting to produce by skillful breeding, if not to find, others which may be even better than those we now possess. A history of the recognized and named varieties of apples of American origin would be a book in itself. It should begin almost with the first settlement of the country. At the beginning of this century the early harvest, Baldwin, Soir, Esopus Spitzenberg, Rhode Island Greening, Yellow Bellflower, and a few others which are yet popular, were already grafted into hundreds of orchards. Some of them being as far west as the Mississippi River. William Cox, in his excellent book on fruits, published in 1817, mentions 100 kinds. William Prince, of Long Island, who kept the first nursery of note, had 116 varieties of apples in his published list in 1825, of which about half were of American origin. Now there are nearly 1,000 kinds offered by the nurserymen of the country, and the books on pomology contain nearly 5,000 varieties, a large part of them being American. Truly this is progress. We have the best and by far the most extensive apple country in the world. The largest apple orchards in the world are in America. The biggest of all belongs to F. Wellhouse & Son, of Kansas, in which there are 1,600 acres. There are others in Missouri, Illinois, Iowa, Colorado, and New Mexico that are nearly as large. The variety principally grown in these orchards is the Ben Davis. It is a thrifty, rugged grower, a most productive bearer, and a handsome apple to sell. Its brilliant red stripes, large size, and ability to keep, make up for its deficiency in flavor. It is, today, the business apple of America. Baldwin is the business apple of the eastern states. Both these varieties are well known in every market of this country, and wherever our apples are exported. The first government record of exported apples was in 1821, when 68,643 bushels, or about 22,781 barrels of apples, were sent abroad. In 1897 there were 2,371,143 barrels exported, which is the largest quantity ever shipped to foreign countries in one year. During the same year there were also exported nearly 31 million pounds of dried apples, 94,000 gallons of vinegar, and 750,000 gallons of cider. Certainly this is a good showing for the surplus products of American apple orchards. The year 1898 gave a lighter yield, but 1899 will, perhaps, about equal it. The pear dot, whoever has eaten a delicious little seckle pear must know that its equal in richness and spicy flavor is not to be found. This little gem is one of the triumphs of American fruit culture. How far beyond and above the old, choke, pear of our grandfather's days is this one, and many more of the delicious pears that grow in our orchards and gardens today. Pear growing was only a side issue until lately. A few trees were planted about our forefathers' houses or in the edge of the apple orchards, but these were often sprouts from some neighbor's seedling trees. As the appetite for good fruit increased, the false idea that pears should be ground and pressed into cider, called perry, decreased, until now no one thinks of wasting this delicious fruit by making it into an intoxicating drink. The Bartlett is our most popular pear of good quality. It originated in Berkshire, England, about 1770, where it was called Williams. When brought to America early in this century and planted at Dorchester, Massachusetts. The original name was lost, and it was renamed in honor of Enoch Bartlett, who first propagated and distributed the trees and grafts. 
the old tree, from which came the millions that have been and are now a source of delight and profit to our people, is still in bearing condition at Dorchester, and I have lately eaten as good Bartlett pears from it as ever were grown. The variety flourishes better in America than in its old home, and every year large shipments of the fruit are sent to England and sold at a very high price. Some fifty years ago there were brought from China seeds of a type of a pear that was entirely new to this country, and was called by us the sand pear. The only apparent reason for giving it this name is, that it is gritty, hard, and little better to eat than so much sand. But the seeds made trees that grew with remarkable vigor and were much alike, and so was their fruit. From this stock came up a seedling some thirty years ago, in the garden of Peter Kiefer, in Philadelphia, that has almost revolutionized pear growing in America. It is supposed to be the result of a cross between a Chinese sand pear tree and a Bartlett that stood near each other, although this is mere supposition. The fruit is only of medium quality, and some say it is very poor. But it is large, very beautiful when fully mature, late in ripening, and endures rough handling with as little harm as so many potatoes. It is very popular with the canners. The greatest point in its favor is the freedom of the tree from blight, its vigor and almost never failing and abundant bearing. It is the business pair of today, despite its inferior quality. The peach. When the peach was first planted in America by the Spanish and French, and later by other nationalities, there was little thought of it ever becoming a great commercial fruit. The trees that sprang from the seeds brought across the ocean grew so luxuriantly and bore so abundantly that their progeny was soon scattered far and wide. Peach trees were early found growing wild, like our native trees, wherever seeds had been dropped by travelers or hunters. There was no attempt at commercial peach orcharding until well into the present century, and for the first half of this there were scarcely more than a few seedling orchards planted for family use or for making brandy. In some sections dried peaches were an article of trade before any commercial peach orchards, in the true sense, had been planted. But they were always the product of women's work, and were prepared under the disadvantageous conditions with which they are usually hampered. It is no wonder that the grade was low, for the peaches were generally of poor quality, and no other mode of drying was then known than on boards and wooden trays, exposed in the open air to flies, moths, and dust. All that was sent to market was first taken in at the stores where the country people came to trade, and it was a mixed mess, indeed, that was thus collected. What fresh peaches were sold brought a very low price, rarely more than 25 cents per bushel. Early in the century budded peach trees were almost unknown in America. A few were brought over from France and the fruit houses of England, all of which did very well here. However, it was soon learned that there were seedlings of American origin that were equal to the best of the foreign kinds. Among the first of these were Heath, Early York, Tillotson, and Old Mixon Kling and Free. A little later, two large yellow freestones came up by accident on the premises of William Crawford, of Middletown, N.J. One ripening early and the other late. Early Crawford and late Crawford are, after more than sixty years of trial, still very popular upon the markets. Many other kinds, once popular, have long since been discarded and forgotten. Just before our civil war the hail peach was discovered and, being earlier than any kind then known, it became very popular. About 1865, the Amston, Alexander, and some others came to notice. They were a month earlier than the hail. A peach, called Pintu, was imported from southern China about the same time, that ripened still a month earlier. But as it belonged to a very different race from our other peaches, and was exceedingly tender, it has been found suitable only to Florida and other semi-tropical regions. The most popular peach of the present day is the Alberta. It was originated by Samuel H. Rumpf, of Georgia, about twenty years ago. Its large size, creamy, yellow color, and good flavor, added to its productiveness, make it very acceptable to both grower and consumer. The most extensive peach orchards in America are located in Georgia, North Carolina, southern Missouri, western Colorado, and California. A few are each more than a thousand acres in extent. The advent of patent evaporating machines, about 1870, 
aided greatly in the production of high-grade dried fruits of all kinds, and the peach shared in the progress. California and Oregon alone shipped in a single recent year nearly 40 million pounds of dried peaches. The peach is canned more than any other fruit, as may be seen upon the shelves of any grocery store, or in the fruit closets of the country housewives. Whether eaten fresh from the trees, served up with cream and sugar, a dainty dish unknown in Europe, evaporated or canned, the peach is one of the blessings of our great country. The Plum There are three general classes of plums grown in America today, the European, American, and Japanese. European plums were introduced here at an early day, but were grown very sparingly until within the last 30 or 40 years. The principal reason for this is the presence of a deadly enemy to the plum, apricot, and some other fruits, commonly known as the plum curculio. It is a little enemy but a mighty one. For it deposits its eggs in the young fruit, and they soon hatch into little grubs that work their way into the fruit and cause it to die and drop off. West of the continental divide there are none of these insects. There the soil, climate, and all else seem to conspire to enable the plum grower to prosper. Great prune orchards are planted in the fertile valleys from New Mexico and Colorado westward. Some of them cover thousands of acres in a body, and the yield is enormous. The rainless autumns of California permit the drying of the fruit in the open air and in the most economical and perfect way. From an infant industry twenty years ago it has now grown so great that, in 1897, California alone produced nearly 98 million pounds of dried prunes. Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and some other western states are almost equally well suited to this industry. East of the Rocky Mountains plum growing is not so easy. The curculio damages all classes of plums to some extent, but the European kinds seem to be much less able to endure its attacks than any other. This led to the selection and cultivation of the best varieties of our several native species. Their fruit is not so large or so richly flavored as some of the foreign kinds, but much of it is very good, and the brilliant red, purple, and yellow colors are greatly admired. The Japanese plums are of quite recent introduction. The beginning was in 1870, when the Kelsey, which is the largest, the latest to ripen, and about one of the least valuable varieties of this class was brought to California. Later importations have brought us many very valuable kinds. The trees bear well, the fruit is mostly large, handsome, of good quality, and resists the stings of the curculio quite as well as our native kinds. One of the most interesting and promising steps in plum growing is only beginning to be made, in the crossing of the three classes named. The most skillful and patient worker in this field is Luther Burbank, of California, who has already produced, by artificially pollinizing the flowers, some most excellent varieties. Some of these new varieties are larger than any plums ever before seen, delicious in flavor, and blood-red to the stone. The cherry dot, away back in the history of our country, cherry trees were planted here and there, but only for family use. The list of varieties was meager. Most of them were sour, bitter, or small. Now we have hundreds of named varieties and of all grades of color, from creamy yellow to black, and both sweet and sour, early and late. In Washington, Oregon, and California the cherry does better than in any of the regions farther east. The first cherries of the season to ripen are in the famous Vaca Valley of California, and sometimes shipments from there reach New York as early as April 1st. The largest cherry trees in America are found in the foothill regions of Pennsylvania and Virginia. Trees are sometimes seen there that have trunks three feet in diameter, with a spread of branches of more than fifty feet. Such trees sometimes yield more than fifty bushels of fruit at a time. The apricot dot, all over the eastern and central states the apricot is almost an entire failure because of the ravages of the plum curculio. After many years of trial its culture there has been almost abandoned, except by those who are willing to follow the jarring of the trees to catch the insects. Across the continental divide, where this enemy does not exist, the apricot flourishes as well or better than anywhere else in the world. It is one of the profitable fruits from western Colorado to the shores of the Pacific. California dried and sent to market in one year over 30 million pounds. 
There is also a great amount of apricots canned there every year, a large part of which are shipped all over the world. The quince. Although sour and unfit for eating from the hand, the quince is one of our most delicious fruits when cooked. No store of sweetmeats is complete without a generous supply of quince jelly. This fruit delights in a moist soil and a cool but not severe climate. However, it succeeds very well over the main part of North America. Almost every home plot has a tree or two. In western New York many commercial quince orchards have been planted within the last 25 years, some of them being of 40 acres in extent. American Grape Culture In no department of American pomology has there been more remarkable advancement than in grape growing. It was the belief of those who first began to grow fruits here, that the grapes of Canaan, Persia, Greece, and Rome, which were brought down through the ages to the vineyards of modern Europe, would grow equally well in America. One great reason for this belief was the abundance of wild grapes of many kinds that were found from Nova Scotia to Texas. One of the first things the pioneers of civilization did in New England, at Roanoke Island, and at Jamestown, was to make wine of the native grapes. The Spaniards in 1564 also made wine of the wild grapes of Florida. After testing the wine and finding it inferior to that produced in their old homes, they were more determined to grow vineyards of the choicest grapes of Europe. The French established a vineyard of this kind in Virginia, and another in southern Illinois, and William Penn did the same near Philadelphia in 1683. The most notable attempt that was made was by John James Dufour, a native of Switzerland. He came to America in 1796, and at once set about doing the wisest thing that he could have done, by first visiting and critically examining the vineyards that had already been started. He was not favorably impressed by what he saw, for the European vines had done very poorly, because of some unknown disease or weakness that seemed to cause them to make but feeble growth, or gradually dwindle and die. The cause has since been found to have been the fungus diseases and insect pests that are peculiar to the eastern half of America. But Dufour thought the right varieties had not been tried, except a few that he found near Philadelphia. From these he secured a start, and in 1799 organized a stock company with $10,000 in capital, to plant a vineyard, Henry Clay being one of the stockholders. A tract of 633 acres was selected near Lexington, Kentucky. And there he began work in the most enthusiastic manner. He induced two of his brothers to come from Switzerland to join him, and they brought other varieties of their best grapes. But after three years' trial he gave it up as a hopeless effort and turned his attention to the cultivation of our native grapes. The beginning of successful grape culture in America may be said to have been made by Dufour, in his next or second attempt, which was in 1802, at Veve, Indiana. On the banks of the Ohio, and with a variety of the wild Vitus labrusca, or fox grape, found near the Schuylkill River before the Revolutionary War. It was at first called the Cape Grape, from a mistaken notion that it had been brought from the Cape of Good Hope. It was also known by several other names. Although this grape was the first of a very long list of native varieties which have made our country famous in grape culture, it has long since been entirely abandoned for better kinds. But the vineyard at Veve, planted largely of this variety, was the first really successful one in America. The next forward step was the introduction of the Isabella and Catawba, both having originated in America, not long previous to 1820, although of unknown parentage. But, perhaps, as the results of accidental crossing between our native wild grapes and some of the foreign kinds. The Isabella is supposed to have originated in South Carolina, and was brought from there by Mrs. Isabella Gibbs and planted in her garden in Brooklyn, N.Y., where it came to the notice of William R. Prince in 1816, when in full bearing. He named it Isabella in her honor, and introduced it to the general public. The Catawba is supposed to have originated as a seedling near the Catawba River, in North Carolina, but was not generally known until Major John Adlam, of the District of Columbia, found it in bearing on the premises of Mrs. Scholl, a tavern keeper of Clarksburg, M.D. He was at once delighted with its good qualities, and planted it in his experiment grounds at Georgetown in 1819, and introduced it to the fruit-loving public soon after. 
The next impetus to grape culture was caused by the introduction of the Delaware and Concord. The exact origin of the Delaware is not known, but it came to public notice about 1855, through the efforts of Mr. A. Thompson and George W. Campbell, of Delaware, O. It was learned afterwards that the same variety was growing in 1850, in the garden of a Swiss immigrant, Paul H. Provost, at Frenchtown, N. J. It may be that it originated at this place from a chance seed, and that cuttings were thence carried to Ohio. It is evidently a cross between the foreign species and one of our natives, and is today about the best of all the grapes grown in the eastern states. The Concord is a pure native seedling, produced by Ephraim W. Bull, of Concord, Massachusetts. And first shown to the public at Boston in 1853. It has proved itself to be the greatest blessing of all grapes that have ever been grown in America. Its thriftiness and reliability under all circumstances are unequaled. It is not only good in itself, but it has been the parent of a race of seedlings which have filled our vineyards, gardens, and markets with the most delicious grapes, and at a very slight cost of labor or money. Whoever gathers or buys a basket of blue black Concord or Wardens, Purple Brighton or Opal Niagara, should render a silent thank offering to the memory of Ephraim W. Bull, who made their existence a possibility. The first commercial vineyard of importance was planted by Nicholas Longworth, on the hills overlooking the Ohio River, about ten miles below Cincinnati, and it was largely of Catawba. Many others followed his example, and from about 1830 to 1860 so great an interest was shown that the hills bordering the Ohio for many miles were dotted with vineyards. But mildew and black rot devastated them and almost destroyed their usefulness. These diseases are now largely overcome by spraying with a solution of sulfate of copper. In northern Ohio, about Cleveland and Sandusky, and on the islands near the southern shore of Lake Erie, the Catawba was planted with much better success, owing, perhaps, to the climate not being so favorable to grape diseases. The lake region of western New York is perhaps more densely planted with grapes than any section east of California. Thousands of carloads of grapes of high quality are shipped from there every year. The southern states have awakened somewhat to the importance of grape culture. Some of the poorest sandy lands of North Carolina and Florida have been planted to vines and found to produce, when fertilized, excellent grapes. Texas is also a most productive grape region. Their earliness causes them to find a ready market in the north. But in all of North America there is no section where the grape flourishes with such wonderful success as in California and other regions beyond the Rocky Mountains. They're the tenderest and most delicious of all the grapes of France, Italy, Persia, and Palestine ripen their luscious clusters beneath the glowing skies. The grapes of Eshkol, I imagine, did not surpass those now grown in California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Idaho. All up and down their fertile valleys and foothills may be seen great stretches of vineyard after vineyard. The raisin industry alone is immense, and the product is of such high quality and is produced at so low cost that the importation of European raisins is becoming less each year, and may soon be practically at an end. We have already begun exporting our raisins to England and other parts of the world. Over 103 million pounds, filling 5,000 cars, were shipped from California alone in one year. Single clusters of grapes have frequently been grown in California that weighed from 10 to 15 pounds, and 4 or 5 pound clusters are very common. Truly, America is a land of grapes. The berries. America stands alone in the popular use of berries. Except in the matter of gooseberries and currants, which are rather plentiful in some parts of Europe, and a few strawberries and raspberries there and in Japan, there are very few berries grown outside of America. The strawberry was found wild here in all sections. The fruit was small but of most delicious flavor. A few of the varieties grown in the mother country were brought over here, but they did not flourish. About 1834 C. M. Hovey, of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Grew some seedlings of the old pine strawberry, which is an offshoot of the wild strawberry of the west coast of South America, and his introduction of varieties named Hovey and Boston Pine marked the first step in our modern strawberry culture. 
Next came the Wilson, which originated about 1850 on the grounds of John Wilson, of Albany, N.Y. This variety really popularized the growing of strawberries, because of its hardiness and productiveness. Soon after this the crescent was found at New Orleans, Louisiana. Other kinds were soon originated from seed by experimenters, and chance seedlings were found coming up in all fruit-growing regions. It was not long until there were hundreds of named varieties of good quality and that bore abundantly. Within the last decade or two there have been hundreds more originated by the most skillful hybridizers using our native species and the foreign ones also. Others just as good were picked up wherever they chanced to grow from seed. Thus, we now have the most wonderful assortment of varieties of the strawberry in the world. They are early, medium, and late. The facilities for shipping are so convenient that, now, it is possible to have strawberries in the fancy markets almost every day of the year, from some section of our great country. In the flush of the season they are so cheap and abundant that the poor can enjoy them along with the rich. From little garden patches fifty years ago, and very small ones too, we have now come to grow them by the thousand acres. The raspberry is another of our delicious berries. At first our pioneers were satisfied with those they could gather from the wild bushes. Following the same plan that was used with most other fruits, the European raspberries were brought over the sea and planted in the gardens of America. But they did poorly, and about 1850 our people began to plant the native varieties. These grew and bore well. Now we have hundreds of the very choicest named kinds, black, red, purple, and yellow, early and late, and more being originated every year. The history of the gooseberry is almost identical with that of the raspberry. The foreign kinds, although bearing very much larger fruit than our native kinds, were ruined by mildew. About 1845 Abel Houghton, of Massachusetts, grew a seedling from the wild berry, which was named Houghton, and from this came another seedling, the Downing, which was originated at Newburgh, N.Y., some years later. These two varieties are now among our very best kinds. Since the benefits of spraying with fungicides have been known, the larger and milder flavored English kinds are being grown with considerable success. The blackberry is found native only in America. It has been one of the most useful of all our wild fruits from the earliest settlement of the country, and was used by the aborigines for centuries before. Until about 1840 there was not enough thought given to blackberry culture to make the least attempt in that direction, when Captain Lovett, of Beverly, Massachusetts, gave the name Dorchester to a chance variety, and distributed it. Soon after 1850 the Lawton was taken from its wild habitat on the banks of the Hudson River. This variety was the first really good blackberry that was named and distributed. The Kittatinny followed about ten years later, having been found wild in the mountains of western New Jersey. At least two white varieties, and several having pink berries, that were found growing wild, were named and sent out. These novelties are yet cultivated by a few amateur horticulturists. It may seem strange to say that we have white and red blackberries, but it is a fact. At this date we have many kinds of later introduction, some early and some late, and of most delicious flavor. Perhaps all Americans know that cranberry sauce goes with Thanksgiving turkey. No country in the world has so many cranberries as North America. The bogs of Cape Cod are famous for this fruit, and the pilgrims of Plymouth Colony knew of them, and served them on their rustic tables. Now the wild marshes along the Atlantic are nearly all under cultivation, and the product has been increased many fold. Fully one million bushels are marketed when the crop is good. The same is being done with the bogs in the vicinity of the Great Lakes. Cranberries grow in untold quantities on the marshes of Alaska. Citrus Fruits When the Spaniards invaded Florida in search of gold they brought with them seeds of the citrus fruits from the regions of the Mediterranean. There the orange, lemon, and lime were planted in the genial climate of our southern borders. The fruit was carried hither and thither, and soon escaped the bounds of the cultivated areas. The forests in places were filled with wild orange trees, the most of which bore fruit of poor quality. When the tide of immigration set southward after the Civil War, 
these wild groves were budded to good varieties, and new land was cleared and planted with small seedlings. These were budded to good varieties in due time. Orange culture was soon a fixed industry in Florida. This increased rapidly up to the time of the severe freeze of 1894-95, when there were shipped over 5 million boxes. Since then the results of the freezing of the trees has greatly lessened the product, but it is steadily increasing again. The lemon has attracted much less interest than the orange, but I have seen one lemon orchard in Florida of more than 200 acres, and there are many smaller ones. The lime is but little called for, and is therefore grown more as a novelty than for commercial purposes. The pomelo, by some misnamed, grapefruit, is a very large, wholesome, and delicious citrus fruit that is becoming quite popular where it grows, and in the northern markets. In California the orange was first planted by the Mission Fathers centuries ago. The first real orchard is said to have been planted at San Gabriel in 1804. Before the discovery of gold in that faraway region very few orange orchards existed there, and they were of small size. Up to 1872 very little more than this was done, when the founding of the colony at Riverside, and the fortunate introduction of the Bahia or Naval Orange from Brazil by our government, at this juncture, was the start of prosperous citrus culture on that coast. Now there are annually about 5 million boxes of oranges sent out of that state alone, and the amount is steadily increasing. A large part of these are of the justly famous navel variety. Lemon growing is also becoming a great industry there. Orchards of 100 acres are rather common, and some are fully five times larger. Over 2 million boxes of lemons were produced the past season. The Olive Among the historic fruits of Palestine and southern Europe the olive holds a conspicuous place. Numerous but futile attempts were made in early times to establish it in Virginia and along the Atlantic coast, the climate there proving unsuitable. But in the warmer parts of California the olive is perfectly at home. The first olive orchard of consequence was planted by Elwood Cooper, at Santa Barbara, in 1872, and in 1876 he made oil from the fruit grown on the trees. Now there are many extensive orchards in many parts of the state. It is estimated that there are nearly 2 million olive trees now growing in that state. The oil and pickled fruit are steadily becoming popular in our fancy markets in competition with the foreign product. The Fig Very little is done in fig culture east of California, although the trees are not tender along the Gulf Coast, except in case of extremely severe winters. In California it is a decided success, commercially as well as for mere pleasure. The past year dried figs to the amount of nearly 4 million pounds were sent to market, and the quantity has been constantly increasing for several years. The Pineapple Those who have never seen pineapples growing are apt to think they are produced on trees. This is far from the fact. They grow on the tips of stalks about two feet high. The plants have large narrow leaves that cluster at the ground, from the center of which these stalks spring. A few patches were planted on the islands near the Florida coast in 1860, but it is only about 15 years since the first vigorous attempts were made to grow this delicious fruit in the United States. Florida is the only region within our country where the climate is sufficiently moist and warm for it to flourish. Along the east coast, from Rock Ledge southward, and on the west coast below Tampa, are the most favorable sections. Many acres are devoted to its culture there. Frosts damage the plants sometimes, but they soon recover. In central Florida, many acres are grown under sheds. These are made of framework, which is covered with slats or boughs as a protection from frost. Upwards of 3 million fruits of marketable size are now produced in Florida annually. Other Fruits The date is just beginning to be set in the arid regions of Arizona and Southern California, and with good prospects of success. Already many trees are in bearing, and the fruit is of excellent quality. The choicest varieties have been imported from Africa. The guava is being grown in the warm parts of Florida and California. The mango has been fruited in the warmest parts of Florida and California. Nuts The sweet almond of southern Europe has long been tested in America, 
but nowhere with success except in California, where there are almond orchards of several hundred acres each. The Persian, wrongly called English, walnut is a great success in the richer lands of California, where orchards of majestic trees have been in full bearing for many years. Of our native nuts the pecan is the best of all, and it is about the only one that has so far proved worthy of cultivation. It is found in a wild state in Illinois, Missouri, and Nebraska, and southward to the Gulf of Mexico. The creek and river bottoms suit it best, but it will do very well on almost any rich land. On some of the hammock lands of Florida hundreds of acres are now planted to the pecan. The largest pecan orchard is that of F. A. Swindon, of Brownwood, Texas, which covers over 500 acres, and is being increased from year to year. Our native chestnut is of better quality than the foreign kinds, but the nuts are much smaller. The largest are from Japan, some of which are two inches in diameter. Many of these choice kinds have been imported, and others were originated from seeds, which are now being planted in orchards. The best of the European chestnuts have also been imported, and new kinds have been grown here from the nuts. Nearly all of these varieties succeed in America, and many small orchards have been planted. Some have grafted sprouts from our native chestnut stumps and small trees with these improved kinds, and found them to grow and bear abundantly. The coconut is strictly tropical, and can only be grown in the very warmest parts of Florida. It will not endure as low a temperature as the pineapple without injury. As a commercial venture its culture will probably never pay in America, but for ornamental purposes and as an interesting novelty it is already a success from Lake Worth southward. The waving plumes of this giant palm are a source of constant delight to those who are privileged to see them. The huge clusters of nuts are indeed an interesting sight. Surely we have a great and fruitful country, from the cranberry bogs of Arctic Alaska to the waving coconut groves of Florida. This century closes and the new one begins with wonderful advances in fruit culture beyond those of a hundred years ago. The Century's Commercial Progress By Emery R. Johnson, A.M. Assistant, Professor of Transportation and Commerce, University of Pennsylvania. Commercial activity has three phases, trade, shipping, and shipbuilding. In each of these three phases of commerce the 19th century has witnessed a remarkable progress. The expansion of both domestic and international trade has far exceeded the anticipations of those who lived a hundred years ago. And the agencies of transportation by water, the numerous auxiliaries of commerce and the shipbuilding industries, have undergone a technical revolution so complete, and with consequences so beneficent to our social and industrial life. As to make the commercial progress of the past hundred years one of the salient features of the history of the century. We shall better appreciate the nature and scope of the commercial progress of the past hundred years, if we glance for a moment at a picture of the commerce of the world at the close of the 18th century. I. Main features of the world's commerce at the close of the 18th century. A hundred years ago, the volume of trade, both domestic and foreign, was necessarily kept within proportions relatively small as compared with present traffic, because of the slowness and high costs of inland transportation. Domestic inland traffic is directly dependent upon facilities for water and land transportation, and until the railroad came into use, some 70 years ago. Only those countries having numerous navigable rivers or well-developed canal systems could extend their commerce much beyond the cities and districts adjacent to tide water. In all ages since the world became civilized enough to engage in commerce, an overland traffic by caravan or wagon has been carried on. But the amount of commodities could not be large, and the kinds of goods transported were necessarily limited to articles of high value per unit of bulk or weight. Such an inland traffic as this did not establish the basis for a large coastwise or overseas commerce. At present, bulky commodities produced long distances from the seaports comprise a large portion of international traffic. And supply the coast cities with the raw materials from which they manufacture the articles they contribute to swell the volume of foreign trade. When the means were wanting for the inland transportation of these bulky commodities, only a few countries, such as Phoenicia, the Italian cities, Portugal, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, and the British colonies in America, 
could develop an important maritime commerce. During the past 50 years, the improvements in transportation have been such as to enable all industrial countries, inland as well as maritime, to engage extensively in the world's trade. Commerce has become general. And countries like Switzerland and Saxony readily market their wares the world over. The volume of foreign trade, as late as a hundred years ago, was really small, even in the case of the most important commercial nations. The imports and exports of the United Kingdom in 1800 amounted to about $360 million, which, for a population of approximately 18 million, would be about $20 per capita. At that time the trade of the United Kingdom was about one-tenth what it is now. At the present time the foreign commerce of the United Kingdom amounts to nearly $100 for each inhabitant of the country. The thirteen British colonies in America and the original commonwealths of the United States were all maritime states with navigable rivers, and their industries, lumbering, fisheries, production of food products and tobacco. Called for the exchange of large quantities of commodities with the manufacturers of the home country, and with the tropical islands of the West Indies. For their time, then, these states were large traders. The statistical information which we possess of their commerce is meager, but we know that the total trade of the colonies with the mother country in 1770 was about $13 million a year, or something over $4 per person. There was a trade of considerable proportions with the West Indies, some with the Mediterranean countries and Africa, and, after the colonies became states, with the East Indies and the Orient. But in all probability the foreign trade of the Americans did not reach $10 per capita until after 1790. At the present time, in spite of the very rapid growth of population in the United States that has continued throughout the 19th century, our foreign trade is equal to $25 per person. It is when the commerce of the 18th century is viewed from the standpoint of the transportation agencies by which it was served, the size, speed, and efficiency of the ships, that the contrast with present conditions becomes most striking. Two hundred years ago, the 560 ships owned at London averaged 157 tons. A century ago, a vessel of 300 tons was still considered a large ship, and as late as 1840 vessels of that size traded from the United States to India and China. The Grand Turk, of 564 tons, built in 1791, was probably the largest ship built in America up to that time. During the fourth decade of the 19th century numerous vessels of over 1,000 tons were constructed, and in 1840 the Great Britain of 3,000 tons was ordered. In her day the Great Britain was more of a marvel than is the recently launched Oceanic, of 28,500 tons displacement. When we consider that these small vessels in use a century ago took from a month to six weeks to cross the Atlantic, their speed being about one-third that of the freight steamers of today. We realize the great difference in the efficiency of the merchant marine of the present as compared with that by which commerce was served in 1800. The efficiency of the ships, however, does not depend alone upon their size and speed. The commercial auxiliaries which enable vessels to enter and clear harbors without delay, and to load and unload cargoes quickly, lighthouses, beacons, buoys, spacious wharves and docks equipped with mechanical appliances for handling freight. Make it possible for vessels to spend a greater portion of the time at sea. A merchant marine today has fully five times the efficiency that one with an equal tonnage had a century ago. We shall better see how this has been brought about, by briefly reviewing the technical revolution which has taken place in ocean navigation during the past 70 years. 2. The Century's Technical Revolution in Commerce During the first four decades of this century the wooden sailing vessel was the sole carrier of ocean traffic, and in the construction and operation of such ships the Americans had special advantages and manifested peculiar ingenuity. For forty years the American sailing clipper, whose fine lines made it stanch and speedy, had been the type and model of excellence in shipbuilding. But before the middle of the century the supremacy of the wooden clipper ship had been destroyed, and the technical superiority of steam and iron had been demonstrated. There are six distinct steps in the technical evolution of the ocean liner of the present day, six changes which mark the epochs in the history of the substitution of steam and steel for sail and wood. 
The first step in the evolution was taken when the steam engine and the paddle wheel took the place of wind and sails. Like most epic making changes, this one was made slowly. Indeed, it was preceded by thirty years of hesitation and conservative experimentation. Robert Fulton, taking advantage of ideas and plans which he had obtained in Europe, produced his Claremont in 1807, and demonstrated the practicability of the steamship for river traffic. Five years later, Henry Bell of Scotland constructed the Comet, the first passenger steamboat built in Europe, a vessel only forty feet long, ten and one-half feet in width, and of four horsepower. The Claremont was somewhat larger, having a length of 130 feet, a beam of 18 feet, and a hold six feet in depth. She succeeded in making five miles an hour against stream. These little vessels attracted great attention, and the problem of constructing ships that could cross the ocean by steam power began to be studied. In 1819, the Savannah was fitted with engines and crossed the Atlantic, using both steam power and sails, but the vessel did not prove a success, and her engines were taken out the following year. Indeed, it was not until 1833 that a vessel steamed all the way across the Atlantic. And this ship, the Royal William, a Canadian craft of four or five hundred tons, was able to make the trip from Quebec to Gravesend on the Thames only by stopping for coal at Picton, Nova Scotia, and cows near Portsmouth, England. The first steamships to cross the ocean without recoaling were the Sirius and Great Western, which arrived in New York the same day, April 23, 1838, the former vessel having sailed from London and the latter from Liverpool. This achievement on the part of these two wooden craft, neither one capable of carrying more than 700 tons, created a great impression. The New York, Courier and Inquirer, said, in its issue of April 24, 1838. What may be the ultimate fate of this excitement, whether or not the expense of equipment and fuel will admit of the employment of these vessels in the ordinary packet service, we cannot pretend to form an opinion. But of the entire feasibility of the passage of the Atlantic by steam, as far as regards safety, comfort, and dispatch, even in the roughest and most boisterous weather, the most skeptical man must now cease to doubt. The employment of steamships in the regular packet service was assured in 1839, when Samuel Cunard founded the famous English line that still bears his name. And ordered four steamers of moderate size that cost between four and five hundred thousand dollars each. These, however, were wooden vessels, and it was not until 1856 that the conservative Cunards constructed any iron ships. The construction of iron ships for ocean navigation marks the second important phase of the technical evolution of the past century's commerce. It began on a small scale about 1830, and in 1837 an iron vessel, the Rainbow, of 600 tons was built. But the first large iron steamer was ordered in 1840, and was the famous Great Britain before referred to, constructed by Brunel, the engineer who subsequently built the unfortunate naval monstrosity, the Great Eastern. The completion of the Great Britain, in 1843, was an important event in the progress of ocean navigation, not only because she was five times the size of her largest iron predecessor, but also because of the fact that Brunel decided, while building the vessel, to adopt the screw for propelling the ship. The substitution of the screw instead of paddle wheels represents a third phase of the technical evolution of ocean navigation. John Erickson, who subsequently built the famous Monitor, had demonstrated the practicability of the screw as a propeller in 1836, and, three years later, the Archimedes, of 237 tons, was fitted with a screw. It was the success of the Archimedes that led Brunel to adopt the screw on the Great Britain. The superiority of the screw over paddle wheels, and the greater merits of iron ships compared with wooden vessels, have long been accepted. But the adoption of iron as a material and of the screw for a propeller came about slowly. Indeed, iron shipbuilding made little progress in Great Britain before 1850, and in this country wood was adhered to till much later. One reason why the English did not change to the screw and iron more quickly was probably the great influence exerted by the powerful Cunard line, whose conservatism caused it to hold to wooden ships until 1856. The Great Eastern, finished as late as 1859, was an iron ship, 
but was fitted with both screw and paddle wheels. Of the total tonnage built in the United Kingdom in 1853, about 25% was steam tonnage and a little more than 25% was of iron. At the present time three-fourths of all British-built vessels are steamers, and no wooden ships are built in the United Kingdom. America was slow in changing from wood to iron, because the cost of iron was so high. We had wood in abundance, numerous yards for the construction of wooden vessels, and were the builders of the best type of wooden ships. In 1853, the year just referred to for Great Britain, 22% of the tonnage of the vessels built in this country was in steamships, but only an inappreciable portion was in iron vessels. The adherence of American shipbuilders and owners to wood is well illustrated by the action taken by the owners of the famous but unfortunate American Collins Line, established in 1847. The company began, in 1850, to run four palatial steamers, built without regard to cost, and supplied with luxurious appointments, some of which are retained in vessels of the present day. But the company built the ships of wood and propelled them with paddle wheels. The great American shipbuilding firm, William Cramp and Sons, founded in 1850, did not begin constructing iron ships till 1870. Even in 1898, the tonnage of wooden vessels constructed was one and a half times the steel and iron tonnage. About 26% of our merchant marine, foreign and domestic, is now made up of iron and steel vessels. The next important step in maritime progress, following the adoption of iron and the screw, was taken about 1870, when the compound engine came into general use. Though the compound engine had been used on a small vessel in France as early as 1829, it was first extensively adopted as the result of the rapid development in steam navigation which took place in the 70s. In the compound engine the steam, instead of being used in only one cylinder in passing from the boiler to the condenser, exerts its force in two or three cylinders, and even in four, in the quadruple expansion engines. This results in a great economy in the amount of fuel used. In the earlier marine engines the pressure of steam in the boilers was 13 pounds to the square inch, and the consumption of coal per horsepower per hour was 5 and 1 half pounds. Whereas, at the present time, a pressure of 200 pounds per square inch is maintained, and the fuel used has been reduced to less than 1 and a half pounds per hour for each indicated horsepower. Ten years after the compound engine came into general use, the cheapened cost of steel made it possible to adopt steel in the place of iron in the construction of hulls. This may be regarded as marking a fifth epoch-making step in the progress of commerce, because the steel ship was stronger, lighter, and able to carry more cargo than iron vessels of the same size. The substitution of steel for iron in the British yards was made rapidly. In 1879, only 10 and a quarter percent of the tonnage constructed on the Clyde was of steel, but in 1889 the percent had risen to 97. During the past 20 years there have been many improvements made in the construction and appointments of ships. But the more important changes have consisted in dividing vessels, by means of bulkheads, into several watertight compartments, and in substituting twin screws for the single screw. The Inmans placed twin screws on the city of New York in 1888, and since then their use has become general on the larger ocean liners. The twin screws add somewhat, though not greatly, to the speed of vessels. But they render ships much safer and less liable to be disabled. An ocean steamer with twin screws and watertight compartments can suffer any one of the common accidents, such as breaking of one of its shafts, losing one of its screws, having its rudder damaged, or one of its engines give out, or having its side punctured by collision, without being disabled. Although ocean travel still has its dangers, the risks at the present time are far less than they were a half or a quarter of a century ago. The technical progress of commerce during the 19th century is well summarized by Mr. Henry Fry in his book on the history of North Atlantic steam navigation, written in 1895. He says, the Comet of 1812 has multiplied into 12,000 steamships, measuring over 16 million tons. Her 20 tons have been multiplied into a ship of 18,000, her 40 feet to 692 feet, and her 4 horsepower to 30,000 in a single ship. 
Symington's 4-inch cylinder has grown to 120 inches, the pressure of steam in the boiler has increased from 13 pounds to 200 pounds on the square inch. The 243 knots, the maximum of the Great Western in 1838, to 560, and the average speed from 8.2 to 22. Zero one knots, while the consumption of coal has decreased from about five and one half to one and one half pounds per indicated horsepower per hour. The century's naval technical progress is epitomized in the White Star Liner, the Oceanic. The length of this mammoth vessel is over an eighth of a mile, being 705 feet, 6 inches. 13 and a half feet longer than the Great Eastern was. When loaded, the Oceanic draws 32 feet, 6 inches of water, and on that drafter displacement is 28,500 tons. The figures for the Great Eastern were 25 feet, 6 inches, and 27,000 tons. The capacity of her engines is 28,000 horsepower, or two and one-third times the capacity of those in the Great Eastern. The pressure in her boilers is 192 pounds to the square inch, or 10 or 12 times that in the boilers of her famous predecessor. Though not built for speed, the Oceanic can average 500 miles a day, or 60% more than the Great Eastern did. The Oceanic will accommodate 400 first-class passengers, 300 second-class, 1,000 third-class, and a ship's company of 394, making a total of 2,104 persons. In this regard, however, her figures are fortunately less than those of the Great Eastern, for that vessel was designed to carry 4,000 persons, besides crew. These figures regarding passenger accommodations indicate in a forceful way the great advancement that has been made in the comforts of ocean travel during the past 40 years. 3. Improvements in Commercial Auxiliaries The progress of commerce during the 19th century has been promoted not only by the evolution of ships of great speed and capacity, but also by the improvements made in numerous other auxiliaries of commerce. Chief among these aids to commercial activity have been the betterment of natural waterways and the construction of ship canals, the improvements of harbors, the laying of cables, and the extension of international banking facilities. The improvements of such rivers as the Rhine, Danube, Hudson, and Mississippi, and of such natural waterways as the chain of Great Lakes in the northern part of the United States are conspicuous instances of the manner in which the canalization of natural waterways has been undertaken for the promotion of traffic. That part of the Rhine River traffic which passes Emmerich and Mannheim amounted to 2,800,000 tons a year from 1872 to 1875, but by 1895 it had increased to 10,300,000 tons. The traffic on the rivers of the Mississippi Valley, according to census statistics, increased from 18,946,522 tons, in 1880, to 29,485,046 tons, in 1889, and since that year the increase must have been considerable. The effect of the improvement of waterways upon commerce is most strikingly shown in the case of our Great Lakes. In the 70s, the demands of traffic were for channels and harbors 12 feet in depth. During the next decade it was necessary for the United States to increase the depth to 16 feet, and in the 90s the channels had to be made deep enough to accommodate vessels of 20 feet draft. At the present time the traffic on the lakes is probably over 70 million tons annually. During the year 1898 the freight that passed the locks at the Salt St. Marie equaled 21 million tons, two and a half times the tonnage passing the Suez Canal. During the last third of the 19th century six important ocean ship canals have been opened, the Suez, opened in 1869, the Rotterdam Canal, in 1872, the canal connecting Amsterdam directly with the North Sea, 1877. The canal across the Isthmus of Corinth, 1893, the Manchester Canal, 1894, and the Baltic Rakeel Canal, finished in 1895. The Panama Canal was begun in 1882, and the construction of the Nicaragua Canal was commenced in 1889. But the date of the completion of these most important works is still problematical. In the improvement of its harbors every government has been active. Thirty years ago a depth of 23 feet was considered ample, but after 1880 it became necessary to adopt 27 feet as the standard. 
During the past five years the larger seaports have required harbors with 30 feet of water in order to accommodate the largest ocean vessels, and the limit has by no means been reached. The United States government has just recently, 1899, authorized the deepening of New York Harbor to 35 feet. As noted before, the oceanic can be loaded to a draft of 32 and a half feet. The docks of the great seaports have been improved at a cost of many millions of dollars. As an illustration of this Liverpool may be cited. The city's position gave it great commercial possibilities, but a troublesome bar at the mouth of the Mersey, and a tide with a rise and fall of 30 feet made the construction of its harbor and docks a difficult matter. The problem was solved by the construction, under public control, of a large number of commodious wet docks with gates which are opened only a few hours a day, during high tide. These harbor improvements have made possible Liverpool's phenomenal expansion in commerce during the past quarter of a century, an increase that has given the city third place among the seaports of the world. With an annual tonnage of vessels entered and cleared of 16 million tons. The achievements of Manchester during the past decade are even more notable than those of Liverpool. Manchester is situated on a small stream 35 miles from the ocean. But she has become a seaport for the largest ocean vessels, and has docks and wharves equipped with the most improved appliances. Her dock sheds, for instance, are twin structures, three stories in height, and the arrangements for handling freight are such that goods are taken directly from the ships to any one of the three stories of the sheds. In the United States, the government and private corporations are rapidly improving the harbor facilities of our ports. During the past decade the Gulf ports have received a special attention, with the result that a large part of our export trade is now moving through the Gulf harbors. As an instance of what private corporations are doing, mention may be made of the fact that a railway corporation has recently completed a wharf in New Orleans that cost $2 million. Besides these harbor improvements, the erection of more and better lighthouses and signals has made the approach of vessels safer. The United States Weather Bureau has also done much to lessen the dangers of navigation by its weather forecasts and its warnings of approaching storms. Although the Bureau was established only 29 years ago, and in a small way, its services have so increased and in such a practical manner as to have come to be regarded as indispensable by the commercial interests. The first successful transatlantic cable was laid in 1866, at the present time there are 170,000 miles of submarine telegraphs in use. The cables now used for commercial purposes number 320 and include about 150,000 miles of lines, the other 20,000 miles being short government lines connecting forts, batteries, signal stations, and lighthouses. The total cost of these cables has been about $250 million. The influence of the cable upon commerce has been so great as to revolutionize the methods of international trade that prevailed a century ago. Indeed, ocean telegraphy has made it no more difficult to effect international sales and purchases than it is to make domestic exchanges. With 13 cables in successful operation between the United States and Europe, we have had no difficulty in building up an immense trade across the Atlantic. But, with no Trans-Pacific line, we are experiencing much difficulty in securing a large place in the trade of the Orient. Of course the development of our commerce with the East is conditioned by numerous other factors. But no one doubts that the construction of the proposed Pacific Cable will be of assistance to our commercial progress in the Orient. Among the other agencies that have promoted the progress of commerce, mention should be made of the extension and improvement of international credit systems and banking facilities. In this regard the United Kingdom leads the nations of the world, London being the clearinghouse for a large part of the world's trade. Germany, France, and the Netherlands have also developed good facilities for international banking. But the United States has not yet done so. Our merchants are still obliged to settle most accounts through foreign banks, but it is probable that our recent acquisition of foreign possessions will cause us to establish some system of international banks. Four. Expansion of International Trade During the Century In the introductory paragraph of this paper it was stated that the commercial progress of the past hundred years is one of the salient features of the history of the century. 
And, in contrasting the commerce of a hundred years ago with that of the present, a few figures were cited that indicated in a general way the growth that the foreign trade of Great Britain and the United States has enjoyed. The expansion of international trade during the century merits fuller presentation and analysis. Accurate figures for the whole world's trade are not obtainable for the earlier years. And if it were possible to present comparative statistics of the international trade of the world, as a whole, the comparisons would not be so instructive as those which present the progress of the commerce of those countries which rank highest among trading nations. Accordingly it will be most profitable to confine our statistics and analytical study to the commerce of Great Britain, Germany, France, and the United States. During the first four decades of the century, the growth of the commerce of the United Kingdom, though considerable, was not rapid, the figures for 1839 showing an increase of 73% over those for 1800, but during the 5th, 6th, and 7th decades the progress was phenomenal. The value of the exports in 1873, as compared with 1839, shows a gain of 379% and the total foreign trade increased nearly 450%, that is, it was five and a half times as much in 1873 as it was 34 years previous. Since 1880, the quantities of imports and exports have largely increased, but the fall in prices has been such as to make the increase in the total value comparatively small. The commerce of the German states during the 19th century did not grow very rapidly until after 1850. During the early part of the century the Great Continental Wars rendered commerce nearly impossible. Peace was restored in 1815, but the German states had neither political nor commercial unity. Each state had a tariff which applied against all other states. Gradually at Salferein, or Customs Union, grew up, which, by 1854, had come to include all the German states except Austria, Holstein, Mecklenburg, Lauenburg, and the three Hansa towns, Hamburg, Lübeck, and Bremen. In 1866, the North German Federation was organized, and this paved the way for the formation of the German Empire in 1871. That Salferein made commercial progress possible, and political unity gave it a great impulse. The statistics of the German trade before the establishment of the Salferein are very meager. A German authority, Otto Hübner, estimates the value of the total import and export trade of the German states to have been $309,019,200 in 1850, and $504,988,200 in 1855. The value of the imports of Hamburg, the chief port of Germany, rose from an annual average of $92,320,050 for the five-year period 1851-55, to to $157,660,472 during the half-decade 1866-70. The growth of Germany's foreign commerce during the past 20 years has been phenomenal, and her trade is now second only to that of Great Britain. In 1881, the imports were valued at $704,904,000, and the exports at $707,978,000, being slightly more than the imports. Whereas, by 1890, the imports had risen to $986,641,000, and the exports to $792,620,000, a sum nearly $100 million less than the value of the imports. The foreign trade of the country, particularly in imports, has continued its rapid growth since 1890, the figures for 1897 being, imports $1,231,756,862, and exports $977,447,198, a total trade of $2,209,204,060. The foreign trade of France at the beginning of the 19th century consisted of $80,500,000 worth of imports and $59 million of exports, a total of $139,500,000. The Continental Wars, up to 1815, were even more disastrous to French trade than they were to German. But with the restoration of peace, commercial progress began, and between 1815 and 1831 the total trade increased from $119,200,000 worth to $168,152,000 worth. 
The growth by decades since 1830 has been as follows. In 1840, the value of the total foreign trade was $278,383,200. In 1850, $358,748,400. In 1860, $805,659,200. In 1871, $1,242,765,600. In 1880, $1,640,712,300. And in 1890, Two billion three million five hundred and fifty seven thousand five hundred and sixteen dollars. These figures show that the rapid expansion of French commerce began about 1850. The highest point was reached in 1891, but since then there has been a slight falling off in the total trade, due to a decrease in imports. In 1891, the value of the imports was one billion one hundred and fifty five million nine hundred and seventy three thousand three hundred and ten dollars. In 1897, $991,537,500. The exports were valued at $920,839,130 in 1891, and at $926,998,300 in 1897. The total trade for these years was $2,076,812,440 for 1891, and $1,918,535,800 for 1897. During the first quarter of the century France had a strong balance of trade in her favor, that is, she sold more commodities than she bought, and between 1825 and 1840 the exports and imports about balanced each other. But since that date, with the exception of the years 1871 to 1875, when the huge war indemnity was paid, the balance of trade had been unfavorable, as would naturally be expected of a country such as France, whose people are extensively engaged in manufacturing. France, as well as the United Kingdom, Germany, Belgium, Switzerland, and other European countries, imports raw materials and food in large quantities. The decline in the value of French trade, though due to falling prices rather than to a decrease in the quantities of commodities, has given the French people much concern. It is not probable, however, that this decline is due to permanent causes. The population and industries of France have not reached a stationary stage, they are going to increase and cause a natural growth in the country's foreign commerce. The commercial progress of France, however, can hardly be so rapid as that of Germany and the United States. These are the countries whose commercial vitality is strongest, and of these two countries, the United States possesses greater natural resources and larger possibilities, industrial and commercial. The progress of the commerce of the United States merits a somewhat closer survey than has been given its three leading rivals in trade. v. The trade of the United States during the century. The economic progress of the United States during the past hundred years is most clearly indicated by the growth of its foreign and domestic commerce. Being a new country, busied with occupying and developing our large territory, our domestic commerce has been of enormous proportions. With nearly 200,000 miles of railroads, comprising four-ninths of the total railway mileage of the world, with our chain of the Great Lakes and our admirable system of navigable rivers. It has been possible to exploit our natural resources on a large scale, and to develop an inland traffic several times the volume of our foreign commerce. Our international trade, however, although smaller than our domestic traffic, has been large throughout the country, has grown rapidly, especially since the year 1850, the period of the Civil War accepted, and is now increasing in such a manner as to give our foreign rivals much concern. During the first half of the century, the expansion of our foreign trade was not especially rapid. The Continental Wars, lasting from 1793 to 1815, and our own war with England, from 1812 to 1815, interfered considerably with international trade. Probably our tariffs of 1816, 1824, and 1828 had the effect they were intended to accomplish and restricted somewhat the volume of our foreign commerce. The chief reason, however, 
why our trade progress was much more rapid after 1850 was, that it was not until about that time that the means of inland transportation became developed sufficiently to make possible a large domestic traffic. When our central west was able to exchange commodities on a large scale with the seaboard, then our foreign commerce began to increase rapidly. The growth of our imports was very rapid for the period of 15 years, 1879 to 1893, their value having risen from $445,777,775 to $866,400,922. But since then there has been a sharp decline to $616,049,654. Our exports, however, have increased in a phenomenal manner during the past decade. Prior to 1897, the highest point was reached in 1892, when the value of the exports was $1,030,278,148. In 1897, the value was $1,050,993,556, and in 1898, the official year ending June 30, the value, as shown by the foregoing table, was $1,210,291,913. In consequence of this great increase in our exports the total foreign trade of the United States has not decreased in value during recent years, although there has been a considerable fall in prices and a large falling off in our importations. Our total trade, during the fiscal year 1898, was much larger than it was in 1890, and fell only $10 million short of the value reached in the record-breaking year of 1892. The calendar year 1898 shows a larger trade than has been shown by any previous year, the value being $1,868,523,057. The leading industry of the United States being agriculture, our exports consist largely of various products of the farm. In 1898 the exported agricultural products were valued at $853,683,570, and comprised 70.54% of our total sales abroad. In spite of these large figures, the preponderance of agricultural over other products is being reduced with considerable rapidity by the growth in the exportation of manufacturers. Before 1876 our exports of manufacturers were less than $100 million a year, whereas, in the calendar year 1898, they were $370,924,994. In 1880, agricultural exports comprised 83.25% of our exports, and manufactures 12.48%. And in the calendar year 1898, a year of exceptionally large foreign sales of food products, agriculture furnished only 69.06%, less than seven-tenths of the exports, while manufacture supplied 24.96%, or one-fourth of the total. The year 1898 is a notable one in the history of American manufacturers, for it was then, for the first time, that we sold to foreigners more of our manufacturers than we bought of theirs. Our exports of merchandise and gold and silver combined exceed our total imports by the large sum of $2,432,714,759. If the statistics of our imports and exports for each year since 1789 be consulted, it will be found that during the 87 years preceding 1876 there were but 16 years when our exports of merchandise exceeded our imports. The balance of trade was nearly always unfavorable. Since 1876, however, the balance has nearly always been on the other side, there having been only three years when our exports did not exceed our imports. In return for something, we have given foreign countries nearly two and a half billion dollars worth more of commodities and precious metals than we have received in return. A part of this large sum, possibly one-fourth, has been paid to foreigners for freights on our imported commodities, and we have also spent large sums in foreign travel. The chief reason why we have exported more than we have imported is, that we have been borrowing foreign capital to use in constructing railroads and factories and in developing our farms and mines. Prior to 1876, we received $1,084,339,912 more than we exported, we accumulated a large foreign debt. Since 1876, we have continued to borrow abroad. But we have been able to liquidate a part of our former debts, 
and also to exchange large amounts of commodities and precious metals for capital, for, since 1876, our exports have exceeded our imports by $3,517,054,671. If our present large excess of exports over imports continues, we shall soon become a creditor nation with large sums invested abroad. The history of our foreign trade is highly gratifying to our national pride. Our achievements have been signal, well-nigh continuous, and have been more marked during the latter decades of the century than at any previous time. The history of the American Marine, however, presents a somewhat different picture. 6. The American Marine in Foreign and Domestic Commerce In colonial days maritime industries held an important place. The location of the colonies adjacent to the ocean, their dependence upon the mother country for manufactures and upon the West Indies for tropical products, their need of foreign markets for their timber, fish, tobacco, and food products. And their abundant supply of lumber for shipbuilding, all tended to make them a seafaring people. This fondness for the sea was especially intense in New England, where the returns of agriculture were relatively meager. The long Revolutionary War destroyed many ships and interfered seriously with ocean commerce, but the struggle gave the colonists what was of more value than ships, a spirit of venture and hardihood. Hundreds of ships and thousands of seamen engaged in privateering, and when the war ended the maritime instincts of the Americans were stronger than they had been when the Declaration of Political and Commercial Independence was declared in 1776. The imbecility of the general government under the Articles of Confederation and the restrictions placed upon interstate traffic prevented any considerable maritime progress between the Peace of Paris and the inauguration of a truly national government under the Constitution. But a stable government, sound credit, and uniform national laws for the regulation of commerce gave the maritime instincts of the Americans a chance to assert themselves, and the tonnage of our ships grew rapidly larger. Our tonnage registered for the foreign trade was only 123,893 tons in 1789, by 1795 it had grown to 549,471 tons, in 1800 it amounted to 667,107 tons. During the next five years it increased to 744,224 tons, and by 1810 it had reached 981,019 tons. Such a growth as this in twenty years, from such small beginnings, was truly remarkable. The American ships soon crowded most foreign vessels out of our commerce. In 1790 we carried only 40.5% of our imports and exports. But by 1795 we had secured 90%. And, with the exception of a short period during and immediately following the War of 1812, it was not till 52 years later that as much as one-fourth of our foreign trade was carried under foreign flags. Moreover, we not only carried our own commerce, but we also entered largely into the carrying trade of other countries. The Great European War crippled the commercial activities of European countries, and made it easier for our ships to gain control of our own commerce and to secure employment as carriers for foreign merchants. During the 15 years from 1793, the year of the outbreak of the European War, to 1808. When the blockade of European ports and the capture of American ships and seamen led us to attempt to prohibit our ships temporarily from engaging in foreign trade. Our merchant marine rose from a position of obscurity to a place of great prominence on the high seas. As long as ocean commerce was carried in wooden vessels, the maritime interests of the United States continued to prosper. The War of 1812-15, the Panic of 1819, and the competition of foreign vessels after the restoration of peace in Europe, gave our marine a setback, so that it was not until 1847 that our tonnage in the foreign trade exceeded the figures for 1810. But during the period of 15 years, from 1846 to 1861, our tonnage increased 150%. When the Civil War, which proved so disastrous to the shipping interests of the United States, broke out in 1861, our tonnage registered in the foreign trade equaled 2,496,894 tons, the highest point it has ever reached. The American sailing clipper was for nearly half a century the mistress of the seas. As J. R. Soli says, 
it was in these ships that for nearly half a century not only the largest freights of the world were carried, but the finest and most profitable as well. Merchants having valuable cargoes to export would wait for the sailing of a favorite clipper, and merchants with goods to import would instruct their correspondents to wait in like manner. As late as 1850 the higher grades of commodities were almost always shipped in the stanch and speedy American clipper ship. Since 1861 the American marine in the foreign trade has played a role of decreasing importance. Three causes account for this. About the middle of the century our commercial rivals began to substitute iron ships for wooden. But we were not able to adopt the better material in the construction of our ships because of the high cost of iron in this country at that time. Great Britain could build the iron ships much cheaper than we could, and she soon began to displace us in the carrying trade of the other countries. And it was not long before she began also to carry a large share of our own foreign commerce. The second cause for our maritime decline was the Civil War. In 1861 our tonnage registered for the foreign trade was 2,500,000 tons, by 1866 it had fallen to 1,387,756 tons, a loss of over a million tons. During the war period, nearly 800,000 tons of our shipping were sold abroad, 110,000 tons were captured by Confederate cruisers, and other casualties occurred. Of course there were no ships built for our merchant marine during the stormy years of the war. Why, it may be asked, did we not restore our ships after the war and regain our former proud place on the high seas? For the simple, though possibly unsatisfying, reason that we did not find it profitable to do so. Capital is invested where the prospects for profit are best, and the inducement to put money into American ships for the foreign trade was not strong. It still cost more to build ships in our country than it did in Europe, and the expenses of operating them when constructed were greater. Moreover, our rivals had gotten possession of the lion's share of the world's carrying trade, and would not release any portion of their business without a keen struggle. At the same time the American capitalist was offered many opportunities for the investment of his property in domestic enterprises. During the quarter of a century which followed the war, we devoted our energies and capital to building our railroads, opening the West, exploiting our mineral and forest resources, and building the mills and factories whose products are now rapidly entering foreign markets in all parts of the world. America's economic activities were industrial rather than commercial. The result of these general causes has been the decline of our shipping in the foreign trade from two and a half million tons in 1861 to less than three quarters of a million tons in 1898. But it seems that the low water mark has been reached and that the tide is turning. The man who writes the history of our merchant marine on the high seas during the first half of the 20th century will, in all probability, write a record of rapid progress. We have already made much headway in substituting steel for wooden ships, and America's foremost iron manufacturer, Mr. Andrew Carnegie, says that steel ships can now be built as cheaply on our Atlantic coast as they can be built on the Clyde. Furthermore, the opportunities for investment in domestic industries are becoming fewer and less alluring, and there are good reasons for thinking American capitalists will be disposed from now on to put their ventures in ships to sail foreign seas. The attitude of American capitalists, however, will depend very largely on the maritime policy adopted by the United States. That policy should unquestionably be as liberal as the policy adopted by our rivals in commerce. Whatever differences of opinion may rightly exist as regards specific measures for the restoration of the American marine to the high seas. All parties should agree as touching the justice and necessity of treating our maritime interests as generously as Great Britain deals with the owners of her mighty marine. Our domestic marine, being free from foreign competition, has had a prosperity as great as the adversity of our foreign marine. The present tonnage of domestic shipping is nearly 4 million tons, our growth during the period since the Civil War having been nearly a million tons. The traffic on our northern lakes now employs 3,256 vessels, canal boats, and barges, with a total tonnage of 1,437,500 tons, and two-thirds of this tonnage consists of steamships. In 1888 our lake tonnage was only 874,102 tons. 
the growth during a decade having been nearly 80%. It is hardly necessary to remark that the increase or decrease in the efficiency of a marine during the last few decades is not measured by the growth or decline in the tonnage statistics. The modern steamship, aided by the many commercial auxiliaries that facilitated in receiving and discharging its cargo, is a much more efficient transportation agent than was its smaller predecessor propelled by sails. And loaded and unloaded mainly by human labor. Our present domestic marine of 4 million tons is at least twice as effective as was the domestic shipping of 3 million by which we were served a generation ago. 7. American Shipbuilding one great aid to the achievement of maritime greatness is a strong shipbuilding industry, and every nation with commercial aspirations endeavors to establish the business upon a sure foundation. For some countries, as in the case of the United Kingdom, that is much easier than for others, and that is one reason why Great Britain has so easily succeeded in maintaining her place as mistress of the seas. The business of building ships in the United States, to be used in foreign trade, has passed through a golden age of triumphs, followed by a period of decline and discouragement, and it is now entering upon an epoch of revival. The golden age came in the days of wooden vessels. It began in early colonial times and lasted until the middle of this century, when the world began to buy iron ships of the United Kingdom. The magnitude of our shipbuilding industry at the middle of the 19th century is indicated by the fact that during the decade beginning with 1850 the tonnage built in our yards equaled 3,988,372 tons, an annual average of nearly 400,000 tons. During the three years 1854 to 56 we constructed over a million and a half tons. The decline in American shipbuilding set in sharply after the Civil War, and, in spite of the continued growth of our domestic marine, the tonnage constructed by American builders steadily declined until 1886, when only 95,453 tons were built. The causes of this decline have been stated in what has been said regarding the substitution of iron and steel vessels for wooden. The period of decline seems now to be safely passed, for we are annually building over 200,000 tons on an average, and every indication points to rapid progress in the near future. What is more indicative of progress than the increase in the tonnage constructed is the growth in the percentage of steamers and iron and steel ships built, as compared with the wooden sailing ships turned out. During the decade 1872-81, we built 800,000 tons of steamers and 224,000 tons of iron and steel ships, in the decade following, we constructed 1,200,000 steam tons and 485,000 tons of iron and steel vessels. And from 1891 to 1898 our yards turned out 730,432 tons of steamships and 543,850 tons of iron and steel vessels. As these figures indicate, the reconstruction of our merchant marine is progressing with a fair degree of rapidity. At the present time one half our tonnage consists of steamers, but our percentage of iron and steel is still small as compared with other countries. Over seven-tenths of our tonnage consists of wooden ships, whereas our chief commercial rival has practically no wooden vessels whatever. Only seven percent of the French marine consists of wooden ships, and in the case of Germany less than five percent. The outlook for iron and steel shipbuilding is so promising that a rapid increase in iron and steel tonnage is certain to come. Largely through the influence of the reconstruction of our navy, numerous large plants for the construction of steel ships have been established at Bath, Philadelphia, Wilmington, Baltimore, Newport News, San Francisco, and other seaports. Cities on the Mississippi River, and especially those on the Great Lakes, are engaged in building ships of iron and steel. There are several steel plants in the lake ports, and in them we have built the larger part of our steel tonnage. Our iron ships have been built chiefly in the seaboard yards. During the present year, 1899, the American yards are busy constructing vessels both for the Navy and for our merchant fleet, and new yards are being established. Having begun selling crude and structural iron and steel and various classes of machinery in Europe, even in Great Britain, we shall ere long be selling iron and steel ships. The excellence of our navy has brought us orders for war ships, and the skill and invention of our shipbuilders will bring us foreign orders for merchantmen. 8. 
causes accounting for the century's commercial progress. The commercial progress of the 19th century, the salient phases of which have been depicted in the foregoing pages, has been the result of three sets of causes, economic, political, and social. The economic causes of most importance are the improvements in transportation, the reorganization of industry on a large scale, the accumulation of capital. Together with the growth of corporations and credit institutions whereby the utility of capital has been enhanced, and the discovery of large stores of gold. Transportation is the handmaid of trade. Whatever enables this handmaid to do her work cheaper and quicker enlarges the scope and volume of the world's commerce. When one considers that it cost nearly four times as much in 1875 to ship wheat from New York to Liverpool as it did 20 years later, and fully three times as much from Chicago to Liverpool, one can readily understand how transportation has removed hindrances to commerce. Cheap and rapid transportation has made an extensive commerce possible, but it has been the organization of industry on a large scale that has created the chief demand for commerce. Industry at the present time is, to a large extent, so organized as best to promote the territorial and international division of labor, and each large producer regards the whole world as his market. The amount of commerce required increases with the concentration and specialization of industry, and with every widening of the producer's market. It has been the accumulation of capital and its increased availability for purposes of production that have made possible the organization of industry on its present basis. And enabled men to construct the highly developed transportation system by means of which commerce is accomplished. The material progress of the past century is unprecedented. Industry has created wealth as with the touch of a magic wand. And this rapidly growing wealth has been made available capital through the instrumentality of the corporation which, by means of stocks and bonds, has gathered into giant organizations the property of hundreds and even thousands of individuals. The industrial corporations have been greatly assisted in their work of concentrating and applying capital, by the banks and other institutions that have enlarged credit and made a given amount of property capable of performing a much larger work. The expansion of industrial credits, furthermore, has been greatly facilitated by the issue of government bonds in large amounts during the century. These state obligations constitute excellent business securities, of which banks, other corporations, and individuals make extensive use. Such are some of the factors that have promoted the accumulation of capital and increased the volume of commerce. Money is not capital, but an adequate supply of a sound and stable medium of exchange is essential to industrial and commercial progress. Twice in the history of the world the discovery of large supplies of the precious metals has given a great impetus to industry and trade, once, in the 16th century. When the Spanish galleys brought to Europe rich treasure from the silver mines of America. And again, in the middle of the 19th century, when the rich finds of gold were made in Australia and California. The very rapid increase in the commerce of the United States and of the world at large, which began about 1850, was in no small degree the result of the rising prices which followed the discoveries of gold. The closing decade of the century is witnessing a similar occurrence. For many years prices declined rapidly, the demands made upon the world's gold supply were rapidly increased at a time when the annual output was declining. From 1850 to 1870 the annual output of gold averaged over $130 million, it then declined so rapidly that it amounted to only a little over $100 million a year, in 1885 and 1886. It was only $118,848,700 in 1890. But the present annual production is nearly $300 million, and the fall in prices has been cheeked for a while at least. The very rapid enlargement in commerce during the past two years must have been facilitated by the recent increase in the annual production of gold. A second general cause accounting for the world's progress in commerce is political, the commercial policy followed by the leading nations of the world. Up to the 19th century, practically every country strove to promote its trade, navigation interests, and its power as a nation by means of the mercantile system. A system of strict and detailed regulation of foreign trade by means of tariffs and navigation laws. Each country strove to determine the nature of its international trade, and endeavored to carry on its commerce in its own ships. 
In the case of one country, at least, the mercantile system was eminently successful. Great Britain entered the Great Napoleonic Wars with a powerful naval and merchant marine, and emerged from that struggle the unquestioned mistress of the ocean. Her industries also, as well as her ships, were stronger than those of other countries. And she soon concluded that both her foreign trade and her shipping would profit by doing away with the restrictions of the mercantile system, and adopting the policy of entire commercial freedom. She made no mistake, for her industries and commerce have wonderfully prospered. The success of free trade and freedom of commerce in the United Kingdom had much influence upon other countries, and, during the third quarter of the 19th century, several countries began to move cautiously in the direction that the United Kingdom had taken. They soon found, however, that for them free trade and shipping meant British trade and shipping, because of their inability to compete successfully with their powerful rival. And, during the last quarter of the century, the dominant commercial and maritime policy outside of the British Isles has been one providing for the regulation of trade by tariffs, and for the promotion of the mercantile marine by postal payments and bounties. At the present time, the two most powerful commercial rivals of the United Kingdom are the United States and Germany, and their trade policy is one of regulation instead of freedom. It would seem, therefore, judging by results, that both the United Kingdom and her competitors have acted wisely, and that in both cases the means adopted were such as conditions demanded. The third cause of the world's commercial progress during the past century has been colonial expansion. Germany, France, and other countries, influenced by the great success of the United Kingdom, have established colonies in different parts of the world, and assumed control over uncivilized peoples, until there are now 125 colonies, protectorates and dependencies. These 125 regions comprise two-fifths of the land surface of the globe, and contain one-third of its population. These colonies and protectorates import annually over $1,500,000,000 worth of commodities, and of this large sum more than 40% is bought from mother countries. The last nation to adopt the policy of colonial expansion is the United States, her principal colony, the Philippine Islands, having been made a part of her possessions because of our desire to secure a larger share of the trade of the Orient. 9. The Twentieth Century Prospect The world is entering upon the twentieth century with the nations of the earth bound to each other by much closer relations than existed a hundred years ago, and chief among the forces that draw the countries of the world together is commerce. It is commerce, more than anything else, that has brought about the existing organization of industry in which each nation is dependent upon every other. The nations of the world are mutually dependent, but their interests are not identical. In the future, as they have done in the past, nations will compete with each other, each striving to secure for itself a maximum of economic advantage, and this competition will continue to take the form of commercial rivalry. The great international struggles of the present day are being carried on to secure trade advantages. And at no time in the past have those contests been more earnest than they now are. The conflicts of the 20th century will be commercial struggles, and they will be intense. In the centuries when Phoenicia, Greece, Carthage, Rome, and Venice were successively powerful, the Mediterranean was the theater of commercial activity in international rivalry. The navigators and explorers, whose exploits closed the medieval period and inaugurated the modern era, carried the world's commerce from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic and transferred the centers of national greatness from the southern to the western and northern nations of Europe. The great industrial countries of the present are those of Europe and America adjacent to the North Atlantic. These countries originate the larger part of the world's commerce. And the main streams of international trade are those which connect these countries with each other and with those regions of the earth less highly developed industrially. The Isthmus of Suez, just north of the Tropic of Cancer, and the Isthmus of Panama, a short distance south of that line, were the only barriers which nature placed across an otherwise continuous water route around the earth in the northern hemisphere. These barriers diverted the lines which the world's largest volume of traffic tends to follow far to the south around Africa and South America, or did so until 1869. When Europe overcame the barrier of most consequence to her by the construction of the Suez Canal. 
Since the opening of that waterway Europe has enjoyed advantages for international trade superior to those enjoyed by our country. Our regions most highly developed industrially are tributary to the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico. To the east of U.S. lies Europe, a region of great industrial advancement, demanding little more than our surplus food products and raw materials. To the south are the countries of the South Atlantic lying along the line of the world's secondary commercial routes. Countries, moreover, whose trade we can secure only in direct competition with Europe, which has already forestalled us at many points. In pushing their trade westward the industrial states of the United States, and they are found in the eastern half of our country, find that the possibilities of a traffic by land are restricted within narrow bounds by the heavy costs of a long haul over the elevated Cordilleran mountain ranges. While shipments by water have to take the circuitous and expensive route around South America. Until an Isthmian canal is constructed the United States will be handicapped in its competition with Europe for the trade of all countries bordering the Pacific Ocean. The United States looks forward to the coming century, confident of sharing largely in the world's commerce. With an enormous and rapidly growing foreign trade, and with her industries sending their wares into all quarters of the globe, the future of her trade is certain. Shall we also become a great maritime nation? Shall we be as successful in the age of steel steamships as we were in the days when our clipper ships, those strong-winged gulls in timber, put swift girdles around the earth? Unquestionably, yes. The commercial advantages which our rivals have possessed for half a century have nearly all disappeared. Our maritime instincts are not dead. And when we again turn our attention in earnest to the work of international navigation, we shall, when anew the wide-reaching seas our sires loved and occupied so well. Education During the Century By Franklin S. Edmonds, A.M. Assistant, Professor of Political Science, Central High School, Philadelphia The 19th century has been characterized by a deep and abiding interest in popular education. One hundred years ago there were many close observers who strongly opposed all attempts to provide schools for the masses, lest they should be educated above their station in life. This feeling was particularly strong in conservative countries like England. It led the Duke of Wellington to remark to one who was explaining to him the work of Joseph Lancaster, Take care what you are about. For unless you base all this on religion, you are only making so many clever devils. So careful a critic as Alexis de Tocqueville, after his visit to the United States in 1831, wrote to Jared Sparks, Are the effects of education uniformly good? Does not a man who obtains an education above his social condition become an unquiet citizen? The first triumph of the nineteenth century was the conquest of this fear. And there is today a general belief that it is the duty of each community to provide a well-developed school system, that each child may have an opportunity for making the best and highest use of his powers and capabilities. Perhaps no single element has contributed more to this change in the popular attitude towards schools than the writings of the great group of thinkers who, with lofty ideals and keen acumen, have devoted themselves to the study and discussion of educational questions. Germany has been foremost in its contributions to educational literature. Foremost in time as an influence is John Henry Pestalozzi, 1746-1827. Although endowed with an unrivaled incapacity for government, Pestalozzi has yet become an inspiration to modern pedagogy, because of his love for teaching and the tender sympathy of his nature. After various educational experiments, he opened, in 1805, a school at Yverdun, on the Lake of Neuchâtel, which soon won for him a European reputation, and became a center of interest to educators from all Europe. The Emperor of Russia gave him a personal proof of his favor, and Fichte, the great German philosopher, declared that he saw in Pestalozzi in his labors the dawning of a new era for humanity. In his writings and in his teaching Pestalozzi emphasized the importance of the home in education. He asserted the truth that all instruction is based on observation, neither books nor any product of human skill, but life itself, yields the basis for all education. And in a general way he aimed to develop the child through his own personal activity, rather than to furnish him with useful facts. The most eminent of Pestalozzi's disciples was Friedrich Froebel, 1782-1852, the founder of the kindergarten. 
After a varied career as a forester, student at Jena, etc., Froebel went to Iverdun in 1808, and for two years was a co-laborer with Pestalozzi. The impulse which he here received never lost its force. It brought him to consider the problems of elementary education, and finally led, in 1837, to his establishment of the first kindergarten at Blankenburg in Thuringia. His idea may be well expressed in his own words, I can convert children's activities, energies, amusements, occupations, all that goes by the name of play, into instruments for my purpose, and therefore transform play into work. This work will be education in the true sense of the term. His great theory was idealistic, he believed in the unity of the universe, in the essential harmony of the world. It was the duty of the teacher to fit the child for his place in human society. This could be best done if the child was taken at a very early age and prepared for life in an ordinary school. The kindergarten, or child garden, is thus a school where a child learns social life, where his play is systematized and his activities are directed. The average course of study takes hold of the child when he is six years of age. The kindergarten usually fills in the two preceding years. As an educational institution, the kindergarten has met with little public support in Europe, although in Paris there are a number of maternal schools, which correspond closely to Froebel's plan. In the United States, Miss Elizabeth Peabody became the first apostle of the movement. The idea of caring for the children below the regular school age won instant favor, and in a number of large cities kindergartens were opened under private auspices. As their success became clearer and more positive, they were taken under the control of the public. In 1896-97, the report of the United States Commissioner of Education shows that there were 1,077 kindergartens in the United States connected with the public school systems of cities having more than 4,000 population, with an enrollment of 81. 916 pupils. The International Kindergarten Union, formed for the purpose of gathering and disseminating knowledge of the kindergarten movement throughout the world, has aided greatly in stimulating an intelligent interest in Froebel's ideals in America. None of the great German philosophers has been honored with a more loyal cult than Johann Friedrich Herbart, 1775-1841, who directed general attention to the necessity of studying the principles of education. In his writings and lectures while professor at the University of Göttingen, Herbart started an inquiry into the theoretical basis of instruction. He found the final aim of all education to center in the formation of moral character, while the keystone of instruction is interest. The final aim of instruction is morality. But the nearer aim which instruction in particular must see before itself in order to reach the final one, is many-sidedness of interest. Herbart's influence in arousing and directing thought has been most felt in Germany, but in America his name has been taken by one of the most active educational associations, the National Herbart Society. Next to Germany in its list of great educational thinkers must come England. At the beginning of this century there were no public schools, in England, in the American sense of the term. The great preparatory schools, Eton, Rugby, Harrow, Winchester, etc., although called public, by the English, were in reality endowed boarding schools, where as a rule only the children of the rich could be found. General education was cared for by the village schools under the direction of the vicar of the parish, and usually presided over by elderly dames with varied degrees of attainments. At the end of the 18th century, the work of Andrew Bell and Joseph Lancaster began to arouse some interest. Working independently, the one in India and the other in London, both developed the same method of providing general instruction at a minimum of cost, by using the more advanced pupils to instruct the beginners. By the aid of monitors, said Lancaster, one master can teach a thousand boys. In 1798, Lancaster opened the first English school of this kind in Southwark, London, placing this inscription over the door, all that will may send their children and have them educated freely. And those that do not wish to have education for nothing may pay for it, if they please. In 1808, the Royal Lancasterian Society was organized to agitate for more schools, and although its name was changed, in 1814, to British and Foreign School Society, its work has continued down to the present time. In 1818, Lancaster came to America, 
and was at once placed in general charge of the public schools of Philadelphia. He was made principal of a model school for training teachers, which is believed to have been the first attempt at a normal school in America. After extensive agitation in New York, in Canada, where in 1829 he received an appropriation from the legislature to enable him to start his monitorial schools, and even in South America, Lancaster's work was done. Probably the greatest teacher of the century in England was Thomas Arnold, whose character will long live in literature through the loving portraiture of his pupils. While contributing little of importance to the science of pedagogy, he was yet able to work a revolution in the general conception of teacher and pupil, and their relations to each other. He insisted that his teachers must continue their studies after they had secured positions, and so raised professional ideals. The pupil, said he, must drink from the running fountain, and not from the stagnant pool. His sympathy gave him rare power to mold the character of boys. He trusted his boys and they became worthy of it. It is a shame to tell Arnold a lie. He always believes one, was the common saying. As a consequence, there went out from rugby school from 1827 to 1842, the years of Arnold's headmastership, a group of clean, healthy, whole-souled boys, well fitted to become leaders in English life. Many contributions have been made to the literature of pedagogy during the century, but there is none that has attracted more attention or stimulated more earnest discussion than Herbert Spencer's education. In the first chapter of his book, Spencer asks the question which aroused the educational world, what knowledge is of most worth? It at once directed inquiry into the very heart of educational theory. The course of study, the order in which subjects should be considered, the time to be given to each, all these problems were vitally concerned with the answer to this question. Mr. Spencer's solution one instant favor, how to live, said he, that is the essential question for us. And this, being the great thing needful for us to learn, is, by consequence, the great thing which education has to teach. To prepare us for complete living is the function which education has to discharge. This point of view led to the accenting of useful and practical subjects. The human body should be studied, this is necessary to fulfill the first law of nature, self-preservation. The natural sciences should be an essential part of education, this is necessary for our acquaintance with the world in which we must live and work. History and social science should be studied, that each one may become fully in touch with the society in which he forms a unit. Naturally, little time would be left for branches that were aesthetic or cultural, and so Spencer would have the student give but his surplus time to these. But the important thing was that he should know himself, his world, and his society, so that he would be fitted to do his work in the most complete way. His practical influence upon education is best seen in the great increase of appreciation for the natural sciences, which has led to the introduction of nature observation and study, even in the most elementary schools. In America there have been important contributions to educational theory during the century. There has been a perfect flood of educational books, pamphlets, and periodicals, whose merit is so great as to extort even reluctant admiration from foreign critics. While there has been much unevenness in quality, yet Americans have no reason to feel ashamed of their contribution to pedagogical literature. The best work has been done in the discussion of specific questions, rather than in an elaboration of general ideals. Administration, with its manifold problems, has appealed strongly to the American genius. And consequently the greatest names of the century are those of men who have devoted themselves to some practical work, the ideals and details of which they have thoroughly mastered, and so have left enduring monuments of their lives' work. The great achievement of the century in the United States has been the establishment of a system of free and public schools. Like most of the nation's intellectual impulses, this spirit seems to have come from New England. There, the democratic ideals of the people led to an early appreciation of the necessity for universal education. There can be little doubt that it was from the Puritan settlements in Massachusetts that the original impulse toward universal education came. Thus, in 1647, the colonial assembly required that each town containing 100 families should establish a grammar school to prepare youths for the university. During colonial times more and more schools were steadily established. 
But the movement, which was zealously supported in New England and encouraged in the Middle States, especially by the Friends, met with opposition in the South, where education was considered a family duty, and not within the province of the state. Whatever, therefore, was accomplished in an educational line prior to the revolution depended upon the spirit of the individual colonies, consequently, there was the widest possible divergence in the policies and methods of different localities. But as soon as the revolution had been accomplished, and independence had become a fact, a renewed interest in general education was evident. It is exceedingly interesting to watch the development of the point of view that free schools were a necessity for the existence of the republic, and hence must be established by the state. The early fathers of the nation were not slow to recognize this. In the words of Franklin, a Bible and newspaper in every house, a good school in every district, all studied and appreciated as they merit, are the principal support of virtue, morality, and civil liberty. In proportion as the structure of a government gives force to public opinion, said Washington, it is necessary that public opinion should be enlightened. And Jefferson, with his broad philosophical appreciation of democracy, started the battle against the ideas of Governor Berkeley, of Virginia, when, in 1779, he introduced into the General Assembly of Virginia a bill providing for the establishment of schools for the free training of all free children, male and female. The half century from 1790 to 1840 is the period of the battle for free public schools. It was a hard fight, complicated in many states by local questions and conditions that rendered success almost hopeless. Some opposed from the old point of view that education was an individual matter, each should get for himself just so much as was possible. Others raised the objection of cost, if taxation was proposed, was it right to take money from one group to educate the children of another? Religious disputes hindered progress, many of the denominations had founded sectarian schools, and were unwilling to see them replaced by public schools, where no creed would be taught. Especially, in some states, as in Pennsylvania, where Swede, German, Scotch, Irish, and English lived side by side, did the race problem enter as a perplexing element. Should any language other than English be taught? What respect should be given to the traditions and customs of each race group? Moreover, when the conservatism began to yield to progress, it compromised with great reluctance. At first, provision was made whereby the children of the poor should have their school fees paid by the state. Then public schools were started exclusively for the poor, which were branded with the stigma of pauper schools. But these difficulties only served to increase the ardor of the public school advocates, and at length their success was complete. Some episodes of the struggle deserve special mention. Horace Mann, 1796 to 1859, has been called this T. Paul of Education in America. In 1837, the State Board of Education was created in Massachusetts, and Horace Mann was appointed its first secretary. For twelve years he labored with unflagging energy to build up the public interest in education. By speech and by pen, he awakened in his state an appreciation of the value of the public school system that has never since decayed. He established on an enduring basis the business side of education in the state by systematizing the school funds. The personal sacrifice was enormous. He addressed public meetings all over the country. When he found that no arrangements had been made at Pittsfield to prepare the schoolhouse for his meeting, Horace Mann and Governor Briggs themselves swept out the building and set it in order. One of his first interests was the provision of good teachers. In order to spur the assembly to its duty, he begged from his friends the sum of $10,000, which, with an equal sum appropriated from the state treasury, was used in the establishment of the Massachusetts Normal Schools at Lexington and Bar, 1839. Outside of his administrative work, his fame must rest upon his stanch advocacy of the principle of the obligation of a state on the great principles of natural law and natural equity. To maintain free schools for the universal education of its people. In Pennsylvania, the hero of the battle for free schools was Thaddeus Stevens. In 1834, a law was passed by the legislature establishing a state system, and abolishing the distinction between rich and poor which had been noticed in the old pauper schools. Two years later, a determined effort was made by the combined forces of ignorance, 
prejudice, and caste, to repeal the Act of 1834. Nothing but the stanchness of Governor Wolfe and the power exerted by the eloquence of the bold commoner saved free schools for the Keystone State. And so established the system which today receives more direct aid from the state treasury than in any other state of the Union. West of the Alleghenies, the interest in popular education has always been deep and thorough. Settled in large measure by the steady sons of New England, education found there a most fertile soil. Moreover, by the wise foresight of Congress, provision was made for school funds in a most satisfactory way. The Ordinance of 1787, which organized the territory north of the Ohio River, contained a provision that one section of land in each township should be devoted to public education. If this grant, which was originally suggested by Jefferson, had been carefully watched, it would have been sufficient to endow the public schools of many western states. The national government gave to education in the first hundred years of its history nearly 80 million acres of public lands, but these grants were not always conserved with sufficient care. In 1896-97 the total revenue of the school systems in the United States was $188,641,243, of which less than 5% was from state school funds or rent of school lands, while over 86% was derived from state and local taxation. To these grand totals must be added the million and more in attendance at private schools throughout the country, and the rapidly increasing number, now 217,763, of those who receive higher instruction. In universities and professional and normal schools. This makes for the United States a grand total of 16,255,093 pupils and students of all grades in public and private schools. The growth during the last generation has been most marked. The statistical table gives an opportunity for comparison with the year 1870-71, the span of a generation, and it has been estimated that within this period the average total amount of schooling has increased from 2.91 years to 4.28 years. In other words, the amount of education which each one felt able to afford has increased almost one half. Such is the magnificent result which has grown out of the isolated village schools of our New England ancestors, fostered by the democratic desire for intelligence found all over the country. Equally great has been the change in the spirit of the school. In the early days the schools were very crude. Population was scattered, and since the children could not go as far to school as their elders did to church, the number of schoolhouses was very great. They were usually put up by the people of the neighborhood with little pretense at adornment. The average schoolhouse was located either at a fork in the roads or on an elevation, where it shared, with the church, the honor of conspicuousness. We give a picture of old Sleepy Hollow Schoolhouse, made famous by Washington Irving's elaborate description of Ichabod Crane, its ruler in the colonial days. But a structure of this kind is luxurious compared with the hardships of more sparsely settled regions. From Wickersham's History of Education in Pennsylvania, the following description is called, The Pioneer Schoolhouse was built of logs, 16 by 20 feet, 7 feet to the ceiling, daubed with mud inside and out. A mud and stick chimney in the north end, and in the west a log was left out, and the opening covered with oiled paper to admit light. Holes were bored in the logs and pins driven in, on which to nail a long board for a writing table, and slabs with legs answered for seats. The early schoolhouses were generally situated near the roadside or crossroads, being without playground, shade trees, or apparatus. Here the master kept his country school for a term of from six to twelve weeks. In the winter time the pupils were almost frozen, and there were other dangers which the hardy lad of those days had to encounter. Nevertheless, rude, uncomfortable, and inadequate as they were, it was here that our forefathers obtained their scanty schooling. The three R's, reading, written, and arithmetic, formed the basis of the course of study. Methods were very simple. Much of the early instruction was religious in its trend, and the child was expected to use books which would teach moral lessons. Church books, containing creeds and hymns and catechisms, might be used in the school for study. Then there were the primers or books to teach the A, B, C. The famous New England Primer was published in the latter part of the 17th century. 
Later editions contained rhyming couplets upon each letter of the alphabet, illustrated with such imagery as the art would allow. A page from the Child's Guide, published in London in 1762, is shown on page 527. Its verses were easily memorized, and sometimes gave a basis for a spelling lesson. There were no graded readers until this century. Writing in some neighborhoods was taught only to boys, on the general ground that it was an unnecessary accomplishment for the sex which never engaged in business. Ink was homemade from bruised nutgalls placed in a bottle with water and rusty nails. The writing was done with a quill pen, and one of the foremost duties of the old-fashioned pedagogue was to make and mend pens. The master set the copies by writing a lesson which was to be imitated by the pupils. There was no set style, but usually the teacher wrote a bold, legible hand which in time was acquired with a fair degree of success. Arithmetic was taught without textbooks. Sums were given out by the master and worked out on paper on the desk. Nothing but the more rudimentary principles was taught, and the higher branches of algebra and geometry were unknown in the public schools of this time. Spelling was one of the favorite studies. It gave free scope for the memory, and provided an opportunity for one of those public exhibitions in which Americans have always delighted. Spelling on the book, says Wickersham, was taught by attempting to lead the pupil to give the names of syllables and words by naming the letters of which they are composed. The first lesson consisted of combinations of a word with one or more consonants, arranged so that a kind of rhyme aided the pronunciation, as of, eb, ib, etc. Spelling off the book consisted in naming the letters of words pronounced for that purpose. But the chief enjoyment of spelling came from the old-fashioned contests, or, spelling bees. Sometimes it was to discover the best speller of the district, again, one district might be pitted against another. The spellers would be arranged in two rows. The first word would be given to the first speller on one side, the next to his rival, the third to his comrade, and so on. If one missed a word, he at once took his seat. Presently the contest would narrow down to a few, until at last all would have missed save one, and he or she became the champion speller. The teachers of the time formed a group of varied attainments, and oftentimes with little professional enthusiasm. Teaching has always suffered from the fact that a great number of young men enter upon its practice, who use it merely as a stepping stone to some other and more attractive pursuit. The number of those who have taught a few terms, in order to save money for a college, law, or medical course is legion, and this fact has laid the profession open to the reproach that only the unambitious and the unalert follow it permanently. In the early days of our country's history, this stigma was intensified by the number of itinerant schoolmasters, men who wandered from place to place, teaching a term in one village and then moving to the next, odd in dress. Eccentric in manners, and oftentimes intemperate. Their work was simple in its nature, they were to keep order and to teach the rudiments. Their methods in the latter have already been referred to, for the former, they relied, almost universally, upon the unsparing use of the rod. The wisdom of the practice of flogging has only been questioned in the latter part of this century. In the early days it was the one recognized punishment, even for students whose maturity and attainments would suggest an appeal to reason. With this mode of punishment was associated a more or less ingenious series of devices, such as the dunce block, the fool's cap, etc. All calculated to bring the offender into ridicule, but utterly destructive of that good feeling between teacher and pupil, upon which so much stress is laid today. In the course of the century the old-fashioned school has either passed away or else has been modified materially. Today it is to be found in only sparsely settled districts. While in the cities and in the more cultured neighborhoods one finds carefully planned systems of education that show the fruits of the study and direction of some of the keenest minds that our country has produced. While it is impossible in the space of a single chapter to refer to all the changes, yet some of the most important will be considered. Foremost in real importance come the changes in the course of study, in the list of subjects which the well-educated young man may be expected to have mastered. One hundred years ago the average child would have gone to the village school for the three R's, with, maybe, a little training in geography and parsing. If a college career was open to him, 
he would then go to an academy, usually a private institution, for his introduction to the classics, Latin and Greek, and to algebra. While instruction was given in other branches, yet these formed the backbone of the course. The average age of admission to college was considerably less than it is at present. In the ordinary college there was a required course of study, in which Latin, Greek, and higher mathematics played the most conspicuous part. The scientific studies were counted less educative, and were usually rather poorly taught. Literature, history, and philosophy were sometimes included in the college curriculum, and in many ways the course of study was modeled to suit the preferences and abilities of the different teachers. Nowadays this is all changed. In the United States a graded school system has been created, that is, a complete course of study has been worked out, whereby certain studies are specified as suited for each year of the school life. This is not the same for all parts of the country, for the American school system, unlike that in Germany and France, is not national in its organization. The authority over the schools is vested in the individual states, and as a consequence each state shows peculiarities in course of study, in laws, and in methods that make the whole seem chaotic. There is, however, more similarity than would appear at first sight, and while what is asserted in general may not be true of each particular locality, yet certain lines of development may be clearly seen. The schools of the country may be divided into three groups, elementary, secondary, and higher. The elementary schools are built in some places upon the kindergarten. They are ordinarily supposed to occupy the first eight or nine years of the child's school life, and are classified as primary and grammar schools. During that period the pupil studies a great variety of branches, language studies, reading, writing, spelling, and grammar. Arithmetic, geography, United States history, civil government, nature study, physiology and hygiene, physical culture, vocal music, drawing and manual training in boys' schools, or sewing and cooking in girls' schools. Several of these subjects have been introduced only within the last few years. The tendency toward enriching the curriculum is quite manifest today. It is based upon the fact that by far the larger part of the pupils never enter the higher schools, since their education is ended with the elementary schools. Therefore it is thought desirable to bring some of the higher subjects into the grammar school. With the completion of this elementary course the pupil passes into the secondary school. Earlier in the century this was ordinarily a private academy, either conducted for profit or by a religious society. In exceptional cases these schools were public, but as the benefits of higher education were recognized more completely, the popularity of these schools increased enormously. Public high schools were opened, and success led to their rapid multiplication, until today they form one of the most useful elements in our system, sending forth year by year leaders of thought and molders of opinion. Their course of study has been the subject of much controversy. The old academy prepared for the college, the new high school prepares for life. Consequently there ensued a breach between the high school and the college which only now is being closed. The ordinary high school course is four years, and includes languages, Latin, French, German, and sometimes Greek and Spanish. Mathematics, algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and sometimes analytical geometry and even astronomy, history, literature, physical geography, physics, chemistry, biology, geology, drawing, and occasionally political economy, ethics, and civics. It will be noticed that subjects formerly taught only in the colleges have been brought into the high school curriculum. This again is due to the enriching process, and is illustrative of the fact that for so many of its students the high school is the crown of their education. The stress laid upon nature study and the physical sciences, and the introduction of modern languages, are among the most significant changes of the century. As indicative of the desire to bring the schools in touch with the conditions of practical life. From the high school or academy, the student passes to the college or university. Within the last decade an attempt has been made to give a definite pedagogical content to each of these terms. A college is an institution where the liberal arts are studied for purposes of general culture. A university, on the other hand, prepares a man for one definite line of work either professional or technical. 
Both confer degrees upon those who have successfully completed their courses, but those of the university, Ph.D., A.M., M.D., etc., are of a higher type than those of the college, B., Ph.B. There were 24 colleges in the United States in 1800. The six oldest were, Harvard, established in 1687, William and Mary, 1693, Yale, 1701, Princeton, 1746, University of Pennsylvania, 1749, Columbia, 1754. In 1896 there were 472 colleges and universities in the United States, representing most of the states and territories in the Union. Many of these are entirely public, being supported by state appropriations, some receive state aid. Others were originally founded by private endowment, but have become public in their management, some are entirely private in both endowment and control. Most are nonsectarian, but many require worship in accordance with the services of some denomination. In general, all recognize their lofty function in society and are anxious to discharge it properly. Originally aristocratic in many ways, prior to the revolution some colleges classifying their students in the catalog according to the social rank of their families, they have become among the most popular institutions in the educational world. Largely because of the high worth of their graduates. Universities, in the scientific sense of the term, did not exist prior to 1800, except in a few medical and law schools and theological seminaries. The American conception of the university has been very largely molded by the experience of Germany. The college does not exist as a degree-conferring institution in Germany, but its place is taken very largely by the gymnasium. The German system comprises three grades of schools, one, Volksschulen, primary schools, where the elementary instruction is given. Two, Gymnasia and Realschulen, secondary schools, which provide a nine years course for the pupil, usually covering the period from 10 to 19 years. The aim of the first is to prepare for the university, while the real shulen fit their students for the ordinary business callings of life. 3. Universities, in which the studies are arranged in four faculties. Theology, law, medicine, and philosophy. On account of the thoroughness of the German teaching, many American students have gone to Germany for their university course. A sincere effort has been made in America to develop universities according to the German concept, with its detailed study of particular topics based on a thorough general education. Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore, opened in 1876, has done most along these lines. During the century a determined and successful effort has been made to break down the old-fashioned college curriculum, with its absolute and unvarying requirements from every student. Harvard University, under the leadership of its brilliant executives, Thomas Hill and especially Charles W. Eliot, has led the way by providing a series of elective courses from which the student might select a sufficient number to make up his roster. This has given scope to the exercise of a freedom of choice that has been most wholesome in its effects upon both the scholar and university. It has led to the neglect of the poor courses and to the encouragement of the good ones. And it has promoted individuality in the different students to a marked degree. The success of the elective system, and the development of postgraduate courses in the university, taken in connection with the very great interest in all the phases of higher education, constitute the chief lines of advance during the century. It is evident, then, that the student of today has a tremendous advantage over his fellow of 100 years ago in the subjects which he may study. The courses have been enriched, instruction has been systematized, new subjects, more closely allied with popular needs, have been developed. But a gain which transcends in importance even these alterations in the curriculum, is that which has come through the teacher. We have seen that the teacher of our forefathers was a man of doubtful attainments and uncertain character, and while there were golden exceptions to any general criticism. Yet it is beyond question that as a class the teachership was not well esteemed. As a rule, there was no stable salary, the teachers boarded around at the homes of their pupils or received payment in produce from the farmers. At the school he was janitor as well as educator. Outside of New England, there was little intelligent supervision of his efforts, and, on the whole, very little effective home cooperation. 
Within the century, however, there has been a marked increase in the esteem in which the teacher is held, and in the popular appreciation of his work. Moreover, today, the teacher better deserves esteem and respect. While the profession still contains a vast floating element who look forward to a future in other lines of work, yet on the whole its members possess a keen interest in their work and a desire for professional improvement. A most powerful means toward this end has been found in the various teachers' organizations. The Institute, with its annual assembly of all teachers within a given district, who for two or three days discuss school questions and listen to lectures upon educational topics, has been introduced throughout the whole country with great success. The teachers in the various states have organized state associations, and there are innumerable voluntary organizations. Whose meetings give each teacher an opportunity for that free contact with others of his own kind that is so helpful and so suggestive. The oldest educational association in America, maybe in the world, is the American Institute of Instruction, organized in 1830. During its nearly 70 years of life it has been a vast inspiration to thousands of teachers. It has drawn its support chiefly from the New England states and recently from Canada, but its influence is widespread. Annual meetings have been held regularly. Among its leading spirits, it has numbered such men as W. E. Sheldon, Francis Wayland, Henry Barnard, etc. Out of the success of the various state associations, and perhaps suggested by the necessity for more general action, grew the National Educational Association, founded in 1857. With the objects to elevate the character and advance the interest of the profession of teaching and to promote the cause of popular education in the United States. Its first president was Zalman Richards, and his successors have been the foremost educators of the country, including James P. Wickersham, Emerson E. White, William T. Harris, Albert G. Lane, Nicholas Murray Butler, Charles R. Skinner, etc. Its membership has grown from 80 in 1857 to 10,654, 1898, and it has been estimated that some of its conventions have brought 25,000 people in their train. In spirit it is thoroughly national, meeting in every section of the country in turn, so helping to promote uniformity in school ideas. As the association grew larger, and its work became more complicated, its organization became involved. Today it consists of 17 departments, each of which devotes itself to one phase of education, usually reporting at the annual meeting. Since 1892 the National Educational Association, NEA, as it is popularly called, has appointed three committees to investigate special lines of work in separate departments of the school system. The Committee of Ten, whose chairman, Charles W. Eliot, was the distinguished president of Harvard University, submitted a most useful report in 1893 on secondary school studies. In 1895 the Committee of Fifteen, of which Superintendent William H. Maxwell was chairman, then of Brooklyn but since chosen to be the first superintendent of schools of Greater New York, made a valuable report on elementary education, including reports of subcommittees on the training of teachers. Correlation of Studies, and the Organization of City School Systems. In 1897 came the report of the Committee of Twelve on Rural Schools, Superintendent Henry Sabin, of Iowa, as chairman. These documents have been epoch-making, they have accumulated a mass of trustworthy information. They have procured opinion upon a wide variety of topics, and their influence upon the general systematization of the school system has been enormous. Their additional value lies in the fact that they have been prepared by teachers who thoroughly understood the topics which were being considered. And they have furnished to educators generally that consensus of professional opinion which has been so badly needed in America. In this work of gathering and disseminating information, a most potent part has been played by the national government. The limitations of the Constitution left education as a state interest, to be worked out by each commonwealth as it should think best. There had always been a general desire among teachers for some national organization, and at last, after the Civil War, Congress established a department, and then later made a Bureau of Education in the Department of the Interior. In 1867 Han. Henry Barnard was appointed the first United States Commissioner of Education. A wiser choice could not have been made. Dar. 
Barnard's career in education covers a period from 1830, when he was appointed secretary of the Board of School Commissioners in Connecticut, down to the present. Beyond question, his greatest work has been the organization of the National Bureau of Education, which today is a grand educational clearinghouse, sending forth in its excellent reports an account of ideas and work of each state to the others. Its high efficiency has been due, in a large measure, to the character of its commissioners, Henry Barnard, from 1867 to 1870, John Eden, 1870 to 1886, Nathaniel H. R. Dawson, 1886 to 1889, William T. Harris, 1889 to date. The present incumbent has had the satisfaction of the knowledge that his position has been removed from the list of partisan appointments. By his tactful prudence and genuine scholarship, Dr. Harris has brought his office into touch with every good educational work for a decade, and has made his name a synonym for genial wisdom throughout the whole country. The teacher has been aided in his work by his professional associations. It is, moreover, true that today the teacher enters upon his work better equipped for his duties. The normal school system has spread over the whole country, and every year thousands of young men and women are sent forth with a preparation that fifty years ago was not even dreamed of. Since the teacher better deserves respect, he has commanded it the more readily. Gradually the barbarisms of the schoolroom have disappeared. As the sympathy with education increased, the necessity for excessive flogging passed away. Today there is a wide variety in opinion as to the efficiency of this mode of discipline. In one state, New Jersey, corporal punishment in schools is forbidden by law. But in most of the others it is permitted in special cases, as a general part of the teacher's power when in loco parentis. The teacher is now paid a regular salary, but unfortunately it is the lowest paid in any profession for which formal preparation is required. In 1896-97 the average monthly wages of teachers was, for males, $44.62, and for females, $38.38. In comparison with the standard of life throughout the country, this is poor pay. Superintendent N. C. Schaefer, of Pennsylvania, in a recent annual report, states that one superintendent found that there were teachers in his county teaching for four dollars less per year than it cost the county on an average to keep one pauper. This is an exceptional case, but it illustrates the general truth. One consequence of this low pay has been to accent a tendency which is fast removing education from the list of those professions in which men will engage. From 1870 to 71 to 1896 to 97 the percentage of male teachers decreased from 41.0 to 32.6, especially is this true in the older states. This is in striking contrast with 100 years ago, when, except in infant schools, teachers were almost universally of the male sex. A variety of causes may be given for this change. The preeminent fitness of women for guiding the child during certain ages is acknowledged. Again, the decline of the rod and the introduction of a happy sympathy between teacher and pupil have helped the tendency. But of all the forces which have contributed to this change, none has been more potent than the great increase of opportunities for the higher education of women. At the beginning of the century the United States was not behind European nations in its provision for the education of young women. No one thought of making anything like the same provision for both sexes. Women were refused admission to the colleges, and were obliged to content themselves with an elementary education or else meet the expense of private tutorage. Gradually, in protest against this state of things, girls' seminaries were opened and girls' high schools were established in the large cities. The idea of a seminary, which should be to young women what the college is to young men, was first given definite shape by Mary Lyon, who collected funds for that purpose, and in 1837, 200 years after Harvard. Mount Holyoke Female Seminary was opened. Its success was complete, it offered the regular English and classical course, and its graduates entered generally into the teaching profession. Presently, colleges for women were incorporated, of which today the best known are Vassar, Wellesley, Smith, and Bryn Mawr. As the demand for the higher education of women increased, presently it was queried, why may not the two sexes be trained in the same institution? 
Is there any real necessity for a duplication of plants with the consequent weakening of resources? The West has advanced far beyond the East toward co-education. Oberlin College, founded in 1833, opened its doors to both sexes from the first, and most of the institutions that derive their spirit from the West have followed the same plan. As a result, some of the city systems are trying co-education in their high schools and elementary grades, and thus far, while there are many opponents, the general verdict is favorable. But the women were not content with a general collegiate training or a normal course that fitted only for teaching. Within recent years they have entered into the other professions with a keen enthusiasm. They are allowed, in a few institutions, to take theological courses fitting for the ministry. The first woman physician was graduated in 1849 from the school at Geneva, N.Y. Since that time special medical schools for women have been opened and some colleges have decided to admit women on the same terms as the other sex. In most law schools, women may be admitted, and in several states there are women practicing at the bar. While the influence of tradition has been strong, yet there is today no reason why an American woman should not receive as full an education and as complete a training as her brother. In considering the changes in school life, the improvement in buildings and equipment must not be overlooked. With the appreciation of the value of education, there has come an attention to the environment of the pupil that manifests itself in the provision of textbooks, in the erection of larger and better ventilated buildings, and in the adornment of school grounds. School architecture, especially where populations are dense, has become an important science, involving problems of light, heat, ventilation, etc., together with questions of furniture, fireproof construction and playgrounds. There was a time when the most interest was aroused by the exterior, that the school might be an adornment to its neighborhood. Today the important problems of arrangement receive the most attention, and deservedly so. We give two suggestive pictures of modern schoolhouses. Professor Liberty H. Bailey of Cornell University, in a pamphlet which has been extensively circulated, has advocated a judicious arrangement of shrubbery around a schoolhouse, as space permitted with a view to the elimination of all bare and cheerless features from the landscape. This is especially adapted to country districts. As a comparison, the new Central High School of Philadelphia is given as one of the best types of a complete city schoolhouse. It has been erected at a total cost of over $1 million. The furnishing of a school has undergone characteristic development. The hard bench, upon which our forefathers sat, has in a large measure disappeared, and in its place has come a variety of desks patterned with chairs fitted to each curve of the back, etc. Blackboards came into general use about the middle of the century. In certain studies, maps, charts, models, etc., seem indispensable, and the modern schoolroom contains all these. Moreover, as soon as science teaching had won a place in the curriculum, the cry went up for laboratories, that a higher grade of work might be done with the more advanced pupil. It is rather a singular fact that in many places the public high school led in this demand, rather than the more conservative college. Today no high school would count itself able to do its work without one or more laboratories where each pupil might work for himself. In the new high school of Philadelphia there are physical, chemical, and biological laboratories, as well as a completely equipped astronomical observatory. Textbooks were just coming into use at the close of the 18th century. The Child's Guide was being superseded by such works as Noah Webster's Spelling Book, Grammar, and Reader, 1792. Within a few years came Lindley Murray's English Grammar, the work of a Quaker merchant who wrote his famous textbook primarily for a young lady's school in his immediate neighborhood. The instant success of these books demonstrated what a need there was for such a class of literature. The writing and publication of textbooks has become one of the most flourishing industries of the country. On account of hard usage, a textbook does not last more than a few years, and this gives continual opportunity for a new book more nearly up to date than its predecessor. Within recent years, less stress has been laid on the textbook, and its influence is being minimized. In the elementary schools the teacher explains the lesson, and in the higher schools the professor lectures upon his subject. Consequently, the textbook is relatively less important. 
This does not mean that less reading is being done, but it does mean that the reading covers a wider ground. Particularly is this true where libraries have been established. The public library system is a most valuable auxiliary to the school system, and is fast becoming indispensable. This is one of the great advantages which city pupils have over those whose home is in the country, and it will lead in the end to district libraries. In some states, as in New York, a successful effort has been made to inaugurate a system of traveling libraries, whereby a case of 50 or 100 volumes, relating to a particular topic, will be lent for a time to any circle of readers. Massachusetts has best developed a library system, since there are but nine towns in the state that have not free libraries. The growth of the universities has led to the accumulation of great collections for special research and study. In 1800 there were but 11 college libraries in America worth mentioning, today there are almost 500, of which the largest, Harvard, contains a half million volumes. Libraries are of use, not only for pupils, but also for adults as well. They have aided materially in solving the great question of adult education. In the New England towns of the middle part of the century, the Lyceum Lecture was exceedingly popular. University extension has recently come to the front as the latest form of the Lyceum system. The idea of lectures to the people by university teachers came from England, where it was suggested just after an extension of the suffrage had attached a new value to the education of adults. Societies for the extension of university teaching have been formed in Oxford, Cambridge, and London. Their methods are on the whole identical, university men are sent to town or village centers to give a course of lectures upon some general topic. After each lecture a voluntary class is held where questions may be asked and answered, at the conclusion of the course an examination based upon the course and collateral reading is given to those who care to take it and sometimes a certificate or testimonial may be given. The method has been transplanted to America and generally adopted by the universities, with greatest success, perhaps, in the Middle States, where the American Society for the Extension of University Teaching has organized the field. During the period 1890-99, 862 courses of lectures were given under the auspices of the American Society to audiences aggregating 952,068. Another movement of equal importance is that done by the Chautauqua Literary and Scientific Circle, which prepares lists of books for home reading, with a view to encouraging system in one's use of spare time. Perhaps the most interesting public work for adults is being done in New York City, where a lecture department has been organized by the Board of Education, by which free lectures are given in schoolhouses to the people. In 1898, 1866 lectures were given to 698,200 people, and the President of New York School Board has declared that these lectures have contributed more than any other agency to the distribution of general intelligence among the masses. These forces have supplemented very well the work that is being done by the public night schools, which are established in most large cities, with a view to providing elementary, and sometimes technical, instruction to those adults who care for it. No educational question has aroused more interest in business circles than the problem how to train best those who will devote themselves to a commercial life. This has become a live question recently to the American people. With improved processes in manufacture, the power of production has grown far beyond the consumption of our own people. Consequently America is competing with the great industrial nations of Europe for a control of the markets of the world. As soon as this competition became evident, the need for a better trained class of commercial leaders was felt. The example of Germany has had a great influence upon other countries. There is a general conviction that the leading position among commercial nations which Germany has won for itself is due in large measure to the technical education given to German artisans and the commercial education provided for businessmen. For illustration, the German government has recently established in Berlin a school where young men, preparing for business careers in Asia, can learn Chinese, Japanese, Arabic, and Turkish. German youths have been supplanting English young men, to an appreciable degree, in the great commercial houses of London. As a consequence, there has been a strong demand in America for the establishment of commercial high schools, public institutions in which German, French, and Spanish will be taught, together with economics, industrial history, commercial geography. 
public finance, social science, etc. These institutions differ entirely from the business colleges, of which there were 342 in the United States in 1897, in that they are broader in scope and content. The latter qualify a man to be a good clerk by teaching him stenography, typewriting, bookkeeping, etc. But the former aim to give him a broad, liberal education, enabling him to have an intelligent comprehension of all matters which interest him in active business. This movement is too recent to have borne much fruit, but in many of the larger cities of America, as New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Brooklyn, and Cleveland. Commercial courses have been established in connection with the regular high school course. And in some of the larger universities, as Pennsylvania, Chicago, Columbia, schools in economics and politics have been created, all with a view to equipping a young man for an active business career. In view of the present interest in this movement, more may be expected in the near future. The close of the Civil War brought the American people to a problem, vast in its importance and intricate in its solution. The Negro race had had no opportunity for education under the institution of slavery. But with their freedom came the necessity for creating a system of schools which could be of special help to this new body of citizens. The South has preferred generally that separate schools should be provided for the two races. In the antebellum days, the wealthier families usually sent their sons and daughters away from home to obtain their education under better auspices than their own neighborhood could afford. So when the war concluded, and there was but little sign of public schools, a new system must be created, and at once. The first work toward educating the Negro was done by the national government, through the schools opened by the Freedmen's Aid Society. The different religious bodies throughout the country took a hand in the good work, by establishing special missionary boards for work in the South. Private benevolence lent substantial assistance. George Peabody, the philanthropist, and John F. Slater, both founded trusts which they richly endowed to aid in the establishment of schools in the southern section. But the greatest work was done through the awakening of the people to the value of education, leading to liberal appropriations and to a firm public support. Within recent years, Negro education has assumed a new and interesting phase. Booker T. Washington, principal of the Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute, Alabama, is the leading educator of the Afro-Americans, and he has won his high place by the success which has attended his efforts at industrial education. His school at Tuskegee was started in 1881, and today contains over 1,000 students. While fully appreciating the value of an academic education, Mr. Washington has felt that the first necessity for his people was the knowledge that would earn a livelihood. As a consequence, the industrial side of education has been accented. Twenty-six different trades or industries are in operation at Tuskegee, and one is taught to each student of the institute. As a consequence, its graduates have gone forth into active life, well equipped to become breadwinners and to fill a useful place in society. The care of those who, from birth or by accident, do not possess all the powers of a normal person, has aroused much interest during the century. The deaf-mutes, the blind, and the mentally deficient, have each had institutions created, where they are taught as much of the knowledge of the world as is possible. The instruction of the deaf and dumb proceeds along two lines. The manual or sign method of conversation, based on gestures, was founded by Abbé de L.A. Pay in 1760. While about the same time Samuel Heinecke, a German, introduced the oral method, by which the eye of the mute is trained to perform the part of the ear. By learning the meaning of spoken words through observation of the changes in the position of the vocal organs. Special institutions for these classes abound in Europe and America, with the difference that, in the former, they are generally private or maintained by charity, whereas in the latter they are maintained by the state. Rev. T. H. Gallaudet and his son, Dr. Edward M. Gallaudet, have been the leaders in the instruction of deaf-mutes in the United States, and have achieved a high degree of success. The teaching of the blind is of equal value to education. Two methods are generally followed. An alphabet of raised letters is employed in some cases, or, and more generally in the United States, a system of raised dots or points, which do not resemble the letter in form, 
but are a kind of shorthand to the reader. In both methods, the sense of touch takes the place of sight. In some cases, notably Laura Bridgman and Helen Keller, the success has been so complete as to excite universal wonder. Perhaps no institutions alleviate more human misery than do the schools for the blind, by bringing world ideas within the limited horizon of this afflicted class. Much also has been done for the training of idiots or those who are mentally deficient. In 1848, the Massachusetts School for Idiots and Feeble-Minded was opened, and other states followed with equally generous provision. Within recent years, special schools have been opened in connection with the school systems of large cities, so that children who need individual care and watchfulness may receive more attention than they could secure in the graded classroom. All these tendencies are exceedingly hopeful, as indicative of society's recognition of her duty to those who cannot satisfactorily care for themselves. Humanitarianism in education has been a powerful and constant force during the whole of this century. It must not be forgotten that other agencies beside those established by states have been contributing to education. The Sunday School Movement is one of the great efforts of the century, to help in training children by a voluntary organization. In 1781, Robert Rakes employed some teachers for the poor children of Gloucester, in order that their Sundays might be spent quietly and with profit. Presently, as the number of Sunday schools increased, men and women proffered their services gratuitously. The teaching followed two general lines, secular, reading, writing, etc., and religious. The former was of help, especially to children who were employed during the week. From England, the movement came to the West. The American Sunday School Union was organized in 1824, and has ever since continued to stimulate the establishment of more schools of this kind. In 1896, there were 132,697 Sunday schools in the United States and 9097 in Canada, with a total membership of 12,288,153 and 721,435 respectively. While it has been computed that in the world the number of Sunday schools was 246,658. With an enrollment of 24,919,313. In European states, they have been solving the same problems as in America. The importance of education once admitted, the next problem is to secure the funds and develop the system. 5. Because of administrative centralization, this has been far easier in Europe than in America. The Minister of Education in France or Germany orders, and his directions are carried out. The United States Commissioner advises, and while his recommendations influence public opinion, yet the latter method is by far the slower. As a consequence, the European schools are more systematized and better organized than our own. Their course of study differs widely in details from our own, and generally shows more influence on the part of the pedagogical expert. Technical and professional education has been developed to an exceedingly high degree. England has had a peculiar problem to face, in determining the relation between the church schools and the secular schools, and has only solved it by maintaining both. Most European countries have adopted the principle of compulsory education for children within a certain age limit, and the same principle has been accepted in 32 states in America. In general, it may be said that in the changes in course of study, in equipment, in the teachership, etc., Europe and America have been working along parallel lines. As a rule, these changes have come more quickly in America, where traditions were as yet unformed, nevertheless, the progress in Europe has been constant and very great. Canada has a well-established and well-regulated system, in which the principle of free and public education is recognized. The eight provinces contain 24 colleges, and the schools have over 1 million pupils. Education is more or less compulsory in all of the provinces, but the law is not very strictly enforced. In Ontario, Quebec, and the Northwest Territories there are separate schools for Roman Catholics. In the other provinces the schools are nonsectarian. There is a high professional spirit among the teachers, so that the schools may be expected to keep fully abreast of the times. The 19th century has been a century of continuous advance in education. Its spirit has been healthy, its achievements are notable, its work has been great. It would be futile, 
however, to assert that all is yet accomplished. The problems in elementary education are so many and so important that there have been times when solution seemed impossible. Nevertheless, the system is now established and is assured of public support, and with an education within the reach of every child, the security of free institutions is forever guaranteed.